The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Marshall, your guide through the macabre maze of the occult. Love, hatred, and revenge are accepted by us as part of our daily lives. But those who claim to know the spirit world assure us that these emotions don't necessarily die with the death of a mortal, but are sometimes carried over into the hereafter. Our tale deals with love, hatred, and a revenge that reached from beyond the grave and made a mockery of the marriage vow till death do us part. Honestly, Jack, do you think Vinny will come along with us on our honeymoon, too? Now, Anne, don't talk like a fool. Vinny is dead. Forget him. He won't let us. Your dear, dead twin brother just won't let us alone, and it doesn't seem to bother you any more than it did when he was alive and tagged along on all our dates. Jack, I can't live with a ghost. All right, Anne. What do you want me to do, kill him? You know as well as I that Vinny's already dead. Just make him stay that way, Jack. Just make Vinny stay dead. Our mystery drama, An Identical Murder, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars William Redfield and Elliot Reed. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. thin line between love and hate has been walked by tellers of tales ever since tales have been told. For other storytellers, the line between life and death became a thoroughfare on which they balanced fascinating tales of terror. Today, we cross both lines, love and hate, life and death, as our path leads us to the ultimate unknown terror. Our guide along this path is a man named Harry Carlson, who's more experienced climbing mountains than dealing with the unknown. Let's set the record straight from the start. I'm not a man who sees things. I'm a guy with both feet on the ground, my head on straight. Darn well better be because my hobby is mountain climbing. And the icy face of a mountain is no place for a guy with jumpy nerves. The funny thing about what I have to tell you is that this whole bizarre adventure started with a climb. The climb I made with the Benton twins. I remember the three of us sitting in the warm tap room of the Regenhof talking about the climb. Harry, the map shows we shouldn't have too much trouble after we reach this point, about halfway up the north face. Right, Vinny. Tough part should come when we leave the trail. Uh, I'm Jack. He's Benny. <laughs> you keep mixing us up. <laughs> Wouldn't you think I'd be able to tell you apart after the last four years? Well, Harry, why <laughs> should you be different than everyone else? People have been calling Jack, Vinny, and me Jack ever since I can remember. Uh, well, I- I'd love to talk more with you guys about people mistaking you for one another, but I think we're prepared for tomorrow's climb and... I better hit the sack. I'm just a lonely young lady looking for a date. Uh, Anyone interested? And what are you doing in Switzerland? Annie, darling. Oh, listen, pay no attention to my rude twin brother. I am delighted you're here. Oh, Vinny. <laughs> and I know you're Vinny because Jack always says my brother, and you say my twin brother. Uh, uh, and since you're such an observant minx, come here and put your arms around me, and I'll show you just how glad I am to see you. Mm, you've made yourself a dear. Oh. <laughs> Oh. Hey, my ribs, Dad. Leave me my ribs. I'll need them for the slopes tomorrow. Oh, what's this about slopes? I don't know how you got here, but now that you're here, there'll be no skiing. You're climbing with us tomorrow. Please don't take this personally, but I have no head for heights. I'm all right on skis, but climbing is out. 
If everyone knew their own limitations, there'd be a lot fewer accidents. Well, good night. We'll meet here tomorrow, bright and early. Yeah, that seems like a good idea for all of us. Well, what do you say, Jack? Uh, if you don't mind, Vinny, there's something I want to discuss with Jack. Oh? Private? <laughs> sort of. Well, Diane, you ought to know by now that Jack and I have no secrets from each other. He'll, he'll only tell me anyway. Perhaps, Vinny, that's exactly what I want. Oh, it's beautiful up here, Jack. Just beautiful. And so are you. Jack. Jack, please stop kissing me or I'll want to elope tonight. Oh, what's wrong with that? Vinny. Oh, from the conversation back in the tap room, I gather you hadn't told him about us yet. That's right. Are you going to tell him? You know I am. It, it, it's just... Well, you know how Vinny feels about you, and he is my twin brother. <sighs> and don't I know it. What's that supposed to mean? That I love you, not Vinny. That I want to live with you, not Vinny. And... That it may be hard for even me to tell you apart physically, but there's a world of difference between you. I'm in love with you, Jack, and Vinny had better be told I'm soon. So that's why you've come. You traveled 4,000 miles to pick a fight. Oh, not really. My boss sent me to Paris to check on some designs, and I was so close I... Well, I wanted to see you. And I was right. You still hadn't told Vinny about us. And it, it isn't easy. Vinny loves you, too. But it's you I'm marrying. Y you really don't understand how close Vinny and I are. It, it, it's something... Well, being twins... I, I can't explain. That's been the story of our entire courtship. Wherever we went, there went Vinny also. Sometimes I felt as if I was getting engaged to two men. You never told me you felt this way. I've been thinking this way for a long time. And I'm desperate. An ultimatum? No. I'm too much in love with you, Jack, to give you ultimatums. All I want to know is, am I engaged to two men? If I am, tell me, and I'll see whether I want to be. But tell me, or tell him. Vinny, I have something to tell you. Oh. It's about Anne, isn't it? Uh, I should have guessed you'd know. Mm -hmm. We've always been able to read each other's thoughts. So... Aren't you going to congratulate me? Well, you've just lost me. I knew it was about Anne, but where do the, uh, congratulations come in? Anne and I are going to be married. You dirty double cock! Oh, Vinny, what do you do? I, behind my back! Vinny, stop it! I'm going to stop kill it. you! I'm going to kill you! I will kill you! Okay, I'll kill you. okay, I'm not going to stand here and let you beat me up! You dirty! Now are you going to listen to me? You. Or do I have to pound your head against the floor? Okay, okay, Jack. Okay, Jack, let me out. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I blew my top. Vinny, what happened to you? I, I, uh, I honestly don't know, Jack. For a minute, I, oh, I, I really wanted to kill you. You almost did. Now calm down and let's talk about no, my marriage. No, 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 the only talking I'm going to do is to tell you how sorry I am. I'll make it up to you, Jack. And I'll prove it with my wedding gift. How are you doing, fellas? We're okay, Harry. Why don't you let Jack speak for himself, Vinny? There you go again, Harry. I am Jack. And I'm Vinny. And I'm doing okay, too. How far are we from the summit? I'll keep you straight somehow. Just the low man on the line, and Vinny, you're next, right? Right. How far from the summit? Not too far. A couple hundred feet or so. Uh-oh. Trouble? Yeah, a little. Oh, uh, what is it? It's a pretty easy path to the summit, but to get there, it looks like a tough summit right in front of me. How tough? I don't know. I don't want to get you guys started on it until I don't know what it's for. Well, how long do you think it'll take? Oh, well, not too long. I don't want to untie my rope. You guys be all right? We'll be fine. Hey, the uh, wind seems to be getting stronger. Yeah, it is. And the storm can be real close. Maybe we ought to forget the 
from it. Start back down, huh? No, let's give it a try, Harry. Go and take a look at the traverse. Okay. Watch yourself. Jimmy, you hang on to my rope. All right. I'll call on again when I return. Hey, that wind's really rising. You okay, Jack? Fine, Ben. How about you? Well, I'd like it better if we were a little closer together. I... Can you come up a few steps? Why not? Hang on to the rope. Right. <laughs> hey, hey, Ben, don't let the rope go slack. I'm having trouble. I, I'm flipping. What? What's that? I can't hear you. Ben, Ben, I can't get a foothold. I'm, I'm flipping. The rope, Benny. Across the traverse, and I heard the scream, then the slide. My stomach told me what had happened. I looked, and I saw the one man clinging desperately to the face of the mountain, the empty rope dangling from his waist. Hang on! I'm coming to get you! Hang on! I, I couldn't help it. I tried, but he was... He was gone before I could get the rope around me to hold him. Don't think about it, Vinny. Just hang on till I reach you. I'm not Vinny. I'm Jack. What? Wasn't Jack below you? I could have sworn that Vinny was where you... Then he's gone. Dead. And I'll be following him unless you get to me. You can call me anything you want, but whatever you call me, the fact remains that I'm Jack. And Vinny's at the bottom of the mountain. <laughs> I dreaded going back to the Rangahoff. I didn't know which I feared most. Losing a man for my team, or having to tell Ann Slater that Vinny had plunged to his death. Fortunately, Jack spared me the latter ordeal. But I was put in the middle of a strange and painful scene. The fault was mine, Ann. All mine, Vinny called to me, and I pulled on the rope, but it, it slipped, and then, then he was gone. I, oh, I'll never forgive myself, never. That's the wrong way to think. I haven't heard Ann say it's wrong. In fact, I haven't heard Ann say anything since we came back. I, I don't know what to say. I'm too shocked. Well, that's understandable. Maybe we ought to get a doctor. Oh, no, thanks, Vinny. I, oh, what am I saying? I called you Vinny. Oh, you... of course, of course. Vinny is on your mind and... Oh, and no, I... Jack, don't. Don't hold me. I just want to be alone. Oh. I'm sorry. I'll see you in the morning. It looks as though it's going to be a difficult situation for you, Jack. She'll get over it. She has to. Because she's a girl I love. And I'm going to marry A few months passed. I expected to read the announcement of the wedding between Jack Benton and Ann Slater, but all I heard was that they were seen around town together and no date had been set. Until one day at my office, I looked up and Ann Slater stood there. Only she wasn't the vivacious, laughing girl I remembered. But a frightened, confused woman on the razor edge of a breakdown. I'm sorry, Harry. I'm really sorry. I, I shouldn't have come, but I... Oh, you don't think I'm crazy, do you? No, no, Anne, sit down. Let me get your drink. You were there. You're the only one I could think of who might be able to... to help. Brandy, coffee. He's dead, isn't he? You were there. Now, Anne, try to get hold of yourself. What is it? That's what Jack keeps telling me. He says it's all in my mind, but I know it isn't. It isn't. And why didn't you start somewhere and explain so that I can understand? It's Jack and Vinny. Vinny? You know how close Jack and Vinny were, but what you couldn't know was that all the time Jack and I were dating, Vinny was along. What does that have to do with Vinny? It doesn't help me, but I think we still are. I think we still are a threesome. A 
According to medical science, identical twins have the same heartbeat, the same skin, hair tones, and if you took a voice print, you would find that although the voice might vary in pitch and timbre, they would follow a somewhat similar pattern. The question is, would a woman be able to tell the difference between identical twins if she loved one of them? I'll return shortly with Act Two. Two's company and three's a crowd. But I'm puzzled about which kind of a third party on a date is more disturbing. A dull and insensitive bore who refuses to take any hints about leaving, or an unseen but definitely felt presence. In other words, a ghost. Anne Slater is trying to explain how she feels about this ghostly third party as we continue with our strange tale. I, I feel so, so disloyal. You must remember I'm the one who's supposed to help Jack forget about his brother's unfortunate accident. And it seems I just keep reminding him of it instead. Man, you still haven't made it clear to me just why. Wherever we go, Vinny is with us. Well, that's not possible. Vinny's dead. I know, I know that, but... Just listen. Last night, we went to the pump room for dinner. Ah, good evening, monsieur, madame. I have your table over here. As you see, monsieur, it's set for four, but I'll have the busboy remove two place settings and you will have more room. Oh, thank you, captain. I appreciate that. And, monsieur, may I recommend our special salad? They're all on the table up front. You may serve yourself. Ah, uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. And then, then the strangest thing happened. Jack and I sat at the table and... You must believe me. We saw the busboy clear away the other two place settings. We went to the salad table. And when we came back, there was a third setting. Well, that's easily accounted for. Maybe another busboy started to set up the table for four. Yes. Then tell me how you account for the fact that the third place had a salad plate heaped with Caesar salad. Caesar salad? I remember that's Vinny's favorite. Well, maybe Jack... We were together at the salad table every minute, and we came back together. What did Jack say? What he always says when this happens. Forget it. Then he isn't as concerned about this as you are. Oh, that's another thing that's bothering me. He's concerned. I know he's concerned, but he won't admit it. Do you think he's trying to act as if everything were normal so as not to upset me? Well, now, don't you think that's a strong possibility? But... There are other possibilities. I don't know what you mean. I hope you will when I tell you what happened a week ago at an amusement park. Oh, look, Jack. Cotton candy. Hmm? I haven't had cotton candy in years. Well, then you'll have a big, giant portion. Uh-oh, no. It's too fattening. Just a small one will be fine. No, no, you'll see, you'll see. Here you are, darling. Oh, thank you, Jack. Oh, I wish I could make your eyes sparkle and your lips smile that way when I'm not bringing you cotton candy. Mm, delicious, but sticky. And? Mm? Did you hear what mm. I said? Mm -hmm. And? I'm sorry. Oh, what's wrong? Why can't I make you happy the way I used to? It's my fault. I'm all mixed up. About us? About us and Vinny. And... Look, Vinny's dead. We just have to forget him. He won't let us. He just won't, and you don't seem to understand. Sometimes I think your voice sounds just like Vinny's. But... But maybe I've mistaken you for... Oh. Forgive me, Jack. I just don't know what I'm saying. It's all right, it's all right. Now, look, I've known a lot of girls. You know that. But you are the one I want to marry. Not just for your looks, but for your wonderful sweetness and sensitivity. I know how you must have felt about Vinny always tagging along. It was only natural that when you heard he died, it, at first you... Well, I suppose you were glad. No. Be honest with yourself. Only at first, you were glad that he was out of the way. 
And because you're feeling guilty about it, you're letting that feeling lead you into imagining all sorts of ridiculous things. You think that could be the explanation? Oh, darling, I'm sure of it. Now, look, let's just forget all about Vinny and enjoy ourselves. Which do you want to try? The slide or the shoot the shoot? Your choice, Jack. You wait right here. I'll get the ticket. But, Jack, I want to... Jack, come back a minute. No! No, no! I won't listen! I heard sweet too. Just as if Jack were right beside me. But how could that be if he was off buying tickets? I heard it. I heard it! All right, all right, all right, Anne. All right, now you thought you heard it. Oh, no one believes me. I'm... Not sure what it is you want me to believe, Ann. You were also there when it happened, on the mountain. You would know definitely which one of them fell. Well, I heard the shouts, but I didn't actually see. There's one way we could be sure. One way there'd be no doubt at all. How? Fingerprints. If the body could be recovered. No chance. Not at least until the spring thawed. But, Anne, that still wouldn't explain the strange happenings. Maybe not. But can't you see that I'm terrified I'm marrying the wrong man? If I knew which one had died on the mountain, at least I'd be sure about the man I'm supposed to marry. <laughs> Didn't you get my note? Oh, you bet I did. That's why I'm here. All right, now, what's this about your taking a trip? I said it in the note. I just have to get away for a while and think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Where are you going? I didn't tell you because I didn't want you to know. Anne, Anne, what's happened to us? That's what I'm going to go and try and figure out. Look, you're not going. What? I mean it, not without me. I love you. I love you more than life itself. Jack, that's very sweet. But if you do love me, you're going to have to let me get away for a short while to get my head straight. Why, what have I done to you? I'm afraid I've done it to myself, Jack. It's not you. All right, I... Well, look, may I have a cup of coffee? It will have to be instant because I don't want to miss my plane. Okay, instant, instant. <laughs> Lucky I left the kettle out. I've put most of my other pots and pans away. Look, if it's too much trouble, don't bother. It will only take a minute. What is it? What's the matter? You've been sitting in that chair all the time, haven't you? Well, uh, yes, of course. I mean, you didn't come into the kitchen, did you? Well, darling, I told you I've been here. Now, Anne, what is it? What happened? Nothing. I... I just got frightened. Oh, darling, darling, come on, tell me. I, I thought... I thought I heard you whistling Sweet Sue. You thought... Sweet Well, why should that get you so upset? As a matter of fact, I was. <laughs> No, uh, but I heard it close up in the kitchen with me. Oh, you see, I'm worried about your being alone. <sighs> the kettle. I'll get your coffee. All right. Look, at least let me drive you to the airport, will you? Please forgive me, but I have to finish packing. <laughs> Here's your coffee. All right. Um, what about the airport? Let me think about it while I pack. Three valises? How long are you thinking of staying? Until I feel I can handle the situation. Uh, you can close the one on the love seat. All right. Uh, is it all right if I uh, put my coffee on the night table? Be my guest. Your guest. I'd rather be your husband. Oh, love. When are we going to get married? Mm, I always forget my toothbrush. No, there it is. Look, Anne, did you hear my question? I heard. Well? Let's go back into the living room. All right. What about the other police? I'll leave it. I may have some last-minute things. <laughs> now what? Look on the table. Right there, on the table. What? You mean the, the coffee cup sitting there? And the lighted cigarette. I don't smoke. And you haven't lit a cigarette since you came in. 
Now I know I brought only one cup in from the kitchen and you left it on the night table in the bedroom, so how can now, you... Now, Anne, calm down, please. <laughs> now you know why I'm going away. And you also know why I may never come back. I just can't go on like this, Jack. I can't. <laughs> You know where she went, and you're going to tell me. I have no idea where Anne is. I tell you, I've got to find her. Now, Jack, I'm not much on giving advice, but Anne's a big girl. I imagine if she wanted you to know where she was, she'd let you know. Harry, tell me this. Did you and Anne talk about that day on the mountain? I've already told you I think you should ask Anne about our conversation. Oh. Now, look, Jack. I got a lot of work to do, so if you don't mind... Yeah, I get it. I... You're kicking me out, aren't you, Harry? Oh, please, Jack, I... What's that? Who's... I was looking at you, and suddenly I heard... Your phone, Harry. Huh? Oh, yeah, 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 excuse me. Hello? What? How did it happen? It... Where is she? It's Anne. What's happened? Hold it, Jack. Ha- uh, skiing accident. Yeah, I see. Yes. Yes, yes, I'll take care of it. Oh, no, it was about Anne, wasn't it? Yes. She's in a skiing accident. But oh. she's all right. Yes, the hospital called me. All right, all right. What hospital? Where? Jack... She called me. Hi, it was sweet of you to come. They uh, tell me I should be out in a few days. Well, what happened? Jack has told me so many times you're an expert skier. What happened really had nothing to do with skiing. It was... It was eerie. I was all alone at the top of the run. It was a beautiful day. And I was just about ready to push off when I heard... I heard... I looked around, but I was alone, and then... And then I heard someone whistling. I panicked. I dug my poles in and took off. But the sound followed me. I knew I was going too fast, but I just wanted to get away from the sound. I wanted to go faster than all those awful sounds. But I couldn't. And then... Well, I... I never even saw the tree I hit. Mm. And I have something to tell you. When that call came from the hospital, Jack was with me in my office. He knows about your accident. Oh, well, I don't suppose I could have kept it a secret. Anne, Anne, are you all right? I got here as fast as I could. I should never have let you go alone. Hello, Harry. Anne, please. Are you all right? Jack, Jack, I will be in a few days. Oh, The doctor says it isn't serious, just a mild concussion. But, Jack, you shouldn't have come. Oh, that's where you're wrong. Not only am I here, but I'm going to stay until you get well, and then we're going to get married immediately. Jack, don't you understand that the reason I went away was because I wasn't sure about... Well, I'm sure. Darling, I'm sure you need me, and from now on you'll be with me, and I'll be here to solve all your problems. Having the man you love by your side in times of trouble can be a great comfort. But it also can be greatly disturbing if you're not sure whether the man by your side isn't the wrong man, the wrong twin, and perhaps even a murderer. We'll be back shortly with a resolution of our Anne's Dilemma. Menage à trois means a household made up of three people, usually two men and a woman. But the three can be any combination that medical science and the new sexual freedom can devise. In our story, Anne Slater, one week before her marriage to Jack Benton, was deeply worried about a possible menage à trois. 
But her concern was that the third person in her menage was a ghost. Harry Carlson, the best man, was also worried. I certainly didn't relish the idea of Jack Benton asking me to be his best man, but my guilt over the death of his twin brother left me no choice. And so, three days before the wedding, I found myself Jack's guest at a charming cottage by the sea that he and his brother had inherited. It was here that he had decided to spend their honeymoon. Now, we were alone that first night, just Jack and me. Well, I'm sure glad you could make it, Harry. There's no one in the world I'd rather have as my best man, except, of course, Vinny. Uh, thank you for the compliment. Who's upstairs? Hmm? Well, wow, you're the only guest. Yeah, but there's somebody up there. Surely you can hear the footsteps. <laughs> there's no one there. Oh, you must be putting me on, Jack. I tell you, there's no one. Now, don't tell me you don't hear those steps. Must be someone making them. Well, okay, if you want, you can look for yourself. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Hello? Who's there? Let's not play games. I'm Harry Carlson. There's someone in the bedroom? Hello? Hello? Jack? Are you up here? Jack, what the devil's going on? The next day, when Ann called and asked to see me privately, I knew what it was about. And I dreaded the meeting. But there was no way out. I met her, as she asked, at a little restaurant overlooking the sea. We can't look at the ocean, but this table's far enough away from everyone so that we'll have some privacy. How are you, Anne? You look completely recovered. Physically, I'm just fine, but mentally, Harry, I just have to find out if I'm going crazy or... You spend a night with Jack in the beach house, and I want to know if... If... I heard anything strange. Yes. Whenever I'm with Jack, I... I don't know how exactly to describe it. There's always a feeling of another person. A presence. Someone else there. Did you feel that, too? You're not crazy, Anne. Oh, thank heaven. You felt it, too. Harry, I think you saved me. From what, Anne? Sometimes I'm absolutely sure that the man I'm going to marry isn't Jack, but Vinny. Now I know what I have to do. I'm going to call the wedding off. I thought it was supposed to be bad luck if the bridegroom saw the bride before the wedding. I think it's only on the same day or... Something like that. Ah, uh, and alone here in your room at the motel, what will people say? What will people say when they hear that there's not going to be a wedding? <laughs> you know, I've always loved your sense of humor, until now. I'm not joking. No, you're not. I don't mean I won't marry you. I will just as soon as you level with me. Don't you see, I can't go into a marriage with a man who just laughs off something that's terribly important to me. Anne, please, that I'm not doing that. I simply don't know what you're talking about. When you do, maybe we can go ahead. Okay, okay, all right, all right. I have been lying to you. Oh, Jack. But why? Why did you lie? Because, darling, I didn't want to worry you. I, 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 I thought... Vinny would go away. Then it is. Vinny, or his ghost. You wanted the truth, didn't you? Yes. Then you're going to have to be able to face it. You knew, of course, that Vinny was in love with you. I knew. I mean, I won't pretend that I can explain it, but we were identical twins. You must remember how sometimes we didn't even have to talk because we knew what each of us was thinking. I remember. Sometimes it drove me crazy. Well, somehow, now, I don't know how... Vinny is still with us. I, I, I feel him at, at times so strongly that I've, I've even started talking to him. Then you're saying that Vinny is a... 
is a... A ghost. But look, there are ways of getting rid of ghosts. You mean something like exorcism? Whatever you call it, there are people, uh, mediums, who get through to the other world. What makes you think Vinny can be made to leave us alone? And I'm telling you, I'm sure he'll do it. Out of his love for you, I know that was genuine. But how would I go about it? I, I don't know anything about the spirit world. I made some inquiries. I have the name of a reputable medium, no phony. And I've spoken to him, and he's agreed to help. You spoke to him about me? Yes, and he feels exactly as I do. That Vinny's ghost will be more apt to listen to a plea from you. <laughs> This is your first visit to a medium? That's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me explain briefly what may happen. I was going into a deep trance, and I will call to him and ask him to talk with you. If you hear him, you may answer him, but otherwise you must keep quiet. All right? All right. Vincent Benton. Vincent Benton. The one you loved on Earth is here. You know her, Vincent Benton, the girl named Anne Slater. She wants to talk with you. Are you there? He's here. Vincent Benton, listen. I speak for Anne Slater and your brother Jack. Stop that. You have no reason for anger. Listen to us. Your actions are making Anne Slater and your twin brother Jack very unhappy. You must realize that you will only have peace when you give them peace. You must understand that your peace and their happiness lies in their marriage. Stop! 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 Let go of me! You're, you're hurting me! Ah, let go! I, I must get back to the sphere where I belong! Let... Let... Me. Go! I'm not one of you! Gladys! Are you all right? What happened? Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I cannot help you. I don't believe anyone can. We contacted a malignant, a very evil spirit. And it's best that you leave immediately. The wedding took place just as planned. As I followed Jack and Ann up the aisle, I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I looked around. Everything seemed perfectly normal until Jack took Ann's hand. <sighs> Your hands like ice, Jack. Harry, do you have the ring? I handed Jack the ring. And suddenly my blood ran cold. Because very faintly, I heard it. I knew that Anne had heard it too, because I saw her lips tighten. That her hand was steady as the ring went on her finger. And then it was over. And they were man and wife. At the reception after the ceremony, I was only counting the minutes until the last guest left, and I could also decently leave. Nothing more had happened, but I still desperately wanted to get away. After what seemed an interminable length of time, only Anne, Jack, and I were left. I took Anne aside to offer my good wishes. Thank you, Harry. Thank you. I owe you a lot. Oh, you don't owe me a thing. It's just... Uh, you sure everything's gonna be all right? You heard the whistling at the ceremony, too. Don't worry. Jack and I have made up our minds. We'll be fine. Yes. Yes, I'm sure you will be. I'll just go back to the cottage, pack my bag, and clear out. Uh, this is going to sound silly, but Jack and I decided we wanted to be in the cottage alone for the next few hours. Well, of course, I understand. What time should I drop by? Well, half an hour or so. Jack and I are walking back along the beach. I don't ask 
you to believe what happened next. I only tell you what I saw with my own eyes. As I stood on the steps of the church and watched them walk on the wooden planks that had been laid along the beach to form a crude boardwalk. Their backs were to me. And Jack's arm was around Anne's waist. When suddenly... I'll swear there were two arms around her waist. And one of them was encased in ice. It's suddenly so cold. I think... I think the wind has come up. I don't feel any wind, but... Jack, I'm freezing. Let's walk faster. Darling, I... I can't. Uh, look, you... You run on ahead and... And light a fire, will you? I'll, uh... I'll be along in a minute. Don't be long. I won't. Jack, please let me go. I really tried. I tried to throw you the rope. Look, believe me. You know Anne would never have married me. I had to take your place. It was better for Anne. Oh, please, Jack. Let me live. Please, go back to being dead. And as I watched, the arm encased in ice grew to a whole man, who with his icy arm walked around the bridegroom's shoulders, led him inexorably off the planks and across the sand and into the sea. As Harry Carlson told us, you don't have to believe it. But I have to report that the bridegroom's body was washed ashore on the following day. Coroner's finding? Death by drowning. There was, however, no explanation offered as to why the new bridegroom had suddenly decided to go swimming by himself with his clothes on. I'll be back shortly. Castor and Pollux. The heavenly twins, fixed and immutable in the sky, made a bargain with Zeus. When one died before the other, they were to be together always. Only they were to spend six months in heaven and six months in hell. I like to think that the Benton twins made the same deal to be together. But what troubles me is which twin belonged in heaven and which in hell. Our cast included Elliot Reed, William Redfield, Roberta Maxwell, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. But who are you? The image you cast in the mirror. That's me, isn't it? No. That's me. I can't believe this. I, I'm... You're what? What? Drunk? You never drink. Mad? You're the safest man in the city. I'm seeing things. Why? What's happening to me? That's it, Jerry. What is happening? I've gone mad. You will be. Soon, Jerry. Unless you fire that girl. Why should I fire her? You know why. I don't know what you're talking about. If you don't get rid of her, you're headed for ruin, disgrace, death. How can you say that? It's true. You know it's true. Don't you, Gerald? Deep down, way down. Don't you know where it must end? How it must end? Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. How the poets like to talk about the disastrous intervention of the completely unexpected. A sudden gust of wind, a flash of light, the unforeseen, the accidental. We're playthings, puppets dancing in the wind. But although we pay the piper, do we really call the tune? You must pay those people, Paul. You must. Relax, baby. I have every intention of paying. Tomorrow. Do it tomorrow. Absolutely. I'm getting the money tonight. Come on, relax. It's only $9,000. No, it's ten. It was nine last week. Every week you delay costs you $1,000. Our mystery drama, Death is Blue, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Francis Sternhagen. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. There are those times when everything seems to go just perfectly, but it doesn't last long. Something, somewhere, somehow arises, and things go back to being normal again. Let us begin in the office of Julia Hoffman. Who's Julia Hoffman? Well, she's a private detective. Well, not a private eye like Dashiell Hammett's Sam Spade, or Raymond Chandler's Philip Marlowe, or even Earl Stanley Gardner's Perry Mason. But she has her points, Ms. Hoffman. The gentleman's name was Edward Everett Bascom III, and he looked it. He was between 35 and 40, tall, rather handsome, in a somewhat dissipated way. A splendid physique was beginning to show the ravages of good food, strong drink, and easy living. He was extremely nervous and very much ill at ease. But those are the kind of people we get. May I inquire your fee? Of course. $150 a day. A hundred and fifty dollars? Plus expenses. Well, isn't, uh, isn't that rather high? You would pay an automobile mechanic or a plumber between fifteen and twenty dollars an hour. Which is more important? Your kitchen sink, your car, or the problem you have brought into my office? I, um, I need your help. Exactly how may I help you, Mr. Bascom? It's a delicate matter. I, um... It involves my sister, Matilda. Matilda Bascom. Uh, my, uh... My spinster sister. Yes. She's about to make an awful mistake. Yes. A tragic mistake. By doing what, Mr. Bascom? By getting married. I take it you don't want her to get married. Not to Paul Darrow. Uh, you spell that... Uh, D-A-R-R-I-E-U-X. And what's wrong with Mr. Darrow? He's a liar, a thief, a scoundrel. You have proof? Miss Hoffman, he has to be. Why? Well, this, this is the delicate part. I have here a photograph of my sister. An eight by ten portrait so that you may see her clearly. Yes. It's in color, you notice. So? Speaking forthrightly, could she appeal to a man? Obviously she has. Miss Hoffman is after my sister's money. Why do you insist? Isn't it obvious? Oh, don't get me wrong, Miss Hoffman. She's my older sister. I adore her, but I face reality. And what is reality? Reality is that she is not an attractive girl. I mean, woman. She's almost 40. And she's very plain. The, uh, the, the birthmark, that, oh, that hideous birthmark. Hideous? Well, I'm, I'm trying to speak frankly. I hope you never said that word to your sister. I would die first. 
I'm being, as I said, frank. You may be overdoing it. You can see that blue birthmark. It covers her entire forehead and practically half her right cheek. And it offends you. It doesn't offend me. I, I'm just stating a fact. Well, obviously it does offend you. Well, I cannot pretend it doesn't exist. Uh, what is it that you require of me? I want you to prove that Paul Darrow is after her money. That Paul Darrow is either a criminal or possesses a criminal record. I want you to prove that to her. Mr. Bascom, how much money does she have? Each of us inherited half a million from our father. I see. Do you still have your half million? Is this question germane to our discussion? Do you? Well, no. I've had some reverses of a temporary nature. But she still has all of hers. Yes. Now, Miss Hoffman, I assure you, I'm not thinking about the money. You're not. I love my sister. I want more than anything in this world to see her happily married, fulfilling her destiny as a woman. But I'm realistic. And therefore, I want you to get printed proof of the fact that Paul Darrow is or was a criminal. Do you have a picture of Mr. Darrow? Yes, he's given several to Matilda. I assume your sister lives with you. She does. And does Mr. Darrow ever visit your home? Much too often. Good. Then you may even be able to secure a fingerprint. Now then, why spend money to hire me when you can quite easily handle the entire affair yourself? M myself? Gather as much information as you can about Mr. Darrow. Go to the district attorney... Tell him you have reason to believe that your sister is about to be victimized by a suspected confidence operator. But I... I His I, office will do all the work. I don't know the district attorney. I couldn't ask for a favor. Your taxes pay his salary. You're entitled to it. That's exactly how I'd go about it. Mr. Bascom, I'm trying to tell you that the district attorney and every other officer of the government is your paid servant. You need not hire intermediaries... It's more than that. It's... 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 Well, it's a matter of presenting the facts to Matilda. Presenting them? Well, why should that be a problem? Well, I, I, I thought a professional detective who is also a woman would have the proper tactful approach. To... In other words, since you are unable to behave like a brother, you want to hire me to act like a sister. Could you start immediately? She's so infatuated, she may decide to run away with him at any time. Every now and then, one just drops into your lap. This makes up for the ones that fall on your head. But it was so easy, so unbelievably simple. Let's see, Mr. Bascom came into my office with his problem at 9.30 in the morning. At 10.15, I was in the office of an assistant district attorney. At 10.16, he said to me... Why, uh, Julia, that's pretty Paul Darrow. What's he up to this time? He wants to get married. I bet she's rich. Rich enough. And ugly. No woman is really ugly, Tom. Just unfulfilled. <laughs> you know, he's a specialist. In what? Separating women from their money. Is there a sheet on him? Oh, as long as your slender, lovely arm. <laughs> At 11.15... I phoned Mr. Edward Everett Bascom. Uh, yes, Miss Hoffman? I have the information you asked for. Proof? Proof of that man's criminal record? Yes, Mr. Bascom. Proof. So soon? When can you bring it to me? Any time you say. Now. At 11.45, I was in the Bascom living room. I showed Mr. Bascom the dossier on Paul Darrow. He was overjoyed. He didn't even grimace when he wrote out my check. And then the door opened. She came into the room. She was tall like he was, well-built like he was. She resembled him so closely, it was obvious they were brother and sister. She had the kind of face which makes a man handsome and a woman plain. And of course, the birthmark. It covered her forehead and most of her right cheek. It was a violent, angry, livid blue. You wanted to see me, Ed? Uh, yes, Matilda. May I present Miss Julia Hoffman? 
How do you do? How do you do? Uh, Mrs. Hoffman is a detective. Oh, I do hope there's nothing wrong. A private detective. Oh, I see. Am I to assume that you hired her in my best interests? Well, yes, Matilda. Oh, then would you excuse yourself and leave me alone with Miss Hoffman? Well, I... I'm sure you already know what she's come to tell me. Yes, but I... I would like to speak with Miss Hoffman privately. All right. Of course. In that envelope, Miss Hoffman, I'm sure you have proof that my fiancé has a criminal record. Then you know about it. <laughs> of course. He's been in jail once, ten years ago. Sold a widow stock in a non-existent corporation. He's been connected with several confidence schemes since. I'm aware of all of them. He claims to be a salesman, but in fact he has no visible means of support. That's not true. His support is quite visible. It's me. Miss Bascom, I was hired to present you with certain facts. I have done so. I will leave these papers here. Thank you. But I intend to marry Paul Darrow in any event. Would you like to know why? Obviously, you're in love with him. Exactly. Now, you understand that. Why can't my brother? All your brother can see is a man who's out to steal your money. Oh, but that's true enough. Well, I don't object to it. Why not? Because he's going to give me my money's worth. Do you understand? Yes. <laughs> I believe you really and truly do. I like you, Miss Hoffman. You're a kind, sensitive woman. I watched you as I walked into the room. I watched the expression on your face. I'm an expert at watching people's first reaction to me. Your face was frank, open, friendly, as if there were nothing at all wrong with me. But there isn't. Oh, there is. I have this absolutely hideous birthmark, this dreadful blue... Miss Bascom, if it's so traumatic... You could have it removed. Mm -hmm. This is an age of medical miracles, but not for everyone. Not for me. Now, I've learned to live with it. Mm, not live, exist. I became reconciled to doing without companionship, love, the things that make life worthwhile. You understand? Yes. And then, Paul Darrow happened along. And a whole new world opened up for me. He wants to marry me. Now, you may ask, would he wish to marry me? Would he even look at me if I were poor? And I answer, certainly not. A marriage without love. Oh, that's a platitude. That's a slogan. You can sympathize with my condition. But you cannot know how it feels to live inside my skin. I'm repulsive, Miss Hoffman, but I'm a woman and I want... Love. Even if you have to buy it. On any terms, Miss Hoffman. But love, love, for you, Miss Hoffman, is the love of the poets and the philosophers and the dreamers. Love can come to you at any time, in any place, in any chance encounter. Love, for me, is whatever I can get, whenever and wherever I can get it. And, and besides... Besides, I have so much love to give. I've been hemmed in, shut off, repressed for so long that, that I will love him with all of my being, the way no one has ever loved him. And he may even fall in love with me. I wish you the very best, Miss Bascom. Well, no, I, I mean, I don't think that will happen. What will happen... He'll squander my money, and when it's gone, he'll leave me. And you still feel it's worth it? Oh, yes, oh, yes. Um, may I ask you a favor? Of course. I have very few friends. I, well, actually, none at all, and I was wondering, may I ask you to be the maid of honor at my wedding? Well, oh... I'd pay you for your time. Oh, now, please, Miss Bascom, please don't spoil it. You're all invited to the wedding. Who knows what kind of wedding this could turn out to be? 
certainly you must admit it differs from most weddings. Since both parties are entering upon this matrimonial venture with their eyes wide open, all we know about the bridegroom so far is that he specializes in separating women from their money. One way or another, this may turn out to be a very short marriage. I shall return in a few moments with Act Two. Marriage has many pains, but celibacy has few pleasures. So said Samuel Johnson. The reason we quote Mr. Johnson here is because he was married to a grotesquely homely woman, and yet he truly adored her. We're about to meet a gentleman, a Mr. Paul Darrow, on his wedding day. He too is about to marry a woman who may be considered unattractive, and it will be interesting to see how he will cope. If that's the word, the story is being told by a private detective named Julia Hoffman. And so they were married. It was a small affair held in the bride's home, where she was reluctantly given away by her brother. I thought she looked positively radiant. The groom, Paul Darrow, was a slender, handsome man. To me. He looked like a confidence operator, but then again, I'm a detective, and we do tend to take a dim view of things and people. It's an occupational hazard. We're not always right. Miss uh, Hoffman. Congratulations, Mr. Darrow. You disapprove of me, don't you? And you know why? Yes, you're a detective, and you checked me out. You're a hunter of women, Mr. Darrow. And what chance did vulnerable, defenseless Matilda have against you? Not at all. Then we understand each other. No, not completely. If all I wanted was Matilda's money, I could do better elsewhere. Really? Oh, she's comfortably well off, but she's not fabulously wealthy. Do you understand? No. At first, it uh, it was all a play for her money. But then. But then, let but, me finish. You gazed into her eyes. An emotion you never knew before took possession of your heart, your mind, your soul. For the first time in your life, in your wasted, misspent life, you fell in love. Yes, that says it. I'm disappointed. I would imagine you'd have a better line than that. The truth of the matter is, I don't. What you just said, the old tired, for the first time, my darling, I know love, true love, that old chestnut. That's the way it is. What are you trying to tell me, Mr. Darrow? That I'm in love with her. Oh yes, it defies logic and all understanding. But I am in love with her. Are you telling me, Mr. Darrow, that the leopard has changed his spots? I have been redeemed. By Matilda Bascom. Is that a fact? Oh, you're a most charming and attractive woman, Miss Hoffman, but you're a cop. And you have the mentality of a cop, the cynical, suspicious, skeptical attitude of a cop. Once a thief, always a thief. <laughs> that is your motto, isn't it? Well, it may sound hard and even unfair, but unfortunately, it's supported by the record. Oh, there you are. Oh, I hope you two get to know each other, like each other. Julia, isn't he wonderful? Well, he certainly fills me with wonder. A detective, by the very nature of the job, sees people at their worst. And after a while, begins to suspect the worst in everybody. Why? Why couldn't I give Paul Darrow the benefit of the doubt? At least I should be grateful to him. Right or wrong, I was becoming cynical, suspicious, skeptical. It certainly was doing nothing to improve me as a human being. Paul and Matilda Darrow went off to live in a house at North Beach. Matilda kept inviting me out there. But one thing and another kept coming up. Almost a year had gone by when guess who walked into my office about guess what? 
He's about to drain her of every last cent she has in the world. You know this for a fact. Miss Hoffman, I wouldn't come here to buy your valuable time if I didn't know it for a fact. And what is the fact? I received a call from her broker, Emil Morgan. Emil's upset, as he should be, as I am. She told him to cash in $100,000 worth of municipal bonds. Mm -hmm, he yeah. asked her why. She said she wanted the money. He asked her why she wanted so much cash. She wouldn't tell him. So, I asked her. And she said Paul had an excellent business opportunity. She used the word excellent, not me. Well? Well, what do you mean, well? Isn't it obvious? He's simply going to steal that money from her. Probably. Well, how can you sit there and say probably? What else is there to say about it? Why, she should be... She should be what? Well, told about it. She knows about it. She's even more aware of this man's basic character than you are. How do you know? She told me. She told me, too. Then let's face reality, Mr. Bascom. She has taken a flyer in romance. She knows she's buying worthless stock. She knows she's buying the glitter and not the gold. But she's getting a terrific dividend of happiness while it lasts. Oh, that's nonsense. I can see her point. Well, not necessarily agree with it, but see it and understand well, it. Well, just because you're a woman, Miss Hoffman, don't think you have a monopoly when it comes to understanding a woman's emotions. Mr. Bascom, why is this a matter for a private detective? What can I tell Matilda about her husband that she doesn't already know? You can tell her that he's got another woman. Does he? He must. Can you state that as a fact? Absolutely. Well, who is she? I don't know who she is. I only know she exists. How do you know? She has to. He, he has to have another woman. But you have no evidence. Evidence. All right. That's why I've come to you. Why are you so sure? Because I know the Paul DeRose of this world. I know them very well. It's quite possible that Paul Duro was truly in love with my sister. You admit it. That was a year ago, but by now he is tired of her. It has nothing to do with her, her disfigurement, that awful blue birthmark. Even if she were Miss America, she'd begin to bore him. So find out who the other woman is. Get me the evidence. You'd be amazed, or would you, how much of this work is cut and dried. Get me the evidence. How? As they say in the movies, put a tail on Paul Darrow. In the beginning of my career, I myself would be the tail. But now, however, I hire people. Yes? It's Jerry here. I got your boy, Julia. Where? Little joint on West Side. Alone? With a babe. What kind? I don't know, but this dame is stacked. Do they know each other well? Julia, they can't seem to keep their hands off each other. Know what I mean? Mm. It's disgusting. Can't they do all that in private? The joint on West 3rd was a quiet, dimly lit place where people went in order to be alone together. There was a piano bar, and the man played pretty dreamy music. Most couples sat around in booths and concentrated their conversations on each other. Paul Darrow and his attractive female companion were too taken up with themselves to notice me. I slipped into an empty booth directly behind them. Oh, baby. There's nothing to worry about. I know, sugar. It's just I don't see you enough. I know. But I have to go home. Home? And it won't be for too much longer. Oh, that's what you said last month. You can't leave the goose while she still lays a golden egg. Oh. You were supposed to have your hands on that money last week. Well, baby, it has to be done with finesse. Why? Why not just grab the money and walk out? Paul, you have to get that money. You have to. I'm aware of it. I don't think so, honey. You already owe some of that dough. Oh, I know. It's only $9,000. That was last week. This week it's ten. I told you, those guys have a wild way of figuring interest. The bonds are due to be delivered tomorrow. Grab them and run. And here's a photograph of the two of them. There can be no doubt about their relationship. How did you get this picture? 
That's not important. Oh, but it is. It shows her darling husband practically making love to this woman in public. True. Now, do you know what I suggest you do? You don't have to. I know exactly what I'm going to do with it. I'm going to drive out to North Beach first thing in the morning. Take my advice. Burn the picture. Burn it? Forget it. Are you insane? I intend to expose this man for what he is. He'll do that himself when he runs away with her money. What do you mean, when he runs away with her money? Paul Darrow is a desperate man. He's in the hands of the loan sharks. That's his problem. If he doesn't pay off, they'll kill him. I'll shed no tears. But Matilda will. I know my sister now. She'll take anything from him except another woman. She'll throw him out. And she'll hate you for the rest of her life. This is a lesson she has to learn for herself. The only lessons of lasting value are the ones we pay for. A hundred thousand dollars is a good price. I can't believe you're serious. You know I'm right. Are you saying that we should permit this man to steal a hundred thousand dollars? He worked for his money. I can't believe we're having this kind of a conversation. I will not let that man take a hundred thousand dollars from my sister. You haven't been listening. I told you Paul Darrow is a desperate man. His life is on the line here. If she refuses him, he's capable of turning on her. He could kill her for that money. What are you saying? Believe me, Mr. Bascom. I know your every instinct rebels against it, but don't interfere. Don't risk her life. Pay the price, and you're both out of it. Pay the price. Suddenly, we're able to place a figure on the value of a human life. And the advice is practical. But can Edward Everett Bascom take it? It certainly goes against the grain to permit a swindle. Can he be depended on to swallow his pride, choke down his anger, and eat his words? I don't know. I shall return shortly with Act Three. good advice is seldom welcome, and those who need it most appreciate it least. Private Detective Julia Hoffman is in the business of giving advice. She has just delivered some very hard-to-take counsel to a gentleman who has been resisting her every step of the way. You know I'm right. Her safety should be the first consideration. And we're just going to let this fellow walk out with a hundred thousand? Yes, and he's gone forever. And so what's going to happen? From what I understand, her broker can't stall her off any longer. He'll have to deliver the cash for the bonds tomorrow or the next day. And then? You know, and then. She'll give him the money, presumably to invest in his new business. And he'll walk out the door with it, never to be seen again. That's correct. Well, that goes against the grain, but... All right, all right. You're correct. I won't say a word to her. Let's be rid of him. One way or another, let's be rid of him. That was on a Tuesday afternoon. On Tuesday evening, I spoke to Matilda on the telephone. Julia, what a pleasant surprise. How are things, Matilda? Oh, wonderful. I'm glad to hear that. I'm happy, Julia, really, really and truly happy. Then that's all that counts. How is Paul? Oh, he's marvelous. Good. He's all excited and optimistic. Really? Yes, he's got a chance to buy into a fabulous business. And you're going to give him the money for it. Ah, what else is my money for? What else, indeed? Now, Julia, I know you're skeptical about Paul. Well... But he's changed. Maybe marriage has changed him. Maybe I changed him. But he's a new Paul, a different Paul. Oh, Julia, how is it possible to be so happy? never spoke to her again. Five days later, I was called in to see the district attorney. You know Matilda Darrow, didn't you? Knew Matilda? She's dead. Murdered. No. Yeah, her brother's been trying to reach her all week. Couldn't get her on the phone, so this morning he drove out to her place in North Beach. She's gone. Gone? Gone? But that doesn't mean she's dead. There was a struggle. He found bloodstains. You're... You're sure? Gone also, uh, an envelope with bearer bonds worth $100,000. Gone also, friend, husband. 
in the Frascati sports car. She'd bought him for his birthday. How was she killed? Oh, that we don't know. We don't have the body. A neighbor, Mrs. Matson, said that uh, at twilight yesterday she saw Mr. DeRoe carrying a huge sack down to the dock. A huge sack? And she wasn't suspicious? Of what? They have a cabin cruiser. At that time, she thought DeRoe could have been taking supplies down to the boat. And that's all you've got? Well, this uh, Mrs. Matson heard the boat go out. About an hour later, she heard it come back. She saw DeRoe hurrying toward the house. She called out a greeting, but uh, he just disregarded her. He seemed very nervous. He didn't have the sack? No, what we can assume is he weighted it down, took it out of ways, and dropped it overboard. Where it can never be found. It sounds right. Of course. That's what we have to assume. If we can find Mr. Paul DeRoe and he tells us a more convincing story, well, uh, yeah, that's what happened. What did you know about Paul DeRoe, Julia? He's into the loan sharks. Ah, then he had to have the money. Yes, but why did he have to kill her? She was willing to give it to him. Un unless... Unless what? I have to see somebody. I didn't tell her. Then why did she refuse to give him the money? I don't know. The only thing that could make her angry enough would be if she found him unfaithful. But I didn't tell her. How do I know? Because we agreed, you and I. I don't trust you. You saw that hundred thousand flying out the window and it was too much for you. I swear to you that I... You didn't tell her, I didn't tell her, then how did she find I out? I don't know, but I do know this. I want that animal found and brought to justice. I inherit what's left of her estate, and it's quite a bit. I'll spend every penny hunting that murderer down. Mr. Bascom, let's back off and look at this thing from another perspective. How do we know you didn't kill her? Me? I spoke with her broker, Mr. Morgan. Unlike yours, which has been senselessly squandered, her estate has been carefully tended... It's grown to almost a million dollars. You are the sole heir. Well, this, the, the... this is an entirely reasonable conjecture. You could have killed her. If I killed her, why did her husband disappear? Well, what do you want him to do? Who would believe him with his record? He's running for his life. Are you saying that I murdered my own sister? I'm saying there are a number of possibilities. But, but do you believe it? At this point, I don't know what to believe. Can you tell me, Mrs. Matson... What's it feel like to be a, a woman detective? Uh, when was the last time you saw Matilda Darrow alive? Oh, that's what I always wanted to be. But in my day, we didn't have this here women's lib. Mrs. I seen her alive the last... Oh, must have been five days ago. Five days ago. You get to use a gun... Or are you one of them brainy ones? Oh, you see, their house is separated from ours by them hedges, but when I'm sitting upstairs in my sewing room, I can see over to their property. They like to walk down across the lawn a lot to their dock, especially her. But you say you haven't seen her in five days. When was the last time you saw him? Oh, right up to the other morning. The morning her brother come on out and called the police. She was last seen on Friday night. Had Mr. Darrow been here all week? Oh, yeah, yeah. He'd been keeping more or less to himself. He'd come out every afternoon, take a quick walk down to the dock. And... It's been raining all week, hasn't it? A little rain wouldn't stop him. Thank you, Mrs. Matson. Have you uh, uncovered something? <sighs> Not yet. Yes? Miss Doralee Spurich? The same. May I come in? Why? Would you like to win a million dollars? What do I have to buy? Nothing. Who do I have to kill? No one. Come in. Let's hear your line, anyhow. So, how do I win a million? First, tell me, what's a million worth? No, you have to do the talking. Is it worth your life? Oh, sure. Then I offer you the equivalent of a million. What's this? Where's Paul Darrow? 
Who? No, we can't waste time. Now, you look here. You look here. Who? I don't know what you're talking about. All these things waste time. Look at this picture. At every detail from every angle. Mr. Paul Darrow is wanted for the murder of his wife. If you conceal or withhold any information concerning Mr. Darrow, you become an accessory. And it can mean life imprisonment. But I didn't... I haven't finished. On the other hand, since I have my own way of knowing that you really didn't assist Mr. Darrow in the actual murder, why do you even have to be brought into it? Who has to know that you and Mr. Darrow have been intimate? That's a lie. Is it? Really? And recently... Now, where is he? I don't know. And that's the truth. Now, tell me more about the truth. Okay. He was set to take his wife for a hundred thousand. The sharks were swimming around him, so he was going to pick it up last week. And then he and I, we would take off. Where? Europe. The works. England, Paris, Rome. We'd have enough to live it up for a while. Well, he was supposed to pick up the dough Friday night and meet me here Saturday morning. He never showed. Maybe he ran out on you. I don't think so. You mean your pride won't let you think so? I think they killed him. Who? The sharks. Why? He only owed them 10000 How do you know it was 10000 I know things. Why kill him? He had the money to pay off. Maybe he had too much money. Maybe they saw the size of that roll and they figured... Why not grab it all? So, he's under cement, under a garbage dump. Oh, he was a great guy when he had it. Tom? Yeah, Julia? Anything new in the DA's office on the Darrow case? No, we haven't been able to take a single step forward. Except for your angle on the loan sharks. We've run that down. It's true, he could be gone that way. So he killed her for the money. And the sharks killed him for the money. Is that the way it could wind up? Well, all the pieces would fit together neatly. Don't you buy it? Could I have your permission to search the house at North Beach? Oh, what do you expect to find? Mm, You never know until you look. Hello there, Miss Hoffman. Oh, it's you, Mrs. Matson. I noticed you poking around out here in the garbage. Well, I'm wondering why there's so much of it. These two, three cans full? You should come over and see mine. This is nothing. Well, don't they collect garbage around here? They do when they ain't on strike. Oh. Well, how long have they been out? Oh, three weeks. Three weeks? I I noticed you took them two things out of the garbage can. Are they clues? That handkerchief and that, that thing that looks like a little round plastic disc. Are they... Are they clues? Miss Hoffman. May I come in? Yes, of course. Is there anything new? Yes. What? Tell me. Suppose you tell me. Well, what can I tell you? To begin with, where is your sister? My, my sister? What are you talking... Do you, talk... you want to listen to my theory? It goes as follows. She discovered that Paul was cheating. She confronted him. What I don't know is, did she become so enraged at his infidelity that she killed him? Or did he become so enraged at the thought that she wasn't going to give him the money that he attacked her and she killed him in self-defense? Which was it? Miss Hoffman, I won't hear any more of this. Well, you might as well hear it all. I would prefer to think she was the one who got angry first. Anyhow, it was a struggle to the death. She killed him. This is the most monstrous accusation. It was a fit. It was frenzy. I don't even say she's not entitled to it. When it was over, she became panicky. She called you. Are you saying that I... Oh, come on, don't be ashamed of it. You worked out this plan. You have no proof that she knew about his infidelity? His handkerchief. This lipstick smudge. It wasn't hers. She doesn't wear any. You made sure to throw it in the garbage. No, 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 just a minute. For five days, after I could no longer reach my sister, he was seen walking about the grounds. By Mrs. Matson, the neighbor, she saw him. From a distance. 
She saw your sister, Matilda, wearing Paul's clothes. She saw Paul carrying that sack down to the dock. Again, from a distance, in the rain. But, but that birthmark, that livid blue birthmark, it's visible, noticeable from any distance. The birthmark was hidden. How could you hide that birthmark? You see, I found a few of these in the garbage, too. What are those? These little discs. You know what they are. You brought them to her. To help her. This is a little container of that hypoallergenic theatrical makeup. Light flesh color. That's how she covered the birthmark. Mrs. Matson, seeing what she thought was the figure of a man, naturally assumed what you wanted her to assume, that it was Paul Darrow. That Paul Darrow was the one who was alive. You can't prove any of this. What are you going to do with that, that handkerchief, that, that little disc? I thought about that. It was thrown in the garbage. Ordinarily, it should never have been found. But there was a strike. Now, if I get rid of it, could I be accused of destroying evidence? What evidence? The police were all through the garbage... If it was considered evidence, they would have picked it up, wouldn't they? Well, it's your sister's garbage, still one of her possessions. Since you inherit her estate, I leave it with you. Miss Hoffman, I... Maybe what I've just said has absolutely no basis in fact. I do know that the police are content with matters as they stand. If my theory is correct, you will have to spend the rest of your life caring for, protecting your sister. Assuming she's alive. At any rate, I have no official standing. I see no purpose in pursuing the matter further. Miss Hartman, I want to say that... No, 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 Mr. Bascom. Neither you nor I must ever say another word. And they didn't. And so, we don't know. We really don't know who killed whom. That is, we don't know officially. This story took place some years ago, and neither Matilda nor Paul were ever seen again. The official version is that Paul killed her and the mob killed Paul. The mob. It really does come in handy sometimes, doesn't it? I'll be back in just a few minutes. People set such store by beauty, and yet some of the greatest women in history were either homely or possessed a very special kind of beauty. Joan of Arc was a scrawny, half-starved peasant. Even her flattering portraits show Queen Elizabeth I of England as pinch-faced and half-bald. Helen of Troy? By today's standards, she'd be rather fat. So it goes. Our cast included Frances Sternhagen, Marion Seldes, Bryna Rayburn, Ralph Bell, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Sit down. Anywhere you like. I have a small confession to make. I am crazy about ghosts. And I cannot for the life of me comprehend why anyone should be afraid of them. What, after all, what do ghosts do? They haunt, that's all. To haunt means to visit, to frequent. In short, to hang around. What's so scary about that? A hopeful lover hangs around a lot. If an inspiring lover or a wistful compatriot can hang around without inspiring fear, why not an anxious ghost? Is it... Is it really you, Paul? Huh? Yes, Melba. It is I. <laughs> Don't cry, Melba. I can't... I can't help it. All right, dearest. Go ahead and cry. <laughs> Paul. Paul, tell me something. What? Are you happy? Where... Where you are? I'm really sorry you asked me that, Melba. <laughs> mystery drama, Ghost Talk, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Lenka Peterson and Elliot Reed. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Places. Traditionally, they haunt large, decrepit mansions with long halls, extensive staircases, and musty attics. But these big old edifices have all disappeared from our landscape, and it is more than likely that the ghost of today has to restrict himself to one-bedroom apartments with bath, kitchenette, and dining area. Poor ghosts. Will they give up haunting altogether, or will they do what we have done? I just... Melba, you have my number? Yes, Leonard. Both at home and at the office. If there's anything I can do, Melba, anything at all... I'll call you. Bless you, my dear. Oh, Paul. Where are you? Where? Where? all gone. Leonard Whipple was the last to leave. I'm all alone. No, I'm not crying. I'm trying to be brave and calm and, and remember everything you told me. Leonard said to call him if I needed anything, but <laughs> what does that mean? I need my husband. I need Paul. <laughs> oh, no, Irene, I couldn't go to the movies. No. I'll just sit here and think about Paul. All the beautiful memories. 22 years of beautiful memories. You know, Irene, I keep thinking all the time of what you said to me after the funeral. You said, Paul will never be really dead as long as he's remembered. I keep saying that over and over. Paul isn't really dead, as long as he's remembered. I want to thank you, Irene, for that beautiful thought. It means everything to me. Oh, Melba. Melba. I'll go 
Good, is it, Paul? Well, hello. It's Bruce, isn't it? I'm new here. I haven't got everybody straight yet. <laughs> you never will. It doesn't matter. Yes, I am Bruce. Mind if I join you? I wish you would. You had a particularly beatific expression on your face just now as I was floating by. Oh, I was thinking of my wife. My wife, Melba. Yeah, why? Why? Well, actually, because she was thinking of me. Remembering our wedding day, I was touched. You're really very new here, aren't you? Oh, yes, very. At the start, everybody is either touched that they're remembered, apprehensive that they won't be, or furious that they're not. Melba feels that no one is really dead as long as he's remembered. Is that what you want to be? Not really dead? It sounds nice. Well, it isn't. I don't know how you can say that. Because I happen to know. From bitter personal experience. My sainted mother remembered me every day of her life after I died. Till the day she died and joined me here. Since her arrival, I'm happy to say, we've exchanged precisely six words. A while back, she had the grace to apologize. I'm sorry, son, I didn't understand. Well, those were the six words. Sorry for what? For remembering me. What was she supposed to do? Well, forget, for goodness sakes. I wouldn't expect her to forget immediately, of course. That would be unreasonable. But as soon as possible, put me out of her mind. My life on Earth was over. Well, I'm sure she meant well, your mother. After you're here a while, you'll realize that everybody doesn't mean well. And quite often does a lot of harm. But your mother loved you. Then why not leave me alone to enjoy myself? Why wake up in the middle of the night to remember how handsome I looked the day I graduated from dental college? So inconsiderate. Why was it inconsiderate? Because, my dear fellow, if she kept it up long enough, I'd have to stop whatever I was doing and go visit her. Visit her? How could you do that? How? Well, the way it's always done. As a ghost, of course. Irene? It's me. Oh. All right, I guess. Leonard was here. We sent out for Chinese food. He left about an hour ago. Oh, I'm just sitting here and remembering. I got out the old picture album to show Leonard. <laughs> I don't think Leonard cares too much for travel. I wasn't sorry when he left. Looking at the snapshots and remembering the beautiful life I had with Paul, it seemed to bring him closer. Oh, I mean it, Irene. A couple of times, I, I felt as though he was right here in the room with me. Honestly. <laughs> Oh, Bruce. Is that you, Paul? I had a terrible time finding you. Well, now you have. I asked everybody where you were and nobody knew, and then Salome said, oh, he's probably out strolling among the stars. That's his favorite pastime. But I had no idea how many stars there are. You still haven't any idea. Actually, neither have I, and I've been here heaven knows how long. So far, this is my favorite galaxy. But, of course, I haven't seen them all. Has anyone, do you think? Oh, I suppose he has. He must have seen everything since the beginning of time. And before that? Ah, uh, yes. What made you come looking for me? Something special? Bruce, I can't get a moment to myself on account of Melba. Your wife. You know what she did. She got out an old snapshot album and started looking over all the pictures we took on our vacations, birthdays, Christmases. Typical. They all do it. The worst part is she showed all these pictures to a friend of mine, of hers, ours, Leonard Whipple. He couldn't have cared less. She's really hanging on to you, isn't she? It's very nice of her and all that, but it's it, it's terribly exciting for me being here. Everything's so completely different. Oh. 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 There she goes again, hear her. Oh, oh dear. Dear Paul. Hear that? Vaguely. She just keeps after me and keeps after me. Well, what me. about this Leonard Whipple? Well, he's a very nice guy, but he's not going to hang around much longer if she makes him look at pictures of our honeymoon in the Grand Canyon. Mm. You couldn't just ignore her, I suppose. Well, she's my wife, and I love her. I mean, she was my wife, and I did love her. But now, things are different. I'd say so. 
Well, for goodness sake, look there. If it isn't him. Him? You mean it? Really? Him? I haven't seen him in Eon. I never have. Uh, sir? Sir, please? Hmm? No. Yes, yes, it's Bruce. Yes. Am I right? Yes, sir. And this is Paul. He's new. I know. Hello, Paul. I... I'm really thrilled to meet you, sir. The galaxy is looking well, don't you think? I love this galaxy, sir. You set it out so neatly. Mm. There's one star I've been concerned about. I think it's beginning to twinkle out. Uh, sir, as long as we were so fortunate as to run into you like this, could we have your advice about something? You know I dislike giving advice. It's for me, sir. I don't know what to do about my wife. Is she here? Oh, no. She's with the living. On Earth. Oh. And she's grieving. Well, that's to be expected. She'll stop after a while. She doesn't show any signs of stopping. I, I was wondering if I shouldn't, you know, appear to her. Bruce says it's a simple procedure. Well, you could do that, of course. I never thought very highly of that ghost business, so theatrical. But if it'll make her feel better? I suppose we do owe a measure of responsibility to the living. You think I could go back for a short visit? Well, you're free to do as you like. If I were to tell you what to do, you wouldn't be free anymore, would you? Well, if you just tell me what you think. No, I really can't do that. That would be tantamount to telling you what to do because of me being who I am. You see, you think I have all the answers. Everybody thinks so. Well, I don't. There are countless things I haven't found answers to. <laughs> However, like everyone else, I keep trying. Now, if I really have to go to see if that poor star is feeling any pain, you'll both excuse me? He wasn't much help. Well, that's his way. Oh, dear. Oh, there she goes again. Bruce, I'm going to turn ghost and visitor. At least you've made a decision. How do I go about it? Well, there are no hard and fast rules. Actually, not many of us do it. It's, it's, it's considered kind of freaky. Freaky? Look how many of us there are and how few of them. If we all took to ghost walking, we'd have them outnumbered trillions to one. No, I don't care. I want to do it. I just need to know how. Well, you can do it in the old-fashioned way... Clanking chains, winds whistling through the trees, moon behind black clouds and all that. Uh, I don't think Melba would go for that. Well, then there's the crying, sobbing type of ghost. Inconsolable weeping. Since I don't feel particularly inconsolable. Well, then there's the ghost that flits through the halls, appearing and disappearing. Now you see it, now you don't. No, we don't have a hall, just a rather small foyer. Mm. Uh, uh, can't I just appear? In some simple, straightforward way, just say, here I am, dear. You wouldn't want to start with one weird, uncanny shriek. I wouldn't know how. Or a sardonic laugh. Well, what would I be laughing at? Oh, life, death, anything in between. Well, if you don't want to do any of those things, things which he calls theatrical, then just appear. That's more my style, I think. But wrap a bit of vapor around you. After all, they need something to identify you by. Don't stay too long. And above all, don't let it depress you. Why should it depress me? Mm -hmm. You'll find out, my friend. You'll find out. It never occurred to me that a visitation by a ghost could be depressing. Take now that well-known ghost of Hamlet's father... Speaking spookily from the battlements at Elsinore. Of course, he didn't sound happy. How could he when his own brother had just killed him and promptly married his widow? He sounded angry, yes. Vengeful, yes. But depressed, no. And certainly not depressing. I'll return shortly with Act Two. Hero Paul has decided to return to Earth as a ghost, 
and haunt the three-room apartment where he once lived with his wife, Melba. He has simply draped what remains of him in a shred of celestial vapor. And now, as he gazes through the living room window of what used to be his own tenth-floor apartment, he can scarcely be distinguished from the melting moonlight that floods the room inside. Nothing's changed. She hasn't changed a thing. Let's take our coffee into the living room, Leonard. Good idea. I think I picked the wrong time. Bring in that plate of cookies, will you? Right. Not those same old oatmeal things. I've always been crazy about oatmeal cookies. They were Paul's favorites. Set them down there. Mm -hmm. Cream in your coffee? Sugar? Uh, Black, please. No sugar. That's the way Paul took his. His after-dinner coffee in the morning. Cream and sugar, yes, but after dinner, nothing. Is that so? And milk in his tea. You don't say. That's the English way, you know. Milk and tea. I didn't know Paul was English. He wasn't. Oh, I see. Oh, way back, five, six generations, he was English, but... I, myself, was born in Wales. Is that so? Oh, well, that's near England. Richard Burton is Welsh, you know. For goodness sakes! Well, didn't you know that? The last movie Paul and I saw together had Richard Burton in it. I I wanted to show you something fascinating. Paul's World War II uniform. I've saved it all these years. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, not tonight. And his captain's bar. Some other time. I, I've really got to be moving on. Oh, if you really have to. Such a beautiful night. I think I'll walk home. Yes, a beautiful night. Oh, just look at the moonlight streaming through that window. Care to walk a ways with me in the moonlight? Oh, no, I don't think so, Leonard. I have a lot of things to do here. Well, if there's anything you need, you have my number. Yes. At home and at the office. Good night, Melba. Thanks for dinner. Thank you. For bringing all that fried chicken. Oh, it it was nothing, really. Good night. Good night, Leonard. Oh, Paul. Dear Paul. I need you, Paul. Melba. I need you so. I'm right here. What was that? I said, I'm here. Paul? Yes. Me. Paul. But... But... Where? By the window, dear. I can't see you. I'll step inside. That'll be better. Oh, I see... I I see something. You see me. I dare say I've changed somewhat. Oh! Can that be you? It is. I. Really, you? Well... Fairly, really. Everything considered as real as I can get. Oh, I... I can't believe it. Believe it, Melba. Oh, Paul. How are you? Oh, never mind about me. How are you? Oh, I'm all right. Really? All right? Everything considered. Everything considered, I'm better than all right. Paul, tell me. Are you happy? Happy? I must know. Are you happy? I'm sorry you asked me that question. Why should you be sorry? Happy just isn't a word we use. Why not? Because it... It doesn't mean much once you've died. Oh, Paul, you're not saying you're unhappy. No, I'm not saying that. Then what are you saying? Look, Melba, I didn't really come here to talk about me. What about you? Well, naturally, I'm not happy. Why not? Without you? What about Leonard Whipple? Oh, him. What's the matter with Leonard? Well, nothing's the matter with him. He's just not you. Well, I'm not me either. Not the way I was before I... Oh, but I remember you the way you were. And as long as I remember... Melba, honey... I don't even remember me the way I was. You don't? 
Not very well. You remember me, don't you? Sort of. Sort of? Well, you were my wife. I'm still your wife. Not exactly. There'll never be anyone for me but you. Never, I swear it. Please, Melba. We are man and wife forever, for eternity. And now that I know you can return to me, not in the flesh perhaps, but even like this. It's strange. It's weird, but it's enough for me. I can live on as your wife and on and on till I join you. Melba, you don't know what you're saying. Oh, I knew you could never really die as long as I remembered you. And you see, here you are, living on. <laughs> Irene, me. Guess what? You'll never guess. Paul was here. Yes. Yes, yes. Right here in this living room. All right, then he's a ghost, whatever. Well, he looked different. Yes, yeah, sort of steamy. Kind of like a, a street light on a foggy night. But I knew it was Paul, all right. His voice and the things he said and the way he called me Melba, dear. Well, he didn't say too much. I I asked him, was he happy? Because naturally I wanted to know, but he wouldn't say. He wouldn't say he wasn't unhappy either. Isn't that weird? He wanted to know about me. Am I happy? (laughs) Isn't that sweet? And he asked about Leonard Whipple. Imagine him knowing I've been seeing Leonard off and on. Of course, I told him Leonard doesn't mean a thing to me, that there could never be anyone else for me. I said, Paul, we are man and wife for eternity. I said, you can never truly die, Paul, as long as I remember you. And then, you know what, Irene? There was this big, great big noise, a crash sort of... Not like thunder, more like like music, like a chord out of Beethoven or somebody. And all of a sudden, he was gone. But he'll be back. Like you said, no one is really dead as long as he's remembered. Sir. Oh, oh, sir. May I speak with you? Mm -hmm. No. Oh, it's uh, Paul, isn't it? Sir, Uh, could I have just a moment of your time? I have all the time in the world. I have all the time there is. Well, I don't quite know how much time there is, but I do know I have all of it. Uh, does that star look all right to you? Well, I, I wouldn't know. I, I don't quite know how a star is supposed to look. Please, sir. May, oh, may I... yes, 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 of course. You want to talk to me. Uh, what about? I, I've been back to the earth. My wife kept calling me. You said we owed some responsibility to the living, did so I... Did I say that? Yes, sir, you did. Oh, I wonder if I was right about that. These earth trips can be very upsetting. Mine was. My wife wanted to know, am I happy? They're all so preoccupied with happiness, aren't they? I didn't know what to say to her. I, I couldn't answer her. This woman I'd been married to for half my life, I couldn't talk to her. It was as though we were living in two different worlds. Well? Oh. Uh, oh, oh, yes, I, I see what you mean. Still, shouldn't I have been able to answer her? Well, what could you have said? Well, that, that happy is a word that doesn't mean anything anymore. Happy is nothing without unhappy. The way pleasure is nothing without pain. The way health is nothing without illness. Euphoria is nothing without depression. Oh, you know what I mean, sir. I do know, yes. It's ridiculous to say I'm happy when I'm never unhappy. What I am is... What you are is... What? What I am is... Free. Yes. I'm free. I'm Paul, and I'm free. And I'm free to be Paul, no more, no less than me. Me, Paul. Sir, why couldn't I be free like that before? Ah, dear, I ask myself that same question all the time. The only answer is that I 
miscalculated somewhere. And I did give those people the power to think, to reason, to figure out the sensible way to do things. Why don't they use what I gave them? Why leave everything up to me? Theirs isn't the only planet in the universe, you know. I do have other things to look after, but the way they call out to me, they, they want me to do everything. Well, it's, it's, it's not right. It really is not right. No, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Well, what's done is done. They'll just have to muddle through the best way they can. Uh, now, about your wife. Uh, Melba, is it? Yes, sir. Mm. Tell you what. Why don't you talk to Bruce about it? You two seem to get along so well. Yes, yes. Talk to Bruce. Now, excuse me, will you? Um, I really do have to go take a look at that poor star. Bruce, he just wasn't any help at all. Now, you listen, Paul. Suppose you had invented the greatest machine imaginable. One that would do, uh, oh, practically anything you can think of. How would you like it if somebody came running to you every time a bolt got loose and asked you to tighten it? But, Bruce, Melba says she's going to go on remembering me forever. We'll be man and wife forever, till she joins me here, and then we'll still be man and wife. Maybe once she gets here, she'll change her mind. But she's only 42. She'll be remembering me for years and years and calling for me, and I'll have to put on that vapor stuff and haunt the apartment... And, and, Bruce, it's so hard to carry on a conversation with her now. It didn't used to be, but now... Well, you, you couldn't just ignore her. I love her, Bruce. Do you? Well, I did. For a very long time, right up to the moment I died. My last words were, I love you, Melba. At least, that's what I meant to say. I know I had it in my mind to say that, but I'm not... Positive I ever got around to saying it. Anyway, I can't just... just brush her off. My, my. You do have a conscience, don't you? Well, I hope so. It's a very fine thing to have, of course, but sometimes... Look, there's only one thing you can do. What? Get married. G married? To, to... to Melba? No, not to Melba, you idiot! How could you marry Melba? She's there and you're here. Some marriage that would be. But then, who... Whom would I marry? Oh, heavens to Betsy, Paul. The place is full of women. Have you ever seen Helen? Helen who? Helen of Troy, they call her. Actually, I've never met her myself, but from what they tell me... Marriages are made in heaven. So it's been said. There are those who consider this a profoundly true observation, while others think it one of the silliest statements ever made. I myself have no opinion, at least none that I care to express here. But no one, so far as I know, has ever claimed that people actually get married in heaven. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. was a wonderful wife to Paul. But as his widow, she leaves something to be desired. Two things. She won't stop desiring him, and she won't leave him alone. In his desperation, Paul has gone to his kindred spirit, Bruce, for help. The only advice Bruce could offer was for Paul to marry again. Not his earthly wife, Melba, but one of the heavenly creatures who, like Paul, expect to live on forever in whatever place it is they live on forever in. You definitely burned yourself out, little one. Mm. Too bad. Sir? Oh, sir. Now, look, Paul, this dear little star has burned itself out. Well, I knew it wouldn't be long. Uh, sir... I did what you told me to. I talked to Bruce about my problem, and you know what he said? He said, get married. It married? He said, the only way to make Melba forget me is for me to get married to someone else. Someone here. Where else? 
What do you think of the idea? Why do you keep asking me what I think? Can't you ever think for yourself? Well, I just thought... No, no, you didn't. You came running to me like all the others. I'm getting tired of it. Well, if you could give me a little advice... I gave you a little advice. I said, talk to Bruce. You talked to Bruce, and he told you what he thought you should do. Now, either do it or don't do it. Is it all right? Is uh, what all right? To get married. Here. Paul, the essence of this place is perfect freedom to do as you choose. It might work out, it might not. But that's true of everything, isn't it? It's certainly true of everything I do. Do many people get married here? Well, I don't know. I do know they don't come running to me to ask, is it all right? Bruce mentioned someone called Helen. Helen of Troy? Are you asking me to pick a wife for you? Now, what else do you want me to do? Tie your shoelaces? Help you with your arithmetic? Don't you people ever grow up? I'm sorry, sir. I don't care about your being sorry. That's too easy. I care about your achieving some measure of maturity. A bit of independence, a little simple sense. Is that asking too much? Tell me, is that really asking too much? Oh, sir, I... Sometimes I feel like giving up on the whole human race. You're, you're not going to cry, are you, sir? Why not? Who has better reason to cry than I have? Nobody, I guess. Uh, however, we must all carry on, mustn't we? Never give up. That's my motto. Because if I gave up... Uh, don't oh, say it, sir. Please, don't say it. No. No, I won't say it. I wouldn't be so cruel, no matter how provoked... Now, Paul, I really must go tend to that poor little star who, believe me, needs my help more than you do. Irene? It's me. Oh, just sitting around. Leonard asked me to go to that new steak place with him, but I said no. I didn't feel like it, that's why. Don't be silly. I like Leonard. He's a very nice man, but... You know, there's a beautiful moon out tonight. And I thought maybe... Oh, for heaven's sakes, what's that? Well, there was a terrible clanking noise just now and scared me to death. Oh, how could it be the radiator? The heat's not turned on yet. Is there a storm coming up or something? But that, that whistling sound, can't you hear it? Like a, like a terrible wind. Maybe a hurricane. <laughs> what do you mean you don't hear anything? <gasps> what, there goes the moon. It must be a hurricane. I mean, the moonlight will stop shining. How can it be shining where you are and not here? Oh, now it's shining here, too. <laughs> Irene, oh, are you there? Oh, are you crying about something? Oh, I thought you were. No, no reason, I just thought I heard... Well, I heard somebody crying. More than crying, really sobbing. Oh, oh my goodness. Something just ran through the room. I, how do I know what? It disappeared into the kitchen. <laughs> Rain, there's something here in the kitchen. And, and laughing, terrible laughing. It couldn't be, Paul. Because, because it couldn't be. Paul doesn't behave that way. He just comes to the window and says, Here I am, Melba, dear. It couldn't be, Paul. Here I am, Melba, dear. <gasps> he just said it. Here I am, Melba, dear. Melba. I am here. Irene, I'm going to hang up. I've got to find out if it's Paul. And if it is Paul, I've got to know why he's behaving so peculiarly. No, no, don't come over. You, you might scare him away. I mean, after all, I'm used to these things and you're not. Bye, Irene. Hello, Melba. Paul, is it you? No, it's not Paul. <gasps> oh, don't be frightened. I'm Bruce. Bruce? Who? I don't know any Bruce. I'm Paul's new friend. His best friend, actually. But why are you here? Why isn't Paul here? He couldn't make it tonight. 
Why not? Nothing's happened to him, has it? What could happen? Well, nothing, I suppose. Everything's already happened. Precisely. Well, then why isn't he here? I've thought about him and thought about him every single day and every time I woke up during the night. I've been over every moment of every day of every year we had together. That's just him. I'm just about to start over at the beginning. Uh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Why not? He's not really dead as long as I remember him. He's not really alive either, is he? Well, no, but... Melba, you're wearing him out with all this remembering. Wearing him out? Yeah, back and forth, back and forth. It's very tiring, Melba. You mean he'd rather just stay where he is? I think so. Oh, nobody wants to be dead and forgotten. Wait till it's your turn. I certainly don't want to be. Wait, you'll find out. Nobody wants to be dead and forgotten. That's because they haven't tried it yet. You mean... To tell me that Paul wants to be forgotten? By me? If you think you could manage it. Forget 22 beautiful years? Oh, I I couldn't. I, I couldn't possibly. What about having 22 more beautiful years with somebody else? Like who? Well, I've heard nice things about a certain Leonard Whipple. Leonard Whipple? I've heard he's very devoted to you. But Leonard's not Paul. Leonard could never be Paul. But he could be Leonard, couldn't he? If you'd let him. Well, Paul is the only man for me. Always was, always will be, and that is that. Oh, Melba, Melba. Why do you say, oh, Melba, Melba, like that? Because you forced me to tell you something I really have no right to tell you. What? What is it? Hardly anybody knows about it. Just me. And Paul, of course. What is it? I shouldn't repeat it. No. My lips are sealed. It's too private. Does it concern Paul? Is it about Paul? You won't mention it to a living soul? I won't mention it to anybody. What is it? Paul. Paul is getting married again. Paul? Is getting married again? Yes. Who to? I think her name is Helen. Is she pretty? I've never met her, but I hear she is very pretty. (sighs) Young? I believe so. Oh, how could he? How could he? That's life, Melba. Life? Paul's not alive. True, but you are, Melba. Yes, I am. Make the most of it. That's my advice to you. Thank you, Bruce, for telling me what you told me. I really appreciate it. You're quite welcome. I don't suppose Paul would ever have told me himself. Oh, eventually he would have. Maybe. Maybe not. Well, if you see him, tell him I hope he's very happy with his Helen. I'll tell him. Nice to have met you, Melba. Very nice to have met you, too, Bruce. I... Are you still sitting down or standing up? I can't quite tell. Does it really matter? Well, I'd just like to... I don't know, shake your hand or something. <laughs> Not necessary. Not necessary at all. I... I could see you to the door. No, let's just part this way. A fond adieu to you, Melba. A fond... Oh. He's gone. Just... Well, that's the way with ghosts. Who needs ghosts, anyway? With all their comings and goings, and the way they talk, who can understand them? Hello, Irene? Irene, you are absolutely not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. You simply will not believe it. Bruce. Bruce, where have you been? I've been looking all over for you. Even Salome didn't know where you were. Where were you? I went to see your wife. Melba? What for? To tell her you were getting married. Bruce, you had no right to do that. Here we do as we choose. He told you that. 
How did she take it? Shocked, of course. Hurt. What you'd expect. You could have told me you were going to tell her. I knew you wouldn't let me. I wouldn't have. For one very good reason. It's not true. What's not true? That I'm getting married. You changed your mind? Not exactly. I asked Helen. Yes? She said absolutely not. She says she's not the marrying type. But you didn't stop right there, did you? There are others. I asked Catherine. Uh, uh, I can't pronounce her last name. She used to be an empress in Russia. She laughed, fit to kill. And so did Amy and Louise and Marie. Even Salome laughed at me. Are you upset? Well, nobody likes to be laughed at. Yes, I'm upset. But on the other hand, I'm relieved, too. Bruce, I really don't want to get married. I never thought you did. Everything's so nice here, so free and sort of uninhibited. So peaceful. Leonard, it's Melba. You don't mind my calling you at your office, do you? Oh, that's good. How was the new steak place? You didn't go? On account of me, you didn't go? Well, I must say, Leonard... Oh, I, I spent the evening doing various things. Things that really needed to be done. Like, I got all Paul's clothes together and packed them in boxes. Tomorrow, I'll send them to some deserving charity. <laughs> Listen, Leonard, I was thinking, as long as you didn't go to that steak place, why don't you come over here tonight and I'll cook you the best steak you ever tasted. And hash brown potatoes. Would you like that? Oh, good. We'll come early and we'll have a martini first. Well, good for Melba. Good for Leonard. And good for Bruce. And for Paul, too. Good for everybody who faces up to a problem and solves it the best way possible. The solution may not be a perfect one. Solutions seldom are. But at the very least, they are an attempt to use the sense we were born with. And that's all God asks of any of us. I'll be back shortly. don't you, that the story I've just brought you is all pure fantasy. I don't know any more than you do what happens to us once we have resigned this terrestrial life, and you know as little as I do. Unless, of course, you are a ghost. Oh, if you are, I wish you'd get in touch with me. I have gobs and gobs of things I'm dying to ask you, like, uh, like, uh, well, well, for one thing, are you happy? Our cast included Lenka Pearson, Elliot Reed, Robert Dryden, and Gordon Gould. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Not there! For God's sake, Charles! Why not? That's the haunted villa! You? Superstitious? About that place? Anyway, it's boarded up. Has been for years. But there's the house now. Maybe we can find some shelter. Oh, statue. There's the house. The light can hit it. I can't look. It's as bright as molten steel. It's gone. Melted. It's never been. Let's get out of here, Charles. I could swear I saw that thing jump and run into the house. Oh, dear. Maybe it's on fire. No, it's okay. It's lamplight. Welcome, Frank. Come, this is no night to be abroad. Welcome to the Villa de Despoir, the house of despair. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant... Dreams?
The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... E.G. Marshall. In his immortal comedy of manners, William Congreve wrote, Heaven hath no rage like love to hatred turned, nor hell a fury like a woman scorned. That was over 200 years ago. Have matters changed in the intervening centuries? Judge for yourself in this story, which happens today. Mark, who is it, dear? I thought you were sound asleep. All those pills. Oh, something woke me for the moment. I don't know why I came alive so suddenly. Some alarm bell in me. Which will never ring. You're not going to be alive. What are you doing with that pillow? Playing Othello to your desdemona, my love. No, Mark, oh. you can't be serious. It's all just... <laughs> Yet I'll not shed your blood, nor scar that whiter skin of yours and snow. Yet you must die. Put out the light. And then put out the light. If I can quench thee. Ah. No more moving. Still as the grave. My wife. My wife. Our mystery drama, Hell Hath No Fury, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars William Redfield. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. and Emily Lawrence. The wedding of a decade. The first, a shining light of the classical theater. The second, a new, fresh, and lovely star of the screen who transcended any picture she illuminated. A public romance shared avidly by the fans that ranks with Romeo and Juliet, Eloise and Abelard, Desdemona and Othello, and which is destined to end as tragically. But to start a story, one must have a beginning, not an ending. So, let's go back a few days before Emily Lawrence's sudden and tragic death. Back to a meeting between Emily's half-sister, Elspeth Whitmore, and Mark Stanton. But who the devil... All right, Dodd, you better get your clothes on and be ready to scoot. I'll give you the high five. Uh... Hand me my gown, will you? Whoever it is, they aren't going to quit. Thanks, baby. Oh, it's you. Where did you get a key, Elspeth? One of the privileges of the family, even a half-sister. Well, come in. Why ring the bell when you have a key? I wanted to give you time to, uh, put your robe on. Uh, <laughs> well, I was just trying to snatch 40 winks. Oh, do I know her? Didn't she used to go under the name of Tiger Tilly, the jungle cat? Funny, very funny. Not to me, or would it be to my sister? Now, get rid of her, Mark. I want to talk to you. I will be in the living room on the phone, my back to the door, pretending your matinee curtain isn't coming down early. But don't think I won't sneak a look at what's your style this month, brother-in-law. B. Elspeth. Anything stirring? Oh, how much? No, no, it's too low. They've got to come up with 700. Well, well, let them stew on it. I'll be back in the office soon. Huh? Oh, wait a sec. Uh, uh, no. 
Uh, no, I was just looking at a would-be rising star. Listen, if there's anything urgent, I'm at my sister's apartment. It's listed under Mark Stanton on the Rolodex, but it's still my sister's apartment. Bye. Well, Elspeth, to what do I owe this rather surprising early afternoon visit? <laughs> I thought agents were always busy during lunch hours. Oh, sorry to disappoint you. We take a breather now and then, don't you, Everett? What does that mean? Well, didn't I surprise you hard at work? Now, look, Eleanor brought me a, a new treatment she wanted me to see. I'll bet she did. A screen treatment, a script. Okay, Casanova, it's enough banter. Are we alone in this joint now? Oh, don't tell me you want to open old books between us. No, this is a new one. We closed the other when you married my sister. Half-sister. You have to rub it in. I'm plain flat-chested and no hard hat ever whistled at my legs, but I still have brains. Uh, who needs them when you have Emily's 36, 24, 36, and even the members of the Union League Club look up from the Wall Street Journal when she moves by? Mark, sit down. I'm about to kick your feet from under you. What are you talking about? It's a pity you met me before Emily, isn't it, Mark? And needed me. I beg your pardon. Well, without an agent and one who cared, you were nothing but a stud. If I hadn't nursed and supported you through speech lessons, singing lessons, small parts, and nothing out of town. Now, damn you, I may not have had much education, but I always had talent. Oh, I'll grant you that. But you're lazy. And once you met Emily and knew she had all the looks and all the money, it was time to drop me. But don't forget Emily's money comes from being a film star. And I made her that. Let's forget past history. Mark, since I came back from Europe, I've been going over Emily's financial position. What right have you to... I happen to be her manager as well as her agent. And I don't like what I see. Emily has never made more in her life. You have never spent more. We have a front to keep up as two reigning stars. Hogwash. You're a successful ham who draws suburban ladies with delusions of culture and dreams of vicarious God knows what to the theater. You make peanuts compared to Emily and spend the kind of money she makes. A temporary loan or two. I have some pictures in the world. Oh, come on, Mark. You couldn't draw flies to a movie theater even in an exploitation film. Huh. So, I have talked it over with Emily. And, as uh, Harry Truman used to say, the buck stops here. <laughs> what does that mean? I'm putting Emily on an allowance, enough to take care of her needs. You can handle the apartment and the rest. But no more play money, little boy. And uh, that's only the beginning. The next thing I'm going after is her will, uh, the one that leaves everything to you. If anything should ever happen to my sister, I can think of better causes for her estate to serve than Mark Stanton, the heel of ham. <laughs> All my efforts to stay calm and unruffled meeting Mark again dissipated into thin air. Thank heaven I was alone. And my knees turned to water thinking and dreaming of him as once it had been between us. By the time I reached the ground floor, I knew I needed another session with Madame Erexo. Why do you imagine you can ever fail? You are one of us. I have always thought one of the strongest in the coven. I never have doubts except... except in one area. <laughs> Every Achilles has his vulnerable heel. Every witch her own weakness. We must fight always against the world to hold the true faith. Come, daughter. Let us pray together. Draw the drapes while I light the candles. Now, step within the magic circle with me. Yes. Oh, great Erexo, mother of us all, who crouch in the black shadow of your wings. I conjure thee from the instrument by Lucifer, a prince of darkness, by all the stars which rule by the four elements, 
that it really may obtain by me the perfect issue of all our demands. It is also seek to perform without evil, without deception. We are answered. I know what I'm doing is right. Will it turn out that way? Will you read the tarot cards for me? I am your sister in fate. I am at your command. Sit down while I shuffle the cards. You know what that means without asking. The king of coins. A sign of ill omen. Was the question asked for yourself? No. I will ask one for myself now. Then cut. The Ace of Cups. That is a promise of beauty and fertility. For me? Uh, why not? You are young. <laughs> Scarcely beautiful. Uh, one more question. One only. I'm asking it in my mind. Cut. The card of death. The nine of swords. No. Not my sister. Not my sister. I love you, Emily. I love you, Mark. Oh, now I feel relaxed. And hungry. Good, good. Um, Elspeth was around this afternoon. Here? Why? Oh, being the big business manager, saying we were spending too much money. <laughs> She's smarter than we are about things like that. Yes, but is she really putting you on a strict allowance? Well, I guess I'll have to go along with her. She says I'm starting to spend more than I make. Now, well, how is that possible? Maybe you need a new business manager. Oh, <laughs> Nobody would be better than Elspeth. Hmm. Besides, she's got to make a living, too. And who would I get? Well, how about me? Oh, darling, you. You have no idea of the value of money. No, oh, when I'm old and penniless, and if in his infinite mercy the man upstairs saves you from looking at me anymore and snatches you upstairs for himself, Elspeth tells me she'll be my guardian. Well, she does want me to make a new will. It wouldn't be a bad idea. We're both so stupid about how to handle what we've got. And if anything ever should happen to me... Oh, darling, please. I was only kidding. Let's get off this. No. As long as we got on it, I think Elspeth has the right idea. She'd see you didn't throw it all away. So I agreed. I'm going to remake my will on Monday. Well, now, I've got to wash up, and you go tell the cook to get that dinner on the table. I am famished. Well... Here's it. Elspeth, Emily, one of you has got to go. Now, let's see. Which shall it be? Which can I get away with? Charming fellow Mark Stanton. Matinee idol for a limited audience of aging women. His main role, Romeo. Although he has been seen with varying success critically as Orlando, Bassanio, Lysander, all Shakespearean lovers. Interesting casting when you think of it. Or as we learn about him. He might have made a better Claudius of whom his nephew Hamlet said that one may smile and smile again and be a villain. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. epitaph on a child's grave reads, It is so soon that I am done for. I wonder what I was begun for. That might apply to this story of Emily Stanton, or at least the plan that is forming in the mind of her husband, Mark. The problem with murder is not to want to commit it, but how? How to commit it and not be caught? One thing I knew it would have to be out of the city. And fortunately, we have a place up the Hudson Valley, suitably isolated. Also, by sheer luck, 
Emily's picture was not shooting that weekend. Oh, what time is it, Mark? Mark? Did you call, m'lady? Oh, what on earth are you doing up at 5.30 in the morning? Uh, bringing the woman I adore beyond reason her orange juice. And coffee's on the way. Oh, you angel. Thanks. Welcome. I'm so tired. I don't know how I'm going to make it to the studio today. I'll call them and tell them you're not well. No, no. Two more days and I have a whole long three-day weekend off. I'll bounce back then. Uh, speaking about the weekend, how about going up to the country? Mm-mm, no, thanks. I want to just slump down here in bed and sleep and rest and hold in like a bear for his winter sleep. Oh, but darling, it isn't winter, it's spring. And I want to get up to the house. <sighs> that long drive. Well, you see, I'm worried. You know, I've got the hole dug in the fall. I've got to get that sump pump into the cellar before the spring waters flood us again. You can rest up there just as well. I can rest here and we can get some men to do the job. Oh, where were they last fall when we needed them? Can't we make it next weekend? Well, it'd um, be too late by then, I'm afraid. Oh, all right, darling. I never can refuse you anything. Everything I do is for you. Have is yours. Except for letting your sister run our lives. Oh, that's just money. Because neither of us know how to handle it. Well, what's it, it for except to buy things? Mm. Mm. Well, we can enjoy them. I mean, I'd feel like a fool having to run to Elspeth for the rent or something. Are you trying to get rid of me? Well, of course not, darling. How could you think a thing like that? <laughs> I don't. So stop talking about it. You'd only have to do that if I was dead, and I don't intend to be. I should hope not. <gasps> Look at the time. Whoop. I've got to shower and dress and get out of here. How about lunch? I can't, sweetie. I have a, a business appointment. <laughs> shower a moment or two later, I wondered why I hadn't told Mark my lunch was with Elspeth. Then I decided it was better that I hadn't. And I wished I hadn't agreed to drag him up to the country house. <laughs> but he's really so beautiful and so sexy and so persuasive, it's awfully hard to refuse Mark anything. If I'd only known I'd picked the wrong thing to ever refuse him, I'd never have let Elspeth talk me into what she called... Having more backbone, Emily. You can't give in to everything Mark wants or asks. He's a selfish child. That isn't true, Elspeth. Look, honey, take it from me. I found out the hard way. I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to bring all that up again. Oh, I forget it. I've forgotten Mark that way. Plant us two side by side and ask any man to choose. Which way would it go? Well, I'd never have come back from the coast a year ago if I'd known I was going to bust up a romance between you. Emily, we've been over this ground before. You didn't bust up the romance. There wasn't any to bust up except on my side. But Mark needed a good agent, and he got me in more ways than one. So, beneath, period. I'm still sorry it hurts. I, I wish I could make up for it. Well, you can. Two ways. Draw that will making me executrix of your estate and let me budget your dough. <laughs> Seems unfair to Mark. Listen, Emily, I don't want you to get your back up, but I get the word he has gambling debts, and if he thinks he has backing, he could go sky high. Now, just let me put the brakes on, okay? I suppose it's too much to hope that uh, your love for that muscle-bound Greek statue you married isn't letting up any. Mark? What would make you think a thing like that? Oh, I don't know, just uh, an irrational hope, I guess. You still love him, don't you? That isn't the point. I love you, and I'm very concerned about you. What do you mean? I don't know. You, you'd only laugh at me if I told you. <laughs> it's really funny, isn't it? I mean, uh, the genes. We both come from the same mother, but our fathers were so different. You, blonde, blue-eyed, open, uncomplicated, trusting. And me, dark, brooding, sharp-tongued, much of this world, and and yet not. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> I could never explain that to you in a millennium. But I am a psychic. You mean like those funny cards you used to read and foretelling what's going to happen and things like that? Yes, things like that. Emily, listen to me. This is a dangerous time for you. 
Be careful. Just be very careful. But I don't know what you mean. I can only see so far. I can only warn you. Just be very careful. Now, you are scary. I mean to. Well, it isn't only you. It's just that I... I have the weekend off, and Mark and I are going to the country. Ellie, I really don't want to. I'm scared of the drive. You mean because of Mom and your father? Yes. Emily, how many times have I told you it wasn't your fault? It was in the cards. I was driving when they were killed. And a drunken madman by fatal chance jumped the road divider and forced you off the road. What else could you have done? It was not your fault. I know, but I still have nightmares about it. You're not going to drive, are you? I'll never drive a car again. It's just, I'm afraid even to get into one. Now, excuse me for changing the subject, but you have to get back to the set soon. I want you to take a quick run up to my office. Why? Harry is there now. I had him draw up a new will for you, and I think we ought to get it signed right away. Well, I don't know. Mark is sort of hurt. But Emily, if anything ever happens to you, I will take care of him the way he should be. You know you can trust me for that. Emily? Yes? Oh, you had your eyes closed. I thought you were asleep. That's not why my eyes were closed. Oh, darling, come on. We've got to put things behind us. I try. It's just... <gasps> You're in the fast lane. Well, darling, it's late. I want to get us home. Move over. Move over. Never travel in this lane. All right, all right. I'm sorry. I'll cut right into the next lane as soon as the car behind me passes. Now, please, sweetheart, I want you to relax. Just forget everything this weekend. Just play possum. Play possum. Would I have the nerve to do it? And beyond that, could I really find the how? As the hum of the car soothed both of us, and Emily appeared really to drop off to sleep, other things came to my mind. That damn cellar. Flooding every spring when the surface water unfroze and coming down the hill defeated every trick we tried to keep it out. The sump pump was the only answer. And suddenly, at that moment, although it turned my stomach, there was the answer to my bigger problem. <laughs> You are very early. I know. The coven does not meet until midnight. I had to come. I need a special reading. I have intimations of disaster. You remember our last... One of my gifts is total recall. The last question I asked turned up the nine of swords. I asked about my sister. Oh? Now I want to know how soon, when... That is not always divulged. But let us tell the cards and find out if we can. If you want. If I want? Remember, there is no way of stopping what has been decreed. Has it been a good weekend, darling? Oh, yes. <laughs> I feel so rested, so relaxed. Good. Maybe it's just as well I came... Did you get everything done in the cellar you want? Well, yes, I had to do some more digging, make the hole larger, but I have plenty of cement to finish up tomorrow. Tomorrow? Well, that's Monday. Right. I thought you could drive down tonight. You know, I won't think of ever driving again. All right, darling, all right. I'll drive you in the morning and then drive back up. Now, come on, sweetie. I've taken off the phone so we won't be disturbed. And I'm going to carry you up to bed and tuck you in for the best sleep you've ever had in your life. I was so tired I could hardly keep my eyes open. But some inner alarm, some nonsense voice kept jogging at me to stay awake. Until I thought it's only tension. Foolish to be afraid. I am in my beloved husband's arms. And how safe can I be? Is she still in danger? The nine of swords still threatens. But when? How soon? I cannot tell from the cards. Maybe... Maybe I should call the country. May I use your phone? Of course. 
What danger can she be in with her husband? It's a very long drive. You know what those roads are like. Oh, damn. What? A busy signal. Well, at least it means they got there safely. Still. Wait for the mass tonight. Within this circle, more questions are answered than through the cards. Be patient. I'll try. But I can feel death in my bones. Yes, you must die. Put out the light, and then put out the light. If I can quench thee. No. No more moving. Still as the grave. My wife. My wife. I must have been mad, Emily, to have killed you. Because I do love you. Only that I love myself more. For money. For the need of it. What have I done? How do I cover it? Of course. The car. An accident. No, no. No. An accident with a car. Into the river. At the devil's elbow. But the body must never be recovered. Then, who could prove anything? The grave is already made. Can I get away with it? Of course I can. I can get away with anything. No! What is it, Elspeth? You interrupt the mass. Erexo, a death has occurred. A death you prophesied. I must leave. Give me permission to leave the magic circle. If the death is accomplished, what can you do? But go, if you must. Well, try it again, operator. Or get me someone who can make the connection if it's out of order. This is a matter of life and death. Shame to waste a car I love. On such a night... Troilus climbed the Athenian walls. (laughs) Madness. The whole thing is madness. But there has to be a reason for Emily's death. The car smashing through the guardrail 500 feet to the river below. The car recovered, the body never. I will bury that five fathoms deep. And why should anyone question that Emily's body lies cemented in the well of a new sump pump planned over a year ago? So... Goodbye, my favorite car. The die is cast. The adversaries established. A murderer and a witch. By whom is justice best served? Which will prevail? If a woman has loved not wisely but too well, who can best revenge her? The majesty and justice of the law or a kangaroo court beyond and outside the law? I'll return shortly with Act Three. deliberately murdered his wife. And he has had what seems to him a very practical means of disposing of body and suspicion, which may work for normal authority, but possibly not for his sister-in-law, since he has no idea that she is a modern witch. For the moment, he is involved with simple but furiously necessary occupations. Ah, that looks pretty good. Pump in its well, cellar floor replaced. Who'd ever find Emily or think to look for her here? What? What the devil? 3 a.m. in the morning, who... Damn. Lights are on upstairs. I better answer. Ah, Gotta change first. 
Well, about time. How? Oh. I always seem to be surprising you in on disabilities. Well, hmm? what do you expect at this time of night? All right, come in. That's about the first polite thing you've said to me in months. Oh, let's cut the funny talk. What are you doing up here in the middle of the morning? <laughs> An interesting phrase. Shouldn't it be the middle of the night? All right, all right. Let's bury the New York smart talk. What do you want? To see my sister. She isn't here. Oh, why not? <sighs> She had a five o'clock call on location for sunrise shots. So she decided to drive back last night and have the limousine take her on location this morning. What made you take a two-hour drive out here at this time of night? I'll tell you half of it. I was scared, if that means anything to you. Well, it doesn't. What's the other half? I won't tell you that yet. Although someday you just might have to learn. I won't even pretend to understand that. Oh, excuse me. Yes, Yes, that's right. I'm I'm Mark Stanton. What? Where? No, no, never mind all that. How is she? N -n no, I'll be right down there. What was that? Emily, her car went out of control at the Devil's Elbow. Oh, no. She went through the guardrail, plunged 500 feet down into the river. The, the car's a total wreck. Never mind the car. What about Emily? I, well, they haven't found her yet. The car windows were open it, if she got swept down the river and into the lake, they may never find her. You mean... She's dead. You... You don't have to... Oh, what else? A plunge like that? The, the car totaled? What else is there to think? Nothing. Emily is dead. What? That's a strange way to... Oh, Elspeth, I'm sorry. This must be terrible for you, too. It is terrible for me. But not to... Huh? What does that mean? I mean you killed her. How could you... Think a thing like that? I don't think. I know. But it isn't going to do you any good. It was all for nothing. I don't know what you mean. You will. When I'm ready to tell you. Right now, let's go to the scene of the... What shall we call it, Mark? Let's just say... The tragedy. Okay, boys, use the crowbars. Get those doors open. Go over the inside. Check the ignition key, huh? Oh. Uh, you Mr. Stanton? Yes. Yes, that's right. I'm Mrs. Stanton's sister. I do, ma'am. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry about this. My wife, you... You think she's dead? What can I say? A fall like that, and then, and, um, and... And what? Well, ma'am, this here shoe. One of my men found its mate washed ashore just before the river emptied into Lake Cahokawa. Right down near where the car landed in the river, we found your sister's pocketbook. It don't look good. Can't her body be recovered from the lake? We'll try, but that lake bottom is soft mud or whatever you want to call it from all the leaves the trees have been dropping for millions of years. It's like, like a quicksand. Nobody who ever drowned in that lake ever was seen again. Oh, my God. Look, uh, why don't you go on home, Mr. Stanton, and take, Miss, uh, take your sister-in-law with you. As soon as I'm finished up here, I'll drive up. There are some questions I'll have to ask. What do you mean, was Emily exceptionally tall? Well, for a woman, I meant. Actually, my sister was quite small. Two inches shorter than I am. And I'm only 5'4". Well, all right, yes, Emily was quite tiny. But what difference does that make? The driver's seat was adjusted for somebody as tall as, well, say you, sir. Oh, well, it could have been knocked back in the crash, couldn't it? Yes, sir. It could. Uh... Was your wife wearing gloves when she left? Gloves? I... Why? Driver's wheel had no fingerprints on it. I just wondered. Oh, yes, yes. Now I remember. Yes, uh, I think... Yeah, yes, she did have gloves. You drive with gloves, Mr. Stanton? Well, yes, yes, usually. And the uh, car is on constant maintenance at the garage. Yes, sir. All right, just one more question for now. Were you alone in the house when the accident happened? Oh, I suppose I must have been. Well, I was just wondering if your sister-in-law was also here. I... I arrived shortly before Emily left. 
I had planned to drive her into town this morning. We had some business to discuss, but when she insisted on leaving last night, I was just too tired to make the trip, and I had brought Mark a new script. Since Emily was taking Mark's car, I decided to stay, let him read the script, and we could drive in tomorrow discussing it and return it on time. Uh, well, I guess that closes things up for me. Sorry to have taken so much time. My condolences, Mr. Stanton. I, 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 I hope we can find your wife. He is just as certain of it as I am. You murdered Emily. What are you saying? The truth. If you believe that, why did you alibi me? I wanted to spike the sergeant's suspicions, at least temporarily. What are you up to? Uh, at the moment, not very much. I want to sleep on all of this. Oh, by the way, don't entertain any ideas of getting rid of me. You see, brother-in-law, dear, I happen to be exactly what you think of me. A witch. Only I am a real one. And because I am what I am, I can feel her presence in this house. If I told the police what I know, they'd search it from top to bottom. <laughs> because of someone who claims to have ESP, they'd write you off as a nut. Mark... You haven't a leg to stand on. On Wednesday, last Wednesday when we had lunch, I arranged for Emily to change her will. It was finalized before you drove up here Friday. I am executrix and control every penny. <sighs> I'm too tired to talk about it now. After I've slept on it, I'll decide your future. I suggest you get some rest to prepare for it. I wouldn't have bet a plug nickel I could get any sleep out of what was left of the night. But a bottle of brandy and sheer emotional exhaustion from fright put me to sleep in the library chair. The last thing I remember was a whirling confusion of surrealistic plots for disposing of Elspeth. I even finally believed what I'd always thought of her. That she was a witch. I was sick with grief and desperately tired. But I couldn't go to sleep. Every time my eyes closed, I seemed to hear a voice. I couldn't stand it any longer. I got up, went downstairs. I saw Mark passed out in the library, a brandy bottle in his hand. And the voice was closer. The voice threw me to the cellar. Help me. And there, Help beside the furnace, I knew it at last. The fresh cement, still drying, beautifully blended and tapered into the old surface. Now I knew where my sister was. Now I knew exactly what I had to do. <laughs> I now pronounce you, Elspeth Garrick Whitmore, and you, Mark Blaine Stanton, man and wife. You may kiss the bride. Ah, home sweet home. So, you got me at last, Elspeth. That's right, Mark. My dear husband. And no way out for you. One word from me and Sergeant Harkness would dig up that cellar and you'd spend the best part of your life in jail for murder. I'm grateful to you, of course. But some things I... I still don't understand. Oh, you will. Happy, darling. Just give your bride a few minutes to slip into something fetching and we'll start to begin our married life. I promise you'll find me all I told you I really am. Be witchy. I damned her under my breath for what she claimed to be. I found a longing ache for Emily and what she'd been to me. I seethed at being emasculated, at having to act like a pet poodle, at the hopelessness of my situation. I dreamed of the thousandth plot to get rid of Elspeth. Oh, an idle dream. I'd gotten away with it once, never again. And then... 
She called me into the bedroom. Come, lover boy. Oh, good Lord. No. <laughs> you didn't really believe I was a witch, did you? You're not else, but you're... You're Emily. I've borrowed her aspect. Does it please you? Yes, I... I, I love you. I, I want you. Oh, Emily, my beloved. Help us, Mark. Not Emily. Only her aspect, which you will live with every moment we're at home. Oh. But you will not touch me, either as myself or my sister you killed. I... I don't understand. I want to be sure you can't get away with it. A good lawyer, your own natural charm, a long, bitter trial, the possibility of escape. And even if they found you guilty, there is no death penalty, so... My way's better. No money. No freedom. And the remembrance every day of the crime you committed. The girl you murdered to haunt you fresh and lovely while you grow old and forgotten. This is your cell, Mark. Flush-lined, perhaps, but more confining than anything state or government could devise. And I am your jailer. Watching you die a little day by day, year by year. I've read it in your cards, traced it in your horoscope. You will have a long hell on earth before the spirit I worship welcomes you to the real hell for eternity. This is my revenge for my sister. And for myself. As it was in the beginning, so it is now and ever shall be. Heaven hath no rage like love to hatred turned. Nor hell no fury like a woman scorned. For this story, there is no ending. A man bought only what he deserved. I'll be back shortly. For a while, Mark Stanton's matinee ladies wondered about his abrupt retirement. But the Gorgon who guarded him fiercely finally discouraged their attentions. Not Elspeth alone. His good looks began to fade strangely, till by the time he was 35, his haunted, gaunt face and emaciated body looked more like a man in his 70s. He eventually was committed to a state institution for the insane and died there without even an obituary to mark his passing. Mysteriously and suddenly, Elspeth died on the same day. Our cast included William Redfield, Patricia Wheel, Terry Keene, and Ken Harvey. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I'll tell you why I called you, Sam. Your favorite parolee, Steve Janos, was just in. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know what a big football fan you are. Me, it's the Polish. What's on my mind? I don't know. The Cleveland police just sent me down a picture of that wife of his. And... Huh? Oh, <laughs> she's not marked up in what I'm looking at. Sensational looking doll. Too good to just pass up. What I want to know is, how are you coming on that trace you've had out on her? Yeah. Well, the moment anything turns up, you get on the pipe. Even tonight, I'll be here late. I wouldn't want to know that your boy and this girl were in the same town. That could be begging for trouble. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams...
The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The greatest poet dramatist in the English-speaking theater, or perhaps in any language, is William Shakespeare, whose body was laid to rest 360 years ago, but whose spirit is as alive today as it will be in another threescore years or millennia. This begins our salute to the master, not in the soaring poetry of his words, which would be presumptuous for this series, but to the enduring excitement, suspense, and mystery of his tragedies, adapted especially for our audience today. Dramas as gripping and tense as any of the stories I have brought you in the past two years. This is a sorry sight. What? My hands. You must not dwell on what is done. It could make us mad. I thought I heard a voice cry, sleep no more. Macbeth has murdered sleep. Innocent sleep. Sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care, the death of each day's life, balm of hurt minds. Macbeth has murdered sleep. Our mystery drama, Murder Most Foul, was especially adapted from William Shakespeare's classic tragedy, Macbeth, for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Kevin McCarthy. It is sponsored in part by Greyhound Package Express and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. simplest of historical notes are enough to make this story as up-to-date as any murder on your newspaper's front page. Greed, passion, and revenge are as alive in our society today as they were in the Scotland of that time. This was a country of clans, warrior states held loosely together by a king who won and held his throne by force of arms. Every clan who supported the king was headed by a thane, a rank equivalent to earl, conferred by the king. This is the story of one thane who aspired to be king and of the lady who drove him to reach for the prize. The haunting, bloody, tortured story of Macbeth, thane of Glams. Banquo. So foul and fair a day I have not seen. Uh, when the king hears of your deeds at arms, your future should be bright. Look! Look yonder through the mist. Oh, what are they? So wild in their attire and withered. They don't look like inhabitants of the earth. And yet are honest. Look. They beckon to us. And I am drawn to them. I must go. sisters, and a bonfire in all this rain? <laughs> Who are you? Speak if you can. Oh, hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Glam. By Our Lady, she knows you. Oh, hail, Macbeth. Hail to you, Thane of Cordor. By that title, then, she knows me not. Oh, And there she proves she knows me not at all. Why could any prediction be more promising? Forgive me, sisters, but I believe that you can look into the seeds of time and tell which grain will grow and which will not. What fortune do you see for me? Hail, Banquo, lesser than Macbeth, but greater. 
who shall be not so happy as Macbeth, yet much happier? Hail, Banquo, that shall be the father of kings, and yet no king himself. Banquo and Macbeth, all hail, all hail, all hail! Stay, sisters! Tell me more! Too late, old friend. Even the fire has melted into thin air. Your children shall be kings. And you to be king? <laughs> old Duncan would not like that so well. Uh -huh. Or his son, Malcolm, already named to succeed him. I don't think the Thane of Corder would be so pleased either. Well, it should bother him little since he's alive and well. Yeah, I am anxious to get home to my lady. Come! To the castle, and let's leave this melancholy heath behind us. What ho, the castle? Who goes there? Macbeth and Banquo, weary, wet, and battle-worn, and in haste for the comfort of a fire. Let down the drawbridge. Let down the drawbridge. Can he be doing at my castle? No doubt to bring honors and greetings from Duncan, our grateful king. But we shall soon find out, for he is waiting to greet us. Well, I'll spend little time on him. My lady is the one I want to welcome me home. You men, take the horses and see them groomed. Macbeth, to the Thane of Glams, I bring greetings from King Duncan for your victories against the invading Norsemen. And better still, I bring the ward. I am instructed to greet you also as Thane of Cawdor. How can the devil speak true? How can I be dressed in Carter's robes? I've just left him alive and well. And I have left him more recently very dead. Dead? How? Treason, confessed, and proved. The penalty? Death. A traitor, that sniveling coward. Oh, no good, Benquo. I saw him die. And nothing he ever did in life became him like the way he left it. But let us spend no further time on him, Macbeth, an old friend, and Victor... Go, take the spoils of battle. Your lady knows of your honors and waits for you. Great clams. Worthy, Cawdor. My husband and my darling. Mm. I am so proud of you. My new thane of Cawdor. <laughs> Did Macduff's news surprise you? No. Oh, you know how pleased you are. Mm, pleased, yes, at the king's generosity. Surprised? No. Who else could have told you? Another woman. Then me. <laughs> I cut her heart out and yours. My bloodthirsty little eagle. But you would have had a hard time finding this one's heart. What are you talking about? Banquo and I were returning across the moor when suddenly... We spied the fabled three. The Reed Sisters? Mm, aye. They hailed me as Glams and Thane of Carter and more. More than that. What? I was also hailed <laughs> as king hereafter. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, indeed. Duncan is king. And I am not in succession. And yet... They say the sisters are possessed of more than mortal knowledge. I have some further proof. Mm -hmm. What? Did not Macduff tell you? The king comes here tonight. Tonight? Huh? How long will he stay? He plans to leave tomorrow. If he sees the sun tomorrow. What? What? does that mean, my lady? Oh, my dear husband. Your face is a book which is too easily read. What both of us are thinking. No, 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 no. It's beyond thought. We could not, cannot do this thing. Glams, you are. Corda, you have become. And you shall be the third that was promised. Yes, I am afraid you are too full of the milk of human kindness to seize the opportunity when it is offered you. Here comes the king now. I must go. The king must be provided he for. He will be provided for. I did not Do mean... not lie I... to yourself or me. Only 
only to the others. Look innocent as a lamb, but hold the serpent under. Go quickly, my Lord Macbeth. Leave all the rest to me. The raven himself will be horse who croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan as I watch him here from the battlement. If there are spirits that can read a mortal's thoughts, come and unsex me here. Fill me from crown to toe with blackest cruelty. Thicken my blood. Drown all remorse. Come to my woman's breast. And turn my milk to gall. Bring down a night as black as all the smoke of hell. Hide me from seeing the wounds my keen knife makes. And allow no pang of conscience to see through the blanket of the night that might cry, Hold, hold! Uh, This castle lies upon such pleasant land. The air is soft and gentle. I shall find a long rest here tonight, my Lord Macbeth. I pray it may be the rest you seek. I have no doubt. My dear cousin, I owe you much. My loyalty alone pays for whatever I and Banquo have accomplished. God save the king. May I have your... Your Majesty's permission to withdraw a moment? Uh, We must all soon... The day has been long. If it were done, when it is done, then it were well, it were done quickly. If only the assassination were the be all and end all. How to jump the life to come when conscience shall turn the instrument of death back at me? He's here in double thrust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject, then as his host, it is I who should bar the door against his murderer, not bear the knife myself. And he, so many virtues of his that will plead like angels against the deep damnation of his taking off. I have no spur to prick my ambition, which overleaps itself. Who's there? Oh, no, my lady. What news? The king has finished supper. Why have you stayed so long away from the chamber? Has he asked for me? You know he has. We will proceed no further with this plan. I've won too much esteem to throw it all aside. Oh, what of your own esteem? Would you live a coward, letting I dare not wait upon I would like the cat in the old adage? Peace, peace, I dare do all that may become a man. When you broached this venture to me, then you were a man. But suppose we fail. Why, then we fail. But screw your courage to the sticking point, and we will not fail. Listen to me. Duncan is old and tired, and will sleep sound. I will so drug his two bodyguards with wine and wassail that neither sense nor memory will remain with them. While they lie drugged, you and I will finish the unguarded Duncan, and his officers shall bear the guilt. Mm, Bring forth men, children only. (laughs) Your undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. We shall mark with blood the sleeping guards. And who can question that their stained and drawn daggers have done the deed? Who dares receive it any other way, torn and grief-stricken as we shall be at our benefactor's death? I am settled. So, away. And make all merry. False face must hide what our false hearts know. this? Is this a dagger I see before me? It's handled toward my hand. Come. Come, let me clutch you. Ha! I have you not, but still I see you, and on your blade great gouts of blood. I know, I know. I see, but cannot touch you. You are only 
A vision of the mind. Oh, God. Oh, God. Let no one hear my steps. For fear the very stones beneath my feet will cry out, Murder. Murder most foul. The signal. I go, and it is done. Hear it not, Duncan, for it's a knell that summons you to heaven or hell. The castle sleeps, save for Macbeth and his lady. From the chamber she comes, a finger poised to her lips for silence. She nods to Macbeth that all is as planned. He nods in return, and drawing his dagger silently, pushes aside the tapestry and enters the king's chamber. I shall return shortly with Act Two. suspended in a vacuum while a driven Lady Macbeth paces her chamber in the silent castle waiting for her husband to carry out the bloody murder which without her purpose and drive he might have shrunk from there is a brooding and unnatural quiet and the seconds seem endless to the waiting woman The drink which lulled the watching guard to sleep has served to make me bold. What quenched them has set me on fire. What's that? Nothing but an owl shrieking. (laughs) Had Duncan not resembled my father as he slept, I would have done it myself. He's coming. Well, my husband... I have done the deed. Did you not hear a noise? Only the owls scream. And it was you who spoke. When? Now. As I descend. Yes. No. This is a sorry sight. What? Look on my hands. One of the bodyguards cried out in his sleep, God bless us, and the other amen. Why could I not say amen? I had... The most need of blessing, but it's stuck in my throat. You must not dwell on what is done. It could make us mad. Ah, uh, I thought I heard a voice cry, sleep no more. Macbeth has murdered sleep. And it's its sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care. The death of each day's life. The balm of hurt minds. Macbeth. Has murdered sleep. Give me the daggers. The sleeping and the dead can bring no harm. I hope he's bled enough that I can smear them well, for it must seem their Ah, guilt. ah. Sleep no more. Sleep no more. Could all the great oceans of the world wash this blood clean from my hands? No, no, no. These hands would rather all the multitudinous seas in Carnadine, making the green one red, bloody red. Now my hands are of your color, but I would be ashamed to wear a coward's heart of white. What's that knocking? It's the south gate. The porter will attend to it. Then let's retire to our chamber. A little water will wash away the blood. You will see how easy it is. Remember who you are. Knowing that deed that I have done, I do not want to know myself. Wake, Duncan, with your knocking, then. I wish before God you could. Has my knocking disturbed your master, Porter? Ah, I see it has. Good morning, Uncle. Good morning, nephew Malcolm. I'm sorry you could not sup with us last night. My loss, noble Macbeth. Is my father stirring yet? I doubt it. I doubt it. I'll make the most of family ties and wake him by myself. Good morrow, good Banquo. And to you, young Malcolm. Mm. Macbeth, what brings him here at this ungodly hour? Oh, some business with his father, the king. It's of a piece with all the night. It was an unruly one with too much wine to sleep on well. Aye, it was a rough night. Ah! Murder! 
What? Why, that's, that's, that's young Malcolm. What's amiss? I cannot guess. My uncle, my good man, go give me your arm. Steady, boy. My father is, my father dead. Wow. You, you mean his majesty, impossible. What is afoot? Are we attacked? Oh, far worse, Macduff. My father has been murdered. I'll not believe it. Stay you with the boy while I find out what's happened. Duncan dead? How? He's stabbed to the heart. Attend the boy. Ring the alarm bell. Seal up the castle! Murder and treason! Ring the bell! Gentlemen, what hideous noise is this to wake the sleepers of the house? Oh, gentle lady, it is not for you to hear my answer. Let it come from a closer member to the house, Lady Macbeth. The king is dead. In his sleep? But he was so full of life and laughter only last night. If I had only died in battle before this came to happen, I would have been blessed. Macbeth? My husband, who's... Blood is on your hands. I, I can answer that. Brave Macbeth has taken swift revenge. As I came to the chamber, in a welter of blood, alive and unharmed, and fast asleep, lay the king's two guards. I, in a fury that I now repent, I slew them both. Why did you so fast? The revenge was mine by Oh, my... dear Malcolm, who can be wise, amazed, temperate, furious, loyal, and neutral in a moment? No, man. Duncan lay on his bed, his white skin spattered with his lifeblood, and in my love, my anger outran reason. Oh, help me, Hans. I am faint. Oh, look to the lady, Macduff. First, let us learn to control our grief. Then, when we can talk calmer, let us meet and question this most no, bloody piece of no, work. No, let me attend my wife. And once I see her safely settled, I will take hold of myself and put on my manly readiness and meet with you in the great hall. Fair enough. Any is fair at all. So let it be. What will you do, Macduff? What do you mean? I will not stay to share their show of sorrow. I'll flee to England. You realize your flight can make you scapegoat for the deed. You think I'd kill my own father? You stand in succession to the crown. Alive, I do. You think my uncle would have less compunction about removing me than he had my father? No, thank you. I will not take the chance... Nor will I be dainty about leaving. Farewell, farewell, gentlemen. If gentlemen you be instead of traitors, too. What do you think, Benko? I was not there to see. And you, Macduff? Sometimes the young are quick to sense a changing tide. I do not know. And yet I feel Macbeth will be king. I was too close to Duncan to enjoy Macbeth's full regard as you do, Banquo. I'll take discretion for the better part of valor and absent myself a while. It seems this is a time for swift goodbyes. Dead I, Macbeth, with this my pledge here on the sacred stone of Schoon, do humbly accept the crown and the honor my liegemen thus bestow in naming me their king. So now, Macbeth, you have it all, just as the weird sisters promised. And even I, your friend, must fear you won it by the most foul of means. And yet the sisters said that I would father a line of kings, though never be king myself. How can I read this? I must study it a while. And meanwhile, follow in your train to Inverness. Ladies and gentlemen, way for the king and his royal consort. Tonight, we hold a solemn feast, dear friend. May I request your presence? Let your highness command me. Command, Banquo. Not from friend to friend. Then I come both as my duty and my pleasure. As soon as I return. Mm, you're riding this afternoon. I must. Mm, a pity. I'd hoped for your good advice at the council table, but that can wait for tomorrow if you fail not our feast tonight. My lord, mm. fear not. Does your son ride with you? Fleance? Yes. Ah, to horse with you then, and ride swift and safe. Till we shall meet again. I think that that must be never. What said, my lord? Hush. I spoke of Banquo. I fear him. Mm. Mm. So do I. A king overshadowed by a subject? A king. But no father to kings, as the sisters promised him. What, what have I murdered?
Croesus Duncan destroyed my honor, peace of mind, my nightly rest, all to put his seat upon the throne. And must you suffer this? There is a man I told you of who hates Banquo. For what cause? Some fancy one, for he was sure to blame. A hangdog, cutthroat, drunken, brawling thief whom Banquo turned out of home and heart. Use him. Mm, I. So I will. See to it that our consul is seated and bid the attendant send in this man to me. I will obey you in all things. Obey or lead me to do them. It is understood then. Yes, my liege. You understand, I could with bare face power sweep him from my sight, yet I must not because of certain friends that are both his and mine. So I draw on your assistance to mask this from the common eye. I shall Mm -hmm. perform... uh, We shall perform as you command. So, with all understood, leave me now. But it must be tonight. As sure as the sun will set. The sun will set. Banquo, your soul's flight, if it... Find heaven must find it out tonight. Sire, the deed is done. There's blood upon your face. If so, it's Banquo's where I cut his throat. (laughs) He was mine. And the son. Sire, my friend failed me. He lies in a ditch with Banquo gaping from his many boys. The boy, the boy. He escaped. I would I could have tended to them both. Uh, 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 no doubt you did your best. We'll talk again. Go. Oh, yes. Yes, my liege. Banquo dead, the serpent gone. But the worm is fled to wet his serpent fangs for some future wound. Ah, uh, well, well, well. No teeth for the present. My royal lord, we need you here to give the toast. From thence to the sauce and meat is ceremony. Ah, uh, forgive my lapse. Affairs of state. Now they must stand aside for mirth and laughter and the festive board. First, as my sweet conscience has reminded me, the toast. Let good digestion wait on appetite and health on both. Long live the king. Long live the king. But not his friends. What? My lord, why are you staring at that empty chair? What empty chair? The one that's held for Banquo. And he is here. There's no one there. Then worse, his ghost is waiting there. All blood. All blood. And calling me down to join him in the tomb. Around the table, the other guests are unaware of the delirium that racks their king. In quiet desperation, Lady Macbeth tries to hold her husband from disintegrating at the vision which stares across the table at him. His closest friend, Banquo, bleeding freely from a dozen wounds, his eyes fixed and haunting on the man who lulled him to his violent death, a ghastly specter at the feast. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Macbeth stares, riveted at the bleeding ghost of his friend Banquo across the table from him. Slowly, the awful vision fades until the chair is empty again. Meanwhile, the guests at this festive board, gathered to celebrate the accession of their new king, have slowly, most of them, become aware of their host's strange disorder. Now, as we return to the feast from which the specter has left... Lady Macbeth tries quickly to reassure her husband. (laughs) Are you a man? A bold one that can look on what might well appall the devil. To look on what? There, where he sits. What kind of man? This is the imagined dagger you drew in air which you sniveled and led you to Duncan's shame. Such actions could become a woman's story at a winter's fire. You look on nothing but an empty chair. It's true. It's true. It's all imagining. My worthy lord, your, your noble friends are being overlooked. I do forget. I do forget. Don't be concerned, I pray you. I have this sometime infirmity, which is nothing to those that know me. Come, give me a goblet, and we shall drink to our good friend Banquo. Hey. 
Word that he were here to fill that vacant chair. Macbeth doth murder sleep. Macbeth shall sleep no more. No! Quit my sight! Let the earth bury you! So much to break up the meeting, displace the murder. Blood has been shed before now. Time was when brains were out, a man would die and make an end, but now he rises again. Begone! Begone, horrible shadow, unreal mockery. Do not haunt me. My lord is not himself tonight. Too worn with cares of state. I beg you, go at once to all good night. Stand not upon the order of your going. <laughs> My lord, why keep these thoughts which should have died? What's done is done. Ah, no, my lady, we have scotched the snake, not killed it. Banquo is in his grave. All is safe at ah, last. All is safe? While Banquo's son lives to steal the throne from our children, while Macduff plans to join dead Duncan's son Malcolm to raise armies against us in England. I thought you sent for him in fight. Oh, I did, but has he come? I'll send for him again. But by the Lord, if he has fled or plans to, I'll have his castle seized and put them all to the sword. Wife, babes, and every unfortunate soul that traces him in his line. Meanwhile, before I sleep tonight, I'll ride to the moors and find those sisters to forecast me better times. I must have peace. Peace at any price. Uh... And trouble, fire, burn, and cauldron bubble. By the pricking of my thumb, something wicked this way comes. Open lock, swear not. <laughs> At last I find you, secret midnight hags. I conjure you by that which you profess to know. However you come by the knowledge, answer to what I ask you. We know the thought. Hear your answer. Macbeth, Macbeth, beware, Macduff. You read my fear right, but... Be bloody, bold, and resolute. Scorn the power of man, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. I've made assurance double, sure. Macduff should by now have been put to the sword. But still... Uneasy thoughts possess me. Put them by. Macbeth shall never be vanquished until great Barnum Wood to hide on Selene Hill shall come against him. Ha, ha. <laughs> and that shall be never. Who can move the forest? Bid the tree tear out his earthbound roots. Macbeth shall live his life full out. But yet to snuff out false Macduffs I'll not forget. <laughs> Macduff, what brought you here to England? I hear you think to raise an army to invade our unhappy land. What you want to know, believe. Your judgment is your own. This tyrant Macbeth, whose name alone blisters our tongues, was once thought honest. You have loved him, and he hasn't touched you yet. I am not treacherous. Ah, but Macbeth is. Your castle was surprised at the order of Macbeth. Your wife and all within savagely slaughtered. What? M my children, too? Wife, children, servants, all that could be found. Merciful heavens. Oh, my pretty one, did you say? All? <gasps> Hell cried all! Dispute it like a man. I shall do so, but first I must feel it as a man. Let it be the whetstone of your sword to strike your anger into glowing sparks. Oh, oh I could play the woman with my eyes and wail my sorrow with my tongue. But not for now. For now, bring me this fiend of Scotland front to front within the length of my sword. <laughs> What is it, Seymour? Uh, Your Majesty, forgive me. While you have been in the field with preparations for the English invasion, I have tried to keep all safe at home. But your poor lady... My lady, yes? Though closely in the doctor's care, her gentlewomen 
have reported to me disturbing signs. Well, speak, man, speak. That they have seen her rise nightly from her bed, clad only in her gown, and taking paper from her closet, right. Fold it, write again, read it, seal it, return to bed, and all the while fast asleep. Hush, my liege may see for himself, for here she comes. Her eyes are open. Look closely. You will see that their sense is shut. Ah, look how she rubs her hands. For often at least a quarter by the hour. Here's a spot still. Shh, she speaks. Out, damn spot. Out, I say. Fie, my lord, fie. A soldier and afraid. What need have we to fear anything? No one can call us to account. We are too powerful to be questioned. <laughs> Yet who would have thought the old man would have had so much blood in him? Marked you that, my lord? Still. Will these hands never be clean? They carry the smell of blood still. Oh, God. Oh, sweet, forgiving God. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this, this little hand. Oh, no, no. She cannot, should not bear the cross as heavy as I do. Wash your hands. Put on your nightgown. Banquo is buried. He cannot rise from his grave. Shh, shh. To bed. Come, come, come. Give me your hand. What's done cannot be undone. To bed. To bed. To bed. You should follow her. If you will, your majesty, but her gentlewomen await to see her back there safely. And God forgive us all. Are there no doctors to minister to her, to cleanse her of the poison that weighs so perilously on her heart? The doctors say, as we must know, my liege, that where the mind is poisoned, the patient must minister to herself. Give me no more reports. Let them fly to the winds. They are less than an old hag's gossip till Burnham Wood shall come to Dunsinane. And that even the English cannot accomplish. What I should cower before this boy Malcolm, Duncan's son, was he still not born of woman? I'll scour these English from our Scottish land. I will not be afraid of Bane till Burnham Forest come to Dunsinane. What wood is this before us? The wood of Burnham where we can gather an army unseen and prepare our attack on Macbeth's castle. But how to come across the valley in between? I have a thought. Suppose each soldier should hew down a bow and then, holding it before him, advance slowly so that the castle under siege could not be sure of our numbers or where the main attack lay. By God, of all men, you may have fixed the course that will undo Macbeth. <laughs> on the castle walls. The cry is still, they come. But our castle strength will lay a siege to storm. What is that cry? I had thought I had forgotten the taste of fear. That I had supped full of horrors and nothing else could make me start. Who cried out? Seymour? Yes, Macbeth. What was that cry? The queen, my lord. Is dead. Ah! Ah! -ha! No! No! Ah, she should not have died now. But when there was time to mourn her, what? What's left for me? Tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day, and all our yesterdays only served to light fools the dusty way to death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. No more than an actor who struts and frets his hour upon the stage and with the curtain down is heard no more. Now, life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, but signifying nothing. Now, Seymour, the, the, what the, is it? That I should have to, to bring this, this knowledge. I, Speak I, out, man. Though you may doubt my wits, sir, as I stood watch upon the turrets, I and others with me could swear that looking out to Burnham, the wood began to move. Liar and slave! I would to God I were! If you speak false, I'll hang you alive on the next tree. But still, I will take no chance. Ring the alarm, Burnham! Ring out! Ring out! Let all prepare for siege. Blow in Carmarack. At least 
like we'll die with harness on our back. Drop the barrels! To the attack! On the trumpet! We are in the open now! On! To Jen City! Go with the tyrant Macbeth! They have thrown down their cover, my lord, and are at full attack! I'm tied to a stake. I cannot fly. Oh, I must fight the course. Because I am safe. Who can I fear since what man is not born of woman? I have tried to avoid thee. Get back from me. I have too much blood of your family on my hands already. I have no words for you. My voice is in my sword, you bloody villain. Oh, no, listen for your own sake. Cross not swords with me. I bear a charmed life. No man can harm me, a woman born. Then fear for your life, traitor, murderer, villain. You have no charm to save you. Next up was not born of woman. What? I was from my mother's womb untimely ripped. So yield, you coward! I will not yield to you or Malcolm or be baited by the rabble's curse. So Burnham Wood has come to Dunsinane, and you may claim you are not born of woman. Yet will I fly to the last, before my body I bear my shield. Leon Macduff, and damned be he who first tries, hold it up! of course is history whether by prophecy and the voice of the fates or in the chance of battle Macbeth was slain a bloody corpse to lie beside the ones he made himself and the still small body of his fierce and tender lady who died not in blood but from those hands from which she could not wash the blood of regicide away that is the story of Macbeth a footnote to this drama. Within the body of our story, all the forecasts of those strange three sisters who haunted the barren Scottish moors came true. Save only one, which history had to wait to document. From the family of the murdered Banquo, eight kings ruled Scotland in succession, as foretold. While the royal family of Macbeth began and died in that one wicked, misled, tortured, tragic king. Our cast included Kevin McCarthy, Carol Titel, William Redfield, Court Benson, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Beneath the cloaks that shielded them when I brought them here, each man has a dagger like... Like this. I have no personal spite against him, and, and yet... And yet he will be crowned king. It's his ambition that we destroy, not the man himself. Before the serpent's egg is hatched, it must be crushed. Come, brothers. I think we know our cause. Is it Caesar alone who is to die? No, Mark Antony is too close to Caesar. If he outlives him, he's shrewd enough to bring us down. Let them fall together. This is no bloodbath, Cassius. Cut off the head. But we will not hack at the limbs. We kill Caesar boldly, not in anger. Carve him as a dish fit for the gods. A sacrifice. Let us be remembered as purgers, not murderers. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Allied Van Lines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... every civilization, there has come a time when the troubles of a people become so great that in desperation, they seek just about any means to ease their hopelessness. So often in the past, they have turned to a single person to lead them out of their misery and confusion. Sometimes that man has acted for the good of his people. Almost as frequently, he's brought them to their own destruction. Upon these hands, I bear the curse of my child's blood. Oh, gods, what dirge can I sing? What funeral song, what lamentation as I rock back and forth, cradling my dead son here in my arms? You gods, be merciful to a miserable, unhappy woman who should be in her grave. The drama on the Night of the Dead is based on one of the most moving tragedies of the ancient Greeks, the Bacchae of Euripides. It was especially written for the Mystery Theatre by Arnold Moss. It stars John Vickery and Marion Seldes. I'll be back in a moment with Act One. Long ago, a tiny privateer sailing under the flag of no nation drops anchor and discharges its passengers on an uninhabited, desolate island lapped by the warm waters of the South Atlantic. The place becomes a sanctuary for some hundred wanderers seeking refuge from persecution, a place where they can practice without being molested, their belief in more than a single god. A hundred years go by. The island's population has found a way to tear a day-to-day existence out of the barren, unwilling earth. Until one particular summer, in his crude palace, the island's young governor, Pentheus, listens to the words of his old and trusted advisor, Cadmus. Your excellence, my governor, you must listen. Stop pacing like some wild and untamed beast. I listen, Cadmus. For two months now, I listen. The time for talk is ended. We now must act. What can we do that we have not yet done? My thoughts exactly. But I dare not say, Your Honor. Say, speak freely, Cadmus. You have my promise. I shall not punish you. We know our island is dying. For all these months of summer, no single drop of water has fallen from the skies. Not one. We know. And each morning when the sun lets loose its light to warm the earth, our grazing herds of cattle, they lie down. And in a final gasp, their tongues lick at the air, reaching for the water that is not there. For the grass that dried nothing weeks ago. You have a plan? Let's hear it. We must leave this island, all of us. Leave? We must board our ships and seek another land, a gentler, kinder land, just as our fathers and their fathers did so many years ago. And there lies madness. Our people's wanderings ended a hundred years ago. After all this toil, to leave it to the seagulls once again? Never. Not while I still live. No, Cadmus. We stay. And die as you wish, my governor. Look, Cadmus. I know the little water we have stored from heaven's bounty is undrinkable. I know the plants dry up and wither without the nourishment of rain. I know the cattle die of thirst. I know the people die of thirst. By all the gods who should preserve us, what can we do? Drink water from the sea? Dig deeper wells? We've scratched the earth until we've reached the bottom, and still no water. Pentheus, my governor, look, 
Look at what I carry in my arms. Who let you in here? No one could keep me out. Look down at my poor son. This pitiful thing I cradle in my arms. Take care of her. See, she's taken home. Come, come, my poor woman. Follow me. Don't touch me, you old fool. Look. Look at my son. This baby. His breath. It comes no more. We are sorry, sister. We grieve with you for your child's death. (laughs) You grieve with me. How kind of you. Then bring him back to life. What have you done to see that my child stayed alive? The best we knew. (laughs) Not good enough. Look at his swollen belly. At his staring eyes. His ribs. Would you care to count them? It's so easy, Your Excellence. So easy. Here. Fondle him in your arms. No. Don't turn away from me. Stay away, woman. Don't come near me. With my long nails, I'll tear you. Enough! I say enough. And now, go home. Bury your dead. Bury him deep. And know one thing. What? Unless the rains come soon, we're all as good as dead. As dead as your poor child. Cadmus here. And you. And I. What must we do? The one thing left to all of us. Which is? Lift our eyes to the skies above and pray. Please, leave us now. You gods who hold our destiny in your hands, who choose to smile upon us for the good we do, to punish us for our evil, spare your people and your land from this cruel, deadly drought. Open the skies and let the cold rain fall. Look down at the misery of your poor island and then weep for it. Let your tears fall from the heavens above. Let your tears soak into this parched earth. Show us your pity. Cadmus? Are you all right? Are you hurt? A little shaken, but I'm well. But what was that? A raging wind that seemed to come from nowhere, roaring its swift way over the land. With the strength of a thousand men. As quickly as it came, so quickly has it gone. Somewhere among the gods we worship, there must be one with pity in his heart for our poor, suffering land. Pentheus, my son, I bring great news Agave, my mother, what is it? We're saved, our land is saved At last our prayers are to be answered What are you saying, mother? The drought is about to end How can that be, Agave? The sky's turn blue, no single drop of rain has fallen We'll no longer need the rain What nonsense are you speaking, mother? A god has come to our island A god has seen our anguish and our heartache A god has come to answer our prayers Nonsense, who is this god? Or better, this one you call a god. He's beautiful. He's so beautiful. Who is he? We we do not trifle with divinity, Agave. We are the heirs of customs and traditions hallowed by age and handed down to us by our father. What has he done, this god of yours, that makes you so sure this cursed drought will end? First, he passed the goatskins out among us. Goatskins? Filled with wine. They were sweet wine. I touched the wine. I felt it on my lips. This was no trick. By what name does this street magician call himself? From what city, from what land has he come here? Zenos, he calls himself. Zenos, the stranger. What land, what city? My son, he has come to us from heaven. I see. Cadmus? Your Excellency. Whoever this Zenos, this stranger is, we must get rid of him at once. He threatens trouble. Great trouble for us all. We've grief enough without this mischief maker. We'll stop this waving of his wand if it's the last thing that we do. Come, young woman, join the rest of us. You too must celebrate the happy coming of a god. 
I am too deep in sorrow, Agave. No, put down that child of yours. Let the living comfort you. There, that's better. Now come and sing his praises with the rest of us. Blessed are those who know the mysteries of this God. Blessed are those who sanctify their lives in worshiping this God. Come now, you young woman. Blessed, blessed are those whose heads are crowned oh, with ivy. ivy. Now together, blessed, blessed, blessed are, are they. Hail, Zeno, hail, born of the gods on high. This island. Drink more of the wine I've given you. I am Zenos, the stranger. Come to your suffering land in answer to your prayers, to a land whose people cry to me in anguish, whose people call to me for help. I am Agave, mother of the governor Pentheus. Welcome, mother. We need you, Zenos. Now, you young woman, let him hear your voice. How can you help us? Tell us what we must do. Believe in me. Believe. We believe. We know you are a god. A god whose pity reaches out to all of us. We believe. You know that only I can end the drought that sucked this island dry. That only I can give you all the water you need. We know, we know, my lord. Zenos, hear my voice. This bundle that I carried in my arms. That was my infant son. Go. Take him with your own mouth. Breathe life into him again. That's, alas, I cannot do. How then can I have faith in you? How can I believe that you have powers greater than any other man who walks the earth? I promise you that deaths like this will come no more to you. How? How will you do that? I lift my staff and strike it so against this rock. Flames burst from my staff and see. A fountain of cool water comes bubbling from the earth. Have faith in me and it will grow into a mighty stream pouring its rich blessings from the mountaintops. Now I strike this other rock and lo, a spring of wine, a good red wine comes spurting from the ground. Come, all of you. Drink of the wine, this holy wine. And last, I touch the soil here, gently with my staff. You, you young woman, scratch the sod with your bare fingers. Tell me what you see. Milk, sweet white milk comes welling from the ground. Blessed is he who brings us all these wonders. Holiness, angel of heaven. Holiness gliding on golden wings. There is no greater greater God than Zenos. Wait, out of the way, women, all of you. Scatter yourselves. A wild and raging bull stands, glaring at us, his eyes aflame. His hoofs tear up the earth beneath him. Run for your lives. We'll all be torn to pieces on his horns or else trampled to death by his sharp moves. Stay where you are, women. Stand your ground. He will not harm you. Here he comes. Heaven help us. Stay. Stay, my friend. Stay. You glare at me, do you? I strike you with my staff. So. The ball has toppled to its knees. Its eyes are glazed. Its tongue hangs from its mouth. The sweat drips off its body. It rolls on its back. The beast is dead. Down. Down on your knees, women of the island. Sing out with songs of thanks for your deliverance. Sing to the God who has rescued you. Women of our island, I've come to order you back to your homes, each one of you. You're acting as if all of you were mad. Oh, call it what you like, Pentheus, my son. The drought is over. I see water pouring down the mountainsides. I see the wine, the milk, the drops of honey. Mother, listen, these are the crafty games of a trickster of the street. What you and all the other women think you see is some weird fantasy, a blinding of the brain brought on by all the wine he's fed you. There is no water. 
no drop of milk, nor honey, only goat skins filled with wine. Leave here at once. Go to your homes. I order you. Well, what have I done, my lord, that you, you should be so angry? The good women of our island have gone lunatic, and you have driven them to this. You've corrupted their minds. You've poisoned their souls. And this I will permit no longer. Well, what do you plan to do, my governor? I've warned you. Warn all you like. I am a god born in a stroke of lightning carried here in a powerful wind. Then let that wind carry you back to where you came. Make yourself to disappear. If not, what will you do? Don't press me, Zenos. I have a few tricks of my own. As Pentheus confronts the stranger with an ultimatum, the powers of civilized order and routine are pitted against the most primitive and disruptive forces of nature. What can Pentheus do to reestablish his authority over the women of his island? And does this stranger, who claims to be a god, have the power to thwart him? What new and hidden magic has he in what Pentheus calls his bag of tricks? I'll return shortly with Act Two. Defending the existence of God, the French philosopher Voltaire once wrote, if God did not exist, it would have been necessary to invent him. Is the Zenus of our story a true divinity among these people who believe in many gods? Or is it the invention of a fertile imagination? His own invention, for purposes of his own. Pentheus, governor of the island, is at his wit's end as he speaks once more with old Cadmus. This man, this god, whatever he calls himself, has only added to our misery, Cadmus. The drought goes on. The cracked earth, dry as ever... And he's robbed our women of their senses. Yes, he, he has them thinking that the water flows from mountaintops and that the drought is ended. Cadmus, what's even worse, the women's brains are sodden with the wine he's brought them. Uh, and yes, my lord, have you thought why he should want increase of our misfortunes? What could we have done to earn this added sorrow? I've no idea. Unless he... Unless? Uh, I hesitate to speak. Go on, Cadmus, tell me. Uh, unless, Your Excellence, this Zenos is indeed a god. What? A, a, a god we've never heard of till this moment. A god who's come to pay us for some unknown wrong we may have done him. You think that that's a possibility? Why not? Cadmus... I've known you since I was a tiny babe in swaddling clothes. All my life, I've trusted you, relied on your good judgment, on your wisdom. True? Yes, true, my lord. But now you speak to me as if you, too, were mad. <laughs> Admit, there is the smallest chance... Silence, old man! Don't try to wipe your madness off on me. Well, he hasn't done all that much harm, at least not yet. He, he just talks... More than he should. Your tongue without reins, defiance, stubborn pride, deception, they lead to sure disaster. This Zenos is a fraud, a dangerous clown who hunts a kind of glory. His, his simple gift of wine, the innocent gladness of the great... Innocent indeed, I've heard enough. Go with your soldiers to where this prophet prophesies. Surprise him in the deadness of the night... Make him your prisoner, clap him tight in chains, and march him here in irons. My son, what brings you to this part of the palace? You come so seldom to the women's quarters. I must speak with you. Well, it won't disturb you if I go on with my work. I'm almost finished. Work? Oh, I'm putting a new tight skin, the skin of a sheep... Over the ring of this tambourine. I struck it hard last night when dancing on the mountaintops. <laughs> so hard it split. Now, Pantheus, why have you come to see me? I ask you what you think you're doing. Your meaning isn't clear to Dancing me. on mountaintops at midnight to the frenzied music of your drums and pipes. But what harm's in that? Singing vulgar songs in praise of this conjurer of the streets who'd have you think that he's a god. 
Where is your sense of decency and shame? I'm listening, Pentis. You forget you are the mother of the island's governor. You forget you are not some mindless child, a careless schoolgirl. You're an old lady, mother. You should be serving as a model of restraint and dignity. Set an example to the other women. Instead, you drink this humbug's wine and act like... like a senile lunatic. Like some lascivious bored. <laughs> you slapped me, mother. Have you finished speaking, child? Now you listen to me. This street magician, as you've called him, will bring life back to our island. You'll see how right we women are to worship him. I can't believe you mean what you're saying. You call that worship. Indeed. You and your cronies, all you men, you stand around in shadowy corners, pleading to the gods in gloomy prayer. Well, we do no less, but we pray to our god, Zenos, under the open sky. We pray with joy and gladness, and he, he makes the blood warm and tingle in our veins like the spring sap in the trees, and sooner or later, he will make the rain to fall. Give him the chance to prove himself. I've ordered that he be placed in iron. You'll make a prisoner of a god? Unless this fraud, this libertine, agrees to leave our land never to return, I shall destroy him. Have him stoned to death. If you... So much as harm, one hair of Zeno's head. I will destroy myself. And you, Pentheus, my son, so jealous of your honor, you and you alone will take the blame. My own son's hand will plunge the dagger into his mother's breast. You understand me? I understand. Careful, Cadmus. Those stones are very sharp beneath the feet. Yes. When I was young, my lord, I found few greater pleasures than playing in the sand along these shores, imagining myself the captain of some great sailing ship. Oh, Cadmus. Cadmus. What must we do about this Xenos? I've had him bound in chains. What must I do next? Yes, prove to our women that he is no more than an imposter. That his promise of an end to drought is cruel and without truth. Cadmus, look there. There, where the shoreline curves. <laughs> it's a wreck. The ship's been wrecked, smashed all to pieces on the jagged rock. Its sails, they're torn to ribbons. Its lines ripped to shreds. It must have blown onto the rocks and crashed when the great wind came tearing out of nowhere. And the crew, the sailors. No sign of living souls. They must have drowned, all of them. Drowned beneath the waters of the roiling sea. Wait, wait, wait. Pentius, over there, the entrance leading to that grotto. One of the sailors, perhaps more than one, must have escaped the wreck. You, you see, there's a boat. Let's look. If maybe we can find some little trace of life. Uh, I, I don't believe it. From stem to stern, from one end to the other, the boat is filled with goat skins. And filled, each one of them, with wine. <laughs> The very goatskins, the same one. That supply the wine that Zenos is providing to our women. We now have all the proof we'll ever need. I, I don't understand. This rogue must be the sole survivor of the ship that foundered. He came ashore in this boat here. The goatskins floated on the water to the shore. He gathered them. And this is what he's using to persuade our ladies that he is a god. Hand me one of them, Cadmus. Yes. Now, now we have our proof. But why, Lord Pentheus, would he do this? We can only guess. He's an adventurer, albeit a very shrewd one. He saw this as an opportunity for self-aggrandizement, to puff up his importance, to live in glory for an hour or two. So now you know what step to take. I do. I do. Thank you, my soldiers. Remain where you are. I see the prisoner from here. This way, Lord Pentheus. Excuse me, Your Excellency. May I pass? Young woman, I've seen you somewhere once before. 
I came to you pleading with my dead child. Why are you here? What brings you to this prison dungeon? I... I came... I came, Lord Pentheus, to see that this imposter, Zenos, was indeed in chains. In chains where he belongs. Uh, the soldiers at the door, they let me in to look. <laughs> then there's one woman on this island who's not been hoodwinked by this fraud. I leave, Your Excellence. Do what you must to help us all. You're here where you belong, my friend. Behind cold bars of iron, shackles on your feet. I do not plan to stay in here forever. That's good. I, too, have other plans for you. Yes, I'm sure. A few last words before you leave this island forever. Just as you please, my lord. You claim you are a god. I am a god. A god? In mortal form? The choice is mine. What do you know about a boat laden with goatskins? Goatskins filled with wine. Goatskins, my lord? Good. I know nothing. Nothing. I see. Would you tell me why you hold your sacred rites by dark of night? Or does the daylight frighten you? The darkness is well suited to devotion. Or better suited to the foul corruption of impressionable women? And this. You imagine things are happening with your women that, for all you know, may not be happening at all. These well may be the fantasies of your poor sick mind. The women of this land are fine and upright women. Such women cannot be corrupted by you, the island's men, even by me. The time for words is over. Soldiers, come unlock the gate. Remove the shackles from the prisoner's feet. He's leaving us forever. Spare yourself the trouble, my good lord. I leave this dungeon any time I wish, with or without your help. Oh, you don't believe me? Watch. I touch this lock that hangs upon the door, the shackles that bind my ankles. I touch them with the tip of my ivy-covered staff. And lo, the locks click open without a key of any kind. My feet are free. The iron door swings open. That girl, she found a way to get the keys. She found a way to open all these locks. Give me that staff of yours. I'll show you, Xenos, just how much magic lives within that staff. No need to struggle for it. Here it is. There! And there! It's splintered into a dozen pieces. Work your magic now. If that is your wish, your excellence. It's dark. The light is gone. Only the bolts of lightning. Help me! Someone! Genos! Save me! was once described as an illogical belief in the occurrence of the improbable, a firm trust that would seem to make no sense in the face of the impossible. Pentheus has refused to believe what he considers the irresponsible, corrupting credo of the stranger. Then why, when faced with circumstances beyond this comprehension, does he cry out to the same stranger for his help? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. country, we are not unfamiliar with the growth of cultism, a sacred ideology and a set of rites around certain symbols. We have had instances of young women blindly following and killing for a man they call their leader, of hordes of young people slavishly beating the drum for a man who has convinced them that he is an important means for their salvation. Faith can sometimes be a curious thing. As Pentheus recovers from the shock of this last experience with Zenus, Zenus says to him, You are not hurt, Lord Pentheus. No. No, Zenus. I'm all right. I think. What happened? What was that? That shattering sound, that blinding light. You splintered my good staff and challenged me. Work your magic, you commanded. 
And I did. Now, tell me something. Yes? When the earth seemed to burst from out its skin and we were lost in darkness, was not that your voice I heard crying desperately for my help, begging for me to save you? It was. Help from me? Me, whom you call a fraud? An imposter, a street magician, a master of hocus-pocus? Or is it possible that you, along with the women you claim I have corrupted, are at last beginning to believe in my divinity? I ask the questions. Tell me, how did you get free? The prison door was locked. The iron chains that fettered you were strong. It was that girl who helped you. Am I right? The girl is innocent, Pentheus. A god can do such things. My lord, Pentheus, I am so glad I found you. What is it, Cadmus? What is this one doing here? I thought he'd been arrested, put in chains. He has been freed. Why are you here, Cadmus? You're, you're, you're needed, Pentheus. Since this one was condemned to jail, the women have gone absolutely mad. They tear up trees, beat animals to death with sticks, pillage the villagers, and successfully fight off anyone who dare oppose them. Go down, Cadmus, to the city gates. Order the infantry to duty. The javelin throwers and the archers. And this, I warn you, do not take arms against them. Your soldiers will be routed. The women's wands will even beat back shields of bronze. A god inspires them. Can anything on earth make you to hold your tongue? One thing, my lord. And that is? See for yourself what Cadmus calls the revelry on the mountaintop. Come with me tonight at midnight. See how innocent it is. Innocent indeed. Come, come, convince yourself. But you must come disguised. Why so? Well, if they discover someone spying on their sacred rites, great harm might come of it. There might be bloodshed. What disguise? I have a mountain lion's skin complete from head to tail. You'll fasten it about you. Then, even if you're seen, no one will know it's you. Where do we meet? At the foot of the mountain, just before midnight. I shall be there. Come, Cadmus. Young woman, hey, you, you there, come out of the shadows. Is it safe now? Have they gone? Until 12 tonight, my little one. He's fallen for the trap and thrushes in the net I've thrown for him. Blessed is he who escapes a storm at sea, who comes home to his harbor. Blessed is he who gathers day by day the good things of his life. Blessed is he. Blessed is Zenos. Do you see them, Pentheus? Not very well, but I hear them. There is Agave, your excellence mother. I can hardly see her. From where I lie here in the grass, the brush obscures my vision. Lower your voice or they'll discover you. No, no. Don't try to stand. How then can I see? I have an idea. It may be if you climb that towering fir tree that overhangs the banks, then you could see them better. The tree is too high. Now watch what I am about to do. I reach for the high branch of this tall fir, and I bend it down. Down to the dark earth. Quietly so no one can hear. What are you up to? Now, now hang on tightly to the highest tip. Hold fast as I release it slowly, inch by inch. Are you all right up there, Lord Pentheus? Do you see all? I'm fine. I see everything. That's good. And I see that you lied. You told me they'd be winding stalks of ivy on the wands they carry. Their hands busily moving in their quiet tasks. You lied, Zenos. Old Cadmus spoke the truth. Women of the island, a wild, bloodthirsty beast sits cowering in the branches of this tree. Shower it with stones, hurl javelins, draw bows, and shoot your arrows straight into its heart. Here you, Zenos. We do what you have asked. Ah! 
Bar! Bar, shoot straight! Unless you kill this beast, he'll pounce upon you from the tree, and with sharp claws and pointed fangs, he'll tear you all to pieces! Huh? Good! Good! You have found your mark. You've brought the evil creature to the ground. But while it still breathes, it is still gasping for its life. I'll stop that with my javelin, Zena! Do as a gobby! Jab your spear between its bloody ribs. So! Uh, so! And... No. Stop! Mother! Stop! Whose voice is that? The wine has confused me. It's Ventheus, your son. Pity me. Spare me, mother. Hold back your hand. Since when have wild beasts learned to talk? Strike! Strike with your javelin! Strike one last telling blow! There! Ah! The creature's dead. At your brave hands, Agave. The mountain lion's dead, Agave. Slaughtered by you alone. How proud you must be. I'll bring more wine so we can celebrate. I shan't be long. Where's my son? I must tell him what I have done. Find me, Pentheus. Let Pentheus see. He'll be proud of me, won't he? He'll nail the head of this wild lion against a high wall somewhere as a trophy to my skill. He'll do that, won't he? Won't he do that? What, what, what happened here, your women? Where is Pentheus? It sounds like Cadmus' voice. It is I, it is Cadmus. I fear for Pentheus' safety. Cadmus, look at the mountain lion I just killed in the dark. With my own hands, I killed it. Oh, never. What have you done, Nekavi? This body lying at your feet, bathed in its own blood, is... It is no mountain lion. It is not? See, I pull the animal's skin away. And, and there lies... Who, who is it, Cadmus? Let me look. Your own son, Pentheus. Oh, oh. Your own flesh and blood. Oh. Uh, he is what oh. you've killed me, Gabby. Oh, you've murdered your own son. No. My own son? No. <laughs> No, no. Oh, my son. Oh, my son. Let me lift you to my breast. I weep with you, my God. What is this that I hold in my arms and clasp against my bosom? Oh, my son, my son. What happened to you? Why do I hold you so? Tell me, Cadmus, tell me. Your son is dead. He cannot answer you. The crime is mine, Cadmus, mine alone. I see it clearly now. The fumes have lifted from my brain. The prize I thought to carry home with such great pride is my destruction. Upon these hands I bear the curse of my child's blood. What dirge can I sing? What funeral song? What lamentation? As I rock back and forth, cradling my dead child here in my arms. Oh, you gods. Be merciful to a miserable, unhappy woman who should be in her grave. Enough, enough, no more. You cannot bring your dead son back to life. Give me a shroud. Cover for his corpse. Oh, dearest face. Oh, pretty boyish mouth. I place this last kiss on your dead lips. Now with this veil I shroud your head. Gathering with loving care these mangled limbs. This flesh I brought to birth. Here is the wine. The goat skins overflow. Now, now we can celebrate. What brings you here, old man? I came to see what happened to my master. He's dead. I am old, but I am not blind. Dead in his mother's arms. Dead by his mother's hand, guided to its fatal mark by you. And God or no God, you will pay for this. You'll not escape this time. Go away, old man, before you come to that same fate. 
This man has found the death that he deserved. He defied a god. I stay. Then watch what happens next. This is what happens next. False god. This. <laughs> Did you try to kill me with the weapon that you used to spear your son? You're mad, old woman. No one can kill a god. A god is murdered only by himself and no one else. But I am not pitiless, not unforgiving. For all of you, one final draft of wine. For old time's sake, then I'll drink with you. Here, pass the goat skins out among you. Now... Drink. Drink deep. Each one of you. I do not drink with murderers. The pleasure is theirs, old fool, and mine. To the living and the dead. What, what is happening? What's happening to the women? They're dying, Cadmus. In a moment, they'll be corpses. The wine... Shot through with a quick and deadly poison. But a kindly poison. Though they die peacefully, you can see without a bit of pain. Xenos! Xenos! Oh, now my turn comes. I tell you that there is no pain. No pain at all. No pain. All dead. Oh, pity on you, gods. Take pity on us all. Rain. Oh, gentle rain. The drought is ended. The gods have listened to our prayers. As the blessed rains soak into the parched earth of the island, the men are left to weep for the tragic death of their young governor, of their wives, their mothers, their sisters, and their daughters. And you may ask, who is this Zenus? That depends upon your faith, on what you would like to believe. I'll be back shortly. God. As we said earlier, as far as faith is concerned, you pay your money and you take your choice. The story you just heard was based on the Bacchae, one of the most famous tragedies of Euripides, the great playwright of ancient Greece, who in his time took almost every prize ever given for dramatic writing. This, some 2,400 years ago. Our cast included John Vickery, Marion Seldes, Earl Hammond, and Tracy Ellis. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Raven House Paperback Mysteries. This is Tammy Grimes, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. 
Social scientists have been arguing for years over the troublesome question as to which is the more important influence on a child, heredity or environment. Then the argument was further complicated by Sigmund Freud with the injection of the subconscious as the key factor in human behavior. I'm not here to offer any solution, but to tell you a tale of heredity and a wild love blighted by a strange and fearsome curse. You say you love me, Marla. With all my heart. Well, then tell me why you won't come away with me. Because in this life, I must walk alone. What was that? Perhaps a sign. A sign? It sounded almost human, or like an animal. I must go. Not until you tell me. Let me go. I beg of you. Let me go before you hear worse. Our mystery drama, The Cesar Curse, was especially adapted from the Robert Louis Stevenson classic For the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Richard Kiley. It is sponsored in part by Uncle Ben's Long Grain and Wild Rice and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. We all know that there is no such thing as a curse transmitted from one generation to the next which calls down evil upon all the descendants of the cursed family. Science, of course, tells us that such diseases as diabetes, hemophilia, and madness can be handed down in a family, but science frowns upon anything of the extraordinary or bizarre. In this instance, I must respectfully take issue with the scientists and, as a case in point, bring you the story of George Capewell, whom we first meet at the age of 67 as he adds a codicil to his last will and testament. Today my family physician told me that death is no more than a week or two away. Therefore I feel compelled to explain why I, George Capewell, will be the last of the Capewells. This was my choice. And this codicil to my will will explain why I made it. For the sake of clarity, I must go back some 40 years to one summer when I fell seriously ill and almost died while vacationing in Spain. Well, young man, you are looking almost alive again. And I don't mind saying it is a small miracle. Sponsored by you, Dr. Valdez. Ah, well, let's give God a little credit, too. And now, to complete the cure, I insist that you have a few weeks of absolute rest and good fresh air. Well, if you're talking about one of those sanatoriums, forget it. Uh, the place I have in mind is as completely unlike a sanatorium as you can imagine. It is a residencia, the estate of a very old and proud family who have fallen upon hard times and are willing to take an American as a paying guest with one proviso. Which is? That you remain a stranger. You are not permitted the smallest intimacy. And so it came about that I found myself in an ancient, dilapidated, horse-drawn carriage, driven by a young man whose, whose appearance excited both attraction and repulsion. Lithe and well-built, with large, brilliant yellow eyes, good aquiline features... He was also so extremely hairy that one instinctively grew back from him. Do we have much farther to travel, Felipe? Over two bridges and past the top of the mountain, senor. Ha! Ha! Get on, move! There's no need to whip the horse. I'm in no hurry. Sometimes he grows lazy. Besides, there is the bad place. We come to it shortly. Bad place? On this road? Oh, yes, senor. The first bridge. You can begin to hear it. The bridge is under repair? No, no, senor. The bridge is safe. Well, why is this a bad place? Because it makes me afraid. What is there to be afraid of? The noise, senor. The noise. There. It is better now. It's a 
engine noise won't hurt you, Felipe. It's it's just the sound of the water. So my sister tells me, senor, but still I am afraid. With that answer, I realized that there was a child's mind in that body. And from that time on, I regarded Felipe with indulgence and even a sort of liking as I listened to his innocent prattling until we drew up before a great arched Moorish doorway, secured by iron-studded gates. We arrive, senor. We are home. You can descend from the carriage now, please. Through this gate, senor. Please. This is the courtyard, senor. It is very beautiful by day. And now, senor, if you please, uh, up the stairs. Carefully. Oh, thank you, Felipe. I, uh, I don't suppose we could have more light. Alas, senor, we have no electric. Only the candles. We are here, senor. Your room. But how pleasant. How really pleasant. And a, a table laid for supper. <laughs> That's very thoughtful. Yes, senor, it is a fine room. A very fine room. In daylight, what can I see from these windows? The courtyard, senor, and some of the countryside. It is very fine. And the fireplace, too. The fire is good. It melts out the pleasure from your bones. <laughs> well, I suppose that's one way of putting it. Those, those animal skins on the wall, they, they come from... I the... do not know. They have been here always. But look, look at the bed. See the fine sheets. How soft. And smooth, smooth. Well, you're careful with that candle. You, you'll set the place on fire. Here, let me have it. So smooth, so smooth. This looks like a fine wine you have here on the table. It's uh, from a nearby vineyard. Will you join me in a glass? Oh, no. No, not that. Uh, that is for you. I hate it. Very well. But then, Felipe, I would like to make this first glass of wine in this residencia a toast to your... Hospitality, and to your mother, the Signora. Gracias, Señor. Uh, which reminds me, when shall I have the pleasure of conveying my respects and thanks to your mother? Never, no, never. Good night, Señor. Even now, as I write this document, with the cold hand of death coming ever closer to me, I can still feel the warmth of that fire. And see the portrait of the woman on the wall, illuminated by the flickering flames. For ten days I gained in strength, saw no one but Felipe, and for ten nights fell asleep with the face of that portrait looking down on me. The face of a magnificently beautiful woman, yet marred by a cruel, sullen, and sensual expression. I was struck by the strong resemblance to Felipe. And one morning, as he served me my breakfast... That portrait on the wall... An ancestor, senor. More coffee? Uh, no. No, thank you. Who is that crossing the courtyard? The padre. He comes to hear your sister's confession? Yes. He's been doing that for some time, for, for many years? Many years. Well, then he would know who the woman in the portrait is. I could ask him... You are not to ask questions. You are not... I have been told. But who told you? Your mother, the senora? You will be punished. You will see. You will be punished. And it will not be because of me or anything I have done. It will not be my fault. And now my pen hesitates. Even today, 40 years later, I, I feel ashamed. I justified my action by telling myself that I was entitled to pierce the veil of mystery that surrounded this strange household. What I refused to admit was the spell the woman in the portrait had cast upon me. Day after day, the double knowledge of her wickedness and my weakness grew clearer. So, shamefully, I confess, I set out to find Felipe to continue questioning that childlike mind. I knew I would find him in the woods, but I didn't know I'd be horrified by my discovery. Felipe! 
Let that squirrel go. Let it go, I said. Yes, senor. I am sorry. Sorry? What kind of person are you? A little while ago, you pretended to be upset because I didn't like your coffee, and now I find you torturing a poor, dumb animal. You're the one who deserves to be tortured. I'm going to tell your mother I don't want to see you again. You're not to serve me, you understand? Please, senor, please. I go upon my knees to you. Forgive and bear with me, senor. I try so hard. Forgive me, please. Only if you promise never to do anything like this again. Oh, I promise, senor. I promise. Thank you, senor. I promise. I swear, senor. Felipe! Felipe, come back. Come back here. I want to talk to you. But no amount of calling brought him back. I returned to the house, and as I walked slowly across the courtyard, I first saw my hostess. She was seated on an animal skin, leaning against a pillar, sunning herself. She was an elegant, sumptuous figure, and although she must have heard my footsteps, she seemed unconscious of my presence. Good day, Senora... Cesar. May I join you? If you wish. You... you know who I am? A guest. I should have presented myself to you before, but... your son told me you were unavailable. He may sit here if you stay out of my son. You like the sun? It warms me, and I like warmth. I... I really wanted to talk to you about the woman in the portrait in my room. Portrait? Yes, the, the painting. Surely you know it. Felipe told me she was one of the family. She... she fascinates me. Who was she? I think she was my mother. You think? Well, don't you know who... I beg your pardon. You look so much like the woman in the portrait. Your, your mother, I think you said. I I really would like to know something about her. The sun is going behind the clouds. I am afraid the black wind is coming and we shall all suffer from it. I must be judges. And she was gone. Silently, gracefully. She was right about the wind. It came from the malarial lowlands and over the Sierras. It stormed about the house with a hollow buzzing that was wearisome to the ear, depressing to the mind, and jangled the nerves. By the time Felipe brought my supper, I was in a state of nervous exhaustion. Felipe also was in a state of nerves, his yellow eyes burning in his face like two candles, his hands shaking so that the silver clattered against the plates. For heaven's sake, stop that noise. Sorry, senor. It's the black wind. It pulls and pulls at you, telling you you must do something. But you don't know what it is you must do. Your mother? She seemed to be unhappy with the wind, too. You think she's ill? Oh, senor. With this wind, who can be well? Now I must write of that black wind and blacker night. I went to bed early. I couldn't sleep. But suddenly, a sound filled the house. I thought of Felipe and the squirrel. I ran to the door only to find that it was locked from the outside. It resisted all my efforts to open it. I sank to the floor, my hands pressed over my ears, trying to blot out those inhuman ravings. It was useless. I heard before losing consciousness was those ravings from hell. There are those among us who feel that some mysteries are best left unsolved. Some secrets never should be told. Because George Capewell was not one who believed this, we can continue in a moment with Act Two. But I warn you, the discovery may well send a shuddering chill through your bones. Everyone.
anyone within the range of my voice has experienced some evidence of love's blindness. The doting male sees his beloved as perfection, whereas the young girl may see his faults, but is certain that all that's needed to correct them is the gift of her love. George Capewell was destined to fall in love profoundly, electrifyingly, overwhelmingly for the first and last time in his life, only to find that this all-consuming passion was to lead him to the very brink of hell. I must continue with this writing so you will know why I leave this earth with no child to carry on the name of Capewell. Even though the writing brings back all the anguish and terror of those days more than 40 years ago, when I awoke on the floor the morning after the terrible night of the black wind, the sun was shining, and a cheerful Felipe appeared with my breakfast. Good morning, senor. Is it not a beautiful day? Yes, beautiful. And quiet. There'll be enough coffee for the moment. Yes, senor. What were those dreadful cries I heard last night? The wind, senor. Now, you know that's not true. And I mean to have the truth. Was it some animal you were torturing? No, senor. I swear it was not. I promised you, senor. And Felipe keeps his promises. Give me your hand, Felipe. Yes, senor. This is the hand that tortured that poor squirrel. But, senor, I swore to you... No use to struggle, Felipe. I'm stronger than you are. And unless I'm mistaken, this is the hand that locked my door last night. Senor, please, let go of my hand. I'm a stranger, Felipe, but I'm also a guest. And I will not be locked in my room like a criminal. Now, you understand? Yes, senor. Yes. Thank you. I understand. Well, how is it I never see your sister? Does she have some reason for avoiding me? My sister is a good girl. It is she that keeps me up, senor. Without her, I would be lost, senor. And no doubt she's reproved you for your sin of cruelty. Twelve times. And when I told her what you had done in the woods, she was pleased. Yes, she was happy. Then who or what was unhappy enough to make those sounds in the night? I have told you, senor, the wind, the black wind. Now you know I'm stronger than you are, Felipe. Please, senor, let me go. And I will get the truth if I have to shake it or beat it out of you. Please, senor. Yes, who is it? Father Ramon, may I answer? Yes, come in. I was passing in the courtyard. I thought I heard a cry. It, it was I, Padre. I, I burned my hand with the coffee. Ah, so, Felipe, then I will be going. No, 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 Father, don't, don't go. I'd like to speak to you. Yes, my son. If the senor doesn't need me... You can go, Felipe. I should introduce myself, Father. I'm... George Cape Wells. The guest here at the Residencia. Yes, Father. And... Well, you see before you a very puzzled and disturbed man. Is there some way I can help? I hope so, Father. Do you know the woman in this portrait on the wall? Ah, yes. That is the likeness of Marla Cesar. Well, I was hoping that you could tell me something about her. She was the great grandmother of the present daughter of the house who is named after her. But uh, why are you concerned with the painting? Well, because of the, the beauty of the woman, because of the resemblance of the present Senora Cesar to this woman and... Well, because, Father, the woman in the portrait has, has cast a dark shadow on my mind. I know that you came here to regain your health after a severe illness. Perhaps there are still some traces of fever that linger. No, no fever in the world could make me hear the cries I heard last night, Father. They sounded like... like the bestial screams of a soul in hell. And you think they came... From the portrait? The whole atmosphere of this residence here is strange. I, I've i never seen the daughter of the house, and I... That is how it should be. Oh, if you will forgive me, I should be with her now. I don't like to keep her waiting. You're telling me to close my eyes and ears to everything that goes on and not interfere? I am only reminding you 
that you are a guest, and you should remain a guest. Nothing more. Sleep came to me early, and dreams filled the night. I tossed and turned as the dreams became more and more vivid. And then I remember waking to see that somehow the beautiful face had left its frame and was bending over me. Only the face was younger than in the portrait and softer with great eyes that looked deep into mine. I tossed off the bedclothes and struck a match to light a candle. Where are you? Come back. Please, I, I know you are here. Come back. I won't harm you. But there was only silence. And the cruel eyes of the portrait looking down at me. I sat up the rest of the night and... It was the next day when I came face to face with Marla Cesar as she stood in her doorway after saying farewell to Father Ramon. Once again, I looked into those marvelous eyes. And then she turned quickly and closed the door. I rapped sharply. Senorita. Senorita, please open the door. Senor, it is useless. What is useless? That we should talk. But we must. We cannot. Cannot? What will stop us? I will. I know that what you're thinking is impossible. Then you know what I'm thinking. Of course. And you'll turn your back on me? And my love? I have no choice. Nonsense. Everyone has a choice. Except me. Why do you say that? I know. Believe me. I know. All right. Tell me why. Please, senor. It is not permitted to love me. Who will not permit it? I will not. Well, then again, I ask you why. If you really loved me, you would not ask me. If you really loved me, you'd tell me. I did not say I loved you. But your eyes speak for themselves. You knew we loved from the moment our eyes first met. Are you not ashamed? Of my love for you? No, never. Of breaking the rules under which you came to be a guest in this house. Of using your worldly wisdom to make me betray myself and my family. Are these not shameful, senor? I only know that I love you and you love me. And between two people who love, there must be trust. And between us, senor, I tell you there can be nothing but a closed door. As I look at the pages I've already written, I feel now, as I felt then, the urge to stop, to seek no more answers. In my heart, I knew that the beautiful creature I loved had a strange mother and a pitiful brother. My heart told me that she was a child of an afflicted house. But all that mattered was that I should make her mine. For two days, I walked in the woods with her image ever before my eyes. But she didn't appear. Then, on the third day... Martha, my beloved, you came to me. Yes. I came to you and I shouldn't. And I hate myself for it. I hate myself for my weakness. Love isn't a weakness. For me, it is. And it gives me strength. Strength yes. to ask you to marry me and to come away with me as my wife. You don't know what you're saying. I'm saying marry me and come away from this place. Come to my country and my house and let me show you how much I love you and how much I can give to you. I can't. Marla, we were drawn together by the miracle of love. It would be a sin to ignore this miracle. This is madness. Goodbye. Marla, come back. I won't let you go. You must. Never. Please, don't touch me. Don't be afraid. Once my arms are around you and our lips have met, you'll see that I'm right. You know that we belong together. Oh, oh no. 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 Marla. Marla, how sweetly the name sounds on my lips. You do love me. Admit it, darling. You will go away. Today. You will leave the residencia, and you must never return. Fatalists believe that the threads of our lives are woven for us long before we embark on life's journey, and that it's useless to struggle against our destinies. But for centuries, the stuff of drama has been fashioned from a man's refusal to accept the inevitable, to fight on, no matter what the odds. 
George Capewell chose to fight. And we'll be back with the terrifying results of that decision in a few moments. To find love, only to lose it, is an age-old story. But usually, the rejected lover knows in his heart why he's been rejected. George Capewell sensed that Marla Cesar had refused to marry him out of a nameless but genuine fear, a fear which he himself felt hung heavily over the Cesar household. George Capewell was convinced that if he only could discover the cause of this fear, he could dispel it, and he and Marla would live happily ever after. As my life in this last will and testament draw near to a close, it becomes ever more difficult for me to find words adequate to describe the anguish and terror I felt more than 40 years ago in the remote and fear-ridden Cesar Residencia. I remember crossing the courtyard on my way to my room, trying to dam the raging torrent of my thoughts and and seeing the sensuous figure of Senora Cesar dozing contentedly in her favorite spot in the sun. Senora. Mm-hmm. Senora, I'm, I'm sorry to disturb you, but mm. I, I must talk with you. Must? Why? Your daughter has asked me to leave your house. Why did you come to me? I want to know if, if you want me to go also. You have done nothing to annoy me? What did you do to annoy her? I fell in love with her and asked her to marry me. Malice, a very pretty girl. Very pretty. I know she loves me, and and yet she asked me to leave. She she has some reason for wanting me to go away, and... Well, it, it occurred to me that maybe the reason concerns you. I took care of Marla when she needed me. Now she is a grown woman... She can do as she pleases. What was it that made those hellish sounds the other night? Sounds? What sounds? Well, surely you you must remember it. It was the night of the black wind, and the, the, the cries and the screams of pain came from the throat of some animal or some human that was undergoing torment. They, they shook the house. I heard nothing. But then I sleep very soundly. She was lying, of course. I reached my room in a black rage and found a note in Marla's handwriting. I took it to the window to read. The words are seared into my brain. It read, If you have any feeling for me, any love for Marla, go from here today. I beg of you, go. Almost insane with rage, I slammed my fist through the window. The pain and the the blood flowing from my arm brought me partially to my senses. I tried to stem the flow of blood, but the cup was too deep. Through the shattered window, I saw the senora. I ran down the stairs to the courtyard and approached her, holding out my arm. Senora, as you can see, I've I've cut myself rather badly. Could could you help me stop the bleeding? Senora, what are you doing? I lost consciousness and remember waking up in bed in my room with Marla kneeling by my bedside. Oh, my love, my love. Dear, precious heart, I should have sent you away long ago. But I didn't have the strength. Don't don't cry, Marla. Darling, and uh, don't blame yourself. I have done as you asked, sister, and brought the carriage in front. Will he be able to travel? He must, Felipe. You know that. No. You think that now I'd go away and leave you with... with... My mother. Can you sit up? Of course I can. Oh! You cannot walk. 
I will have to carry him. No, no. I, I can't leave you here. It's dangerous. I have lived here all my life. Now that... that there are no longer any secrets between us, you must come with me. Felipe, he must have a doctor. Take him where there will be no questions asked, and he can be attended to. Where am I? What what place is this? Marla? Where's Marla? Old sir. Easy, my son. Father Ramon, what are you doing here? Praying for you, my son. Yes, but what is this place? How, how long have I been here? July in the house of the Tekindama family. In the old days, they belonged to the Cesar estate. They s- still feel loyalty to the Cesar family. You have been here three days. Yes, but who brought me here? Philippe Borio, aided by one of the Tegendama sons. And my wounds? Marla cared for them? Ah, only at first. Your cuts were too serious, so we sent for your doctor. Cuts? You put your hands through a glass window, did you not? Sir, you... You know that I'm not asking this question out of idle curiosity. What of this is our family? What... What are they? Hey, an unfortunate example of a declining race. Once rich and mighty, they are now poor and neglected. But not by you. You you visit Marla often. I've seen you. Ah, yes. The senorita is well informed. And her mother? You do not visit her? No. Is she insane? I can only answer that according to my belief. She is not, or, or was not. Oh, when she was young, she was wild, but she was surely sane. You know I love Marla. I know. Then you will help me see her? No. But why not? Such a meeting will only bring pain to you both. It could also bring happiness. How could that come about? I propose to marry her and uh, and take her away from here, from the evil influences that pollute the residence here. This, this strain, or whatever it is, may, may live only in the place where it was born. If Marla were to be removed from this place with a man who loved her devotedly, wouldn't there be a chance? I do not know. But in a matter of this kind, I would trust the judgment of the senorita. Will you take her a message? Before I answer that, I must tell you what the people of these parts believe about Marla's father. Marla's father was a good friend of the head of the house you are in now, the Tengendaba house. One day he and his friend delivered some packages to the residential. The friend met Marla's mother, then a young woman, and immediately fell in love. All the villagers knew it and warned him, but he could talk and think of nothing but the woman. The way I feel about Marla. Oh, yes, my son, but with a difference. In winter time, there are terrible storms upon the mountain and the passes become dangerous. On this one night, Francisco taken down and his friend found themselves on the pass before the residentia. It was a wild night with snow and wind. And now I use the words of Francisco, who swears that Mara's mother came out upon the gallery with a lamp in her hand and called to them. Francisco says there was death that night on the mountains. But he felt there was worse inside the house. And did they go in? Francisco's friend did. But Francisco wouldn't. He says that he even went down on his knees in the snow and begged his friend not to enter. But to no avail. 
Well, what happened? Heaven knows. The man was never seen again. Will you tell Marla I must see her? I will, my son. I promise. But still, she may not come. You both know me. Tell her that unless she comes to me, I will go to her. I will return to the residencia. It was wrong of you to send me that message with Father Ramon. I wanted to see you to tell you that nothing matters. If you will not go away with me, I will stay here with you. I ask nothing. I love you. Dearest, I know you love me, but listen. I wish with all my heart that I did not have to tell you these things. I prayed, oh, how I prayed that you would leave without seeing me or asking for me. But my prayers were not answered. I must teach you to see me for what I am, for what I may become. Not you, Marla. I know your beauty not from your face, but from your soul. Give me your hand. There. I place it against my heart. You feel the very beat of life. It only moves for you. It is yours. But then why are you... But it is mine. Think how affected you were by the portrait that hung in your bedroom. You remember that painting. Yes, every line, every feature. The woman who sat for it died years ago, and she did evil in her lifetime. Now recall the painting and look closely at me. And what do you see? I see the beautiful girl I love. But you also see that my eyes and my hair, the lines of my body, they're exactly the same as the portrait. But the mouth is different. Your, your lovely mouth reveals only sweetness. The mouth and the portrait showed cruelty. Forget your family and be my wife. You ask me to forget my family. Can't you see that no gesture I make, no tone in my voice, nor any glance from my eyes is wholly mine? Yours and yours alone. It's you I love. You think I can escape my heritage? Of course. And I tell you, my love, that the hands of the dead are in my bosom. They move me. They guide me. Marla, I love you and not shadows from the past. Shadows? Shadows bearing the weight of centuries. Eight hundred years ago, my fathers ruled all of this province. They were wise, cunning, and cruel... Their flags led in war. The king called them cousin. In what you tell me, there's nothing in which to be ashamed, nothing to, to fear. There came the change. My ancestors began to go down. Their minds fell asleep. Their passions awoke in gusts. Beauty was still handed down, but no longer guided by humanity. The seed passed on. It was wrapped in flesh. The flesh covered the bones, but they were the bones and the flesh of brutes. And their mind was as the mind of flies. Oh, you've lived too long with this, too long in that house, too long with the portraits of the books I saw in your study. You also saw Felipe and my mother. So you have seen for yourself how the wheel has gone backward with my doomed race. Did you overlook one thing? Me, my heritage, my blood, my ancestors... I feel they'll be strong enough to, to... And if they don't, you ask me to hand down this cursed vessel of humanity, charge it with fresh life as with fresh poison. Never. I ask you to love me. I already do. And that's why we shall never meet again. Even now, the people in this village are beginning to speak of your love for me, and they will not have it. Every day that you linger here increases your peril. I'm not afraid. I have given my vow. My vow that my race shall walk the earth no more. I shall be the last. I must go. Wait, Marla, please. You heard, and you know, I must go swiftly. Remember me as the woman who sent you away, and yet would have longed to keep you forever. The girl who had no dearer hope than to forget you. And no greater fear than to be forgotten. Marla. Marla. Come back. Now 
I can lay down my pen. My tale is told, and it answers the question I evaded for so long. Why I never married. Whether what I've written here is believed or disbelieved is of no importance. What is important is that I proved one fear of my beloved Marla to be groundless. Her fear that she would be forgotten. Like George Capewell, I ask for neither belief nor disbelief. The pages of history are filled with the names of people who were burned at the stake because a lot of other people believed they were witches. Therefore, I must add a fact which George Capewell omitted. A few months after he returned to his home in America, the newspapers reported the destruction by fire of an ancient residencia in Spain belonging to the Cesar family. I'll be back shortly. It is widely believed that love conquers all. What puzzles me is why this belief is so universal when our literature abounds in stories proving the exact opposite. My fancy is that we want to believe in the conquering power of love and goodness to balance our beliefs in the bad dreams of demons and destruction that at times haunt us all. Our cast included Richard Kiley, Roberta Maxwell, Anne Petoniak, Bob Caliban, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. What is her condition? Well, it's not fatal, thank God. Not even very serious. Uh, badly bruised, uh, cut over her right eye, but she's going to be all right. The monster failed to make good his threat to kill her. He may indeed, thank God for that. Yes. Well, at least we know more than we did before, Monsieur Dupin. We know that the murderer is a big man, a huge man of unbelievable strength. And that he has black hair. We know a great deal more than that, dear. We do? Well, I do. And so do you. Only, as I've said before, you don't know you know. Oh, monsieur. Monsieur, I do not have your brilliant brain. Well, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that you can solve this awful mystery, that you can save Yvette. The murderer failed this time, but he'll try again. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. A gentleman named Frank Richard Stockton whose name may not be familiar to you, as I must admit it wasn't to me, wrote one of the most famous short stories of all time. It was called The Lady or the Tiger. I mention it only because, in its own curious way, it reminded me of the story that Dr. Felix Brandt is about to reveal. What impulse drives me to put what follows on paper? 
I don't exactly know. I suppose it's a need for confession. Or perhaps a prayer for forgiveness to a God I've forgotten and, and whose mercy I do not deserve when I die. Which will be shortly. And I wonder when they close my eyes at last if I shall meet the soul of Hugh Prentice and if I too will be condemned to wander eternally in a vast limbo of loneliness as punishment for my crime. A crime worse than murder for which I do not have the courage but I was determined that death was too easy for someone who had violated the one person I had held most dear in all my life. So I dared play God out of my own special knowledge and exact a punishment to fit the crime. Whoever reads this, make your own judgment. What has been done cannot be undone. mystery drama, The Doppelganger, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Howard Da Silva. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Sign Off, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. back to the lady and the tiger you'll remember I'm sure that it was a story of a man who faced two doors behind one of them was a famished raging man-eating tiger who would devour and destroy behind the other was a love goddess every man's desire now I'm not suggesting that this story has anything to do with that story except in the matter of choice something we do every day select one alternative or the other. So, let's examine Dr. Felix Brandt's selection and judge him as you may. My name is Felix Brand. I have a doctorate in clinical psychology. I was married, have one daughter. As I've grown older, although it has been a passionate obsession of mine all my life, I've had to fight the tendency to devote more time to my avocation than my vocation. Parapsychology. The exploration of the psychic, the world beyond the finite world. A hobby or obsession, if you will, which led to my unspeakable crime. Worse, far worse than murder. It was nice of you to meet me at the airport, Dr. Brandt. For reasons deeper than simple courtesy, Hank, I wanted to have a private chat with you about the woman we both love, that daughter of mine. That's why I'm letting you drive, so I can... Well, w what is it? Is there something, something about Fran? No, not just at this moment. Quickly, Hank. Cut over to the right lane, fast. Uh, yeah, yes, sir, but what... If, if you had told me to pull over, that maniac would have hit his head on. There's nothing more we can do, Hank. The police have it there. Let's drive on. Yes, sir. The man is dead. I don't know. Probably. He is dead. Well, how do you know? I don't. I only sense it. He didn't want to live. I don't know why. Heart condition, terminal disease, some reason. Well, how, how could you know what kind of... Well, how did you know to tell me to pull over so suddenly? If, as if you knew in advance there was going to be an accident. I'm an old man, Hank. An old man who meddles perhaps in too many things outside my province. I've been looking deeper and deeper into parapsychology and some of the things I've come to believe in rub off. What things, sir? Oh, extrasensory perception, ESP, if you'd rather. Clairvoyance, telepathy, all sorts of psychic phenomena. 
I'm thinking of abandoning classic psychology and switching over to the other side. Matter of fact, I'm already teaching one course in it. And that's a little interest to a lawyer. Or even my prospective son of <laughs> Tell me, what brought you flying down from law school for the weekend? Well, didn't Fran, uh... Or hasn't Fran said anything to you, Doctor? About what? I don't know, just, uh... Well, her letters have been very strange lately. And, <laughs> not very frequent. I thought something might be wrong. I, I mean, I had a hunch. <laughs> the amateur outflanks the expert. I hope you're wrong. You, you have me worried. Fran is everything in the world to me. If anything ever happened to her... She means as much to me, Dr. Brand. Now, don't you worry. If anything is wrong, between us, we can set it right. It was a relief to have Hank back again. I had been worried about my daughter, Fran, lately. Fran, the picture of her mother, whom I lost too soon. Bright, open, happy, reaching out both hands to the world, full of love to give and expecting the same in return. And yet I knew, had been trying to conceal from myself something that was very wrong, something it took Hank, whom she had loved with all her heart since high school, to bring out into the open. Hey, Fran. What you trying to do? Get pneumonia? Oh. Hi, Hank. I didn't think you'd be here so soon. I'm, I'm warm enough. Mm-hmm. Huddled out here in the gazebo with snow all around and the wind whistling up icicles. I've got my pocket to keep me warm. How about your love? Uh... Don't I get a welcome kiss, even if it's a cold one? Oh, Hank. Oh, Hank, what am I going to say to you? Well, something a lot more straight from the shoulder than those weaseling letters I've been getting recently. I know. I'm not very proud of myself at the moment, Hank. Hey, you don't have to cut corners with me. There's another guy, right? Hank, please, listen to me and, and, and try to understand... You see, Dad has been teaching his regular survey course in basic psychology, and um, I met this, this this guy there, and I don't know, I, something crazy happened, something I wasn't prepared for or even thought about in my well-ordered life. You fell in love with him? Yes. Which lets me out. Hmm? Please don't put it like that, Hank. It's just... It's something so sudden, so overwhelming. I, I don't Hey, even... don't I even get a chance to get up to bat for the ninth inning? It's too late, Hank. I'm going to have his baby. Ooh. Well, that's... That's right between the eyes. When's the wedding? I don't know. I just found out. About me, I mean... I could cheerfully wring that rabbit's neck. Did your, your father know? Not yet. And this guy? I haven't even told him yet. Why not? Well, I, 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 I just haven't had the chance. I... Okay. So it shouldn't be a total loss, and I don't waste the whole trip down here. <laughs> we'll make a deal. I'll tell the doc about it, and you pin down your, your dream boy. Uh, what's his name, by the way? I won't tell you that. I'm afraid to. I... I do love you, Hank. Why did something else like this turn up? Fran, I'm no oracle. It's just what happens to people. The sort of thing that shakes faith and makes you wonder about God. But it's life. It's what we have to live. Come on, let's... Let's both go inside before we freeze to death. I can't believe what you're telling me, Hank. Well, you'd better, Pop. It's true. Pop. Uh, uh, sorry about that. Just slipped out. That's what I always wanted from Fran and you. And we can't legislate or play God. It's not the way it's going to be. But who's the man? Well, that's Fran's secret. It's her right to keep it that way. There's nothing either of us can do about it. I wouldn't agree with that. You'll give her up so easily? I never owned her. She's her own mistress. But you won't fight for her? Doc, have a heart. What can I do? I can't 
force her to love and accept me, the best I can do is be a good loser. You gotta be kidding, Fran. So we were together a few times. You ought to know better than to get caught. That's all I mean to you? Oh, don't knock it. Look, you're a sweet chick. We, we made great music. It was all for kicks, though. I mean, no ties, no padlocks. Look, don't get me wrong. I'll get you a right guy. I mean, it's all legal now. And I'll bear the freight. You... You, you want me to get rid of the baby? <laughs> well, what else? I mean, you want it, you have it. Just don't try to pin me down. I want to stay loose. That's my thing. I can't believe what you're saying. It's a whole new world. You want to live by old-fashioned boxes they shoved us in. That's your option. You can't push me in a sleeve, so don't ever try. I am today, baby. you got to take me as you find me. Or as I lose you. Well, that's the way it runs. Easy come, easy go. I was that easy. Oh, come on. I didn't say that. Oh, you don't say much you really mean. So? Maybe it's best we just split. No, you please, please. Look, the kid is out. And don't try to hang it on me. I'll deny it. All you'll get is a nice story that will get your old man fired out of the university. Oh, I can't understand myself. How I could... How I can be in love with anyone as rotten as you. Oh, knock it off, friend. If you... Look, if, if, if I did do something about the baby, would you still... All right, hey, hey. Now, that's... Uh... That's more like my old woman talking. Sure, if you do. I mean, you and me are a thing again. I... I don't know if Dad would... I mean, I... I don't have any money. Yeah, well, don't look at me. I ain't got the bread. But I got something better. What? Got a buddy. Mid-student. Senior. And he owes me plenty. I mean, we'll do a little collecting from him. But, but he's not a doctor. He's the next thing to it. Don't get the whammies. He's done it before. It's a breeze. Leave it to me. I'll set the whole thing up. Oh. Oh, Daddy. Oh. Daddy. Brad, darling. What is Daddy. it? Daddy. Oh, the baby. Daddy. It's gone, but I'm... Oh... Oh, I'm bleeding. Oh, good oh. Lord. Doc, Doc, anything I can do? Yes, thank you. Call Dr. Montrose and get him here fast. The number's in my address book by the phone on my study desk. I'm on my way. Help me. Oh. Who did this to you, friend? Friend. The man who made you pregnant. What's his name? Oh, I can't. I, I won't tell. Well, this isn't the time. But one way or another, I'll get it, friend. And when I do, I'll find a way to make him suffer for what he's done to you. There isn't much excuse for the man whose name Dr. Felix Brandt still doesn't know, Hugh Prentice. The sad thing about life is they usually get away with things. Being without a conscience makes life a lot easier. But is anyone really without a conscience? That's something Hugh Prentice is about to have to start exploring as a strange and eerie punishment creeps over him. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. in the Gilbert and Sullivan tradition, the Mikado's object of making the punishment fit the crime was comic and lighthearted. Here, it is deathly serious. In point of fact, unearthly so. Dr. Montrose was able to bring the hemorrhage under control after he arrived, and once it had stopped and Fran was under sedation, he met with his old friend Felix in the study. Well, she's all right now, Felix. Nothing to worry about. You don't think we should get her to the hospital? Yeah, under ordinary circumstances, perhaps, but uh, I'd say she's out of danger. She'll have to be watched closely, but I can handle that. Uh, if I put her in a hospital, it's all out in the open. Uh, you, you don't want that, do you? What do you mean, Jim? This is a pretty hidebound community, Felix. You're a good friend, Jim. 
Well, of yours and little Fran. I don't want to see her hurt anymore. Why did she do it? I don't know. I mean, she and Hank are going to get married anyway, so why... It wasn't Hank's baby. Oh. What would you do about the man who started all this, Jim? If it were my daughter? Yes. I don't know. We're, uh... <laughs> we're a little elderly for physical retribution, aren't we? Hmm. And any other course in problematical probably hurt Fran more than the man. It, do you know who he is? No. Fran won't tell me. Uh, I suppose the best thing to do is let it go. Come in. How are you feeling today, Fran? I'm all right, Daddy. I know. I mean, Dr. Monroe's has given you a clean bill of health. Has he? Well, he says you can get up and go back to college or whatever you want. Whatever I want. There's one thing I want I may never have any more. Didn't Dr. Jim tell you? Yes. We can talk about it later. Friend, I was just wondering... What? Would you like to... Well, I mean, Hank is still here and he would like to see you. No. I don't want to see Hank. I'm going back where I belong. If he'll have me. Are you ready to tell me his name yet? No. Not till I find out where I stand. How can you make yourself so cheap? This man, whoever he is, has taken all the love and the joy and, and laughter out of you. How, how can you go crawling back to him? Because he's the only one who can give it back to me. And if he doesn't? Then I... I just don't want to live. <laughs> was helpless to aid her, to ease anything for her. All that burned in me was a rage for the man who had turned my happy child into a hurt and battered shell. A beggar dependent on a man who was not worthy of her. And at this moment, even though I still didn't know his name, I could curse him and wish him disaster. I could do better than that if I turned my back on a God that I felt had forsaken me and mine. And as an extension of all my psychic research, turned to black magic and called down a curse on the man who had ruined my child. But first I had to talk to Hank. I love Fran and, and I want her. I, I always will, but just for her sake, I wish I could break it up somehow, get her away from this... This slimy crud that... It's as though he has her under some kind of spell. We both know he'll hurt her again, desert her, humble her. I think Fran herself knows it, but somehow she can't help herself. What are you going to do, Doctor? Just let her go back to him, leave it alone? I can't stop Fran any more than you can, Hank. She's not a child, she's of age. Her life is in her own hands. I have no legal control. If we only knew who he was. Well, that won't be too hard to find out. I've thought of all kinds of things. Even though I'm not very rich, I could perhaps buy him off. I'm sure he has a price. But that wouldn't solve anything for Fran. She loves him. He's what she wants. He has only the crook his finger and she'll crawl to him. That's obvious enough after all she's gone through for him. So what can we do? You? Nothing. Nothing. Go back and live your life. Uh, not quite. Without Fran. Well, maybe it won't have to be without Fran. First, we have to clean this man out of her mind and her blood. But you just said we couldn't. One way. If he doesn't exist anymore, if he's dead. Wait a minute. You you can't seriously mean... Oh, don't that. worry, son. Even if I had the means, a gun, a knife, a blunt weapon, I would have neither the strength nor the courage to use them to say nothing of my lack of know-how. No... But I can wish him dead. Or worse, I might just have the power for that. Doctor, are, are you... are you all right? 
I, I, I don't understand you. Of course you don't understand. And I am quite all right. This is something you will have to leave to me. To anyone who reads this, it might seem fantastic. But the rites I prepared are solemn and real to more people around you than you might believe. The ceremonies of dark magic are very real to those who perform them. In the attic, I had found among friends childhood dolls, one in the image of a man. I turned my study into a chapel of the damned, burning sulfur and asafetida. Then I recited from my book of ceremonial magic. Oh, all ye ministers and companions, I direct, conjure, constrain, and command you to fulfill my bequest willingly and straight away to accomplish the destruction of this man, unnamed, who has beset my daughter and most grievously harmed her by whatever means best suited. It's, uh, it's great to be swinging with you again, baby. Oh, I, I wasn't sure you'd want me back. I look so... <laughs> I don't know. Ah, you look great, Ken. My old woman again. I'm sorry we got to ride the subway, but who's got bread for the hacks these days? Oh, I don't mind where I am. Just so long as it's with you. Yeah, stick with me, baby. You ride first class all the way. I like these types. Look at them. Long gone. You and me are special. Just waiting for the right break. The chosen, huh? If you choose me. <laughs> I'll buy you all the way down the line, Ken. Take a look. I mean, who is there who could walk into... What is it, you? Yeah, half, half, halfway down the car there. Look. You see that guy? Oh, which one? Nuts? What do you mean? Which one? How could you miss him? He's a carbon copy of me. He's even wearing the same jeans, the embroidered jacket. I, no, I don't see anyone who... Come on, come on, come on. Let's go. Let, 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 i got to catch up with him. Shoot, take it easy. I don't see anyone like you said. He disappeared. He's gone, but he, uh... He's like... He's like my double. Come on, let's uh, go upstairs. No, I, I've got to get home, Hugh. Look, this won't take a moment. Yeah, yeah, that... There he is, there he is. He's right at the top of the stairs, next to that fat dame. No, there's no one there. She's all alone. Are you, are you? <sighs> He's gone. He's gone again. But he was looking right at me. Who the devil do you suppose he was? What did he want? <laughs> You. Shh. Listen, I gotta see you right away. I need help. What's wrong? I, I can't talk on the phone. Meet me on the campus by the fountain. Something real crazy happened last night. I don't know who else to ask uh, what to do. I was just turning in. I was reaching for the light to douse it when all of a sudden he was sitting right there in the chair facing me. Who? Him, the double, the guy we saw in the subway. I said, how the hell did you get in here? Who are you? I am your double ganger. My what? Your double. Or if you want, your inheritor. What does that mean? It's time for you to wander like me. It's time for me to return and die as I should have. I, I don't know what you're talking about. A long time ago, so long you can't even begin to imagine, I sinned. And because of my sin, I was not allowed to die in peace, but condemned to wander in infinity until I found a body I could be laid to rest in. My time is almost here, and in you, I will find a home again. I don't know what kind of a nut you are, Jack, but I'm going to kick your tail out of here so I can get some sleep. That won't be necessary. Sleep for you is all I'm waiting for. Huh? When you are safely asleep, you are at my mercy. The moment your eyes close, your body will be mine, and your soul will be left to wander through the ages alone, waiting endlessly for peace and the blessing of eternal sleep. <laughs> 
Get out! Get away from me! You're nothing but a... Nothing but a what, Hugh? Uh, he's a ghost. I mean, uh, I, I could see him, plain as I see you, but I could see through him, too, like a lamp in back of him, shining through his head. See, the pattern of a chair he was sitting in is as clear as a, a bell through him. I mean, he wasn't real. See, so I, I threw on some clothes. I ran out of the house. I spent the night walking. I was afraid to go to sleep, to bed. Friend, but nothing like this ever happened. Even on the wildest trip, I, I never blew so wild as this. What am I going to do? You? I think you should see my father. Yeah. Oh, sure. That, that'd be great after everything. I'd be lucky if he didn't try to have me arrested. He doesn't know who you are. He doesn't know you were the one. Yeah, but what could he do? He's a psychologist. He could help you. Look, you were in one of his lecture courses. All you have to do is go up to him and say you have a problem. He'd help you. Now, now the whole thing is crazy. I see some character on a subway in threads like me. I have a crazy dream. Right away, I blow my cool. There's nothing the matter with me. Now, come on, let's let's cut out. I, I ain't even going to see you home. I, I'm going back to bed and, and, and catch some shut Oh, you listen to me. Don't look at me that way. Don't you turn against me. Do you think I could after all that's happened? Yeah. Right, you, you I could count on. Yeah. You're my woman no matter what I do to you. Right? I love you, Hugh. And don't ever forget it, baby. Now, come on, blow. I gotta, I gotta hit the sack. All right, back, back up, man. I got a knife. Get lost. No, you are the lost one. What are you talking? Who is it? Your double ganger just waiting for you to get tired enough till your sleep is deep enough. For what? To take over your body so that with it I may bring myself to the peace of the grave. What is this wraith that dogs Hugh's path? A figment of a diseased imagination? A figure of retribution created by a conscience weighted with guilt? Or is it some ghastly nemesis conjured from the supernatural, the world outside our comprehension, summoned up by Dr. Felix Brandt through the agency of the devil? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. night, Hugh Prentice fled to his apartment as though the hounds of hell were at his heels. Locked in securely, with every light blazing, riding high on Benzedrine to keep awake, he paced the two small rooms like a caged tiger. And everywhere he turned, he faced the doppelganger, watching him silently, waiting patiently, a twisted smile of anticipated triumph on his face. At last, he could stand it no longer and fled the apartment with the first light of morning, roaming the streets, afraid to turn his head, knowing his double still followed on his heels. At last, exhausted, he found a small restaurant open and sat there drinking coffee after coffee and watching the clock till nine o'clock came. Then he crossed to the public phone to make a call. Dr. Brandt speaking. Dr. Brandt, uh, this is, uh, this is Hugh Prentice. Uh, I'm a student of yours in a lecture series. It's a large class. I don't place you for the moment. Well, that doesn't matter. What does matter is, uh, look, uh, Doc, I'm, I'm in trouble. Can you help me? Help you? How? I can't, not over the phone. It's, uh, it's like a, it's like a matter of life and death. Help me. Well, if you put it that way, of course. I'll try, Mr. Prentice, was it? Yeah, Prentice. Hugh Prentice. Very well. How soon can you be here? Well, within ten minutes. Very well, I'll be waiting. I hung up with the strangest feeling. 
my comprehensive basic psychology course has a large attendance, some 100. The name meant nothing to me. No, that isn't right. I, I didn't recognize it, but what I did recognize was a, a stifling feeling rising in my gorge of implacable hatred for this Hugh Prentice. Why? The name filled me with revulsion. What connection could... And then suddenly... Oh, the pain struck again, sharper than ever. Oh, now, where... Where did... Come. Morning, Felix. Uh, I just dropped by to... Uh, uh, what is it? The, the, the pain? Yes. Uh, uh, where are your morphine tablets? Drawer. Forgot this morning. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, oh. I'll feel better than that. Why must you be yeah. so pig-headed? Don't want to establish the habit. Yeah, the habit will hurt you less than the pain uh. right now. To, uh, here, let, let get one, get one arm out of the coat. Uh, 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 that's better. Uh, can you roll back your sleeve while, while I prepare the syringe? Yes, hurry. Just let me let me swab first. There. Oh. Now, now hold steady. Hold oh. steady. Ah. Uh, so this will take hold in a minute. Oh, they're, they're getting worse, Jim. And more frequent. Well, I'm sorry. I can't help any more than I can. The only treatment medicine has to offer you, Felix, is palliative. I know. I also know I haven't got much longer. That's what worries me so about Fran and that guy, whoever he is. I don't want him to wreck the rest of her life. Oh, that'll be one of my students. Wants to see me about something. I have to run anyway. I, I just wanted to tell you some good news. I got the tests back on Fran, and I was maybe a little hasty on my first diagnosis. With care, there's no reason she can't have a child again. <sighs> I don't know if that's good or bad, as long as that skunk is still alive, whoever he is. I'll let your visitor in. Oh, I... I was looking yeah, for... Yeah, Dr. Brandt, you, you have the right office. I was only visiting. Shut the door and come in. You're Mr. Prentice? Yes, 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 sir. Yes, sir. That's right. Hugh Prentice. Sit down. Oh. Suppose you tell me what's troubling you. Have you ever had any delusions like this before? <laughs> Not on your life. Have you done anything recently that you're... That you're sorry for, ashamed of? No. Like what? I don't know. That's why I asked. No. Why should I be ashamed of anything I do? I'm, I mean, like I free wheeled, you know? I give what I get. That's that's all evens with me. What does that mean? Like it's a tough world, Doc. I mean, uh, they're all against me, like most of them. They? Who are they? You know, people. Are your mother and father still alive? No. My old man took off before I was five. And my ma, well, she horsed around like, uh... Well, like she had to live, make the bread for me, like anyone, I guess. Uh, she liked a good time. What kind of a job did she have? <laughs> Are you kidding? Bringing home uncles for me. <laughs> I must have had a hundred or so uncles by the time I was 14 and... Then... Then what? Ah, then she left me with an aunt. Some old dried-up stick. Ah, I shouldn't kick about her at that. When she died, she left me enough dough to go to college like now, and, uh... Hey, hey, look, what has this got to do with that, uh... That, that goon who's tracking me? I'm trying to get around to that. You don't like women very much, do you, Hugh? I don't know what you're getting at. You like to punish them because of what your mother did to you. Isn't that it? Look, I don't have to have you push me around like them. I mean, all I came here for was to ask for help. And I'm trying to give it to you. Well, can you just get this haunt, whatever the hell it is, off my back? I want to try, if you'll just help me. Look, anything, Doc, anything. I, 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 I got to get some sleep, and uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid to. You're quite safe here. What's that thing? It's a metronome. Some people use it to learn to keep time to music. I use it to calm people down. Now, just keep your eye on the needle as it swings back and forth. 
and try to relax. And answer my questions as honestly as you can. And maybe, together, we can get to the root of what's wrong with you. Tell me your name again. Hugh. Hugh what? Hugh Prentice. Where were you born? Allentown, Pennsylvania. What was your father's name? Frank. And your mother's? Mary. I use hypnosis a lot in my work, but never more deliberately, and I'm ashamed to say, callously than today. Because suddenly, from some deep recess of my being, an electric wave was sending its knowledge to my brain. A second sight was born, and I was suddenly sure who Hugh Prentice really was. Can you hear me, Hugh? Yes. You know a girl named Fran Brand, don't you? Sure. She's my chick. You know she's my daughter? Yeah. And you made her pregnant? She was careless. You took her to someone to get rid of the child? Sure. It's the way it is. No sweat. Don't you know she loves you? Man, like their buses. Another one any minute. Yeah, sure. That's how chicks are. Do you love her? What's with all this love, Jive? I ain't tying myself down no way. It's like I told you, I free wheel. Nobody gonna cut down my style. Keep trying. All the squares, all of them, but I'll show them. Anyone ties me down, I stomp on them good. Especially chicks like my mother. All sweet words and cut your throat the first chance they get. Only me, I'm too smart. I cut them down to size first. Don't you worry about old Hugh. The morphine was wearing off already. I sat back in my chair watching the boy whose secrets I had bared. A schizophrenic, classic, already paranoid. Possibly he could be saved through analysis, chemotherapy, new treatments which are being reached every day. Treatments I would never live to see. Treatments he would never willingly seek as he had sought me. Because out of the dark side of my studies and my learning, I had raised a doppelganger. Then for a moment, the pain hit me so wildly, so acutely, agonizingly, that I must have blacked out a moment because... Don't bring him out of his hypnosis. He doesn't deserve to live. I cannot condemn him to the death in limbo like you live. Let me tell you something, old man. You are about to die. Two doors face you. Open one. And you let the scourge out to destroy your daughter as well as himself. Open the other. And I take his body and your daughter has her chance to live her life. Her chance to find happiness instead of despair and degradation. Which will it be? Which will you choose? Choose. 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 Only in sleep can a doppelganger take possession of another body. Looking at the boy frozen in deep hypnosis across my desk, around him, was it my own pain? A shadowy figure hovered. I knew I could banish the shadow if I willed. But I had chosen my door. I rose and left the office to go home to my study. They buried Hugh Prentice or his body 
Two days after he smashed into the rock wall at Highgate Turn, popularly known as Satan's Trap in our neighborhood. What soul possessed it? I will know very soon. I am about to die and leave this manuscript transcribed through those two days in exquisite paint for my daughter and Hank to read. I know it will bring them their own pain, but I hope it will bring them peace. And if I am condemned, too, for my sins, to wander as a doppelganger, I can only pray that what I have done may be worth it and will have brought my daughter happiness. This manuscript was read by Hank as executor of the estate. And in that position, he exercised a humane decision, perhaps beyond his powers. He did not let Fran read her father's letter. He buried it in a safe deposit vault until the time was ripe long after they were married and had children of their own. I'll be back shortly. story came to me through accidental channels, long after the principals were gone. I cannot vouch for the truth of it any more than I suppose any of the principals involved could. It's a story, I suppose, of retribution, and at the same time, a frightening lesson to all of us who stretch the human relationship beyond normal demands. If we sin deep enough, in some form, in some way, I suppose there is a doppelganger who will vie with us for retribution. The only way to avoid that is to deny him the chance. Our cast included Howard Da Silva, Rosemary Rice, Tony Roberts, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now... A preview of our next tale. He can get out and kill somebody else? But I don't think he will. You don't think? You're willing to take a chance because you don't think he will? Well, what else can I go on but my own judgment? How do you know he won't kill somebody? I don't. Any more than I know I won't. Or you won't. Or anybody else won't. Except possibly your mother, and I can't give you any guarantee about her if it comes to that. Now, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like... You've done a terrible thing. I, I don't think so. And you're going to regret it. I, I hope not. Well, you will. You'll see. When you're responsible for another murder, you're going to be very, very sorry for what you've done. Jack, Jack, please. If he kills somebody else, you'll be the murderer yourself. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Uncle Ben's Long Grain and Wild Rice and Anheuser Busch Incorporated Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Evil exists. We all agree on that, don't we? I mean, we read about it, hear of it, sometimes witness it. Even if we are that unfortunate, have it done to ourselves. 
But what is it? The dictionary defines evil as anything impairing happiness or welfare, or depriving of good. If we accept, at least for now, this definition, then who of us, in the course of a lifetime, has not done evil, or darkly thought of doing it? I'm waiting. Who? Anyone can do it. I can't. Don't be silly. Of course you can. But how? First, you have to believe you can do it. And then, then? Why, then you go ahead and do it. Our mystery drama, The Evil Eye, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Mandel Kramer and Carol Titel. It is sponsored in part by Sunkist Growers Incorporated. I'll be back shortly with Act One. intimated at the start that this is to be a story of evil, and before long, you will realize that I did not exaggerate. Cheating, lying, stealing, such things are commonplace. We read about them daily. Then there is betrayal, slander, perjury, oh, the number is endless, and what is worse, all lurk in every human heart. Listen to the words of Blaise Pascal, who lived and wrote more than 300 years ago. Evil is easy and has infinite forms. It's a terrible thing, being a woman. The only thing that's worse is being a successful woman. You've heard of me, I'm sure. Charity Ormsby. You've certainly read one of my books. More likely, you've read them all. I'm the best-known female writer in the country. Of course know that my real name is Louise Bates, married nearly 20 years to John Bates, mother of two, both boys, both, thank the Lord, away at school. At any rate, when the events I'm about to relate came about, there was no one in the house but John and myself. up to better ones. I brought you some coffee. Mm. What time is it? It's a little early, but I have to get to the office. You know, income tax time is mm. coming up. Everybody wants their returns. So I thought before I left, I'd bring you your coffee. Would you like me to pour it? Yeah, I guess so. Oh, I was sleeping so soundly. <laughs> As though I were in my tomb. Depressed, are you? Yeah. Here's your coffee. Oh, thank you, dear. You'll perk up as soon as you get back to work. I suppose so. You always do. <laughs> I do, don't I? Always. Well, I really should be getting started. Oh, it's the dreadful hiatus between two books that gets me down. The feeling that it's all over, that my talent is all used up. I'll never write again. Never have another idea. You can't imagine how depressing it is. No, I guess I can't. Oh, you're lucky to be an accountant, John. Am I? Yes, I suppose, in some ways I am. Speaking of which, I really better get going. Oh. Oh, will you answer that for me, will you, dear? All right. Hello? Is Miss Ormsby there? Uh, yes, yes, she's here. Or should I say, Mrs. Bates? Is this Mr. Bates? Yes, it is. This is Kathy Corrigan, Mr. Bates. Oh, yes, how are you, Miss Corrigan? Oh, you know. Could I speak with your wife? Well, can you can you hold on, Miss Corrigan, and I'll, I'll see if she's able to talk? I'll hold on. It's your agent, dear. So I gathered. Can you talk to her? I can try. Oh, uh, uh, don't go just yet, John. I, I need support. Well, it's... Um, hello, Kathy. I was just wondering uh, if you're working. No, no, I, I'm not working. When do you think you will be, Louise? Oh, for heaven's sake, Kathy, don't you know anything about my habits after all these years? No, I just thought... Well, I... you didn't. You didn't think at all. You know perfectly well I can't put a word on paper until the whole thing suddenly takes shape in my mind. 
Till that happens, I'm helpless as a baby. Well, when do you think something will take shape? Oh, how do I know? I can't plan to have it take shape, you know. I can't command it to take shape. I can't just trick it or, or seduce it or, or bribe it. I can't... All right, I... all right, Louise. I understand. Well, then why do you insist... I thought you might like to know that Benita Barlow has just been given a million-dollar advance. What? On her next book. Benita Barlow got a million-dollar advance? Yes, she did. Thanks for calling. How about that? How about that? That overdressed, overblown frump. That no talent, Benita Barlow has just... I know, I know, I heard. A million dollars. A million dollars. You're better than she is, Louise. You're much better than I she is. I know that I'm better. I know that. You're the best, Louise. I know I'm the best. But do those new poop publishers know it? No, all they know is Benita Barlow, Benita Barlow. So she gets all the advertising, she gets the interviews, she gets all the fanfare, all the whoop de do. I could kill that woman. Oh, now, darling, you don't mean that. I do mean it. I could kill her. Trouble is, <laughs> she's in England, and I'm here. <laughs> happened. The idea for my next book sprang into my head, full-blown, the way it had always done before. Oh, oh, what a joy. What a relief. After months of sterility, I was ready to write again. In ten days, my public would have what they awaited so breathlessly. I could scarcely wait to tell John. It'll be all about a beautiful black woman and a white man and their enduring love for each other. Do we know any black women, Louise? Oh, that's beside the point. I can fantasize it. I can fantasize anything. Of course you can. I shall call it, um, Dark Luster. Good title. All right, now, John, you know what you have to do. I must have ten full days to complete it. I shall shut myself in my room. Now, you know how it goes. We've been through this before. Yes, but now, Louise... Now, you'll stay home. You'll have to cook your own meals. Well, that part's all now, right, you'll dear. eat them by yourself. Yes, but you, you know... You'll sit by the window the way you always have to stop anyone who comes to the door. Now, you will have to hold the phone in your lap so you can answer it the second it starts to ring. Oh, and if that dog down the block starts to bark, you will silence it. And if the people next door play those awful records, you will make them stop. But, Louise... Oh, you... it will be heavenly... Shall I answer it? No. Nope. I'll take it. This one last time. The last call I take for ten delicious days. Hello? Louise, this is Kathy. Kathy. Kathy, the most beautiful thing has happened. Uh, Louise? I am starting a new book. You're the last person I'll speak to for ten whole days. Then you will have the completed manuscript. Louise, it's I'm going calling. to be called Dark Luster. Louise, and have you heard about Benita Barlow? Well, it's all about this. Louise, huh. Benita Barlow is very ill, very, very ill. Oh, uh, is she? It's a very rare disease, and it's always fatal. She can't live long. Is that so? I just thought I should tell you. Well, good luck with the book. I'll be hearing from you. In ten days, precisely. Huh. Benita Barlow's come down with some strange sort of disease. It's terminal. The news about Benita Barlow made hardly any impression on me at all. The concept for my new novel was burgeoning within me, and I could scarcely wait to begin again. I wrote feverishly. The words leapt onto the page. My fingers could barely keep up with the racing of my brain. For nine full days, I wrote, only taking time for an hour or two of sleep here and there, now and then... And even as I slept, the words, the words, the blessed words ran pell-mell through my mind. Then, on the tenth day... Oh, stop. Stop. Who can be banging on that door? John! John, for pity's sake, will you make it stop? Is that a home? John! John, will you make him go away? John, go to the 
door, John! Oh, please, is there someone home? Oh, who in the world is that? You! You down there! You at the door, will you go away? I, I just... You are doing a terrible thing. You are interrupting an act of creation. You are a dreadful, ignorant person. A desecrator, a vandal, a profaner on the altar of art. Look, only... you dreadful man, you don't deserve to live. I slammed down the window, trembling with rage. That creep, that ignorant, selfish, stubborn creep. <laughs> I crawled into my big, comforting easy chair, <laughs> curled myself into a ball and huddled there, cursing him and shivering as though I'd been smitten with a fever. I was exhausted, drained. After a while... I heard the outside door open. Who could it be but John? <laughs> My loyal, devoted husband, who had promised to defend me against such intrusions. Shaking with anger, I went downstairs. John was just coming in. And where? Where, if you will be so kind as to tell me, have you been... Why, uh, at the office, Louise. At the office. <laughs> at the office. While well, I was draining the blood from my veins to finish my novel, my masterpiece, while I was 40 pages from the ending, you were at the office. Well, there was so much work to do. Work? <laughs> you call what you do work? Well, tax return. You know very well that for these 10 days, your work was here to silence the phone, to drive away callers, to keep that dog from barking, to make those people stop playing their dreadful rock and roll. Well, you know what you've done now, don't you? Louise. You have ruined my novel. That's what you've done. It's dead. It's finished. It's over. Please. I am going upstairs and tear it to shreds. Then I shall burn it. <laughs> Writers are indeed strange creatures with strange habits of work. What suits one will not do for another. Some write longhand, others type. Some work early in the morning, others only late at night. Some pace the floor, others sit and meditate. Some compose rapidly, others with infinite slowness. Yes, writers are strange. Quite as strange as the rest of us. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. past houses lighted from within, perhaps brightly enough to make visible the figures of the inhabitants? Have you tried to imagine what they were doing, what they were saying or not saying, what they were feeling or not feeling? I wonder what you would have imagined had you seen the persons of John and Louise Bates as they confronted each other on a certain singular night. I'm John Bates, and I know I shouldn't have done what I did. But I got so bored, so unutterably bored, just sitting on the front window seat, holding the phone in my hands, listening for music from next door or the sound of a dog barking down the block. I wasn't away for more than a half hour. Maybe not that long. And when I returned, I let myself into the house as quietly as possible. And where... Where, if you will be so kind as to tell me, have you been? Why, at the office, Louise. While I was draining the blood from my veins, you were at the office. You know what you've done with your trip to the office, don't you? You've killed my novel. It's dead. It's finished. It's over. I am going upstairs and tear it to shreds. Then... I shall burn it. Now, Louise, Louise, don't do that. Don't do anything while you're, while you're upset like this. Uh, now, tell me what happened. What happened 
was that some idiot came to the door and banged on it. Banged and banged and banged. I was 40 pages away from finishing my book. And this monstrous little man marched up our front steps and stood at our front door and banged on it. What did he want? How do I know what he wanted? To come into the house, I suppose. Well, you didn't let him in. Let him in. I opened the window and I shouted at him. I told him at the top of my voice that he was desecrating the temple of art, that he was an ignorant clod and a terrible man who shouldn't be allowed to live. Then I slammed down the window and I waited for you to show up. And now, now that it's too late, here you are. I'm sorry, Louise. Now, I'm going upstairs and destroy my novel. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait, what did this man look like, the one who came to the door? Oh, how should I know? All I could see was the top of his head. No, oh, he had, uh, he had red hair, I remember that. Long red hair? Hmm. Down to his shoulders. Disgusting. Might have been Stephen Bennett. Who's Stephen Bennett? I do his income tax. Well, <laughs> I hope they soak him plenty. He destroyed my work. Now I am going upstairs. You want me to answer that? No. No. You're too late. I'll answer it. Yes? Hello? Oh. You. No. No, not well at all. Nothing's going well. No. How's that? Oh. Oh, thanks for telling me. Not that it matters, but thanks anyway. That was Kathy Corrigan. Oh? What did she want? Just to tell me Benita Barlow is dead. You know what, John? Maybe I won't destroy my book after all. to Louise when I said I went to the office I didn't I was with a girl yes a girl I'd been seeing her for quite a while I felt guilty as hell about it but I, I couldn't help myself I'm in love with her and I think she's in love with me well, sometimes it's hard to tell anyway after Louise decided not to tear up her novel I stayed around the house for a couple of days just to make sure that you know that she was all right then I went to see this girl. I had to. Kathy, I don't know what's going on at home. With Louise, you mean? Of course, Louise. Louise is home to you, isn't she? Well, of course. I'm married to her. I see. Okay, go on. Kathy, when you called and told her that Benita Barlow was dead, she decided not to tear up her novel. Was she going to do that? Yes. I mean, you, you don't know about uh, about Stephen Bennett, do you? Never heard of him. Well, he's a client of mine. It seems that he tried to see me in my office and I wasn't there because, you know... I... Because you were here. That's right. Stephen Bennett was trying to see me because he was worried about his taxes, among other things. I mean, he'd given me some false figures and he was afraid that he was going to be found out and he wanted my help. Well, I wasn't at the office, so he went to my house. And Louise was almost finished with her novel. There was even an out-of-order sign above the doorbell. I mean, I put it there myself. So he started banging on the door. I mean, the man was really desperate. And Louise leaned out the window, and she hollered at him. I mean, she told me all this herself. Called him an ignorant clod and a terrible man, and, you know, stuff like that. And I guess he just finally gave up and went away. Yes? Yeah. So? Kathy, it's in the paper this morning. Steve Bennett is dead. He took an overdose of something. And he's dead. Well, I, I'm sorry about that, but after all, he isn't a, a close friend or anything like that. I don't know, but I mean, you know, if I'd been in my office, or even at home where I was supposed to be, maybe he wouldn't have done it. Oh, nonsense. I mean, I was here with you. Where you were or weren't has nothing to do with what happened. But it's my fault. Will you stop taking credit for something you couldn't help? You're just being arrogant. Arrogant? Me? It's... It's Louise. Louise? What about Louise? First Benita Barlow, now this Stephen Bennett. Both dead. But Louise didn't know either one of them. That doesn't mean a thing. 
not when you have the... the capacity for evil. The evil eye. What? I'm sure you've heard of it. The evil eye. Yeah, I've heard of it, but I mean... I... Well, what is it? I mean... It is the power to destroy whatever stands in your way. Oh, no, I mean... Oh, well, yes. Yes. Kathy, you mean Louise can... You mean she can destroy people? Well, she has done it, hasn't she? On purpose? I don't know. I don't know precisely how it works. I wish I did. But what do I... I mean, what am I supposed to do? I'm not sure. Let me think. I mean, what if she decides to destroy me? Or you? That is what I'm thinking about. Uh, look, John, you said she didn't destroy her book. Right after you called about Benita Barlow, she said maybe she wouldn't. You have got to insist that she finish it. Insist? She must have felt such a great surge of power when she heard about Benita Barlow. Now, you tell her about Stephen Bennett. If we can direct all that psychic energy into her work, if she'll finish the book, who knows? Who knows what might happen? I can tell you, my head was in a whirl. My wife had the evil eye? Louise? Louise had the evil eye? The power to, to do away with people if she didn't like them, if they interfered with her? I mean, well, it just seemed absurd, impossible. Still, Benita Barlow and Stephen Bennett... I mean, it did seem so, you know, so odd and really horrible. But Kathy had said there might be hope if I could persuade Louise to finish her novel. Insist on it, she said. <laughs> Me insist. I've never insisted on anything in my whole life. Still, I could try. Louise, you, you didn't tear up your novel, did you? Not yet. Well, don't do it, Louise. It's mine to do with whatever I choose. No, no, I'll listen to me. I prefer not to discuss it, John, if you don't mind. But I do mind. I, I think we have to talk about There's it. There's nothing to talk about. If my novel stays unfinished, it's your fault. Remember that. If you had stayed where you belonged and protected me from the outside world... I know that. I know that. ten full days, that novel would have been completed. But no, no. You had to run off to your stupid little office and that stupid little man... Stephen Bennett. Whoever he was. He interrupted my concentration and he ruined the whole thing. He's dead, Louise. Oh? Is he? Yes. He took an overdose of something. And he's dead. Was he a, a friend of yours? Well, he was a client. You seem so upset. Well, he came here looking for well, me. if you had been here... If you had let him in... What are you getting at, John? Are you trying to tell me it's my fault the man overdosed himself? I don't think you know how, how powerful you are, Louise. I'm only powerful if you're here to protect me. But I can't be here all the time. Well, no one's asking you to be here all the time. Ten days out of a whole year, you call that all the time? Please finish the book, Louise. I mean, if you don't... If I don't what? Well, you remember Benita Barlow. That English woman? What about her? She died. Oh, Benita Barlow died of some mysterious disease. I didn't know her. I've never even met her. Yeah, she was your rival. So what? Right here in this very room, I heard you say it. You said I could kill her. You said it twice, Louise. I was right here, right here with you when you said it. I could kill her, you said. But that doesn't mean I did. How could I? It's impossible. Not, not if you have the evil eye. What's that? What is it? What's the evil eye? It's, it, it's the power to hurt people. Just by wanting to hurt them. Even people you don't know. Even people who live thousands of miles away. You think that... That I have this power? I think... Maybe you have it. And I'm afraid of it, Louise. I couldn't tell whether I was making any impression on her or not. After all, I didn't really know what I was talking about. I just put words together and hoped that they would make sense. 
They sounded all right when I said them, but I couldn't tell what effect they were having on my wife. Her, her dark eyes opened wider and wider. Her cheeks got paler and paler. She walked out of the room without answering me. I waited downstairs, hoping to hear the sound of a typewriter, but I heard nothing. Is that you, Joe? Yes, dear. Come in here, will you? Right away. Did you have a hard day? Well, you know, it's income tax time. Everybody's kind of anxious. Yes, that's what I am. Anxious. Terribly, terribly anxious. Agonizingly anxious. Well, maybe... Paralyzingly anxious. Maybe if you were to, you know, finish your book. I try. I try. I sit there in front of the typewriter and I stare at it. I sit and I stare. But I can't even put my fingers on the keys. I can't even lift my hands to put the paper in the roller. But I do try, John. Maybe it doesn't sound like it, but I do try. Really, I do... Really, I do believe me. You... You do believe me, don't you? Louise, if you would just say to yourself, I can do it. And I will do it. I can. I will. That's all you need. The power and the will. The power and the will. That's all. I could try again. Of course you could. Oh, by the way, Louise, coming home, I stopped to talk to the people down the block. You know, the one with the dog? Uh-huh. Well, he died. The dog died. The people said it was, you know, old age. He just laid down in the sun and he died. The dog died? Yes. And you know the couple next door, the ones with all that rock and roll all the time? They're getting a divorce. The second I stopped talking... Louise gave me a peculiar look. Then she got up and left the room. She went upstairs. I really didn't know what I'd said to make her do that, but a minute later, I heard something that made me not happy exactly, but very, very relieved. Pascal, evil is easy and has infinite forms. Think what has happened so far. And we've only presented two acts. A woman dies, a man dies, a dog dies, a marriage dies. What's left for act three? I'll be back shortly. that you have never had the urge to destroy someone, I shall not believe you. The desire starts in each one of us at an early age. It resides in the tiny infant who, if his strength matched his fury, could destroy the world. As he grows, the wish is modified, tamed, deflected. But it never really dies. I'm Kathy Corrigan, and I'm the best literary agent in the country. To begin with, I have impeccable taste. That's just for starters. Then I have terrific contacts, which I've cultivated over the years. And finally, I'm a super salesperson. That about sums it up, I think. Why I should have fallen for an insignificant little man like John Bates, I'll never know. But I had, and that's that. Every time the phone rang, I hoped desperately it would be John and not his frightful wife. Hello? Kathy, this is Louise. Oh, yes, Louise. How are you? Kathy, I have great news for you. Tell me. Can't wait. I finished the novel. Kathy, did you hear me? I've completed my book. What, Louise, that's wonderful. I didn't think I could. Things have been so peculiar around here. What things? Oh, well, I, I don't have time to go into all that right now. Just... Oh, things, you know. Well, they threw me off my stride for a while. But now I think I've got them licked. Well, when can I read the book? Well, I could bring it over to your office right now. Except that I am exhausted. Uh, couldn't you send someone for it? 
Why don't you ask John to bring it over? Oh, I don't know. I really don't have anybody to send. Well, John's really responsible for my finishing it, in a way. Although he's the one who kept me from finishing it weeks ago. Oh, I, I don't but know. John's always so obliging, I'm sure. Oh, okay. I'll send John. Oh, Kathy, I can't wait till you read it. Neither can I. Tell John to hurry it up. Of course, I could have sent somebody. I could have sent my secretary. I could have hired a messenger. But I wanted to see John, and I wanted to see him right away. To find out how he had accomplished the miracle of making Louise finish her book. I couldn't concentrate on my work waiting for him to arrive. John. Hello, Kathy. Girl set to go right in. Oh, you got a kiss for me? You bet. Mm. Okay, now, got the manuscript? Right here. Mm-hmm. Well, it's the right way. <laughs> oh, sit down, John. Listen, I got a lot of work all piled up. Well, just for a minute. I want to know how you did it. You mean how I got Louise to finish the book? Of course, that's what I mean. Oh, it was easy. Well, how did you do it? It couldn't have been that easy. Well, after you told me about the evil eye, I got to thinking about it. And I told Louise that she had it. You didn't. Wasn't I supposed to? I mean, I... I, mean, I pointed out that Benita Barlow had died after Louise had said she could kill her. She did say that, you know. Yeah, go on. And, and, and Stephen Bennett, the man who came to the house and banged on the door, the one that she was so furious with, he died. Go on. Well, none of that made very much of an impression on her. Nothing did until I told her about the dog. The dog? What dog? The dog, the one down the block that barks sometimes. And I told her about the couple next door. What couple? The couple that play their rock and roll record so loud. They're getting a divorce. That's all you did? That's about it. Listen, I better get back to work. John? Hmm? I love you. You know that. Do you, Kathy? Because I love you. Oh. Look, don't you think we ought to tell Louise? About us? She has a right to know. She's got to know something. No, 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 she doesn't. No, she hasn't. Believe me, she, she doesn't want to know. She wouldn't like knowing. She'd hate it. No, she mustn't know. It would be very bad if she knew. All right. All right, darling. I mean, it would be just terrible if she knew. You run along, sweetheart. And you tell Louise I'll call her as soon as I finish the novel. Poor John. So timid, so fearful. Afraid of everything and everybody. Frightened little mouse of a man. But I loved him. And he had accomplished the remarkable feat of persuading his wife to finish her book. A book on which I expected, along with her, to make a great deal of money. I stayed up half the night reading it. In the morning, I made a date with her for luncheon. Well... Tell me. It's great, isn't it? I tell you, Kathy, this is going to be the best yet. A smash. A blockbuster. Tell me, am I right? <laughs> of course I'm right. After all these years, Kathy, I know these things. This book is going to light up the sky. Uh, Louise, you did read it, didn't well, of you? Of course I read it. You know I read it. Well, well. I stayed up half the night uh, reading it. I told you that on the phone. Well? Well, what? Am I right? E no. No, Louise, you're not right, at least in my opinion. I am right. I'm always right about my own work. This is a great book. This is a great book. Louise, I was just giving you my opinion. Now, everybody's entitled to have an opinion, don't you agree? Not when it's the wrong opinion. Louise, how did you happen to finish it? John told me I could. Oh? He said, Louise, you have the power and the will. And I went upstairs and finished it. And that's all? That was enough. After all, if I'd had the power and the will to do what I'd already done. And what was that? Oh, never mind. The point is, I had it. I had the power and the will. He told me I had it, and I had it. <laughs> but of course, I, I'd known all along I had it, but nobody ever told me I had it. 
Well, you see, then when he told me I had it, then I knew that I had it. All I needed was somebody to tell me I had it. Don't you see? I don't know that I do, Louise. <laughs> then I'm sorry for you. Really? Neatly. Profoundly sorry. Really? Well, uh, let me tell you something, Louise. It is a cheap, trashy book. Cheap huh? and trashy. Mm. Not that all your mm. books haven't been cheap and trashy, Louise, because they have been. But you believed in them so utterly, something came through. People who read them came to believe that life could be sweet and wonderful and full of joy and love and light, without pain, without suffering, where goodness and sweetness were rewarded and meanness and cruelty were punished. But I believe that. Oh, yes. You're such a fool, I'm sure you do believe it. And because it's what everybody wants to believe, your books sell like crazy. Love conquers all. That's all your book says. That's all any of your books have ever said. Well, it's true. How would you know? What? What did you say? I said, how would you know about love? Well, I... I know all about it. Well, nobody could tell it from your books. They are sleazy and phony and trumped up. Trumped up! up. With some sex thrown in every 50 oh. pages just to show you're with it. And even those parts aren't very good. They're as phony and full of fakery as the rest of it. Oh, to shut up. Just you shut up. You asked me. I will never ask you again. You can bet on that. What's more, I'll make you eat your words, Cassie. You wait but and I see. I only said what I believe. <coughs> what is What is <coughs> Cassie. Cassie. <coughs> Kathy, what? Kathy, what is it? Well, how does... Kathy, do, do, do you want a glass of water? What can I do? Kathy! Oh, no. oh, it's all right. Oh, it's all right. I was just... just joking on my words. You mean... You mean that I did that to you? I did it? You're a very powerful woman, Louise. Very, very powerful indeed. <laughs> It was true. I hadn't taken a bite of food. We hadn't even ordered. But the power of Louise's hatred, her malevolence toward me, had brought on one of those helpless fits of coughing that till they stop you, you think you're going to die. It was only when I realized, even as I was gasping for breath, that it was the evil eye of Louise Bates that was threatening my very life. It was only then I was able to stop. Janet was awful. Poor Kathy, poor baby. Oh, hold me close. I'm so frightened. Of course you are. I told her her novels were terrible. And I told her something worse. I told her she didn't know anything about love. Oh, boy, that was worse. But she doesn't know anything about love, not the way we know it. Look, I don't think it was a very good thing to tell her. Kathy, I think I, I think I better be getting on home. Oh, must you? Well, I think I better. Uh, what was that? Somebody knocking at the door. Can't imagine him. Kathy, may I come in, please? It's Louise. I need to talk to you, Kathy. What do we do? Uh, uh, leave it to me. Come in, Louise. Thank you. John. Hello, Louise. I didn't expect to find you here, but maybe I should have. Maybe I've been stupid. Oh, no, Louise. I've been stupid about a lot of things, like I never knew till you told me, John, that I had the evil eye. Look, Louise. When I think of what I've done, the power I've had, the power I've used, it's, it's awful to contemplate. Louise, don't think about it. You couldn't help it. But I must help it. I must learn to control it. Uh, are you two in love with each other? Yes, we are. We are, yes. Well, then you have my blessing. I won't stand in your way. Louise, you mean that? With all my heart. I hope the two of you will be very happy... Thank you. And, uh, Kathy, you don't have to show my last novel to the publishers if you don't want to. Oh, but I do. Well, it probably isn't very good anyway. Goodbye. 
And with that, Louise turned and walked out. Out of the room and out of our lives. What had happened, as near as I can figure out, is that she had been so shocked and horrified by the realization of her power that she had turned completely in the opposite direction and was determined to become a saint. It's John Bates again. And I'd like to add a few words. After all, I'm responsible for the whole thing. I was the one who taught Louise to say, I can and I will. Kathy and I are married now. It's working out all right, I guess. But Kathy is a very powerful woman, too. And one of these days, I may have to say to myself, I can and I will. Then I'll go back to Louise, who has turned into a really very nice person. turned about in this world. The cheater becomes the cheated. The robbed becomes the robber. The perpetrator becomes the victim. And no one is satisfied. At least, not for long. A very, very strange world indeed. But, alas, the only one we've got. I'll be back shortly. time from the works of Blaise Pascal. What a chimera is man. What a novelty. What a monster. What a chaos. What a contradiction. What a prodigy. Judge of all things. Feeble worm of the earth. Depository of truth. A sink of uncertainty and error. The glory and the shame of the universe. Our cast included Carol Titel, Mandel Kramer, and Terry Keene. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The difference between man and animal, said Voltaire, is that man knows he will die. Animals have bodies, brains, instincts, and desires, as we do, but they do not have our fiendish comprehension that we are finite. That one day, tomorrow, or the next, this year, or the one after, in this century, or the following one, our bodies, brains, instincts, and desires will have perished. Of course, that is why we seek so desperately to convince ourselves of the truth of reincarnation, the promise of a life beyond this one, of some kind of immortality to soften the implacable reality of death. The house has whispers in it. Too bad. Really, Elaine. Really too bad. They mutter to themselves. What have I done to deserve this? Sometimes they shout. It's your fault. It's not mine. It's yours. Now shut up, both of you. Who would think they'd still be talking after all these years? <laughs> Our 
Our mystery drama, The Intruders, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Lois Nettleton. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Carrier Air Conditioning. I'll be back shortly with Act One. have minds, instincts, and desires, and we all live with the knowledge that one day they will all run down and come to a stop, and the world will spin on, oblivious and indifferent to the fact that we no longer inhabit it. So perhaps the fear that chills our blood is not so much that life will be over as it is that we will have so wasted it as to have left no impression whatever on the world we leave behind. I walked the last half mile or so to the house because I wanted to come to it alone. I had dreamed of it nearly every night for seven years. The serene old house standing under great elms and oaks built of the mellowest old field stone dug out of the resisting earth that surrounded it. And now as I walked up the path and saw the front door painted a soft olive green, the great brass knocker shining softly. I knew that I had done the right thing. I had come home. I pushed the door open. There was the great wide entrance hall. There was the gently curving staircase with its polished mahogany balustrades leading to the floor above where now I was certain I would find my old bedroom just as I had left it. Yes, I had done the right thing. I'd come home. I started toward the staircase, anxious to see my old, my own, my so familiar room with its long windows opening onto the gardens, its four-poster bed all hung in muslin, its tiny fireplace crouching like a cat in one corner. All, all would say, Welcome home, Elaine. We're glad you've come. I had one foot on the first stair when something happened. I heard whispers, very soft whispers, so soft I couldn't distinguish the words. But one thing was unmistakable. I was not alone in my house. I had come home. But to what? Such a bother. It's too bad. It, it really is too bad. Why did it have to happen just now? When everything was going so well. Why did it have to happen to us? It's really too much. It's a shame. That's what it is. Yeah. yeah it's a shame. Who had taken over my house? Who had dared to move into my house? Who was intruding on my property? We have to do something. Don't both of you look at me. I don't know what to do. I hope you don't think I do. Well, you certainly don't think I do. Now, let's not fight among ourselves. Look, let's put our heads together and think what to do. Yeah, we have to figure out something. Yes. Everything was spoiled. Strangers were in my house. Three of them, it sounded like. They had broken into my house, and now they were upset because I'd come back to claim it. They must have seen me coming up the path, heard me open the door, walk in. And now they were trying to decide what to do next. She's so young. That's not the point. I know, but, but... she can't stay here. Where can she go? That's what we have to figure out. She's so young and so frail. Such... such a little thing. The voices were coming from the front parlor. I made up my mind. I would simply confront them. Tell them that I had come home to my own house and they must leave. Who's going to tell her? Well, not I. Yeah, certainly not me. You don't expect me to. You're the logical one. You can't make me do it. I won't. The door to the front parlor flew open and a woman rushed out. I braced myself against the post and tried to summon my courage to find my voice. But everything was happening so fast. The woman hurrying straight towards me. The two men after her. You have to. I won't. You can't expect us to do your dirty work for I won't. I won't do it. Do you know what happened then? The woman rushed right past me and up the stairs. She took no notice of me at all. In utter astonishment, I watched her run up the stairs to the second floor. I, I was trembling all over. 
Everything was being spoiled. I'd come home and now my home was not mine. It was filled with intruders. I turned to see what the others, the two men, were doing. The door to the front parlor had closed again. They must have gone back in. I tiptoed across the hall and put my ear to the door. And I could hear them talking. It's up to you. Why not you? You're the head of the house. Not when it comes to things like this. Oh, you mean not when it comes to whatever you don't feel like doing. That'll be enough out of you. I am not going to argue with you. The door suddenly opened, and one of the men came out. He was rather young, which surprised me for some reason. About my own age, I would suppose. Handsome, with black hair and blazing eyes. I couldn't help but admire him. He strode angrily out of the room into the hall and slammed the door behind him. I watched him dash upstairs, two steps at a time, perhaps to comfort the woman, perhaps to enrage her further. Now there was only one of the intruders left. I would confront him, demand what right he had to be in my house and order him to leave. When he had complied, then I could deal with the other two. You will leave my house at once. My voice lacked all conviction. I was embarrassed, mortified. The man, older than the other one who had just passed me in the hall, was standing at a window looking out. And it would seem hearing nothing. For he didn't even turn his head at the sound of my voice. He simply stared unseeing out the window. Then his hands gripped his head. A quivering sigh turned into a deep sob. His whole great body shook and his knees bent until they touched the floor. Lord, help me, Lord. I cannot bear it. I cannot... Lord God in heaven, help me. Help me, or I am lost. I stood stuck still at the door. All my anger had left me. All my indignation, all my resolve to rid my house of these usurpers. I had only a huge desire to cross over to him, put my arms around his big shoulders, and draw his head to my breast. Whatever his trouble, whatever his misery, I wanted only to comfort him. I did what I could. I did my best. Lord, you know I meant nothing but good. I never meant that things should be like this. I meant only the best. Only the best. I felt sobs in my own throat. A sympathy... I had not known for years. A love for another human overcame me. A human I did not recognize, did not know. He turned slowly and started for the door. I held out both my arms. Forgive me. I'm sorry. So sorry for whatever it is that I have done. thing happened. As I stepped forward to embrace him, he lifted his gaze from the floor, looked straight into my face, into my eyes, which by now were as full of tears as his own, and he said, Am I never to be forgiven? And having said those words, not to me, not to anyone, he walked to the door. The jacket of his coat brushed my dress as he walked past me to the door, which was open, went straight through into the hall and vanished from my sight. I was alone in the parlor. Whatever I had expected my homecoming to be, it was not this. No, never this. To be the outsider in a place that belonged to me? I went upstairs. But before I reached the room that had always been mine, I passed another room. A big square room with a big double bed. And on it lay the woman. I crossed over to her. She was sleeping. But her lips moved. And I bent over to try to catch the words. 
baby, baby, baby. That was all she said. But she kept saying it. Baby, baby. I put my ear close to her mouth to try to catch another word. But I heard only baby repeated over and over. Then I was suddenly aware and I felt a chill sweep through me. I was aware that from her mouth no breath escaped. Not a breath. There was no feeling of her breath upon my cheek. I ran from the room across the upstairs hall. The door to another room stood open. Inside, the young man with the black hair and blazing eyes was pacing up and down. I, I watched him for almost a minute from the doorway, but he never looked up or took any notice of me. Suddenly, he grabbed a vase of flowers from a table and dashed it to the floor. Damn! The explosion of his anger drove me away and downstairs. I ran to the back of the house, to the kitchen. There, seated at the big work table, was the man crying now, not making any sound whatsoever, but staring straight ahead with eyes that were bleak and passionless. He did not move as I entered the room. His big hands lay side by side on the table, palms down. Love and pity stirred me. I moved to where he sat and put both my hands over one of his. Still, he did not move. How could he not move, I thought. And then... Oh, then I realized that his hand, his big hand that lay in both of mine, had no substance at all. It was as though my hands held air. I touched nothing. I held nothing. The hand, big and strong and firm as it appeared to be, was nothing. And then I knew, certainly and surely, I knew that I had come home to find my house inhabited by ghosts. could be worse than coming home after a long absence to find your house occupied by three ghosts? Well, I'll tell you what could be worse. To find that some persons had backed up a moving van to your door and made off with all your belongings. Or to discover that a fire had burned it to the ground. That would be worse. But three fairly civilized, seemingly non-violent ghosts? What's so bad about that? I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Our heroine Elaine has returned to her home the home she firmly believed to be hers and finds it tenanted by three people. Or what she believed to be people, but who she has now decided must be ghosts. There is the lady ghost whose sleeping breaths cannot be felt upon Elaine's cheek. There is a young male ghost who cannot hear Elaine's knock upon his door. And finally, there is a gentleman ghost whose hand Elaine cannot feel when she takes it in both her own. Feeling perplexed, but strangely, not in the least frightened, I went upstairs. I opened the door just as I had opened it countless times before and went in. I heard something. To my astonishment, to my my infinite delight, there was a fire burning in my tiny fireplace. How could this be? 
Had the three unhappy and quarrelsome ghosts been expecting me? Was it their way of saying welcome to the owner of the house? I sat down in the Windsor rocking chair that I remembered from long ago. Why, it even creaked in the old familiar way. How sensitive my ghosts must be to know that I would be disappointed if anything had changed if my rocker did not still give off its well-remembered, its well-beloved little squeak. So, born gently and sweetly into my own past, lulled by the creaking of the rocker and the crackling of the fire, I drifted off to sleep. feeling much refreshed. I washed my face a little, brushed my hair, and went downstairs. I wanted to go back to the kitchen where I'd left the elderly gentleman, my favorite, I must confess, of the three ghosts, though I felt pity for the woman and an odd attraction to the young man. This time, the old gentleman was not alone at the kitchen table. All three were there. The boy still looked angry. The woman still... Anxious and unhappy. Only the older man seemed to have composed himself. Now, I've heated up what's left the lamb stew we had last night, and I want you all to eat some. Oh, I can't, Frederick. Neither can I. I want no nonsense from either of you. Oh. We have decisions to make, and we are not going to make them on an empty stomach. Well. There's some for you, Elizabeth. Now, eat it, eat it all. And, oh, Fred, some for you. Now, come on, dig in. And some for me. Oh, and there's milk in that pitcher, so help yourselves. As they started to eat the stew and drink the milk, I found that I was hungry, too. It had been hours since I'd eaten. There was a fourth chair at the table. What harm could it do if I sat down with them? It would be cozy. It, it would be nice. And there was always the chance that one or more of them would notice me, speak to me, make friends with me. I, I picked up the old bent wood chair, sat in it, and inched it towards the table. No one looked up. They kept right on eating. Seems I was hungry after all. Of course you were. <laughs> Didn't think I'd ever want to eat again. Not after this morning. That was dreadful. I don't think she even knew who I was. Well, the main trouble is this house. Yes, yes, the house. She loves it. Too much. Yes, too much. What were they talking about? This house. That must mean this very house in which we were all sitting. My house. My very own cherished house. And what, what did they mean? I loved it, loved it too much. And that was the trouble. Is that what they were saying? Well, really? My temper flared a little. After all, I was mistress of the house. They were simply guests and uninvited ones at that. I was the owner of the house. <sighs> Meanwhile, I was hungry, and no one was offering me anything. The lady ghost had not even touched her stew. I picked up her spoon and dipped into her bowl. Hmm. Delicious. Oh, I couldn't think when anything had tasted so good. I picked up the pitcher of milk, since I had no glass, and took a hearty gulp. Huh. Life was going to be pleasant if my ghosts kept cooking and cleaning for me. And there was always the possibility that one day they would see me, as I saw them, and we would talk together, touch one another, be a close, if <laughs> slightly peculiar, little family. I watched them finish their luncheon. I had volunteered a few remarks during the meal, and no one had paid the slightest attention. It was clear that I had not yet found the way to communicate with ghosts. I'll, uh, I'll clear the table. I'll help. No, no, let Fritz do it. No. All right, Fritz. Okay. See there now, Mother. You did have an appetite, after all. You ate a whole bowl of lamb stew. I hardly touched it. <laughs> Seeing's believing. Well, I didn't know I was doing it, I swear. <laughs> I could hardly hold back a giggle. 
the lady didn't know I had eaten all her stew. How long, I thought, will I have to go on sneaking food from their plates? How long before they would notice it? How long before they would notice me? Uh, Fritz, will you wash up? Oh, sure. I want to go out and, uh, and pick the last of the roses. I'll come with you. Oh, good. Those two must be husband and wife, I thought, as I watched them go out the back door, hand in hand, walking a little wearily, leaning each one a little on the other for support. I lingered on in the warm, bright kitchen, watching the handsome boy ghost at the sink. I wanted to touch his wavy black hair where it curled down the nape of his neck. I wanted to kiss the long-fingered hands that held the dishes under the running water, scrubbed and then dried them and put them away. But I soon tired of watching his brooding face, and I remembered the elderly couple who were by now wandering among the roses. My roses. There had been vases of them in every room of the house. It had been a vase of roses that this grim young man had dashed to the floor. I would go out and see my roses again. There they were. She with a basket over her arm. He with a pair of clippers carefully snipping off the roses. The pink, the yellow, the white. And placing them in the basket she held. I I fairly danced up to them. I, I felt I loved them so. Surely in this garden spot they would see me and know me. But they simply talked quietly to each other. The yellow ones are almost finished. Yes, and the white. <laughs> the yellow are my favorites. Well, we'll put in more next year. <laughs> we always do that. But what for? Uh, one never knows. You may be right. Ooh. What? Hurt yourself? <laughs> Just a thorn. Oh, well, you should be more careful. went on cutting the flowers and putting them in her basket. She put her injured finger in her mouth for a second or two, then went on arranging the roses, the pinks together, the whites together, the yellow. Oh! What now? I did it again. Oh, really, Elizabeth? This time she held out her finger for him to look at. I looked too, and what I saw bewildered me more than anything that had gone before. From her finger, which she held up to him as piteously as a puppy with an injured paw, from her finger fell drop after drop of crimson blood. Blood. My ghosts could bleed. I told you to be careful. I know you did. I just wasn't thinking... It's hard. I know, my dear, I know. But I don't want you hurting yourself. How can I be hurt any more than I've already been hurt? Tell me that. Well, <laughs> I hurt too, you know. I do know. We've all been hurt. We're all bleeding. Yes. Well, let's go back. We have enough roses. I followed them as he tenderly shepherded her toward the house... Stopping now and then to comfort her and dry her eyes. What was troubling my ghosts? What was the deep unhappiness that depressed them? I ached with sympathy for my newly adopted family. The, the doctor's here. The doctor? Mm -hmm. He wants to talk to you both. Is it good news or... Uh, he wouldn't tell me. He wants to discuss something with you. What? A possibility, he said. Uh, what possibility? A possibility of what? Well, he, he wouldn't tell. Um, he wants to talk to you. We all went into the house, through the kitchen, into the front parlor where sat a strange man. Small, undistinguished, with gray hair, parchment skin, and the bluest eyes I'd ever seen. Pale blue they were, but penetrating, bright and somehow kind. I'm glad I found you in. You have news for us, Doctor. Uh, in a way, I have. Uh, she was asking for you this morning. For me? Did she... She... She asked for all of you. By... By name? Uh, did she seem to remember... N not everything, no. Uh, but enough. 
Enough. Enough to... to give you hope? Well, I should think so. Oh, Doctor. She seemed concerned about three of you. I must say it was a happy thing for me to hear. When I saw her early this morning and she asked about all of you, uh, spent some extra time with her. I... I asked her if she'd like to come home. Come home? Uh, could she? That would be wonderful. Well, I had to talk to you about it first, of course. If, but if she's well enough. But she's better. She's improved. Well, then why not? Now, I want you to talk it over between yourselves. Well, there's nothing to talk over. <laughs> what are we waiting for? Let's go get it. Now not, yes. not, not, not so fast. I insist that you sleep on it. Then in the morning, if you're all agreed, come see her at the sanitarium. If all of you are like-minded, you can bring her home. Oh. Now, I think... I think perhaps we're taking chances, but then, uh... <laughs> we never chance anything. We never gain anything. <laughs> Am I right? Was the doctor a ghost as well? Frankly, I couldn't make him out at all. That bit of homely philosophy, life is full of risks, but we must risk something to gain something, that didn't sound much like a ghost to me. To a ghost, after all, life is... Well, uh, what is it? Something they've lost? Or is it something they found? Or is it something in between... end of Act Two had made some slight progress toward establishing herself as mistress in her own house. She had met the three ghosts who dwelt there, though clearly they had not met her, being apparently quite oblivious of her presence. Still, she had developed real feeling for them, no matter how they ignored her. She had touched them, though they did not react. She had even sat down to luncheon with them. At last I knew what was troubling my three sweet ghosts. Someone they all loved. A woman. A girl. Was very ill. And now they were going to bring this invalid home. Home to my house. Perhaps they had chosen my house so that she would have a particularly lovely place to come to. After the sterility of the hospital. When I went to my pale blue room that night... There were fresh yellow roses in a white vase next to my bed. And surprise of surprises, my bed had been turned down. The blue and white coverlet had been neatly folded across the foot of the bed. The pillow and its embroidered slip had been plumped up at the head. And the turned down corner revealed the loveliest of linen sheets. I, I laughed aloud in my great joy. My new family was about to be complete. And all of us would be very, very happy together. In the morning, I came downstairs to find them chattering excitedly. Fritz, we've decided you should not stay here. Why? Because three of us might be too much company for her. You know how she's behaved those other times. Oh, but Frederick, this time will be different. Remember what the doctor said. It's only a chance. That's more than we've had before. <laughs> all right, all right. Fritz, you go over the whole house, and if you see anything, anything at all, any bit of dust or piece of scrap, everything must be absolutely perfect. And be sure there's food in the icebox and plenty of soft drinks. Fritz will take care of everything. <laughs> everything. Now, don't excite yourself. <laughs> How can I help it? My baby, my baby is coming home. So it was her baby. The day before when I had bent over her, she lay sleeping in the bed and had heard her whisper in her sleep over and over again the word baby. It was her child who was ill, who had been taken away from her, kept away for so long. Not a baby anymore, I suspected, but a girl. How big? How old? Would she be pretty? man 
and brought a car around to the front door. He left it for a minute to go inside to get his wife, and that gave me just enough time to clamber into the back seat and scrunch myself way down on the floor. That way they would never see me. For I was becoming more and more certain that the time was very near when they would see me, when I would introduce myself properly and offer to share my house with them forever. But not just yet. We must all wait till the family was complete, till the one I'd never seen had been brought back from the sanitarium, till she was settled in, felt comfortable. Then, then, they would begin to see me, hear me, touch me, love me. It was only a short drive to the sanitarium. Tomorrow, she and I will go shopping for clothes. That's too soon. Well... Next week, then. Now, listen, we must be patient. Very gradual about this whole thing. I know, I know. Uh, but let me dream. <laughs> dream away, darling. Dream away. <laughs> I felt the car make a turn off the road to the right. Only then did I get up off the floor and look out the window. There stood a great white house. Pretty enough, though not nearly so handsome as mine. The couple got out and hurried up the broad marble steps and went inside. I slipped in with them before the door closed. The doctor I had seen at my house the day before came out of a room, greeted the man and his wife, and took them back with him into the same room. Once again, I managed to slip in before the door closed. I hid myself behind a chair. Please, sit down, both of you. Yes. Thank you. Well, now... How... How is she, Doctor? Yes. How is she this morning? Still... Uh, uh, is still improved? Well, I'm not sure. How can you be not sure? You talk to her. She still wants to come home. We have everything ready for her. Does she want to? Oh, yes. Uh, she still wants to come home more than before. Well, then. Well, uh, wait. Uh, Doctor, there's more, isn't there? Yes. There's more. Well, tell us. Well, she's anxious to come home, very anxious, but her attitude toward all of you... Yes. Uh, hmm? You said yesterday she was concerned for us. Th that's changed? Yes, sir, it's changed. Changed back. What? Back. Back. Back to what it was. To what it was when she first came here. Oh, no. It can't be that she... She... She hates us? She wants to kill us? Oh, no. Now, 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 love and hate live together. You understand that, don't you? They live side by side in every human being. There is never just love, never just hate. Now, we have a, a glib-sounding word for it. Uh, ambivalent is, is sound so impersonal, so technical. But believe me, its substance is anything but impersonal. It is a state of being that rips us apart every moment of our lives. It is the condition that brings great joy and great sorrow. A condition that rules us, confuses us, threatens to destroy us. It is... Well, to put it briefly, it is the human condition. But what does all this mean? It means that Elaine is capable of loving you very greatly and hating you just as much. You see, there is an imbalance in her, so she rocks from one side to the other, unable to regulate her feelings. Now, if she goes home with you, you must bear this in mind if she comes home with us. I wasn't paying much attention to what anybody said, especially the doctor whose talk I didn't understand at all. Crouched as I was behind the chair, I simply wanted the whole thing to be over with, for them to be united with their darling girl and bring her back to my beautiful home so that we could start being a family. Yes? What's that? Oh, I understand. Uh, how long ago? Well, no, that's not too bad. No, I'll hold everything. I'll be right out. Uh, excuse me, will you? Uh, of course, Doctor. Was that was that call? Did it have to do with Elaine? Yes, sir. She's wandered off somewhere. They're oh. looking. No, no, they're looking for her now. Don't worry. She's still on the grounds. I'll I'll be right back. 
I was beginning to get impatient. I was exhausted by my efforts to become part of their lives, to make them realize who I was and what I was and how important they were to me and how important I must become to them. I went up to them. I put my head in his lap. I took one of her hands in mine and I kissed it over and over. Then the door opened. Doctor? What is it? I, uh... I hardly know how to tell you this. What is it? Your daughter is dead. <gasps> no! D d dead? She drowned herself. Uh, it's a little pool on the property. Oh, no. it's, not, it's not deep. She... She must have drowned herself purposely. Oh, I, I can't think how she managed it. She's, she's dead? I'm so very sorry. Oh. Then I knew the two who were still sitting there were not ghosts at all. They were people. Flesh and blood people. Real people. Very real now in their grief. They had come all this way to fetch their daughter home and she was dead. She had drowned herself in a little pool. I looked at my hands. There was water on my hands. And my hair was drenched in water. So very sorry. I wish there were something. There's, there's nothing, Doctor. Yeah. It happens sometimes when a patient feels the beginnings of his own recovery starts to feel afraid of what may lie ahead. Yes, I suppose. We see it rather often. It's hard to be sane. And they know it. Hmm. We'll go home now, Doctor. You'll let us know when to come back and get her and take her home. The doctor nodded his head and the two people left. Slowly, walking slowly, out to the car, getting into the car and closing the door. I hardly knew what to do. In what relationship did we stand now? If they were living people, what was I? Clearly, I had been confused in my analysis of the whole situation. They were real people. And I... I was nothing more than a ghost. I still loved them. And I could not desert them. I slipped back through a back window and crouched down on the floor. They didn't say a word to each other all the way home. I had no idea what I was to do next. The boy I had thought to be a ghost and now knew was as real as the other two came out to meet them. And my heart was wrung with pity when I saw the look on his face. He'd expected her to get out of the car, not just them. And I wanted to run to him and say, but I'm here, you see? I I'm right here. I'm really here. Only, of course, I couldn't do that. Because I was only a ghost. I've lived here for a whole year now. The house stays the same. I sleep every night in my pale blue room... Every night the bed is turned down and I crawl between the pretty sheets. The next day it is made up again. This summer the roses were more beautiful than ever. I would go out to the rose garden every morning at daybreak and pick a yellow one and put it at her place at the breakfast table. She thinks he does it and he lets her think so. Just this morning I left a particularly beautiful one. Oh, Frederick. <laughs> You've done it again, my yellow rose. Oh. Oh, that. I don't know how you manage. I never hear you sneak out. Well, you're always asleep. <laughs> she loved them so, the yellow roses. Yes, I know. 
Frederick. Yes, love. Do you feel sometimes that she's here in this house with us? Many times. So do I. I'm staying on. The boy has gone away to school, and they really need me. Everyone needs a ghost. No matter how busy our lives, how interesting our pleasures, there are depths of loneliness that neither work nor pleasure can plumb. A little core of ourselves that needs someone to talk to or simply to be with. Who can fill this need better than an understanding ghost? I'll be back shortly. The more I think about it, the more certain I am that each of us not only needs a ghost, but has a ghost. We cannot see it or touch it or hear it, but it is there. And it keeps us company when there is no one else. A ghost, perhaps, is no more than a memory of someone once well-loved. Our cast included Lois Nettleton, Carmen Matthews, Fred Gwynn, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. It's all right, Carl. It's just me. Allow uh, Mr. Stevens here to look through the viewer. Well, you are about to meet the man you uh, resemble so closely. I was looking through a viewer that fitted to my eyes like the mask on a periscope or an old stereopticon. By some trick of complementing mirrors, the entire room was revealed and somehow lighted at the same time so that even though the drapes were drawn and the room shaded, every detail was as clear as bright daylight. Too clear as I looked at the man sitting on a chair facing me. I could feel my stomach churn like I was going to be sick. I was literally frozen with horror as I finally saw why Durward Drake had chosen to become a recluse. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by all state insurance companies. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. A young man named Giovanni Guasconti came very long ago from the more southern region of Italy to pursue his studies at the University of Padua. Giovanni, who had but a scant supply of gold ducats, took lodgings in a high and gloomy chamber of an old edifice of a family long since extinct. One of the ancestors of this family had been pictured by Dante as a partaker of the immortal agonies of his inferno. So begins one of Nathaniel Hawthorne's finest short stories, which is a tale you're about to hear. Unforgettable, not alone as literature, but because it haunts and shocks to the root of the soul.
For some purpose, Giovanni, this man of science, Dr. Rappaccini, is making a study of you. I know that look of his. If you know him not, how should he know you? Dr. Battioni, I... I would only be surmising, and it is a subject I would rather not pursue. Heed me carefully. I would stake my life that if you are not already one of Rappaccini's inhuman experiments, you are marked for it. Our mystery drama, The Kiss of Death was adapted from the Nathaniel Hawthorne classic short story, especially for the Mystery Theater, by Ian Martin, and stars Kurt Peterson and Patsy Bruder. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Nathaniel Hawthorne described Giovanni as having a remarkable beauty of person, rather a Grecian than an Italian head, with fair, regular features and a glistening of gold among his ringlets. But the story he wove about him was as dark and menacing as his looks were light and open, and the terrible and tortuous fate which lurked in waiting for him was as exquisitely agonizing as any Dante contrived for his lost souls in the seven rings of hell. I did not catch your name, senor, as we boarded the coach. Giovanni Guascante. Ah, and mine, Salvatore Pergamo. You are young for an occupation. I am a student, sir. And not from our Tuscany? No, sir. From the south, Napoli. Ah, how came you then to Venice? My boat. All the way round the boot. There was no one of my family left, save only an uncle who died and left me a small estate to study with a friend of his in Padua. Ah, you do not go then on to Verona? No, sir. I must find a place to live with as few ducats as I possess and then seek out my uncle's friend who teaches in the medical school. Not by any chance Giacomo Rappaccini? No, I I do not know that name. Ah, so much the better for you. It has a large reputation for Italy, but not of the best. Who is your sponsor? Are you a medical man, Signor Pergamo? Un dottore? <laughs> By the faith, no. I am an exporter and importer of goods. It is in the course of the latter half of my business dealings I have run afoul of Dr. Apacini. Run afoul? I speak too freely to strangers. It is a fault of mine. I say only that Dr. Apacini has deep and strong interest in potent and very dangerous drugs or rather in plants that produce them. You are a young man of open heart and seeming promise. I am glad you will not be associated with him. Uh, Did you uh, tell me your sponsor's name? No. It is Master Pietro Barrioni, doctor professor at the university. Hmm. Where do you stay in Padua? I have no idea. Not with the old dottor Baglioni. Oh, no. He was a friend of my uncle's, but only a distant acquaintance of the family. I, I would not have him beholden to me further. Perbacco, I like you, boy. You have a good heart and an ease of manner that bespeaks you well. Here. There is in Padua an old nurse from our family who came into some property in a large house. Here is her address and a note from me. I am sure Dame Elisabetta Falcone will settle you comfortably and within your purse. Had I a son, I cannot think of quarters where you could be better or safer lodged. Si, signor. La Dame Elisabetta Falcone? At your service. To whom have I the honor of speaking? Giovanni Guascanti. I bear an introduction from an old friend, a signor Salvatore Pergamo. Oh, who... il maestro. Uh... Oh, mio. Any friend of my little boy. Is... Oh, come in, come in, I beg you. Uh, thank you. Prego. Oh, Salvatore. I was his nurse, you know. Oh, many years ago now. Uh, tell me, how is he? In good health, uh, happy? In the most excellent health, I should say, judging by his girth. Oh. He, he gave me a letter for you. Asking you forgive the script. Oh, bless the master. 
He can never bear to remember that I, who brought him up, can neither read nor write. But his signature and seal, that I recognize. Eh, eh, eh. Senor, would you be good enough to read what the paper says? Here, let me bring the lantern nearer. Right, it's simple enough. He says, Carissima. Uh This will serve to introduce a young man of good family and great prospects, whose purse is not yet heavy and must find lodging while he attends the university. I could wish him no better fate than you may find room to take him in. Oh, you could not come with a higher recommendation. Of course, you shall stay here. I followed her up the curving marble staircase. The ceilings and walls finished in great old frescoes. The paint now molding and peeling from the walls. I have a few tradesmen who board on the lower floors. Too damp and musty for the young maestro. Uh, I'm afraid you're not very taken with Padua. I miss the sun. There is a chill here in the bones. Or in the heart. You're homesick. I have no home left. My parents, all my family, are dead. Ah, then. That is enough to dim the sun for anyone. Eco, signor. <laughs> Magnifico. But can I afford it? Oh, oh, no one else is young enough to climb the stairs. Ah, but you have seen nothing yet. Come, come to the window. How beautiful. And how strange. Oh, surely there is as bright a sunshine as you left in Naples. Bright, uh, though not so warm. But what a magnificent garden. Is it not something it's special? Very, a, a botanical garden and so lovingly cared for. Does this belong to the house? Oh, no, senor. No, it's from the villa next door. Such strange, exotic plants. The purples and the the magentas. I I don't recognize any of them. No more than I. Observe the gigantic leaves, the huge, heavy blossoms. They're all imported, of course, for the great man who owns them. You see? Oh, that that, that is he. You you can see working at one of the beds by the stone urn near the statue. Surely that is no gardener in the scholar's garb of black? Oh, bless us, no. He permits no one else but himself to come near his plants. Uh, That is Dr. Rappaccini himself. Rappaccini? Ah, even in Naples you've heard his name, eh? No, not in Naples. Uh, More recently. Oh, well, I'm sure he's famous all over Italy and Europe and the world, for that matter. So, will the room suit you, do you think? Admirably. But uh, if it will suit my purse. Oh, we shall arrange that when you join us for the evening meal. If you will be my guest. Why, how kind. I, I... Oh, thank me later, young gallant. You may have the more reason. Keep your eye on the garden. There is one flower that adorns it, more beautiful than... Any you have already seen. The strange, eerie beauty of that garden below held me spellbound. I watched the tall, emaciated figure of the doctor tend his garden, so intent on his ministrations that he was oblivious to all else. Had an herb or a shrub escaped such a scientific and minute examination that it seemed as if he were looking into their innermost nature... And yet, he avoided inhaling their odors or actually touching them and walked among them with a caution that suggested a a man walking among malignant spirits. Obviously, he, he was not the one who cultivated them. I was just wondering who did when... Beatrice! Beatrice! Here I am, Father. Are you in the garden? Yes, and I need your help. I'll be down in a moment. And now I knew what Dama Falcone had meant when she said I had yet to see the garden's most beautiful flower. For brief as the glimpse I had had of her, this was the most radiant, the most vibrantly alive woman I had ever seen in my life. What is it, Father? Our chief treasure. It needs more care than I dare offer in my shattered state. I'm afraid you must take it over as all the others. Gladly. You know how I love them all. But this one... Oh, yes. I am talking to you, my sister. 
It shall be my task to serve you. And in return, you shall reward me with your perfumed breath, which is the breath of life to me. Never let her languish. She is my greatest triumph. And if truth be told, more than the breath of... What is it, Father? Something wrong? No. Nothing wrong. Come. The hour grows late, and the night air is not kind to my chest these days. Was the sickly, somehow menacing Dr. Rappuccini merely finished with his garden inspection? Or had he somehow spied me in the evening shadows of my lattice window? A bell sounding below took me away from my speculations, and I quickly descended to supper. So, all is settled to your satisfaction, and you desire to take the room? I already feel at home. If the agreed-on sum is enough... Oh, more than enough. I promise you I shall not be a roisterer. In fact, I anticipate spending a great deal of time in my room above that magic window. Uh I take it you have already seen its richest bloom. Uh, Yes, just before supper. Uh Signora Falcone, how can I gain an introduction to her? Do you... Oh, the Rappaccinis are far above my head. For all my villas next door, they might live in another world. But... Surely the great gentleman at the university, Dr. Baglioni, to whom you bear a note of introduction, will will know his fellow doctor. Of course. I shall sleep on the hope of that. (laughs) If indeed, after all that has happened to me today, allows me to sleep. Uh, At your age, sleep comes easily and welcome. When I awoke, I had overslept and was bone-weary from my travels and my new environment. But I was brought to immediate life by the sound of a voice already adored outside my window. Father, must you leave so soon? I have a lecture at the university. Is uh, all well with you here? Of course. I have been tending my, my sister. See how she lifts her head today since I've fed and nourished her. All velvet and sheen and rich and glimmering like the most precious of stones... You breathe a new life on it. As it does on me. You are the richer by far. If either of us are, what would we have without each other? You are lonely, Bellissima. For a little human companionship. Quite right. I must provide you some. But how? We could have a ball or a dinner party. No, no, no. Not in this house. This house, no, no. I know since Mother has gone, you have become a recluse, but it is changing. It is time to think of me. I know, and I promise I shall. But it is not a simple matter. I can wait, but not too much longer. I promise you, you shall not have to. I felt guilty eavesdropping from my window, but my heart cried out to have... Beatrice has my own. And somehow my mind cried out as loudly to forget her, to run, to leave while there was still time. Time for what? And then, suddenly, I realized what was so strange about the garden. All about me, outside it, in in other trees, the birds twittered and swooped and lived their lives. But in the garden of my loved one, no bird lived. And no bird sang. When has any threatened danger held back a man in love? And what danger could lurk in a garden of luxuriant and healthy flowers and shrubs? That Giovanni is about to find out and refuse to believe until the ultimate truth is too undeniable. I shall return shortly with Act Two. in the light of morning that tends to rectify whatever errors of fantasy or even of judgment we may have incurred during the sun's decline or in the less wholesome glow of moonlight. These are Mr. Hawthorne's words 
And what better ones to project that by the following morning, after a good sleep, young Giovanni, looking out his window in the bright sun, found the garden below him a lovely place. It was time to present himself at the university and to meet his sponsor, Il Dottore Baglioni. So, you wish to study medicine, hmm? I wish to provide myself with a livelihood since my patrimony will soon be exhausted. Oh, frankly spoken again, I like you. I think we might make a doctor of you yet. Report to me tomorrow at the hour of six in the morning. Now, you say you are settled with somewhere to stay? Yes, sir. At La Dama Falcone's house on the Via Eletto. Via Eletto. Via El... Is that near Il Dottore Rappaccini's house? Yes. The very next villa. I have been given to understand he is a man of considerable renown. Uh, yes, the... The name is known. I had gathered more than that. Even famous? Rappaccini. Hmm. A brilliant and amazing man. It is his theory that all medicinal virtues are comprised within those substances we call vegetable poisons. Human life means very little to him. Oh, now and then he achieves a miraculous cure, but in my private mind, these are more probably the work of chance. Well, I must confess, I am only interested in Signor Rappaccini because of his daughter. <laughs> With at least half the young men in Padua, huh? of whom few have ever seen her face. Nay, nephew of my old friend, in this I, I am of more hindrance than help. I am afraid an attempted introduction from me to my rival or his daughter would amount to the kiss of death. I beg you to stay away from Rappaccini and his wild obsessions. Too close an acquaintance with him might prove for you what I already jokingly termed myself, the kiss of death. I returned to my lodgings, and on an impulse, I, I bought a fresh bouquet of flowers from a florist I passed. Arriving home, I mounted breathlessly to my eyrie and was rewarded to see my enchantress engaged below in the garden. She was in the act of being about to pluck one of the strange exotic flowers from the special plant by the fountain when, on an impulse, I cried out, By your leave, signorina. Who calls me? Giovanni Guscanti, your servant and admirer. Do not pluck that flower. And why not, pray, signor stranger? Because I have here such fresh and lovely and healthful flowers as should adorn such beauty and grace. May I dare to toss them to you and ask you to wear them for my sake? Thus, uh, I thank you, good sir. You speak our language softly and in a different manner from what my ears are used to. Are you from some other land? No. I am Italian, as you, but from the south. You seem quite fair. Unlike the few... Uh, unlike the other young men I have met. I wish we could meet more formally. And so do I. If, if I were to call and, and present my compliments to your father? No. That is not the way. Uh, not yet. But perhaps sometimes we can talk like this. Only it's so far. I, I wish I could show you my garden. I wish I could walk in it with you. At least if we cannot. Yet. Let me return your gift by throwing you one special flower. I believe it's too far for you to cast it. Since I've already picked it, at least I can try. Ready? Yes, as high as you can. Oh, I, I have it. Oh, no. Don't fall. It had to be one of us, so I let the blossom go. Try again. Not for the world. I would not risk... Luigi! In the garden, Father. I, I shall be in directly. If you should be in your room tomorrow afternoon... Oh, I'm afraid I shall be at my studies at the university. But Let soon, I hope... Tonight there is chill. Come in. Coming? Yes, so do I hope. Soon. And thank you for my flowers. I will guard them and keep them well. 
is it some trick of imagination in the half-light after sundown? But as she turned and fled up the garden path, did my eyes deceive me that my lovely bouquet was already withering in her grasp? What nonsense. I, I tried to tell myself there was no possibility of distinguishing a faded flower from a fresh one at so great a distance. And my hand, where I had touched her flower, burned with a fever of longing. It was three days before I had returned to my full senses again, weak from loss of weight and the debilitating effect of some raging poison that had drained my system. I awakened to see Dama Falcone's kind and worried face hovering over my bed. Ah, oh, so we are awake at last and in our senses, eh? Oh, Signora, what are you doing in my room? Oh, what have I been doing the last three days under the Dottore Baglioni's orders, but keeping cool compresses on your brow and feeding you gruel to keep body and soul together? Have I been ill then? Oh, with such a raging of the blood that our good Dottore was worried about you till this morning. What caused it? Even he is not sure. There are infectious germs about this time of year. And after your long trip and the shock of losing your family, Dr. Baglioni thinks you fell prey to one of them. Three days? What time is it? The afternoon? Oh, it wants several hours of sunset yet. No, 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 you must not sit up yet till the Dottore returns. Oh, I just want to... Oh... I am weak. Can you see in the garden? Is, is the Signora Rappuccini there? <laughs> no one without business save the docks have been abroad these days. It has rained as if it were time to start building a second arch. Oh, Dio, that will be the good Dottori back. I must go down and let him in. As soon as she had left the room, I found my way weakly to the window. Um, gray curtain of rain blurred the empty garden below. I staggered back to my bed, my feet unsteady, my brain reeling. Had I really tossed a bouquet of flowers to Beatrice? And did I remember catching but letting fall the blossoms from the garden she threw me in exchange? Then I blacked out again. Not to come to till I found Dr. Baglioni examining me. Well, 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 well. A fine way to start out learning to be a doctor, my young friend, huh? Will it make you a better physician to begin as a patient? I don't know, sir. Well, not if you start out a dead one. But it seems you will recover. What has ailed me? Some unique humor of the blood. Thanks be to God you responded well when I bled you. You should be on your feet very soon. When? How soon? Oh, within the week, no doubt, with one as young and as vital as you. Meanwhile, rest and eat well. The good Dama Elisabetta will see that you are fed to regain the weight you have lost. How can I thank you enough for your aid and comfort? It is good to have a friend in a strange city. Ah, more than one. More than one. Surprisingly, someone else today inquired as to your well-being with what appeared to be great personal interest. Who? Dr. Rappaccini. What? I was not aware that you had made his acquaintance. Nor have I. Well, that is welcome news. For if you will follow my advice, you will have as little to do as possible with him. Why do you say that? For some purpose... This man of science is making a study of you. I, I know that look of his. I have seen that cold illumination as he bends over a bird, a mouse, a butterfly, which, in pursuit of some experiment, he has killed by the perfume of a flower. Now, if you know him not, how should he know you? I, I would only be surmising and... It is a subject I would rather not pursue. And an acquaintance you had better not either. For, heed me carefully, Signor Giovanni, I would stake my life that if you are not already one of Rappaccini's inhuman experiments, you are marked for it. By the next morning, as I awoke refreshed and feeling myself... Buongiorno, signor Guasconti. 
Buongiorno, Dama Falconi. Oh, out of bed, naughty boy. I bring you your breakfast to eat in bed. Oh, I have it here by the window. <laughs> now, you must eat everything and not allow the attention to wander. Oh, I will eat. I am famished. Oh, for food or for a sight of Rappaccini's daughter? I suppose nothing escapes that sharp eye of yours, Mother Falcone. And <laughs> not much. Or my ear. Oh, I think I could have told that doctor what ailed you better than he. What? I heard you and the signorina talking from the window. I think you are taken with a disease of the heart, no? Beatrice. Yes. <laughs> but it is hopeless, I'm afraid. If, if only I could meet and, and walk with her in the garden. Well... There is a private entrance into the garden from the street. A private entrance to Dr. Rappaccini's garden? Oh, shh, not so loud. Almost any young man in Padua would sell his soul or his birthright to be admitted among those flowers. You may have what little I have if you will show me the way. Oh, Tosh, I want nothing from you. No, I have been well paid already. And here is the key. I give it to you in return for one thing only. What? Name it. You are pale as a ghost and thin as a rail. Manja, senor, so you don't scare the girl half to death. I ate like a lion, dressed in my very best. My blessed guide, the Signora Falcone, led me along several obscure passages. Then suddenly we were at the door. I thanked her, turned the key easily in the lock, which must have been oiled. I was in Dr. Rappaccini's garden, practically under my own window. Welcome, senor. <laughs> you are not surprised to see me? A connoisseur of flowers such as yourself. After the lovely bouquet you tossed me four days ago, it is no marvel that my father's rare collection has tempted you to take a nearer view. Was it you who sent this key? Why, no. Well, then who? I know not. But does it matter? You are here. Come, I will show you our garden. If fame speaks true, you are as deeply skilled in these rich blossoms and spicy perfumes as your father. <laughs> no. Although I have grown up among these flowers, I know no more of them than their hues and their perfumes. Believe me. Oh, there is the flower you tried to toss me by my window. May the good Lord be blessed you failed to grasp it. Why? I, I wanted it very much for a keepsake. Methinks you owe me one. I shall pick it for myself. Oh, no! Touch it not! Not for your very life! It would kill you! Hiding her face, Beatrice rushes from him into the house, and his eyes following her behold within the shadow of the entrance the emaciated, ominous figure of the black clad Dr. Rappaccini. I'll return with Act Three. Bewildered and shaken by his strange encounter with the girl he loves, Giovanni has stumbled back to his room, suddenly overcome with the debility of his three-day illness, so faint that he is barely able to climb the stairs to his room. Once there, however, no matter how much his fever-weakened body longs for the bed, instinct or some deeper drive forces him to the window. But how could you have given him the key to visit me if you knew there was danger for him? No danger now, my little one. But to think that thoughtlessly, the other day I tossed a blossom from this to him. Had he caught it... <sighs> What would have happened to him? He would have died. Oh, sweet Mary, forgive me. You were innocent, my love. That would have been but small help to him. Oh, Papa, how can I let him continue to come, even supposing he ever wants to again? Come inside, daughter. This is no place to talk. We may be overheard if he is back in his room. If we are, then I say this. I know he loves me as I love him. But for his sake, I think it would be better he stayed away from me. No, 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 no. I have not long to live. And it is time for you to meet with someone. 
Let me explain just how this may be accomplished in spite of all. I have been studying on this for a long time, and I have come to a conclusion. Behind the drape on my window, I had listened to this conversation between Beatrice and her father. Now as I watched them disappear into the house, I looked down on that fateful, hideous flower that my beloved could fondle and kiss with no harm. Could it be so deadly? The answer was vouchsafed immediately. Crawling across one of the statues was a small chameleon, which in its passage had accidentally brushed against a tendril from the strange shrub. In a second, from the touch of that tendril, the lizard contorted itself in one writhing spasm, and then, as if eaten by invisible fire, crackled like a moth in a candle flame and was gone. I could think no more. I, I, I threw myself on the bed and mercifully passed into darkness. <laughs> Good morning, my young friend. Oh, oh. Good morning, Dr. Baglioni. So, what is this that La Lama Falcone has been telling me about you having a relapse and other things? Such as? That you have not only talked several times with La Signorina Rappaccini, but that you have also gained access to the garden and met her there. Yes, Signor. That is true. I look at you, and physically, you appear to have made a remarkable recovery. This morning, you literally glow with health. It is true. I feel rested and full of life. I'm forced to conclude that perhaps this strange distemper that attacked you is less of the mind than perhaps of the heart. You're right, doctor. Completely right. I am in love with... Beatrice Rappuccini. Oh, I feared as much. With no estate or name and with no prospects but a long term of study before me, you consider my suit as hopeless as I? I consider it hopeless for deeper reasons. I think you must have some suspicions of the truth already. Very well. I've been too late to stop Rappaccini's experiment with his daughter, but at least I can try to stop him from whatever new experiment he plans for you. For me? What interest could he have in me? I, I haven't even met the man. Well, where do you think the key came from that admitted you to the garden? Um, Beatrice. Who else? From Rappaccini. Ask the Dama Falcone if you don't believe me. It was placed in her hands by the doctor himself, along with a golden ducat to make sure she brought it to you. But why? I, I don't understand. Who, who can penetrate the clouded workings of this, this tortured mind? A man who would sacrifice his own daughter to his own obsession. Is there nothing we can do for her? I, I would gladly give my life. Let us not be too hasty. There may be a way to outwit Rappaccini yet. How? You see this little silver flask? It was wrought by the hands of the great Cellini. It must be priceless. Ah, yes, yes. But most of all, because of what it contains, one sip of the antidote in it would render all the poisons of the Borgias innocuous. Bestow it on your Beatrice... And we will thwart Rappaccini yet. Once my dear old friend had left, I hastened to dress. My heart buoyed with the hope that the silver flask would make all well. And then came the ultimate blow. A small bird had crashed against the pane of my open window and dropped to the ledge. I went to the poor little creature, lifting it and, and finding it still alive and only momentarily stunned. Soothingly, I brought it to my lips, touching them to its head, about to make a, a sound of reassurance. But to my horror, like, like the chameleon in the garden the day before, the touch of my lips galvanized it into one agonizing spasm, and then it dissolved into nothingness in my hands. At the same moment, the voice of Beatrice called me from the garden. Giovanni! Giovanni, are you there? What do you want of me now, accursed, poisonous witch? Oh, no! Come down to the garden. Let me try to explain. No need for explanations anymore. I am the only being your breath cannot slay. Your kiss may never kill. 
I stumbled from my room for the door and, and for the garden. I was a mass of conflicting emotions, love, hate, despair, and murderous fury as I faced Beatrice in that deadly garden. How can you pretend ignorance? Shall I prove the power I have gained from the pure daughter of Rappuccini? No, no, no proof is necessary. So you admit you have cast your poisonous spell on me. You saw what happened to the bird on the window? I saw, but it is not me. Believe me, it is my father's fatal science. How could you have not known? How could I have known? Locked up a prisoner all these years in this garden. My only companions, my father and the flowers. Particularly this evil thing of beauty that I pretended was a sister. Because I had no human being to share my love and friendship with. You must have known. You had to know. Yesterday when I reached for the blossom on this venomous vine, you cried out, touch it not. It will kill you. I did cry that out. And yet, a few days earlier when I brought you flowers, you tossed the same blossom to me at my window. Luckily, that had only grazed my fingers, for that touch alone was enough to put me in a flush, a fever that nearly killed me. I knew nothing of that. Where did you think I was? If I had been myself for all the love I had in my heart for you, don't you think I would have been daily at your window? I thought you were at the university studying as you told me you would be. Of course. All innocence. And having failed to dispatch me from a distance, you had to provide me entry to the garden to make sure to... Oh, oh dear. Forgive me. I, I, I don't know what I'm saying. It, it was you who saved my life. A life that, believe me, I never had dreamed stood in any danger from me or mine. Your life was the most precious thing in the world to me. And because of it, I had to drive you from me. Why? I was in no danger. Don't you see? I knew nothing till after my father had given you the key. Even then, the one thing he told me was that you must not touch this flower upon pain of death. I was so lonely for you. I loved you so. I wanted only to spend a little time alone with you. I had forgot the flower when you were near, and all the world seemed lovely. Before I knew that I was something hateful and poisonous, sister to that deadly flower. Where did it come from? My father created it. Created it? He knows all the vile secrets of nature. At the very hour when I first drew breath, this plant sprung from the soil, the offspring of his science, his intellect, while I was only his earthly child. But I grew up and was nourished by it. I thought of it as my sister, not as my doom. Not only yours, but mine. Look. No, you for me. You see, I picked the flower, and it is as harmless to me now as you. I have put my curse on what I love best. No curse, my daughter. Dr. Rappuccini. No curse. You made us both unclean. Unclean? Look at you. One step below gods, both of you, and I created you. Feel the power that courses through your veins. The magic gift my arts have brought you. You could quell the mightiest enemy with a breath. Shrivel the most monstrous onslaught against you with a touch. What more could you ask than to be as near immortal as man or woman may reach? I would have chosen to be loved, not feared. I am condemned forever to what I am. Our fate is not so desperate, thanks to my friend, Dr. Baglioni. Baglioni? That bumbling bigot! In this flask, Beatrice, is an antidote distilled of blessed herbs which can purify us. Then let us drink. No! I warn you. Drink of that flask and it can bring you only death. So powerful as the poisons you have thrived on, as powerful is that antidote. No human body could stand the conflict. Don't listen to him, Beatrice. Drink, and I will follow. Stop! I will not let you destroy my triumphs. I will shoot you first. He has a pistol. You will have to shoot me first, Father. If death is to be our portion, then let it be for all evil. What are you doing? Uprooting forever this venomous vine. Take it to your own bosom, where it belongs. Ah! I am undone. Oh, 
I did not mean to cause his death. I, I thought he was immune. No. My father was immune to nothing except love. And forgive him. He is better off dead. Now, quick, let us drink. It, it may mean death. You heard Dr. Rappuccini. I will not live as I am. Nor I. Then give it to me. I shall drink first. No. I shall pour half in the cap of the flask. The flask is for you. To the future, Giovanni. To our future. Whatever it may be. What future did these lovers find? Were they star-crossed as Romeo and Juliet? Or did the gods smile on them like Elizabeth and Robert Browning? Well, what does it matter, after all, if they were together? A good story doesn't always need an end. At least none beyond that the listener chooses to select and believe for himself. I'll be back shortly. I hear some murmurs of dissatisfaction with the ending. Then let us make a confession. The story, as you have heard it, does not end exactly as Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote it. If you must have an ending to this dark tale, you can read his solution. We can only say we thought poor Beatrice and her unlucky lover Giovanni deserved a better fate, dead or alive. And we left it to you to choose. Our cast included Kurt Peterson, Patsy Bruder, Arnold Moss, Bryna Rayburn, and Gilbert Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I wouldn't go in there if I was you. You wouldn't? Folks get lost in there. Been a lot of that. Oh, we won't get lost. I have a very good sense of direction. But all the same, you take my advice. You stay out of Dutchman's Woods. See, Ronnie? Oh, that's ridiculous. We can take care of ourselves. We're not going to get lost. Nobody aims to, of course. Folks do it, though. Yeah, I was going to ask you if Mrs. Griffin... Oh, Sarah would be uh, willing to put up a picnic lunch for us. Oh, she'll fix you up something for lunch. No trouble about that. Only thing is... Oh, we'll be very careful. Well, I'll... Uh... Just go to talk to Sarah about the lunch then. Thanks. But if I was you, I'd stay out of Dutchman's Woods. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. There's a land of the living and a land of the dead. And a steady stream of traffic keeps crossing the border that lies between them. But it's all headed in one direction. And yet, now and then comes word that someone has succeeded in reversing that direction. And we ask ourselves, is it true? Did it happen? Can it happen? 
There are those who insist we can never know and others who believe we are about to find out. Come back, Perry. Come back. Why? What have you got to offer me? I'll double your salary. I'm not impressed. Unlimited expense account. I don't think so. I'd just as soon stay here, where I am. I'm just as happy being dead. Our mystery drama, The Lazarus Syndrome, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mandel Kramer. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines, and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The word senator comes from the Latin senex, and it means an old man. The idea being that the elderly possess the experience and the wisdom to rule. Therefore, if you were old, you were worthy of respect. And being old is the best thing that could happen to you. However, as the Romans would say, O tempora, O mores, how things change. Today, if you're old, you're just not with it. And being old is the worst thing that can happen to you. Youth. Youth is what counts. But what's to be done? You have to grow older. That is, if you want to live. May I... Come in, Mr. Marston. Mrs. Flume. Why, of course. Oh, thank you. I, I, I would have had Miss Connor ask if I could see you, but she's on her coffee break, so I thought I'd just pop in. Well, that's quite all right. Well, what's new, Mrs. Flume? Well, I... I've been fired. What did you say? I've been fired after 31 years. I've been fired. But that's him. Who fired you? Mr. Davis. Davis? The, the office manager, the, the new one. Why? I don't know. He, he asked me to come into his office. And then he said to me, Mrs. Flume, the company is dispensing with your services. But he's not supposed to do that. Well, Mr. Marston, his job is to... Hire and fire people. But he's not supposed to fire you. My goodness, Mrs. Flume, we couldn't run this place if you weren't here. Oh, sir, I, I, I know you're very busy. And I, I didn't want to bother you, but... But I do need the job. What is this, uh, Davis's phone number? Oh, uh, uh, four, two, three. Well, Mr. Davis evidently needs to be straightened out. Oh, yes, Davis, this is Perry Marston. Yes. Davis, I understand that you fired Mrs. Flume, the receptionist at the main desk? Yes? Company policy? What company policy? I'm general manager, Davis, and I'm not aware of any such company policy. Well, I tell you that it doesn't exist. Put her back on the payroll. There. Oh, oh Mr. Marston... How can I ever thank you? You just go back to work, Mrs. Flume. Oh. And don't you worry about a thing. Oh! Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ready? Ready! Out! Came and set! Yeah, yeah, I can see. Hey, say. Oh, boy. What uh, kind of way is that to lose? On your own service? I've been hitting them long all morning. Well, what do you say? How about another set? Huh? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Why not? Okay. Oh, say, hey, wait a minute. Hmm? Uncle, what could I be thinking? We have a meeting with Standard at 145. Oh, that's right. Oh, come on. Let's, uh, let's sit at the table. We can order a drink, maybe a sandwich. Then we can shower and go. Okay? Fine, fine. Oh, there's that waitress. Hey, hey, Mary Lee. Two club specials for Mr. R. Marston and me. Okay? Oh, we can count on being served before Christmas. 
I wish they'd speed things up around here. Well, I guess it's all part of the old-fashioned charm. Well, times have changed. Tennis used to be an old-fashioned game. Now it's become an up-to-the-minute industry. You know, we, uh, we ought to get into it. Tennis? We have a clothing company that could be turning out tennis togs. We have a petrochemical division that should be involved in those composition materials they use on tennis courts. Fantastic growth potential. Yeah, I suppose so. You suppose so? <laughs> Come on. Don't you see it? Well, look, Mr. Gotham. Do you uh, mind calling me George? <laughs> All right, George. <laughs> Makes me feel awkward being called Mr. by someone 20 years older than me. 20? Well, actually, 24. You're 53. I'm 29. You've come a long way in a short time. Well, that's the world today. It belongs to the young. Uh, what were we talking about? Oh, oh, yes. The fantastic growth potential in tennis for the corporation. Frankly, I don't see where it involves the computer division. You don't? Well, should I? Perry. Perry, you're not just general manager of digital systems. You're the head of the Digital Systems Division of the United Marketing Corporation. <laughs> Come on. Your thinking cannot be parochial. Well, yes, but my particular expertise is in the manufacture of computers. United Marketing didn't buy digital systems just because there was a computer company lying around. It's all part of a growth strategy. I understand. And we spent a long time deciding who to keep and who to let go. We decided to keep you. Do you know why? Because I know my job. Yes. But also because you're surprisingly young for your age. You mean 53 is old? <laughs> well, a great many 53-year-olds are too old for United Marketing. Too fat, too stodgy, too deep in a rut. So I was surprised when I saw you. Why? Well, you project a very youthful image. You're in great shape. and You have... Tremendous vitality. You play terrific tennis, which is the game today. <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. Our whole culture, our whole economy is geared to youth. We have young values. I guess I never thought about it. I guess I've been too involved with computers. Yeah, this is an impatient country. It wants instant answers. Immediate gratification. And you approve of this? Well, I'm not required to approve or disapprove. Well, what are you required to do? <laughs> I'm required to earn a profit for our stockholders. Oh. And so are you. We do that by analyzing the market. It's a market that's dominated by youthful thinking. Or so-called thinking. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You know, I, uh... <clears throat> I had a little incident today with a personnel manager place. Oh, who's that? Well, you have a fellow named, uh, Davis. Oh, yes, Fred Davis. Uh, what about I asked him to fire somebody. What? Davis can't hire or fire anybody above the level of stenographer. Or a typist in mailroom. I mean, that kind of job. Mm -hmm. I know that. Anyhow, a week ago or so, I said to this Davis, I want you to fire that main floor receptionist. <laughs> and just the other day, there she still was at the desk. Oh? He said that he did fire her, but that you had rehired her. That would be Mrs. Flume. Or whoever she is. Uh, I want her out of here. What do you want with my poor receptionist? I told you. I want her out. But why? She knows the company inside out. She knows where everybody is, what they're doing. She's courteous. She's efficient. Mm -hmm, that well may be. So what's wrong with her? She's old. Perry, we're selling more than machinery. We're selling an idea. We're the newest, most progressive outfit in the market. So, you walk in the reception room of Digital Systems, and what's the very first thing you see? Aha! Uh -huh. An old lady. Look, she's grown old in the service of this company. She's been paid for it. But she doesn't have a company pension or anything like that. She's been aware of it all these years. Those were the terms of her employment. She accepted them. You're really serious about this? Yes. And you should be, too. Look, she was here before I was. She was sitting out at that desk when I walked in to apply for a job. I understand all that. Look, you're being sentimental. You mean there's no room for that in business? Not really. <laughs> Perry, I can tell you don't like me. Well, I don't like you right now. Mm. But I know how to build up a corporation. 
I structured along certain guidelines. I play the game according to certain rules. Your own rules? Of course. But I stick to them, Perry. I'm not a hypocrite. You always know where you stand with me. And where do I stand right now? Well, you won't make an issue of this, will you? I don't know. Look at it this way. We've standardized the decor of all the offices. The same furniture, the same colors. We must have the same look to the people. Bright, good-looking, youthful. <laughs> Here comes that waitress with lunch. Oh, she sure takes her time. Well, what do you expect? She's over 40. Now, oh, Perry, I know it sounds silly, pointless, even stupid. But you have to have a young receptionist, George. George, listen to me. This company has been her whole life. Her husband died many years ago. She never had any children. She should have. She never remarried. Perry, you're blowing this thing up out of all proportion. Now, you know what you have to do. And don't let it ruin our lunch. Miss Connor, uh, this note you left on my desk, uh, the one about Mrs. Flume... Yeah, now look, uh, the idea is she wants to know when I'll be in so, uh, so that she can see me. The fact is, uh, there just is no point in my seeing Mrs. Flume, so uh, you, you, you just tell her, okay? I mean, just get me out of it gracefully, will you? How do you feel? I feel like having a drink. Mm, the doctor says you can have one before dinner every night. Well, I've been looking forward to it all day. It's one of the advantages of having a heart condition. Sometimes. I do not have a heart condition. You were told to watch yourself. We should all watch ourselves. I heard a story about you. I wonder if it's true. No. Because if it is, I shall be very angry. Yes, dear? I understand you've been going to the club every day this week. Of course, that's why we're members. Mm -hmm. And you've been playing tennis every day. Well, naturally, it's a tennis club. <sighs> Singles. Well... Oh, Perry. The doctor said you have to cut down. I'm not an invalid. Oh, well, nobody said you were. Well, then what's this all about? Dr. Gordon said it would be a good idea oh. if you eased up a bit. You're not getting younger. You happen to be under some very grueling tension. Everything is under control. Perry, you're talking to me. The doctor says the way things are going, you're a good candidate for a cardiac episode, which is another name for a heart attack. I have never had that kind of problem in my life. And hopefully you never will. Dr. Gordon laid down a set of rules. You're playing two and three sets at lunchtime. Singles. Hard, tough matches. With George Gotham. Oh, Perry, he's half your age. Well... Pick it up. It's for you. I am. Uh... It's exactly 6.30. I told her you'd be home. You told who? This very nice elderly lady. She's your receptionist, uh, Mrs. Flume. She wants oh, to talk to you. Look, I know, I know. Abigail, please, tell her I'm not home. She said it's very important. I understand, but just tell her I'm not home. You want me to lie to tell her? Tell her I had to fly to Chicago. We're not going to tell her anything. Somebody has to answer the phone. Oh, I don't have to. It isn't for me. Abigail, I just want you to do me this favor. Now, please get me off the hook. Oh, there's a hook? What kind? Oh, it's nothing. Then talk to her. All right, all right, I will. Hello? Hello? Ha no one on the line. I guess you thought there was no one home. But she'll call again. What's it about? I don't want to discuss it. It's not important. Well, then why is your face flushed? Who, who says it is? Well, I'm looking at you. Let me feel your pulse. Oh, Abigail, stop now. But this is what Dr. Gordon said to look out for. Do, do you have any pain? I am all right. I am perfectly all right. Well, why are you breathing so hard? Look, if you'll just let me sit down for one minute, I'll be fine. I'll be perfectly fine. Maybe he won't. But he's not alone, is he? There are so many of him in our society. The cool, efficient men of affairs. 
Capable, competent, seemingly without nerves. But that's all on the outside. As you know, it is the purpose of the second act to peel away some of the protective layers and examine what lies within, which we shall do shortly. Philosophers, the romantics, have made quite a mystery of the heart. The heart is the seat of life, the source of love. The heart is the inspiration for mankind's most tender sentiments, perhaps. But the physical fact is the heart is just a mass of tough muscle. All that the heart is supposed to do is beat, and it will if you treat it right, for years and years and years. Well, you had this chest pain. Well, it really wasn't much of a pain, Doctor. It was, uh, you know, kind of more on the left arm. But it lasted for, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe a couple of minutes, you know. And then it was over. I felt fine. Uh, well, you're all right now. Your EKG is normal. Well, that's good. You know what I think? I think it was some kind of indigestion. Yeah, that's what you think, Perry. But you came here to find out what I think. Well, the reason I say this is because uh, I had a pretty heavy lunch and... It, it, it just didn't seem to sit very well. Uh-huh. If you had a heavy lunch, you probably broke your diet. You <laughs> see, that's going to be another problem. You had what a layman would call a heart attack. Oh, now, Doc. Oh, it was very mild. But we're getting there. Getting where? Well, I guess you would say nowhere. A very big nowhere. Now, look, Doc, I know I have to watch myself. Then why don't you? I mean, you're not losing weight. You're pushing yourself. Abigail tells me you play too much tennis. And you're under a terrible nervous strain. Well, you see, my company was swallowed up in a big merger. And uh, we're on a youth kick. Well, what does that mean? Well, I mean, look at look at us, huh? You you and me. We're both in our early 50s. Now, you, you're considered to be at, at the very peak, the height of your ability and earning power. Me? I have to scratch and scramble to hold my job. Yeah, well, there's something wrong with that. Well, don't look at me. I didn't set up the rules. Well, I can only tell you one thing. Your heart doesn't care about your business problems. It has to be treated right. Look, all these things sound very wise here in your office. You know, away from the strains and all the stresses. But I'm out there in the trenches, Doc. And I have to fight that daily battle. If your job is that destructive, quit. Yeah, and where will I get another one? Well, if you don't lead a more sensible and moderate life, you won't need any job at all. Uh, say, Perry, have you got a minute? Sure, sure. Come in. Sit down. Look, are you free tomorrow for lunch? Well, tomorrow's Saturday. Gee, I, uh, I don't know if Abigail has us down for anything. I don't think so. But I guess I'd better be free, huh? Say, you make me sound like Simon Legree. You have a lot in common. Our petrochemical division has come up with this tennis court surface. An outfit called Worldwide Resorts is building one hotel after another with lots of courts. Now, we have a chance for some real sales. Mm -hmm. Where do I come in? Worldwide Resorts is two brothers. Tom and Harry Hickman. They're both tennis nuts. So I arranged a match. The two of us against the two of them at the club. Oh, well, the idea is to show them we just don't sell tennis courts. I mean, we're tennis bugs ourselves. We give it that real love and affection. <laughs> okay? Yeah, yeah, but I, uh, I hope this heat wave breaks, that's all. Come on, Perry. You mean you're going to let a little hot weather bother you? You must be getting old. Good morning. Breakfast? Uh, just coffee. That won't be much of a breakfast. I'm on a diet, you know. Hmm. It says here in the paper today's going to be a scorcher in the 90s and humid. Yeah, it feels like it. <sighs> you going to play? I suppose so. Oh, I can't imagine that anyone would want to play tennis in this heat. Well, it won't be too bad. Okay, I won't say another word. Look, Abigail. Yes, what is it? I, this is a business date, really. I don't want to know. What's in it for me if I keep nagging and nagging? Well, you're right, but, you know, there are certain situations. Wait a minute. What? Oh, no. What's the matter? What's wrong? Oh, that poor old lady. Who? Mrs. Flume, your receptionist. 
What's wrong with Mrs. Sloan? I can't believe what I'm reading here in the morning paper. She's dead. She's dead? Mm. Uh, Mrs. Abigail Flume, age 67, widow of the late Walter Flume, died last night of what police say was a massive overdose of sleeping pills. Oh. Mrs. Flume lived in a furnished room at 7 Tell Street. Her landlady says Mrs. Flume was severely depressed by the loss of her job with digital systems. Mrs. Flume leaves no survivors. Mm. She was 67. Yeah. Summation of a lifetime. She leaves no survivors. How lonely she must have been. How well did you know her, Perry? Hmm? Oh, she, uh... She was just a receptionist. Oh, but for such a long time. Didn't you ever get to, well, you know, have a talk? Well, no. I mean, uh, you know, uh... She, she was just a receptionist. Hmm. So, uh, it would be, uh, Good morning and good evening. Why do you suppose she kept phoning you? Oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't have the faintest idea. Then why didn't you want to talk to her? I don't know. Maybe maybe she wanted me to intercede for her so she could keep her job. Couldn't you? Well, it wouldn't have done any good, Abigail. We have this mandatory retirement plan at the company. I didn't know you had a retirement plan at the company. Well, we're talking about it. Oh, poor woman. Well, I mean, what what could she expect? Perry. I mean, nobody asked her to make the company her whole life. She should have found some other things, some, some other people to, to, to fill her days. I mean, the woman was stupid. Oh, Perry, she's dead. Well, does that endow her with some kind of nobility? Well, why are you so angry? I'm not angry. I'm not. I, uh, I have to make a phone call. Well, who are you calling? Um... Who are you calling? I'm calling George. George? Uh, uh, I, I guess you're up, aren't you? Is that what you called me to ask? Uh, is the match still on this morning? Why wouldn't it be? Well, it, it's going to be one of those days, George. One of which days? You know, hot and humid. Uh, what does that have to do with anything? Well, say, I'm glad you called. Do you think you can get there a little early so we can really warm up? Well, yeah, yeah, I, I guess so. Great. See you in about an hour. Sure. We're going to kill him. Uh, maybe I'll have another cup of coffee. I had a long talk with Dr. Gordon. Now, look, honey. And you know what he told me? He said that there was no reason why I should develop a condition myself. All I could do was take a rational position. On a day like this, you have no business doing anything but relaxing. Honey, I just don't want to argue about it. <sighs> Darling, we're never going to argue about anything. This thing is complicated, Abigail. I just have to come to grips with it. But timing is, is going to be essential. That sounds very logical. But what does it mean? All right, now listen. We're going to have the new AX99 on the market in less than a month now. Now, that's my baby. And everybody knows it. We're going to set fantastic sales records. Then my position will really be secure. You mean it isn't secure now? Well, when you work for a large corporation, your position can never be secure. But didn't you just say that with this new AX99 that your position would be really secure? Well, these things are, are relative. Oh, I understand. Well, I'm glad you do. I understand that sooner or later one thing is bound to happen. You're going to be fired. That's one of the rules of the game. Except it isn't a game. It wasn't a game for poor Mrs. Flume. It's getting late. Is there gas in the station wagon? Well, Perry, don't go. I thought you said that we were never going to argue anymore. I'm sorry. I have to go, Abigail. I just have to. Hey, great. Bright and early. Come on, let's hit a few. Okay. Oh, listen. Did you see the paper this morning? About that lady, Mrs. Flume? Yeah, yeah. Ah, it's too bad. Uh, Jerry Thorpe. He's our corporate PR guy. He, he's going to fix that up. He's going to fix what? Is he going to bring her back to life? <laughs> no, no. He's going to get a follow-up and uh, sort of change the thrust of the article. What's that mean? Well, it says she lost her job at Digital Systems. It sounds as if she was fired. She was? Well, that's not a good image. It points us up as some 
heartless corporation that fires poor old ladies and drives them to suicide. Well, aren't we? And don't we? Yeah, but we don't have to emphasize it. Well, what do we do about it? Jerry Thorpe will sort of create the impression that she really wasn't fired. That she wasn't? No. Actually, she felt it was time to retire. Oh. And once she took that step, well, she just sort of pined away. Mm-hmm. Only that isn't true. Yeah, but who knows that? I do. And you do. And Fred Davis does. Sure. But we're not going to tell anybody. Now, come on. What do you say we get started? Sure. One thing about these two guys, uh, the Hickman brothers, they expect you to play to win. Sure. If we beat them, that's the best way to ensure getting the order. So let's sharpen up, partner. We have to go all out. Hey, that's doing it. That's moving around the court. Hey, let me hit a few to your deep backhand. Yeah. Uh, Be here any minute. Hey, you want to bang in a couple of serves? Yeah. All right. Okay, go ahead. I'm ready. Uh, okay. Okay. Hey, Terry, what's the matter? Hey, is something wrong? Uh, oh, hey, you want to you want to drink a water? Oh. Hey, Perry. Oh, Perry. Hey, for crying out loud. Hey, hey, hey! Somebody get a doctor. My, Perry, what is it? Chest. I, I can't. I can't. It's my heart. I, I go have an attack. Hey, Perry, you can't do that. Uh, Somebody get Rogers out here. You know that CPR stuff. Get an ambulance. I don't want to die. What is it, Perry? What is it? Did you hear me? I don't want to die. Somebody help me. This pain. I, I can't take it. Do something. Somebody do something. And suddenly it can all come down to this. No matter how rich, how smart, how powerful, how important you may be, something inside you, a little tube or muscle or nerve, strains, breaks, or just doesn't function. And you're on that frontier. You're on the border between life and death. Suddenly, which way you go will depend on the kindness and competence of strangers. I'll continue with Act Three shortly. There is the outer man, and there is the inner man, or perhaps we should say person. The outer person is the familiar one, the recognizable one. What are we inside but an incredibly complex arrangement of bones, muscles, nerves? Inside each of us is the most complicated mass of machinery ever created. You would think most of us would take better care of it. This is 14. I got a code here. I'm bringing him in. Cardiac arrest. You shouldn't try to talk, Perry. I'm dying. I know I'm dying. Just, just take it easy. Don't try to say anything. It's so dark. It's so dark. Why is it so dark? Hey, driver, can't you move this thing faster? Dr. Gordon, Dr. Gordon, report to CIU. Dr. Gordon, cardiac intensive care, report to CIU. It's getting darker. So dark. Uh, let's hook him up, nurse. He's moving his lips. Perry. Perry, you're in the emergency room. You just try to relax. Dr. Gordon, I don't think he can hear you. What have they given him? Uh, lidocaine, 110 cc's. I'll give him 50 more. Right. Start the IV flowing. Watch for a reaction to that lidocaine. Yes, doctor. Oxygen, oxygen. Don't let me die. Let me die. Watch his blood pressure. I can't see. I can't see. It's flat. Pressure is flat. He's going on us. Don't say that. Perry. Perry, listen to me. But he can't hear you, doctor. How do I know he can't? How do you know? Die. Die. Perry, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you. It's me, Dr. Gordon. I can hear you. Perry, if you can hear me. Try to squeeze my finger. Just try. I'm trying, but I can't. I don't 
Get her easy. Don't say that. They're slipping. They're falling away. If we have any chance at all, you'll discourage him. He hears you. He hears everything. I'm going. Fifty cc's more of that ladder came, nurse. Yes, doctor. Perry, don't give up. Don't let go. Can you hear me, Perry? Don't give up. Hold on. Hold on. I'm falling. I'm falling. Oh. What happened? What happened to the pain? I feel marvelous. Doctor, I feel marvelous. Hello, Mr. Marston. Mrs. Flume. Yes. But you're dead. Of course. And so are you. I'm dead? But look around you. Did you ever see anything so beautiful back on Earth? Earth? The other world. No. I never did. Oh, such colors. Such glorious colors. And peaceful for everything is. Yes. Such a wonderful feeling. I, I feel I I want to make you welcome. Welcome, Mr. Marston. Oh, I want to stay here. Oh, you will. You will. I want to be part of this. What a feeling it is. Just joy. Just love. Yes. Everyone who loves you is here. Mrs. Flume, forgive me. Please, for not helping you. I don't remember that. But I do. And soon you won't either. I should have helped you keep your job. It doesn't matter. Whatever we did before doesn't matter now. But... All that matters is love. Yes. Love. I feel so much love. Those of us who loved each other before... Still love each other here, forever. Oh, I loved you so much. You loved me, Mrs. Flynn? Oh, yes. Yes. I never knew that. I loved you because you cared about me. Please, Mrs. Flynn. Every day would stop for me when you said, Good morning, Mrs. Flume. With that smile and that sparkle in your eye. Please. It would begin beautifully and end beautifully when you would say, Good evening, Mrs. Flume. Oh, you cared. They weren't just empty words of meaningless greetings. I feel so badly. Oh, you can't feel bad. Not here. Here you can only feel at peace. You can only know joy. I could have saved you. I didn't. But you paid for it with worry and sorrow. It broke your heart. That's what happened to you. Your heart just broke. Yes. They don't understand these things down there. They call it cardiac arrest and so many other names. But what happens is that the heart... Yes. It just breaks. But here, it's mended. Everything is mended. Welcome. Oh, welcome, Perry. Mother. Mother. Yes, Perry. Yes, child. Mother, you look so beautiful. Oh, Perry, you became such a handsome man. I always knew you would. Mother will never be separated again. Of course not, child. Dad? Dad, is that you? Yes, Perry. Yes, son. Dad, I never even knew you down there. I never really knew you either. You were killed in the war. Was I? I don't remember. Yes, Dad. (laughs) It was such a long time ago. We have so much to talk about. We have forever, son. It's so good to see you. It's so good to be here with you. Will Abigail be here? Will my wife come here, too? Oh, yes. One day. Then it will be complete. What have I done to deserve this? You've been a good, 
kind human being. Well, I tried to be. I tried. Give him the lighter cane right now. Who's that? I'm getting a pulse. Who's that? Mother? Mother, where are you? I'm here, Perry. Here. Mother, something is pulling me away. I'm being pulled away. Get the stronger pulse. Mother? Dad? Mrs. Flume? Hold on to me. I'm being pulled away. Say, he's trying to talk. It's a miracle. He's coming back. I don't want to come back. I want to stay here. See, we didn't really lose him. I don't want to come back. Mother, where are you? Dad, where are the colors? And the music? And the warm, glorious feeling? Where is it? Where is it? More oxygen, that's it. He's coming around. He's coming around. These sounds. The noise. Where am I? Oh, good Lord in heaven. He's back with us. Hello, Perry. Dr. Gordon? Yes. Yes, it's me. Where? Where? Where's what? Nothing. Ah, you had a very rough time. Rough? I know it's hard to talk. You must be very sore. You had an oxygen mask over your face. You had an airway going down your throat. We had to pin down your tongue. My left side hurts. I know. But you're going to be better. Will I? Oh, yes. You're improving every second. You need lots of rest. Starting right now. Lots of rest. Hi, dearest. How do you feel? No. Oh, pretty good. George Gotham was here. Was he? Wants to know when you're coming back. Mm-hmm. He has to reschedule that match with the Hickman brothers. Yeah. You know... I was in the emergency with you while while you were being worked on. I thought you were. They called me from the hospital. But by the time I got there, you were out. Yeah. I even heard some of the nurses saying you were dead. I know. I heard them. I, I thought you were dead, too. Did you? Yes. In that room, there are all kinds of things going on, you know, beeping and beating and pumping and whatnot. I know. Everything kept going downhill, getting weaker and fainter. And then suddenly, for a moment, everything just stopped, cold. I remember. How could you remember? That's when the nurse said, we lost him. Oh, but Dr. Gordon, he just kept working. I don't know, injecting, massaging. I could really see. And I had the funniest feeling. Um, Ask me, ask, ask me what it was. What was it? I had this feeling you were fighting against it, that you were resisting it. You didn't want to come back. Is that true? Yes. And it wasn't my imagination? No. I was dead. I'm sure I was dead. And I was in this absolutely magnificent place. What sort of place? How do you picture heaven? Oh, just a, a glorious... <laughs> well, I don't know. And I met my mother and my father and Mrs. Flume. I'll tell this to you, Abigail, but to no one else. I was really dead. Dead? I but... was dead. You have to believe me. You may have thought you were dead. No. I don't say a thing like that lightly. I was dead. Try to believe me. All right, I'll, I'll try. And for some reason, I came back. What reason? Maybe I was sent back. Sent back? Why? I went to a place where it was all love. Everything was love. I mean, here, that kind of love has... Well, it's just become rare. 
I might have been sent back to... Well, to help encourage that kind of love and create more of it. Can you believe that? Yes, I can believe that. Would you help me? I'd like to try. No, there's nothing very big or very difficult about it. We just have to live at peace with everyone around us. That shouldn't be too hard to do. Even if it is. We have to try. There once was a man named Lazarus. He came back from the dead. Yes, and he may not have been the only one. More and more, doctors, nurses encounter situations where patients are actually, clinically, legally, medically dead. And for some reason, they revive and return. They tell of marvelous things that have happened to them. It has happened often enough for doctors to take note of it and to give it a name, which, appropriately enough, happens to be the Lazarus Syndrome. I, too, shall return. What is life and what is death? Is it a continuation? Are we on some infinite journey? And is this life a stage along the way? The sophisticated scientist looks at the stars through his modern instruments. The unlettered savage stares at the heavens with his naked eyes. The scientist may see more facts, but does he really know more of the essence of existence? Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Lloyd Batista, Ann Williams, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Oh, my goodness! What is it, Miss May? The headlines, look. Ripper strikes again. Oh, oh good heavens, that's awful. Perfectly awful. Read it, Mrs. Pearson, read it. I am. Oh, no, no, out loud, I mean, I want to hear. But you just finished reading. Well, all right. Ripper claimed another victim last night. Thursday night, Thursday. He always kills on a Thursday. This time, another attractive widow, Mrs. Henry Dodd. Always a widow, always a widow. Miss Mapes, please. The body, gruesomely slashed and mutilated, was discovered by a neighbor who, hearing Mrs. Dodd's hysterical screams, rushed to her apartment. There she found the comely young widow lying in a pool of blood. <laughs> And a message scrawled in red lipstick across one wall. Stop me. Please stop me. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The administration of justice requires absolutely that certain men render judgment on other men. It seems to me that these judges can become so burdened by this responsibility that their lives become very nearly insupportable, provided they are men of conscience. 
And the man whose story we now bring you is indeed a man of conscience. And his life, at this time, well nigh insupportable. For heaven's sake, Jack, keep your voice down. He'll hear you. He knows how I feel. Then why keep after him about it? I'm warning him. Don't you understand that? Doesn't anybody understand that? Doesn't he? I think you can leave it up to him to decide. No, I can't. Because he doesn't know. He doesn't realize the man must die. The man has got to die. Our mystery drama, The Man Must Die, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars William Prince and Christopher Tabori. It is sponsored in part by imported Vigna Rosé wine and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The Right Honorable Joseph Bailey is 50 years old, has a wife and a son, Jack, age 18. The judge is a man of both strength and sensitivity, a fine combination in anyone, but most especially in a man who holds and must exercise the power to dispose of the futures and sometimes the very lives of others. We first meet Judge Bailey at a time when his life has become almost insupportable. And don't eat so fast, Joe. You know what it does to you. I don't want any more coffee, Ellen. Why not? What's the matter with it? Nothing's the matter with it. I just don't want any more. But you always have two cups. Well, this morning I don't. Oh. This is the day, isn't it? This is the day. I know you've been dreading it. You can say that again. Well, now, dear, don't you think that just because this is the day, you should start it off right? Now, relax and enjoy your breakfast and... Well, maybe a good, brisk walk to the courthouse? I was planning on walking. It's a lovely day. Joseph, don't eat so fast. Now, have I want to get started. But it's early. You don't want to hang around down there, do you? No. I don't want to hang around here, either. Why not? Oh, because of him. Because of him. I don't think he's even out of bed yet. Oh, yes, he is. I heard him moving around. Well, in that case... But I don't know what you're going to do with your time. Court doesn't begin until 10. I'll get some coffee. Oh, it breaks my heart to have you drink cheap coffee when you could be drinking mine. I'll do some reading in my chambers. You're too wrought up to do any reading, I can tell. Well, I'll do something. Anything's better than being here when Jack comes downstairs. I simply cannot go through that one more time. I cannot. Well... You'd better hurry. I think I hear him. Where's my coat? It's in the closet. Where else would it be? Oh, oh yes. Now, don't brood. No, I, I won't. You always do the right thing. <laughs> well, I'm glad you think so. Bye, dear. Now, take care. Father. You, you talk to me. I him. will. Father. Sneaked off, didn't he? Now, that's no way to talk about your father, Jack. Didn't want to face me. Come now, have your breakfast. Didn't want to listen to me. Your father has heard enough out of you, Jack. I shouldn't have to remind you that your father is quite capable of making his decisions without your help. He's done it on his own for a good many years. This man's a murderer. I know that. And your father knows that. It's not the first murder trial your father's presided over. What's he decided? Is it going to be death or the penitentiary? Well, I have no idea what he's decided. I, I don't even know that he has decided. He may very well be thinking it over. That's, that's probably what he's doing right now. But he must have given you some idea which way he's leaning. <laughs> Eat your eggs, Jack, before they get cold. Hasn't he? No. I don't believe you. I don't like to be talked to that way, Jack. Now, eat your eggs. You mean he hasn't said anything to you? About an important case like this. Well, your father never discusses any of his cases with me, important or unimportant, until they're disposed of. But this case, a man murdering his father. All I know about it is what I've read in the papers. And the man wasn't his father. He was his adoptive father. Oh, yeah, same thing. It's not even clear that the man adopted him. 
He took him from the orphanage at age 14 and put him to work on his farm as he had done with three other boys before and, and did with two more after. Well, yes, but he raised them, gave them a home. And... Yes, and he never had to pay a cent to a hired hand. Do you ever think of that part of it? Are you trying to say it was all right to bash his head in with a shovel just because he made his kids do a little work? Of course I'm not saying that it was all right. You're on his side, aren't you? Whose side, for heaven's sake? Father's side. Your father isn't on any side. You think the murderer should get away with it? Jack, now, I refuse to discuss this with you. I absolutely refuse. I don't blame your father for running out of the house. Well, that's what he did, isn't it? Ran out. Because he didn't want to listen to another one of your harangues, and I don't want to hear another one either. Now, this is your father's decision. It is part of his job. And it's not a very pleasant part either. So, well, I'll thank you to leave it to him and not to butt in. Now, if you don't want those eggs, hand them over to me. I'll eat them myself. Uh, take them. I, I don't want them. Well, pour yourself some coffee, at least. No, I don't want any. Where are you going? Well, first I'm going to get dressed, and then I'm going down to that courthouse. Jack, don't do that. I want to hear this decision. You leave your father alone. I'm not going near him. How could I? He's unapproachable. How could I do anything to him? He's untouchable. He's the judge. The final word belongs to him. That's right. And that's as it should be. I just want to be there to hear him pronounce that final word. But why, Jack? Why? Why do you care so much? Because, Mother, this man, this murderer, has got to die. Can't you get that through your head? He has got to die. Show your passes, please. I'm Jack Belly. See your pass, please. I'm Jack Belly. Judge Belly is my father. Oh, you're the judge's son. Now, that's what I've been trying to tell you. Well, in that case, I I'll have... I'll just go in. Special instructions. You're not to be admitted. He doesn't want you in a courtroom. He left particular instructions to that effect. Left instructions with who? With me personally, sir. Did he say why? Didn't say and didn't inquire. In this building, a judge's word is law. Mother! Mother. For heaven's sake, what is it? He barred me from the courtroom. Can you imagine that? Yes. Do you know... Do you know he was going to do that? No. He had no right. Oh, he had every right. It's his courtroom. What was he afraid of? Well, you know perfectly well what he was afraid of, that you'd make a scene. And probably you would have the state you've been in. I feel very strongly about this. That man should be punished for taking a life. He will be. He should give his own life in exchange for the life he took. Well, you know what the Supreme Court said about I that. I don't care what the Supreme Court said. Twenty states permit capital punishment, and ours is one of them. Twenty states are trying to get around the Supreme Court decision. Now, it remains to be seen. The very what... least Father could have done is go on record that he's against the Supreme Court and for the state law. Well, maybe he will. He better. Well, you'd better watch how you talk about your father. And watch your attitude toward him, too. When will he be home? I don't know. He didn't say. The sentence will be in the afternoon paper. Yes, I imagine so. What time does that come out? About noon, something like that. Uh, it's almost 11.30. I'm going out to buy one. Oh, Jack, for heaven's sake, it's not out yet. Not for half an hour at least. Now, darling, sit down, cool off. I can't. Why in the world is this case so important to you? I, I, I can't for the life of me figure it out. Don't you understand? The whole mess we're in, the whole mess the world is in, you did it. Me? I did it? Oh, no, 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 not you personally. Your generation. Oh. The generation of permissiveness. Bleeding hearts, understanding, tolerance, all that bilge. You swallowed it whole, you poisoned the world with all that compassion stuff. You raised me on it. I never saw anything wrong with the way we raised you. When I flunked out of college, you sent me to Paris, to art school. Didn't you like Paris or art school? Of course I liked it. That's not the point. Well, what is the point? I wasn't supposed to flunk out of school. No, <laughs> but you did. What were we supposed to do about it? You weren't supposed to let me get away with it. But you'd already gotten away with it. You're back in school now. I, I, I don't see that any harm was done. That's not the point. It's the principle of the thing. Nobody is supposed to get away with anything. Oh, Jack, Jack. Oh, I'd hate to have that principle applied to everything I've done. I'm going out to see if that afternoon paper's on the stand. It isn't. Well, if it isn't, 
I'll go back to the courthouse. Somebody down there ought to be able to tell me what happened. Now, Jack. Oh. Jack, you came home. May I come in? Yes, sure. Sure. Well, you uh, want to know what the sentence was? Of course I want to know. 20 years to life. You didn't... I didn't sentence him to death. No, I didn't. Now I'm going upstairs and lie down. Wait a minute. Wait one little minute. Jack, please. You can spare me a minute, can't you? I suppose I can. How do you justify what you did? You mean not sending the man to be killed? He can get out of jail in 20 years, you know. If he behaves himself, I know. He can get out and kill somebody else? But I don't think he will. You don't think? You're willing to take a chance because you don't think he will? Well, what else can I go on but my own judgment? How do you know he won't kill somebody? I don't. Any more than I know I won't. Or you won't. Or anybody else won't. <laughs> Except possibly your mother, and I can't give you any guarantee about her if it comes to that. Now, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like... You've done a terrible thing. I, I, I don't think so. And you're going to regret it. I, I hope not. Well, you will. You'll see. When you're responsible for another murder, you're going to be very, very sorry for what you've done. Jack, Jack, please. If he kills somebody else, you'll be responsible. You'll be the murderer yourself. You know that, don't you? Jack, stop it. It's all been decided. It's over. Now, there's nothing more to be said or done. Nothing more to be said or done. That's right. Nothing more to be said. Nothing more to be done. Nothing, dear. So... We'll see. We'll just wait and see about that. Arguments between parents and their children are nothing new. Actually, they dominate the years the children are growing up. It is not until the child has left the parent's home and has his own home, produced his own children, that the passion subsides and the arguments turn into discussions. And even then, there smolders beneath the acquired courtesy and the polished tact, the ancient hostilities and the basic antagonisms of the earlier years. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. has passed since Judge Joseph Bailey sentenced a confessed murderer to 20 years to life. A month since his son Jack denounced him as worse than irresponsible for not having sent the murderer to his death. Since his wife Helen said to their son, there's nothing more to be said, nothing more to be done. A month since the boy replied, wait and see. Since that day, an unidentifiable mood has permeated the Bailey home. A mood which neither mother, nor father, nor son can break. You need more butter. Oh, I can make this do. No, muffins need plenty of butter. Helen, why doesn't Jack come down for breakfast anymore? Oh, really? It's up to him, Joseph. We can't make him. A month ago, I was avoiding him, and now he's avoiding me. Well, ever since the sentencing of that man. He's been different. No bother to deny it. He's been completely different. I wasn't going to deny it, though. Maybe I wouldn't say completely. He's... Well, he's been different. I, I thought by now... I thought so, too. I'll be in my study if you want me. I have some briefs to go over. Probably take all morning. Well, I won't want you because I'm finally going to put up those peaches that I bought a week ago. Or they'll go bad. I'll see you, Ron. Lunchtime. <laughs> yes, dear. Mother. Oh. <laughs> oh, Jack, you startled me. Sorry. My head's full of dishes and everything. Don't you sneak up on me when I have my hands full of dishes. Don't ever do that again. Okay. I won't ever do that again. And pour yourself some coffee, dear. Oh, and there's muffins, but you'll need butter. I'll bring it. Mother. Sit down a minute. I want to clear the table. I want to tell you something. Oh, come on. 
Put the dishes down. Oh, dear. Well, all right. <laughs> what is it? I've made up my mind about something. Oh, what's that? I'm going to see that man. What man? That murderer. You know which one. That man is in jail. Well, of course he's in jail. Father put him there. Why do you want to see him? I want to ask him a few things. Like what? Oh, how he feels, walking around alive after he's killed a man, eating and sleeping and enjoying life. I rather doubt that he's enjoying life. Well, he's living, isn't he? And the man he killed isn't. Jack, you realize, don't you, that this man has gotten to be an obsession with you. Oh, no, it's not the man. It's the fact that he's alive. I want to know if he's feeling any remorse for what he did. If he regrets it, if he feels any sense of guilt at all. I think you can take it for granted that he feels all those things. Oh, but how do I know? For sure, unless I ask him. <sighs> I'm sure your father won't approve. I can't help that. Well, when are you planning to go to see this man? I thought, now. Today? This morning. Oh, Jack, you've got to think about it. I've thought about it for weeks. Jack, please. Now, please, don't rush into this. Please, talk to your father or somebody. Don't just go tearing off... Sorry. Now. I'll be back sometime. What makes you think they'll even let you in? Why, I'm the son of the right honorable Joseph Bailey. That ought to get me in anywhere, don't you think? Except, of course, into his precious courtroom. Jack, wait, wait. Let Can't me break. ask him. Sorry. Jack? Jack! <laughs> Oh. Joseph? Oh, yes, Helen? I had to disturb you, dear. Well, that's all right. Darling, Jack came downstairs right after you came in here. Well, didn't I just hear him yes, go out? Yes, and that's why I had to disturb you. You'll never guess where he's gone. He's gone to see that man. You know, the murderer. He's, he's gone down to the jail to talk to him. Talk to him? About what? About his feelings, he said. Whether whether he feels sorry that he did what he did, whether he feels remorse or guilt, all that. Joseph, I tried to stop him, but I really didn't quite realize till the very last minute that he actually meant it. That he meant to go now. He hardly listened to me, and, and before I knew it, he was out the door. Don't worry about it, Ellen. They won't let him in. They won't? Oh, I wondered about that. Well, of course they won't. Well, he seemed to think that being your son, all he had to do was mention your name. <laughs> I don't think my name impresses the warden too much. Oh. Not in his own bailiwick where he makes the rules. Well, that's a relief. Another thing that worried me, I I, I didn't think if, if they did let him in, that the man would be too happy to talk to him. Not if he knew how Jack felt about his... Well, about his being put away instead of being executed. He might refuse to see him, but I don't think he'd hurt him. Well, if the warden won't let him in... <laughs> he won't. Well, then I'll let you go back to your reading. And I'll get started on my peaches. You call me for lunch. I shall. <laughs> Half pint of brandy. Oh, that seems like a lot of brandy. Oh, well. Mother. Oh, oh, Jack. You've done it again. Done what? <laughs> Snuck up on me with my hands full. Do you realize I almost dropped a whole cup of your father's best brandy? Oh, uh, sorry. I'm making those brandied peaches. Jack, what's the matter? You look pale. Do I? Very pale. You look worn out. What is it? I saw him. You saw... Whom did you see? You know. The murderer. You mean you went to the jail? I told you I was going. But they... They let you in to see him? There was nothing to it. I walked right into his cell. And I talked to him. And then they let me out and I came home. It was that easy? Of course. Nothing to it. What What did you talk to him about? What I told you. I asked him how he felt. And what did he say about how he felt? He said he felt fine. He felt fine? He didn't feel guilty or remorseful or, or anything. 
He said the killing was the only thing in his life he felt good about. Oh, he couldn't have meant that. Oh, yes, he did. You should have heard him. He said it was his first manly act. That's what he called it. Manly. Well, it hardly seems possible. He said he'd never felt so much like himself. In fact, he said it was the only time he'd felt like himself. His true self, he said. That's well, very strange. It's a, that's a strange way to talk. He's about my age. A little older, maybe a year or two. He's got brown eyes and brown hair. And he sat there looking at me right in the eye and telling me that the murder was the crowning achievement of his life. He didn't mean it. If you heard him, you wouldn't say that. Oh, yes. He meant it all right. He really meant it. He upset you, didn't he? It wasn't exactly what I'd hoped he'd say. Why don't you go upstairs and lie down for a bit? I'll call you when lunch is ready. I think I'll do that. Yes, I, I think I'll do that. Call me for lunch. I will. Now, get a little rest. You hear me? Yes, I hear. <sighs> Joseph, it's me. I have to talk to you. Come in, dear. Joe, they let him in. They let him in. The warden let Jack in to see that man. He did. Well, I must say I'm very surprised and not at all pleased. Joe, that's not the worst of it. It's what the man said to Jack. What did he say? Why, it, it, incredible things. He said that the killing was the only manly act of his life. The only thing he ever felt good about. His crowning achievement. My word. Joe, he said it was his first manly act. <laughs> Perhaps for him it was. But Joe, how can you talk like that? Well, I didn't say I considered it a manly act. I said it's quite possible that he did. Well, I wish that he hadn't chosen it to say to our son. Jack said that he showed no remorse whatsoever. Can you imagine? Why should he show remorse if he didn't feel any? Oh, well, I simply don't understand you at all. I really don't. Well, he was very badly treated by the man he killed. And that's an excuse for murder? I, I declare I'm beginning to see Jack's point. You should have sentenced him to death if that's his attitude. Why, if, if everybody felt that way, if everybody spent his life getting even with everybody who was unkind Not to him. Not everybody, Helen. Well, I... All I know is that Jack is very upset. He came home as though he'd been rocked to his very soul. He was... He was not himself at all. Where is he now? Well, I told him to go upstairs and then lie down for a while, and he said he thought he would... Joe, don't be unkind to him. Please. I won't be unkind. I, I know that you've been terribly annoyed with him these past few weeks, keeping after you all the time about the trial, about, about the sentence, but... At the moment, I'm a lot more annoyed with the warden at the prison for letting Jack talk to that man. I can't imagine what he was thinking of. Look, you go back to your kitchen... I'm going to call the warden and chew him out a little. All right. And don't forget, when Jack comes downstairs, be kind to him. Don't worry. I'll be kind. Good. Come in. Oh, Jack. Come in. You're busy. Oh, uh, no, no, not at all. I was going to make a phone call, but uh, that can wait. Sit down, son. I think I'd rather stand up, if you don't mind. Um, your mother just told me that you went to the jail. Yes, to see the man. And they let you see him? Of course. I walked right in. Oh, come now. It's not that easy to see any prisoner let alone a convicted murderer. Well, it was for me. But I can't really say that I approve of your going there in the first place. And in the second place, I very strongly disapprove of the warden letting you in 
And I'm very unhappy about what the man said to you. Mother told you? Yes. I was going to tell you myself, because I wanted you to see what you've done. What I've done? You let a murderer live. If he kills somebody else, it'll be your fault. You turned him loose. Now, Jack, I didn't turn him loose. On the phone. I let it ring. What? Never mind about the phone. Mother will answer it in the kitchen. I suppose she will. You and I have got something more important to take care of. Now, Jack, that... That's not a gun you have there, is it? It's a gun, all right. Well, put it down. For heaven's sake. I told you. I told you a month ago what a terrible thing you were doing. And you went ahead and did it, Jack. Jack. Joseph, the telephone's Helen, you. be careful. What is it? Are you all right? I'm, I'm all right. Jack! 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 Oh, my Lord, Jack! I told you. Didn't I tell you? Joseph. Joseph, has he gone mad? Joseph, has our son gone mad? What is madness? When does the moment arrive when it is wholly evident? Who is to call it madness? And who is to call it revelation? How long may it last? And can it ever go away? Does it hide? Or is it imprisoned? Or is it disguised in a million minor ways till the day when it springs into full view? And when it appears, who is to recognize it and call it madness? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. It's a great mistake to think of all young people as radical and all their parents as conservative. The story we are presenting here concerns a judge who chose to spare the life of an acknowledged murderer and his son who passionately asserted that the man should be put to death. So passionate was his conviction that he was driven to threatening his father with a gun. And a few moments ago, we heard shots. Shots from the gun held by the judge's son. Pardon keys, yeah? Who? Judge Bailey? What? Yes, yes. Ask him to come right in. Oh, what on earth do you suppose he... Oh, come in, Judge. Come on in. Thank you, Warden. Will you uh, have a chair? Thank you. I should have phoned you before barging in like this, but... Oh, there's no harm Warden done. Keys. Why, in the name of common sense... Did you let my son see that man? Now, wait a minute, Judge Bailey. At least I... you could have called and asked me. Well, I did call you. You certainly did not. I did, and your wife answered the phone. She told me you were working in your study, and she didn't want to disturb you. What in the world was the idea of but letting I him... I didn't. Jack never saw the man. He... He didn't? No. He seemed very disturbed when he showed up here. Not normal at all. And he couldn't give me any logical reason why he should be allowed to talk to the man, so, of course, I I didn't give my permission. Uh, no one else could have let him... No, oh, no. My word is law here, Judge. Well, I owe you an apology, Warden Geese. Well, not at all. It's perfectly all right. But, uh, what made you think that Jack did talk to the man that he say he had? Well, he told his mother some story. She told me. I... I should have checked right away instead of... Well, no matter now, I, I do apologize, Wooden. You know, Judge Bailey, I, uh... I might have let him in just because he's your son. I say, might have. Except that he was so... so overwrought. Plus the fact that he had a gun was in his pocket, very poorly concealed. We spotted it the minute he walked in. Your son doesn't know too much about guns, I take it. I, I didn't even know he had one. Yeah, they're easy enough to pick up, unfortunately. Of course, I asked him what he planned to do with it. What did he say? Told me it was none of my business, and then he ran out of here. 
That was when I called you and talked to your wife and... Well, as I told you. Yes. And I did call back several times. But we always got a busy signal. I suppose your wife must have left the phone off the hook. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, she, she, she must have. I figured uh, something happened and she just forgot. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Uh, something happened. Uh, she... She forgot. Warden Keys, I'm going to ask a favor of you, a, a great favor. If you feel you can't grant it, please say so and I'll understand. Oh, anything I can do, Judge Bailey, I will do. I want to talk to this man. Ah, well, now, wait a minute. I, I know I shouldn't I... ask. And, and I wouldn't, except that... Well, it's terribly important to me. I, uh... Don't ask to see him for more than, oh, you know, five minutes, perhaps. It, it, it shouldn't take more than that. And I don't know. I really... It's more important to me than I can possibly explain, Warden. I, I wish I could explain, but at the moment I can't. Uh, perhaps one day, I, I don't know. Mm. Five minutes. Not a second longer. All right, where would you like to talk to him? Oh, any place at all, in, in his cell. Uh... Look, if you're afraid he'll do me some harm, oh, is that it? You, you're afraid he might attack me? Oh, no. Seeing as you're the man who spared his life, well, I don't... Even so, if, if you think he's dangerous, I, I'm willing to chance that. I mean, <laughs> it's that important to me. I don't consider him dangerous at all. I think this murder is probably the only crime he'll ever commit. You mean that? Sure, it was a crime of passion, pure and simple. I think he'll make trusty within a year. Really? Most of our trustees are murderers, didn't you know that? I never really thought about it. Oh, not the, uh, the professional killers or the psychotic ones, but the, the one-time murderers where the stress and strain of their particular situation simply overwhelmed them, where the... Buried hostility suddenly surfaced. And as a rule, just as suddenly subsided, never to surface again. It's interesting. Well, now, how would you like to see this man right here in my office? Could I? Five minutes? Have my word. Okay. You know, I'd like to know sometime what you think of him. Personally, I like him. You stay right here, I'll have him brought in. You uh, know who I am. Oh, I, I should, don't you think? Oh, yes, that was a silly thing to say. Look, we only have five minutes. I, I promised the warden. So if you don't mind, I'd like to come straight to the point. Yes, sh sure, okay. I, uh, I have a son about your age. He uh, didn't agree with the 20 to life I gave you. He... He thought you should have been given the death penalty. Oh, really? He, uh, his name is Jack. Jack grew really exercised about it as the trial went on. Very, very vehement. Got so, I avoided speaking to him for fear he'd bring it up. I, I, I didn't want to argue with him, and I didn't want him to take the chance of his influencing me in the slightest. Oh, I, I guess you've earned your reputation. I mean, like, you really are a good I judge. I actually barred him from the courtroom on the day I handed down my decision. And that made him even more, more agitated, more hostile. And then came the day, you'd been locked up here about a month, I guess, when he told his mother that he was going to come here to see you. Yeah, what for? I, I don't know precisely. To see how you were reacting to the... To the crime, I guess. But he never saw me. So the warden just told me. But Jack came home and told his mother that he had seen you. And that you were cool as a cucumber about the whole thing. <laughs> Not quite. That you'd never felt so much like a man as when you killed your father. That it's the only thing you ever felt good about. Where could he have gotten such an idea? Oh, yeah, I couldn't say for sure, but... 
Maybe because that's exactly the way I do feel about it. You mean that? Yeah, sure. No no remorse? None none at all? Well, I'd, I'd rather not be here, of course, and and I know I shouldn't have taken a man's life, but, but like, deep inside, deep in I really care to look at the moment, I, I, I know that my whole life had been, like, leading up to the killing. And it wasn't even that killing, the killing of that man, I mean. It was, it was like, it was the killing of my own father. Uh, you don't mean you, you act. No, no, I didn't kill my own father, though I, no, I wanted to. I couldn't do it because I was only four years old when he took me to the orphanage and left me there. He never said he was coming back for me, but... <laughs> I always believed he would. I went on believing for... Well, for a long time. And when this other man took you out of the orphanage... Oh, I pretended to myself that my father had come for me. Of course, the pretense didn't work. Pretenses never do. Yeah. I'm going to tell you something that I, uh, I'd, I'd rather you didn't repeat to, to anyone. Okay. I, uh, I have your word. Yeah, sure, if you need it, you got it. The warden wouldn't let Jack see you because, well, I guess it's against regulations, but besides that, Jack had a gun on him. He came home after the warden had turned him down, and he... He came into my study where I was working and he reproached me again for, for letting you live. And he... He fired a shot at me. His mother came into the room at that moment to tell me about a phone call and he turned the gun on himself. Oh, no. Mind you, no one knows about this. Yeah, but I mean, like, it'll come out, won't it? How he died... Well, he, he, isn't, he isn't dead. He's wounded. He's in the hospital. But he'll live. Now, can you tell me why he should have done such a thing? I mean, I realize you can't possibly know. Not, not really, but, but... I'd like your opinion. Me? Okay, all right. For what it's worth. I think that, you know, brooding about me, what I'd done, your son read my feelings accurately. Now, whether this was thought transference or telepathy or whatever, I don't know too much about those things. But he discovered that this desire to kill the father is a, a, a universal wish. But uh, I, I always thought my son loves me. Oh, he does. I'm sure he does. But that doesn't alter the other feeling, now, does it? I mean, it, it could keep it from, like, surfacing, but it doesn't really alter it. Nothing does. Nothing can. It, it, it's hard for me to accept the fact that that my son tried... To kill me. Oh, but he didn't, don't you see? You, you, no, you, you, you mustn't think that. He, he was standing right close to you, wasn't he, when he fired the shots? Well, about uh, six feet away. Right. Yeah, and, and you weren't moving, were you? you? You weren't trying to stop him? Well, I was, t I was too astonished. And, and perhaps too afraid. So you were a perfect target, weren't you? Well, I, I suppose. Uh, yes, I was. And, and yet he missed, he missed completely, didn't he? Yes. Well, Judge, anyone who could miss a stationary target at six feet, he... he just didn't want to hit it. So... he only succeeded in... in wounding himself. Am I right? Thank you. From the bottom of my heart... For all you said. No. Thank you, sir. For my life. Hello, son. How are you? Coming along okay? I guess. That's what the doctors tell me. Father, lying here thinking, trying to think... 
I can't understand how it all happened. It's all right. I was out of my mind. That's the only way I can figure it. Don't you think so? I think something like that. It won't ever happen again. Oh, Jack. When you went to see the man in jail, the murderer, why'd you take a gun with you? Oh, yes. The gun. Did you mean to kill him with it? Oh, no. No, no. Did you think you'd do what I hadn't done? Take his life? No. You see, I thought he'd be so... so remorseful. I thought he'd be eaten up with remorse and guilt and sorrow for what he'd done. I thought he wouldn't want to live. So I thought I'd just hand him the gun and he'd do the rest. By that, you mean... I thought he'd kill himself. But I never got to see him. Did I? No. Funny. I thought that for a while. I did see him. And we talked a little bit. And he was so arrogant. And he wasn't sorry at all. It was very clear to me at the time. Now, now I'm not so sure. Rest, son. It'll all come clear one day soon. Thou shalt not kill. This simple, terse statement is in the book of Exodus. It is not followed by the word except, or the word unless, or any qualifying phrase. No, it reads plainly, thou shalt not kill. We might ask why the Lord thought it necessary to deliver this stern injunction. Can it be for any other reason but that the impulse to kill lies fermenting silently in every human heart? I'll be back shortly. Listeners, I hope we have not saddened you with our account of the darker side of man's nature. If we have, let me leave you with these lovely words from the book of Psalms. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Our cast included William Prince, Augusta Dabney, Christopher Tabori, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Uncle Ben's long grain and wild rice. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant... Dreams? CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall, conductor of this ominous omnibus that stopped at all stations of the outre and the macabre. Much that I sought, I could not find. Much that I found, I could not bind. Much that I bound, I could not free. Much that I freed, returned to me. And what is the poet telling us? That, practically speaking, in the end, it will all be as it was in the beginning. 
And so, therefore, it's not what you think you accomplished, but how good a run you got for your money. Some folks get a better run than others, don't they? I'm sorry, Doctor, I can't trust you. If you can't trust me, Mr. Bell, I cannot treat you. I have a great many enemies, powerful, wealthy enemies. How do I know you won't sell them my secrets? Because I am a doctor, and I have my code of ethics. Yeah, suppose someone were to say to you, let me look at Harry Bell's file. I'm willing to pay you very well. What would you say? I would refuse. And if he said, I'll give you a million dollars? I would still refuse. Has anybody ever actually offered you a million dollars? No. Well, then don't be so quick to answer. Our mystery drama, The Paradise Cafe, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Court Benson. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and the Allied Van Lines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Consider primitive man who cowered in a cave, who literally trembled at every falling leaf, who saw himself surrounded on every side by malevolent spirits. Even the gods to whom he prayed were capricious and fickle. That was primitive, ignorant, undeveloped man. But why do we have similar problems? We sophisticated, modern, civilized beings. Primitive man went to a priest who would read his fate in the entrails of a goat. We go to a priest who tries to read our destiny by probing into, beneath, and beyond our mind. Of course, we don't call him a priest. We call him doctor. I, I don't know how to explain this. Maybe it can't be explained, but... Yes? I, uh... Oh, it's 1.30. I've I got to use your phone to call my office. I am sorry. I don't think you should make a telephone call. Now, look, Doctor, you don't understand. A multi-million dollar deal is involved here. Some people from Chicago are arriving you and I... You have asked me for one hour of my time to discuss a certain very serious problem, Mr. Bell. But I have to leave instructions for you my... You have already wasted half of it. It's crazy. Yes? I mean, what's happening to me? It's... It's crazy. How do you define crazy? Look, I went to the library. You know why? Oh, how could you know? I went to look up what they had to say about possession. Do you know what possession is? In what sense? Well, I wanted to see if it was possible, if it, if it was possible for something or, or someone to, to take possession of another person. Okay. Now I've told you. And that's a tape recorder playing, isn't it? Yes. You can ruin me. Ruin you? How? How? You could make that tape public. You could play it for the board of directors of my corporation, to some of the banks I have to deal with, to certain other parties. All they'd have to do is hear that. As a physician, I am prohibited by both law and ethics from God, revealing... Don't any... hand me that. Every man, every woman has his price. I don't care who or what you think you are. You can be had. Do you know how much money's involved here? Money? Yes, money. <laughs> what do you know about money? Give me that tape recorder. For what purpose? I want to erase that tape. If you don't trust me, I can't be your doctor. Well, I trust you. But you're going to erase the tape. Now, we press this erase button. Mr. Bell, I'm afraid our session is over. Look, I trust you, understand? But, you see, I, I know I'm being watched. Why do you say that? Well, a man in my position would take my word for it. So it's discovered I'm seeing a shrink. No offense intended by the usage of the expression. So they figure... They? Who is they? I'll take my word for it. I got more days than I can handle. So they figure, what's he telling the shrink? We ought to know. 
And so they offer you a million bucks. I told you, my record are not for sale. What are you giving me slogans? Did anybody ever offer you a million dollars? Why did you come here? Well, it's... Oh, on account of this possession thing. Yes. Well, it's that simply somebody, something is, is taking possession of me. Taking over. Is it happening now? No. No, because right now I'm fighting it. When I think about it, I can fight it off. But I can't keep thinking all the time. So it it sneaks in and takes over. And and even when I do think, it gets harder and harder because this, this thing gets stronger and stronger. How does this uh, possession manifest itself? It, it makes me different. In what way? Well, it makes me feel different, think different, act different. Last night... All of a sudden, I take a cab down to the opera house, and I go to the opera. Now, why would I want to go to the opera? Don't you like music? Oh, not that kind of music. And that's not the point. All I'm saying is, all of a sudden, I have to go to the opera. And I sit through it, too. Something made me stay. How can you describe this something? Well, I'm trying to tell you. It's, it's, it's like I'm somebody else. Doing things, saying things, thinking things. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree. Yes. Why did I say that? Well, tell me. Where did that come from? I don't even know what it means. But you heard it somewhere. You read it somewhere. Never. It is a fragment of a poem by Coleridge. Well, I never heard of him either. But you must have read or studied that poem in high school. Yeah, I never went to high school. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan stately pleasure dome decree. Where off the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man. Stop it! Stop it, Mr. Bell. Huh? That's what he or she or what it, it was saying. Inside me, through me, that wasn't me. It was my voice, but it wasn't me. Now, I want you to lean back in your chair and relax. No, wait, wait not until I make this phone call. What, Mr. Bell? My life depends on it. You doctors, a lot of things you don't understand. You can say relax, relax, but... Hello, Marguerite? Yeah, uh... The people show up yet. Well, tell them, uh, tell them, uh, we cannot go through with the deal. Yeah, that's right. I, I'm aware of the problems, but I, I'm forced to cancel the deal. I'm, I'm afraid they'll have to do their worst. Did you hear what I just said? It wasn't me saying that. It wasn't. Because do you know what I just did? I just signed my own death warrant. When I said cancel that deal, I asked for it. You mean you will die because of a business deal? Doctor, people like you know very little about the world. I mean the real world. Money. That's what it's about, money. Money, the winding sheet of the human race. There, there. He's talking again. That isn't me. And the cancellation of this deal will result in your death? Why? Because certain people won't go for it. Please, doctor. Get rid of this thing for me. Get rid of it? Don't you turn me down. I'll pay you whatever you ask. Look. I'm a hard guy, sure, sure. I'm considered a legit businessman, but the the rumors are true. I got the rackets behind me, and I use the rackets, too. But you have to save me. My life is on the line. But if it is as simple as telling your secretary that the deal is still on, just tell her. I can't. He won't let me. Whoever he is, he won't let me. How is he stopping you? 
But there is the phone. Reach for it. Oh, it's more than that. It has to do with... with... Uh, space. Space? Yeah, kind of open space and fresh air and... and kids. You know what I mean? No. Kids playing. You see, the deal's gonna kill that. The deal's gonna have a lot of factories. We bought up all that land because we knew they were gonna build a turnpike alongside. What are you saying? We own the chairman of the state committee on highways. What am I talking about? We practically own the whole legislature. Look, it's 12 o'clock noon. The Chicago guys will be in at one shop. I have to be able to tell them the deal is on. Do you understand? Mr. Bell, I would advise a period of complete rest. You're doing it again. You're talking to me as if I'm a nut. Somebody's inside me. Get them out. Get them out by one o'clock. Relax. Don't resist anyone or anything. Whoever it is inside you, let him or it take over. Just yield. Well, I have to fight. Later, when we find out who. Now, relax. Let your mind feel free. Weave a circle around him thrice. And close thine eyes in holy dread. For he on honeydew hath fed. And drunk the milk of paradise. <laughs> that isn't me. I never heard that before in my life. Think of those words that have just come out of your mouth. Do any of them mean anything to you? No. Weave a circle? Anything about weaving circle? No, no. Thrice, the number three. No. Close your eyes. Are you afraid of blindness? No. Holy dread. Are you afraid? Sure, I'm afraid. I'm scared stiff. Honeydew hath fed. <sighs> Honeydew is a melon that don't mean a thing. And drunk the milk of paradise? Milk? No. Paradise? No. Then I don't know what approach I can possibly... Well, wait, wait. Paradise? Yes? Paradise. What about paradise? I'm, I'm trying to think. Oh, I know, I know. The cafe. The cafe, Paradise. The Paradise Cafe, yeah. They tore the place down about 15 years ago. Paradise Cafe? The Paradise Cafe. Yeah, he used to come in there and recite poems. Who? Uh, this guy, uh, uh, Stanley. Stanley Mason. Stanley Mason? Yeah, a nutty kind of a guy. He used to hang around. He was sweet on Helen. Who was Helen? She was a waitress in the Paradise Cafe before they tore it down. And before. And before? Before what? Before I killed her. At this point, you know as much as we do. Harry Bell, a wealthy, if notorious, operator is in the office of psychiatrist Maria Kluger. And he claims that he is being possessed. Something, someone, is inside him, making him do things alien to his nature and preventing him from doing something that could be a matter of life and death. To develop this story, we need a second act. And I shall be back with it in just a few moments. play of the London stage in the year 1697 was Possession is worth 11 points in the law. Possession. Well, when you own the body of another person, that's called slavery. When you own his soul, what name can we give that? But can you own the soul of another human being and speak for him? Think for him. Act for him. It seems to be happening to Mr. Harry Bell. Well, we have you 
and a man named Stanley, and a waitress, Helen, in the Paradise Cafe. Yeah, I remember. And you murdered Helen? Uh, that doesn't go past this office. Why did you murder her? Because it... I didn't murder her. But you said that you... I killed her. There is a difference. Oh, yeah, sure. Tell me how it happened. Well, Helen, she was kind of, you know, built. Everybody wanted to take her out. But she was a smart little dame. Well, anyhow, we were sitting around one night and... Helen, thy beauty is to me like those Nisian barks of yore. The gently or a perfumed sea. The weary, wayworn wanderer aboard to his own native shore. You don't say. That's by Edgar Allan Poe. Well, is that a fact? What ever happened to this other guy, Kubla Khan? He give him the night off? Coleridge. I may be in a minority, but I place Coleridge with the major poets. No kidding. <laughs> you hear that, Helen? I don't know when I've ever been so thrilled in all my life. Although his time was during the highly romantic period, he was curiously modern. Oh, this is news to me. Well, he was very much concerned with pollution. For example, in his poem, Cologne, about the highly industrial German city, he says, The river Rhine, it is well known, doth wash your city of Cologne. But tell me, nymphs, what power divine shall henceforth wash the river Rhine? <laughs> Stanley, do you ever figure a way to make a buck out of all these poems? Mm, true, poets have always been involved with the beauties of nature. But Coleridge is the first to be concerned with man's attacks on the basic environment. Oh, Helen, there's a concert tomorrow night. A free concert, I'll bet. In the park. Are you kidding? It's more than a concert, it's an opera. Oh, that lets me out. But it's really a very funny opera. Mm, I'd rather see the Marx Brothers. This is called The Barber of Seville. The Barber of Seville, Doctor. The Barber of Seville. That was the opera I went to see last night. Yes? Why did I go? Why did I sit through it? Tell me more about the Paradise Cafe and why you murdered Helen. I didn't murder her. It was an accident. Tell me. Well, Stanley would always try to make time with Helen. But he was going about it all wrong. He was throwing this crazy poetry at her. Yet each man kills the thing he loves. By each, let this be heard. Some do it with a bitter look. Some with a flattering word. The coward does it with a kiss. The brave man with a sword. Put another nickel in the jukebox, Stanley, and give us a rest, will you? Well, Helen... You gonna order something, Stanley? Well, then, beat it. But, Helen... Get lost, creep! Oh, let it roll off his back. He'd come back for more, night after night, you know what I mean? <laughs> Some guys, they never learn. One night, we're in the place... Uh... Helen's busy with some other customers. So I said to Stanley... Hey, Stanley, that's not the way to score with a dame. Score? Huh. I don't think you understand, Harry. Huh? What don't I understand? I'm in love with Helen. Oh, sure, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> love. Not your kind of love, Harry. Ah, get wise, Stanley. There are guys taking Helen out, guys who spend a couple of bucks. You want to make time? Takes dough. I don't believe it. What do you believe, Stanley? Can't answer, can you? <laughs> you know why? Because you're not money. Only money talks today. Everything else is just idle chatter. You really believe that, don't you? Why, indeed, I do. I really and truly and honestly do. Oh, money. The winding sheet of the human race. Well, whatever it is, without it, you're dead. <clears throat> Guess who Helen's going out with tomorrow night? Me. You? I don't believe it. Why not? Because you're... Harry, you're quite ordinary. And Helen is a is an unusual, a most unusual human being. Yeah, yeah. You think so? Well, here she comes now, Stanley. Just watch this. Observe the old master in action. Well, here's the two freeloaders. She walks in beauty like the night. Uh, Helen... 
What are you doing tomorrow night? Why, what you have in mind? Well, for starters, dinner at Laricio's. Laricio's? Oh, you know what it costs to even tip the hat check girl at Laricio's? <laughs> yeah, I do. Afterwards, we'll go to the Trotters, lay a few bucks on several nags. We'll wind up with some supper and dancing at the Chesterfield Club. <laughs> you must be nuttier than Stanley. <laughs> Well, that may be or not. Meanwhile, I have to make my arrangements for the evening, so uh, what's the answer? No, where would you get the kind of dough for a night like that? Where? In my pocket. Here, take a look. <laughs> hey. Yeah, it's not a 20 covering a roll of ones, either. This is solid all the way, baby. Oh, where'd you get it? Well, I developed a green thumb. No, tell him no. Hey, Stanley. Listen, Creed. Tell him no. Don't go out with him. He doesn't love you. He doesn't even respect you. get out of here before I... I have you thrown out. If you go with him, you'll regret it. Oh, take off. You'll pay for it. Stanley, I think you heard the young lady. I'm warning you. Stanley, you're making a scene. There are people in the place. You'll be sorry for the rest of your life. Well, he finally ran out of there. People looked at him as if he was a nut, which he was. Several questions. First, where did you get the money? Well, that was the year I learned. You see, I knew you had to have money. But how did you get it? Carry a gun and steal ass for chumps. You can say I learned how to put certain people together with certain other people. Or with things they needed, or both. That was the year I began. I learned that if people think you have money, they come to you. And they've been coming ever since. And when did you murder Helen? It wasn't murder. Whatever it was. When did it happen? That night. That night we made the rounds. Dinner, the races, dancing, supper. Here yeah, we kept going. And finally I took her home. It was a great evening, Harry. Yeah, sure was. I, I really enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, so did I, so did I. Well, good night. Uh, good night? Uh, what, what's with this good night? Oh, no, uh, uh, just a minute, Harry. Well, I'm coming in. No, uh, Harry. Good night. <laughs> what do you think this Harry, is? Harry, please, I, I'm, I'm really very tired. And... Well, if you're tired, you can drink a cup of coffee. Harry, I, I'm just going to have to ask you to leave. What do you think you got here, a sucker like Stanley? You know how much dough I went for tonight? 280 bucks. But, Harry, we can go out again? And all I'm going to get for my 280 is good night at the door. Harry, I like you. I, I like you very much. It it's just that... Oh, please, no, please, Harry, I... baby, no. Please, Harry, please. You don't make a chump no, out of no, Harry, no, not keep, you. Keep, keep away from me, please. Uh, old Harry, Harry doesn't mind please. going for the dough, but that's got to be a payoff. Keep away from me. Come on over here, Harry, baby. No. I said, come over no. here. <laughs> Put that knife down. You'll hurt yourself. Keep away. No. I said keep away. All right. <laughs> <laughs> She had on the table, and there was a knife, and she, she picked it up, and she came at me with it, and I, I tried to knock it out of her hand, and, well, I, I had to hit her. I mean, it was self-defense, and I hit her, but I hit her very hard, and she fell over kind of hard, too, and she hit her head against the table. I, I, I can't remember. Anyhow, it, well, that's what killed her. She was dead. Yeah. All of a sudden, she was dead. And then, what did you do? I'm telling you this, but you try to peddle it to anybody and I'll make you look like a chump. What did you do? Well, that was the year I guess I grew up. It was the year I became the kind of guy I am today. And what kind of guy is that? I learned the key to it all. Never use your own money. What does that mean? Always have someone else pay for you. Stanley? Stanley. But how could you get Stanley? To... Uh, you can arrange anything if you know how. I looked down at her body. I said to myself, the very least I can hope for here is manslaughter. And that's at least five years away. Ah... Uh, 
let Stanley serve the time. He's not doing anything anyhow. So I went over to Stanley's little furnished room. <laughs> I had to wake him up. Oh, Harry, do you know what time it yeah, is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, listen, she wants you. Who does? Well, who do you think? Helen. But she went out with you. Yeah, yeah, I know. It, it, it was a mistake, Stanley. We, we both knew it was a mistake. We spent the whole time just talking about you. Uh, at least Helen did. Helen? Yeah. She's in her apartment, crying her eyes out. She... she is? She, she wants you to forgive her, Stanley. Forgive her? Of course. Go there and tell her. Now? Now? Stanley, you you got to make the moves. Come on, she needs you. Don't you understand? Oh, of course I understand. I, I knew. I knew that deep down I could possess her. She would be mine. I would possess her soul with patience. She's mine. Yeah, she, she's all yours. <laughs> Go and get her. 19th Precinct, Sergeant Sloan. Uh, Sergeant, uh, I hope it's a false alarm, but I happen to pass my uh, 221 Collier Place, and uh, I'm, I'm sure I heard a woman screaming. You know, as if she was being murdered or something. You say the address is 221 Collier? But I... I didn't do it, officer. I didn't do it. Hey, you'll have to come along with us, Mr. Mason. But she was dead. She was already dead when I got here. Sergeant, you have to believe me. It uh, doesn't matter if I believe you or not, Mr. Mason. Your problem is going to be with a judge and a jury. As you have already guessed, he's going to have quite a problem. But that's why we're here, to give people problems and to permit them to work out the solutions. And sometimes we discover that the solution can be even more of a problem than the original problem which is where we are heading in Act Three. Well, it's the complicated plans that usually founder and sink in the stormy seas of reality. Therefore, keep it simple. Simple the way Harry Bell kept it simple. You want somebody else to pay for a murder that you have just committed? Don't get involved in complicated machinations. Just arrange to have your patsy in position when the police arrive. You'd be surprised how swiftly nature takes its course. And so, Mr. Bell, you framed Stanley Mason for the murder. It happens every day. People are framed for murder every day. People pay heavy prices for other people. But to make poor Stanley pay the price for you. Why not? Why not? Do I have to explain it to you? No, I have to explain it to you, Dr. Kluger. You see, that's why Stanley was born. To pay for your crime? He was born to be a fall guy. You see, I did a lot of reading. No formal education, maybe, but I did a lot of reading. And I've been around... Did you ever hear the expression, nature hates a vacuum? The word is abhors, but we needn't quibble. Yeah, well, just understand the point. Where there's a need, it gets filled. There's a need in this world for suckers, fall guys, and so nature supplies them. You see what I mean? Stanley was born to be a fall guy. And what happened to Stanley? Well, I lost control of that situation. How? Well, I didn't think he'd get the chair. In those days, they still had the death penalty, and, well, they used to hand it out, too. Anyhow, I, I thought it would be manslaughter or murder in the second or third. But I forgot. The DA could establish premeditation. But you did intend to murder Helen Walker. No. The witnesses who have just testified here, are they lying? Isn't it true that you were insanely jealous? Well, I... 
I, I, I was jealous, yeah. And when you I... heard that Helen Walker was going out with Mr. Harry Bell, didn't you threaten her? No, no. You didn't say, and I quote the witnesses, you'll regret it, you'll pay for it, you'll be sorry for the rest of your life? Yes, yes, I said it, but what I meant was she would lose her self-respect. She, she would lose her, her freshness, her, her ideals. She would sell herself for money, and that's why she would regret. That's how she would pay. That's why she would be sorry for the rest of her life. You deny that you killed Helen Walker. How could I kill her? I loved her. When the police officers entered the apartment, there was blood on your hands. Of course. She was lying on the floor. I, I, I tried to lift her, and there was blood on, if on, on her If you didn't kill her... What were you doing there at that hour of the night? I told you. I went there because Harry Bell came to me and said she wanted to see me. And when I got there, she... She was... She was dead. Mr. Bell, you had gone out with Miss Helen Walker. Yes. <clears throat> and had she ever mentioned anything about Stanley Mason's threats? Uh, well, um... Mr. Bell... You're under oath. Well, well, it's just that I didn't think Stanley was that type of guy. What type of guy? Well, the type that could kill. But, uh... But? Well, but nothing. I, I don't want to say any more. You left Helen Walker at her apartment at about what time? About a quarter after 2 a.m. Where did you go from there? Home. You went right home. You didn't stop off to see Stanley Mason? Why would I stop off to see Stanley Mason? He says you did. Oh, I'm sorry. It isn't true. He's lying. He's lying! Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what are the simple but stubborn facts? We have the defendant who is obsessed by a passion for poor Helen Walker. He became violently jealous when she agreed to a date with Mr. Harry Bell. He threatened her. He came to her apartment late that night and killed her. He was found in her apartment and her blood on his hands. The state rests its case. I'm innocent. I tell you, I'm innocent. I loved her. I still love her. The jury was back in an hour, Doctor. I, I think they could have come back in 15 minutes. Guilty. First degree. No recommendation for clemency. The judge passed sentence. Stanley was dead three months later. And you just let it happen. Well, by this time it was a snowball rolling downhill. It was getting too big. It was going too fast to stop. And your conscience never bothered you? Conscience... I used to have one. And then I heard something Stanley said. And thus doth conscience make cowards of us all. And I knew what that meant right off the bat. There are things that you have to do, and when you're too scared to do them, you blame it on your conscience. Would it have been better for me to have gone to the chair instead of Stanley? To have died instead of Stanley? But Stanley isn't dead. Oh, he's dead, all right. Stanley's wrapped in his coffin and buried in his grave. He lives in you. In me? Yes. He has taken possession of you. Oh, look. That's for... primitive people, for ignorant, superstitious people. This possession business. Oh, I know that's what I spoke about earlier, but... That's not why I came to you. You're a doctor. You're a psychiatrist. You don't believe... You can't believe in that kind of... Or do, do you? I can only believe the evidence. Do you realize it's, it's one o'clock? The Chicago people are already in town. They know I've said no to the deal. They'll kill me. They'll have to. They'll make it look like an accident, but with me out of the picture, they can get the votes to carry it through. Carry what through? The project. See, we're going to build these plants right near superhighways, an airport, railroad. But I I thought it could make up in a wonderful children's summer camp. Who thought? I told you, I thought. Where would Harry Bell get such thoughts? 
That's how Stanley Mason would think. What's wrong with you, Doc? Don't I know how important it is for kids to have a camp? I was brought up in a slum. You are now Stanley Mason. Oh, you're crazy. You are Stanley Mason. Because you want to be Stanley Mason. <laughs> Me? I want to be a creep like Stanley? Why? Because your conscience has made a coward of you. I told you I don't have one. You killed Helen Walker. You made Stanley pay for it. And now your conscience is exacting the price. No. You remember everything Stanley ever said. And you have become Stanley. It's a lie. Prove it. Pick up the telephone. Call your office and say what Harry Bell would say. Say the deal is going through. That is what Harry Bell would decide, isn't it? Well, why can't you do it? <laughs> Because I... Yes. I'm waiting. The words won't come out. Because Stanley Mason won't permit them. A children's camp sounds like a much better idea than a cluster of factories. <laughs> You've got to get rid of Stanley for me. Stanley seems a much finer person than Harry. That's not for you to judge. Well, that's true. And yet... If Stanley has succeeded in transferring his ideals to you, society will certainly be the gainer. But I'll be the loser. Why? I'll be killed. I can't protect myself. I have heard of stories of possession by demons, evil spirits, but this is the first time a benign presence has... It's his revenge, Stanley's revenge. When did you first... Start feeling Stanley's presence. Oh, I, 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 I think it was when this project came up. Well, there was a lot of fuss raised against it, you know, do good as extremist cranks. I didn't pay any attention. You sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Besides, that's all noise. But then some other money got interested and. In... What other money? I'll deny I ever said this. Racket money. And if I pull out on these fellas, send flowers. Excuse me. Yes? I know. What's that? Oh, thank you. My receptionist. First, this appointment has run way past schedule. I'll buy you a whole day. A gentleman is waiting for you in the outer office. For me? Yes. He said to tell you he was your Chicago colleague. The guy's gonna kill me. Here? Shall I call the police? It won't be here. It won't be anything the police will ever suspect or want to suspect. Mr. Bell, you have a devil or, I should say, an angel in possession of you. Only you can exorcise him. Can't you do anything? What could be more simple than saying, the deal is on? Four little words. Four little one-syllable words. Common, everyday words. That is your solution. That is your exorcism. That drives out Stanley Mason. All right. Bring that Chicago guy in here. In here? What a chump I am. I'm going to let Stanley bust up my mind. <laughs> if you insist. Miss Pendleton, have Mr. Bell's colleague come in, please. Yes, Miss Pendleton, I know I'm running late. All right, I feel I got Stanley on the run. How do you think he ever got inside me in the first place? Wait, it might have been something that Jerry Lane said. Who was it? Jerry Lane? Yeah, this guy from Chicago. Oh, uh, hello, Jerry. Harry. Uh, Jerry, this is Dr. Kluger. My pleasure. Your nurse said to come in. Uh, please, sit down. Oh, what is this, Harry? You under the weather? <laughs> no. No, no, I'm fine now. I heard some uh, very puzzling news. Uh... Yeah, well, we, we can talk here. Well, I mean, uh, about the project. Yeah, what'd you hear? Well, that you were having... Second thoughts? Well, 
That's to be expected. So much is involved. There's, there's been a big fuss raised. Oh, that always happens. But what do I keep telling you? By the time we get finished, you work that little magic of yours, why the whole thing will smell like cologne. Ain't that what I kept saying? Smell like cologne. Cologne. The River Rhine. It is well known. Doth wash thy city of cologne. But tell me, nymphs, what power divine shall henceforth Wash the river Rhine. What are you talking about? It's not me. It's not me. It's, it's Stanley. Stanley Mason. Hey, doctor. What's the matter with him? The spoilers, destroyers, defacers. Be gone with thy smog and thy smell. For earth must be made into heaven while thou wouldst convert it to hell. Doctor, what's wrong? The only... The only thing I can think of, he is possessed. You may have read of a tycoon who disappeared. As a matter of fact, it was a memorable headline. Tycoon disappears in typhoon. Mr. Harry Bell was washed off his yacht during a storm at sea. Some say it was a convenient disappearance because his financial empire had collapsed. The truth may be in the files of Dr. Maria Kluger, but ethically, morally, and legally, she cannot say a word on the subject. I'll return shortly. Revenge of an evil man is to bring evil in the expectation that evil will kill his hated enemy. What is the revenge of a good man? Since evil is inimical to his character, he can only perform good. Can you kill a person by filling him with goodness? You just heard it happen. It proves that there are more things on heaven and earth than are dreamed of in anyone's philosophy. And we get around to most of them right here, seven times each week. Our cast included Court Benson, E.V. Juster, William Redfield, and Len Gotchman. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Have you ever turned up a stone and suddenly what was beautiful and verdant is ugly and venomous? You are telling me that what I may find out is ugly and venomous and therefore should be kept a secret. I am saying more than that, Madame Peterson. I am asking you to take the statement we are willing to give you and return home. Heed my warning while there is still time. If you persist in this search, there is danger for you. You are threatening me. No, 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 no. I am simply warning you that your search will inevitably lead you to some who held life very cheaply in those days. I cannot be responsible for what may happen. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Carrier Air Conditioning and True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
the CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. Nice to have you with us again here in this vault of vampires, this haven of horrors this mansion of mystery. For within these halls today, we're going to share an experience of chilling proportions. That of babysitting. Now, I don't really mean babysitting since our young charge is 12 years old, hardly a baby, but you know what I mean. Taking care of a 12-year-old can be more trying than taking care of an infant, particularly such a child as this. Ed, have you looked deeply into his eyes? No. I have, several times. I felt as though I were staring into a deep well, an abyss, into nothingness. Oh, come on. And there's something about the way he stares at us, a deliberate stare, as if he were trying to hold us with his eyes. Our mystery drama, You're Going to Like Rodney was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Bob Juran and stars Tony Roberts and Patricia Elliott. It is sponsored in part by Sunkissed Growers Incorporated. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Sometimes difficult for childless couples to put up with the activity of youth. They lead a life where everything is orderly and comfortable. The intrusion of a child, even for a visit, can upset the harmony of their settled lives. So it was with a certain amount of concern and yet a feeling of compassion that June and Ed Carpenter in San Diego, California, read the letter that arrived from Edgar's brother, George, a New York attorney. Uh, Helen and I are asking a favor. Uh, for the past two weeks, we've been caring for a young boy of 12. A tragic case. His parents were killed in an automobile crash last month. He's been living with his grandmother, a neighbor of ours. And only two weeks ago, she died from a fall. We're taking care of him until I can settle things. He seems to have no one else. Oh, what a trial for the child. It certainly is. Uh, we're asking if you and June could possibly take care of him for us the second week in July. Uh, we're committed to attending the International Bar Association Convention in Switzerland and can't take him with us. I realize you've not had much experience with children, but being my blood brother does create a bond of sympathy. <laughs> Rodney is a special child, and I think you and June could give him the care he needs while we're away. It's only for a week. I wonder what he means by special. Hmm. Bright, probably. He finishes, uh, it will be a great personal favor to Helen and me, and I know the best for Rodney. Let's hear from you. Affectionately, George. Well, what do you think? Well, there's no one around here for Rodney to play with. He'll be terribly bored. Well, July's our slowest month at the office. I mean, I could take more time off. I could take him to some Padres games, uh, the zoo, the beach. I really feel we should help. Of course. We can keep him amused. I don't think it'll be too bad. Agreed? Yes. And Mrs. Nathanson will probably come in to sit when we go to the club. She's always talking about her grandchildren. Well, then I'll tell George we'll take Rodney. We may even get to like him. Oh, you're going to like Rodney, Ed. You can't imagine how much Helen and I appreciate it. Well, we're glad to do it, George. Uh, you know, listen, you said Rodney was a special child. What's he like? What's he like to do? Well, he's sort of the quiet type, you know. Hasn't been much trouble for us. We'll keep him indefinitely until I can settle things with the estate. Uh, there don't seem to be any other relatives. It's strange. You said his parents died in a car accident. Yeah, and I've tried to locate other family members, but there just don't seem to be any. His grandmother was apparently the only one. Well, who took him to her when the parents died? I can't learn that either. I was in touch with some of the neighbors in New Hampshire where his parents lived, but apparently they'd moved in only a few weeks before the accident, and no one knew anything about them. So the poor kid has had a time of it. 
We'll take good care of him here. We'll put Rodney on a plane to San Diego, and you can meet him at the airport, okay? Okay. We'll be ready. Thanks a million, Ed. I know you're going to like Rodney. Oh, I wish we'd left earlier. The plane's in already. Oh, so the kid will wait. It may upset him not to find us there. Look, look we're in time. Now, they haven't opened the gate yet. Oh, I'm glad George sent a picture of him. At least we know who to look for. <laughs> well, there probably aren't many 12-year-olds traveling alone on this flight. We'll spot him. Oh, here they come now. Hey, there he is. Rodney! Rodney! <laughs> here we are. Oh, he sees us. <laughs> Over here. He's a lot smaller than I expected. He looks awfully frail. Hi, Rodney. I'm uh, Uncle Edgar, and this is Aunt June. How was the flight? Fun? Would you like a cold drink or, or something before we start home? Well, at least he shook his head, no. Well, he's probably terrified from the long trip alone. And we're total strangers to him. <laughs> when he sees his room and the swimming pool, he'll brighten up, won't you, Rodney? Now, shall we go home? He's uh, still in his room? Yes. I'm really uneasy, Ed. He, he just won't say a word. While I was unpacking his things, I chatted and asked him questions, but he doesn't speak. And there was one suitcase he, he wouldn't let me touch. Well, I, I wouldn't worry yet. I, he's only been here a few hours. George said he's the quiet type. Give him a chance to get used to us. Quiet is right. <laughs> Completely quiet. Listen, there can't be anything serious. I mean... George would have told us if he had a problem. He's certainly not autistic. No, he responds all right. He nodded yes and no. He shrugged. <laughs> he just won't speak. I, I think I hear him in the kitchen. I'll get him out here and into the pool. Hey, Rodney! Come on out! Oh, you've got your suit on already. W would you like to swim? <laughs> Last one in is a rotten egg. <laughs> <laughs> come, on, come on in. Go on in, Rodney. You you can swim, can't you? Yeah, had a boy. Come on. Oh, there we go. <laughs> get up on my shoulders now. I'll toss you. Oh. <laughs> That's it. <clears throat> a strong little devil, aren't you? <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Ed, Ed, are you all right? <coughs> Ed, Ed, what's the matter? Get off. Ed! Get off! Ed! Help! Help! I'm throwing you the live ring, darling. You can't get it. Hold on. Hold on. Rodney, help me pull him in. Hold on, Ed. You're, all, you're almost to the side. There. Here, darling. Here, gr grab my arm. I'm okay. I'm okay. i got to get my breath. Stretch, stretch up, darling. Face down. What was it? A, a cramp? Oh, that kid is strong. I couldn't get out from under him. What do you mean? Oh, I know it wasn't your fault, Rodney. I I put you up on my shoulders. But, Edgar, he slipped off your shoulders. No, he didn't. He was pressing down on me. Oh, well, there was so much splashing. I, I couldn't tell what was going on, except that you looked like you were drowning. I, I think I almost did. But he's not that heavy. Almost scrawny, and you're 200 pounds. I could. I couldn't get up. Edgar? He's gone into the house. He, he probably feels guilty. I, I tried to tell him it was my idea. Hello? A anything the matter? Oh, uh, Mrs. Nathanson. Oh, please, come in. Oh, well, I was in my garden. I heard a commotion. Nothing serious, I hope. Well, yes, almost. Here, darling, sit down. Oh. Yeah, I was playing with Rodney and nearly drowned in the pool. Dear me, how awful. Well, I'm glad to say you didn't. Uh, uh, by the way, who, who is uh, Rodney? He's a, a youngster my brother in New York took in. He, he's 12. We're looking after him for the week. Ed's brother and his wife are in Switzerland for a lawyer's conference. Oh, yes. I, I was in Switzerland in 1903 with Mr. Nathanson. Mm. Uh, how did you almost drown, Mr. Carpenter? I don't know. I was playing with the boy, and, uh, and I couldn't get my breath. 
I couldn't get to the surface. Oh, curious. Your pool isn't that deep. And Rodney's not that big. Well, all's well that ends well. I'll get back to my roses. Oh, um, Mrs. Nathanson, hmm? since you're here, I, I wonder... Well, could we call on you to sit with Rodney well, one or two nights a week when we go to the club? Oh, but of course. I'd be delighted. You know, my grandson, Arthur, he's a 14-year-old. He called me the other day, all on his own, and it was Would just... you like some iced tea, Mrs. Nathan? Oh, no, dear, thanks. I must get back. I'm glad it was nothing serious. <laughs> just call any time. I'll be glad to sit with Rodney. Thanks so much. Well... I'd better go in and see him. Yeah, and he probably feels that it was his fault. Now, I'll talk to him. We've got to make him understand. He's not to blame. I uh, brought you some lemonade, Rodney. I know you feel strange here, and that's understandable. You've never met us before, but please, we're your friends. Rodney, let me ask you, can you talk and just don't want to, or are we trying to make you talk when you can't? You, you can shake your head, yes or no. Oh, you don't want to answer. All right, Rodney. I'll tell you what. While you're with us, you can do just as you want. We won't press you. And if you feel like talking, we'll be happy to talk with you. Uh, I'm going down and start supper now. We're having steak outside. I'll call you when we're ready. Uh, Rodney, what is it? Oh, you want to write something. Oh, good. Wait, um, let's see. There should be paper right here. Mm, yes, here, Rodney. A pad and a pencil. Oh, I'm so glad you want to say something. T take your time. If you want to communicate to us through notes, it's perfectly all right. Let's see. <gasps> Rodney, wh oh, what a horrible thing to write. Your cat is going to die. Why should he write such a cruel thing? I, I thought he was going to say thank you or, or something. I, I, I was trying to be kind. Your cat? Cat is going to die. Strange, all right. Do you think he means he, he's going to try and kill her? Oh, come on. Where are you going? Going back upstairs and find out what's with this kid. Ed, please, don't upset him anymore. Well, he's getting me upset with that stony stare of his, mocking us with his silence. Look here, Rummy. What does this mean? Ed. Why? I want to know right now why you wrote this. I mean, there's the pad. And write your answer if you won't talk. Ed, wait. He's crying. Well, he's going to have more to cry about if we don't get an answer from him. Rodney, what is it? You're so unhappy. You're sorry you wrote the note. Is that it? Look, he's nodding his head. Okay, okay. Take it easy, Rodney. I'm sorry. I lost my temper. Rodney, get into bed, put on your pajamas, and just rest. I'll bring you a light supper later. <laughs> it's been a trying day for you. We won't bother you any more today. We'll leave you now. Okay? Okay. Brother George sent us a handful. I think you should get in touch with him right away and find out if this is Rodney's usual behavior. I don't see how they could have put up with this for well, even a few months. No, neither do I. Uh, do you want to call him? No, let's wait. I, I can't see getting George upset on our first day. Let's give it a chance. After all, we ought to be able to deal with a 12-year-old boy. Well, maybe we were wise to wait. He's been a little better the past two days. Yeah, he's getting used to us. If only he'd talk. He hasn't even written anything since that... Now, that first note. Maybe he hasn't anything to say. We do the talking, and all he has to say is yes or no. Ed, have you ever looked deeply into his eyes? No. No, not really. I have. Several times. I felt as though I were 
staring into a deep well, an abyss, into nothingness. Oh, come on. Mr. Carpenter. Mrs. Carpenter. Oh, what's the matter, Mrs. Nathanson? You're all flushed. Here, here, sit down. Oh, no, that's all right. I, I don't know how to tell you. I'll just have to say it. Under my porch this morning, I found your cat, Sylvester. Dead. It seems that Rodney's prophecy came true. He told the carpenters a cat would die. But was it a prophecy, I wonder? Or did Rodney have something to do with it? He's such a strange youngster. Would he go so far as to kill an innocent little cat that belonged to people he hardly knew? I hope a similar fate doesn't await the other people in our story. We'll find out when I return shortly with Act Two. company can indeed be troublesome now and then, particularly when the company is a strange child who writes threatening notes. But then, who could be afraid of a 12-year-old child? But remember, Rodney is somewhat of a special child, an orphan whose parents were killed in an auto accident. I think we ought to have some compassion for the boy. But at the moment, the carpenters and Mrs. Nathanson are lamenting the death of the carpenter's cat. There he is. I'm so sorry. Are there any marks on him, Aunt? There don't seem to be. No. None at all. He might have eaten something. Never leaves the yard. He couldn't have gotten any poisoned food. Must have died last night. I'm going to take him to the vet for an autopsy. I'm serious. I'll get a carton. I have one round back. Do you think Rodney killed Sylvester? (laughs) Don't you? I don't want to think that. I'm taking Sylvester to the vet, and then I'm going to talk to that kid. I'll come with you. I don't know what to say to him now. You heard the vet. No apparent cause of death. How could Rodney be responsible for that? Ed, we've got to stop blaming him and being suspicious of him. He needs some kindness. Maybe you're right. Look, what's that on the coffee table? A paper. It's his handwriting. Look at this. (gasps) I told you so. That evil little devil. Rodney? Rodney? Come down here, right now. What are we going to say to him? Plenty. (laughs) He's going to be around here for the rest of the week. He's not going to get smart with us. This has got to stop. Rodney, come over here. Right here. Rodney, I don't know what you meant by this note. You didn't kill Sylvester. And writing a note like this is cruel. Don't let me see another note like this in this house again. You understand? Look, he's going to write something. Oh, good. Let's see what you have to say for yourself. He's not saying much. Two words. Well, at least we're getting something out of him. Well, what did he write? What did I just get through telling you? Ed, what are you doing? You hit him. I'll teach this. What did he write? Here. (gasps) You're next. You go to your room. Right now. No 12-year-old is going to intimidate me. Go on up, Rodney. He's a brat we're stuck with for the week, and he's not going to scare me with those threats. Ed, please, calm down. The the child's just being belligerent. You're going to antagonize him even more. You're not afraid of him, are you? Uh, I... don't know. He won't open his door. We'll have to go without him if you still want to go. Well, we'll go to the beach instead of the zoo. I got a yen for some surf fishing. If he doesn't want a good time, the heck with him. He'll be safe here alone. We'll be back in a couple of hours. Maybe I'd better stay. I don't care that much for the beach anyway. And, now, frankly, you deserve the relaxation. He'll be all right. Besides, I thought you were afraid of him. Not afraid. No. I think... I feel sorry for him. 
He seems a terribly disturbed boy. Okay. Okay, I'll go alone if you don't mind. No, I'll pack you lunch. Maybe alone I can get closer to Rodney. Hello? May I come over? Oh, please do, Mrs. Nathanson. Oh, well, I saw Mr. Carpenter drive off with his fishing gear. Uh, tell me, what did you learn about poor Sylvester's death? The vet couldn't say. Just no apparent cause. Oh. Well, that's strange, isn't it? Oh, but it does happen, I guess. Oh, by the way, how is the young man who's staying with you? I haven't seen him at all. He's well, all right. He he stays in his room a lot. Oh, well, that doesn't sound natural for a 12-year-old boy. Is something the matter with him? Well, we don't know. He, he never speaks. He, he writes the most ghastly notes. There seems to be something disturbing the child. Oh, well, what kind of notes does he write? Well, the first said our cat would die. Oh. And then he left one saying, I told you so. Oh, dear me. And then, right in front of us, he wrote, You're next. Oh. Well, maybe it's his way of attracting attention. We, we don't know anything about him. Uh, could he have killed Sylvester? Somehow? Oh, that doesn't seem likely. Uh, what does Mr. Carpenter think? Well, he thinks Rodney's just a brat. He doesn't take his notes seriously. Oh, well, the child's certainly not going to kill anyone. He's just going through a stage. Oh, oh, excuse me. There's the phone. Oh. Stay here. I I'll be back in a minute. Yes. Uh, hello? June? I never made the beach. I'm at the hospital. W what? W what are you talking about? What's the matter? Lost control of the car going over to Coronado. <gasps> it, it just wouldn't steer. It went into the water. Ed! For heaven's sake. I wanted you to know before you heard it from someone else. The car is in eight feet of water. I'll, I'll be right there, darling. No, no, no. You stay where you are. Uh, the cops are going to bring me home. I'm okay. I, I got out in time. Well, hurry, then. Uh, hurry. I will. Mrs. Carpenter, what is it? You, you're shaking. Oh, that was Ed. Oh. He lost control of the car. It went into the water... At Coronado. Oh, dear me. Is he all right? Yes. The, the police are bringing him home. Oh, thank heaven. I, I don't understand it. Ed had a complete annual overhaul on the station wagon last month. But they would have found anything wrong with the stick. Oh, well, you'd think so. Please, stay with me, Mrs. Nathanson. I, I'm so upset. I don't oh, want to be alone. Of course I will, of course. Can I get you something? Oh, yes. Th there's some aspirin in the cupboard over the sink. I, I could use it. Oh, all right. I'll get it. Now, you sit right there. This is curious. Oh, here's your aspirin. I, I found this on the kitchen table. Oh, no. It says, Mist. Uh, uh, just the one word, Mist. That's his writing. Rodney's. What does he mean, uh, Mist? On top of Ed's accident. Oh, he's a fiend. Oh, but the child couldn't possibly have had anything to do with the car. I am beginning to wonder. Uh, Mrs. Carpenter, I, I think you're letting yourself I get... I don't want oh. Ed to see that paper. Oh, do you still have the other note? Yes. I wonder. My sister is quite good at handwriting analysis. Now, she's helped the police department several times. Perhaps if she looked at Rodney's writing, she could tell us something about his character. It's quite revealing. That is a good idea. W would she? <laughs> And how is Mr. Carpenter? That accident yesterday shook him terribly. He's staying in bed today. Ah. We have to go to the club dance tonight. He's the president. We can't miss it. Oh, I wish we could cancel. Oh, now, don't worry. Everything will be fine. And don't forget, I'll be sitting with Rodney. But I really came over to tell you what my sister says about his handwriting. Oh, yes, what? Well, she couldn't be as thorough as she usually is because the letters are printed, not written. Yes. Of course... I didn't tell her a thing about who Rodney is. Uh, she didn't even know he was a child. What did she say? Now, this is so curious. She said she got the impression, just the feeling, mind you, that the person was a very old man. 
An old man? Now, she admitted it was just a feeling. But, but, but an old man? What did she say when you told her Rodney is only 12? Uh, she looked rather strange and said, uh, I'd never have guessed it. Hi, hi. I couldn't stay in bed another minute. Oh, how are you feeling, Mr. Carpenter? Uh, shaky, but okay. Hey, those look like Rodney's notes. They are, Ed. Uh, Mrs. Nathanson's sister analyzed his handwriting. But she, she's an expert. Oh, you didn't tell me about this. Oh, well, she did it last night. I just brought them back. And what did she say? She thought that Rodney was an old man. What? Well, she couldn't tell much because the letters were printed. No. Mm -hmm. Did June uh, ask you about tonight, Mrs. Nathan? Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm happy to come over. Oh, I, I got to go downtown and see about the car. I'll be home around two. Please, drive carefully. I still feel uneasy with that child in this house. Well, he's troubled, and it's understandable after all he's been through. But uh, really, Mrs. Carpenter, I hardly think he's dangerous. Well, Mrs. Nathanson, we won't be late. That's all right. Enjoy yourselves. Heaven knows you deserve it. I wouldn't even go to this dinner dance at all with Rodney here, but as president of the club, I have to be there. Uh, you know the club number if you need us. Of course. But nothing is going to happen. If Rodney does come down, maybe he'd like a game of checkers. Don't have to talk to play that. Let's go, Joan. Well, bye. And relax. Everything's going to be all right here. Oh, help yourself to anything in the refrigerator. Uh, there's a fresh cream pie and coffee's in the pot. Oh, thank you. Have fun. <laughs> My, that pie does look... Oh, oh you startled me. You... You're Rodney. Well, I, I... I'm glad to meet you at last. I'm Mrs. Nathanson. You're just in time for some delicious cream pie. Uh, you, you don't want any. Oh, I'm surprised. I thought all 12-year-old boys had an empty pit. I... I I wish you, you wouldn't stare at me like that. Uh, you're, you're going to... You're going to uh, write something? Oh, uh, uh, good. Uh, let's see. Uh, do I like butterflies? Oh, why, yes. I think they're very beautiful. Uh, oh, a another note. Would I like to see your collection? Oh, I'd love to, Rodney. How many do you have? Oh, it's upstairs. Okay. <laughs> Lead the way. Oh, so this is your room, Rodney. It's very nice. Oh, but it's my so hot and stuffy. Oh, dear me, let's open a window. It, it's midsummer and you have all the windows closed. There. That's better. Now, ah, let's see your butterflies. Well, aren't you going to show me your collection? Rodney, why are you staring like that? Rodney, don't come any closer to me. I don't like it. Rodney, what's the matter with you? As I said at the start of our excursion into the macabre, babysitting can be an experience of chilling proportions. Rodney is indeed a handful, and he still has two more days to spend with the carpenters. Frankly, I'd take him over my knee and give him what he deserves. We'll find out what else Rodney is up to when I return shortly with Act Three. Carpenter household, once so quiet and serene, hasn't been the same since Rodney arrived. The Carpenters expected that the routine of their lives would change when they agreed to take care of the child for a week, but never in their wildest dreams did they imagine just how drastic the change would be. At the moment, they're trying to enjoy the dinner dance at the club without much success. Edgar, can't we leave? I'll only be another hour. What's going to happen? I don't know. I... I just would feel better if we were back home. I call if it'll make you feel better. Talk to Mrs. Nathanson. I think I will. 
Uh, do you think I should, well, warn her? Now, don't scare the poor woman. Rodney's certainly not going to threaten her. I'll be back in a minute. Hello? Uh, 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 who's this? Well, who is this? Oh, excuse me. I, I must have the wrong number. Now, wait a minute, ma'am. Who, who, who did you want? The Carpenter residence. Uh, Mrs. Nathanson. Uh, who are you? I have to know who you are, ma'am. Well, uh, I'm Mrs. Carpenter. Mrs. Nathanson is babysitting for me. Oh, oh. Uh, I'm police, Mrs. Carpenter. Police? Officer Dugan. What is it? Good Lord, what's happened? An accident, Mrs. Carpenter. Can you come right away? Uh, yes, 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 right away. <laughs> I can't believe it. Mrs. Nathanson. A neighbor out for a walk saw the body lying next to the house. We we think she fell from the upper window. Rodney's room. We haven't been able to get a word out of the boy. I'm glad you're here. If only we'd stayed home. The boy doesn't talk, officer. Doesn't talk? He's your son? No, 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 no. He's, he's my brother's ward temporarily. We're taking care of him for a week. Well, you think we can get anything out of him? We'll try, but he's a strange kid. We'll need a pad and a pencil. Oh, I got it right here. Ronnie, you've got to answer some questions. What happened to Mrs. Nathanson? He's shaking his head no. Yes, you do know, Ronnie. You were here with Mrs. Nathanson. She was found on the ground outside your bedroom window. Now, what happened? Answer me. Yeah, the kid's frightened and... It's getting late. Uh, put him to bed. We'll try to talk to him in the morning. Okay, okay. Go to bed, Rodney. I'll take him up. Well, there, there'll be an autopsy. It'll probably show she died of injuries from the fall. I, I hope that kid can tell us what happened. Ed. Mm. Ed, mm. wake up. Huh? What is, what's the matter? Ed, Rodney's just gone downstairs. What time is it? Uh, four o'clock. Well, I'll get up and see what the kid's up to. Rodney? I'll come with you. Rodney, where are you? He can't answer. We'll have to find him. I don't trust that kid wandering around the house. You know, he's liable to come at us with a butcher's knife. Ed... The front door. He went out. Turn on the light. Why would he be going outside? Rodney! Get in here. Can you see him? No. He might be running away. Huh. We should be so lucky. Uh, Rodney! We know you're out here. Now come on in. Right now. I don't like this. I, I'm getting frightened. You go in. You're cold. Uh, I'll find him. I, I, I don't want to be alone. She could be hiding anywhere. Either. Shrubs. Uh... <gasps> the front door. A little devil tricked us. He doubled back inside. Come on. What's he trying to do to us? Rodney. Rodney, come here. Right here, right now. Me the willies. He's deliberately trying to bait us. I'm not going back to bed until I know where he is. Well, we know he's in the house. Do we? And we heard the front door slam when we were outside. That's all we heard. How do we know he actually came in? Well, when you put it that way, how do we know he actually went out? Why is he doing this? Because he's a malicious brat. That's why. We're not playing into his hands anymore. It's ridiculous to be terrorized by a 12-year-old. I keep thinking about Mrs. Nathanson. Oh, this whole night's been one horror. Well, Rodney knows damn well what happened, but how do we get it out of him? But what can we do? We're going back upstairs. I couldn't sleep if my life depended on it. Yeah, well, it won't. <laughs> I don't know what he's up to, but there's nothing he can do to us. Look, I'm... I'm not looking for him anymore. Oh, it's starting to get light. I might as well get dressed. The police will be back later this morning. And if Rodney's not here, I don't give a damn. Ed. 
His door's closed. There's no way it could be. He... Oh, but he, he's in bed. <laughs> Hello? Ed, it's George. How's it going? Oh, you should ask. Where are you? New York. Flew in last night. Brought a visitor from England back with us. Listen, how'd you get along with Rodney? Why didn't you tell me he was a little fiend? What do you mean? Well, he never said a word the whole week. Oh, I know, I know. He writes notes to us, too. That's only half of it. Well, anything happened to you? Yeah, we had a tragedy. Our neighbor was sitting with Rodney when, uh... When we went to the club, she fell out the bedroom window. What? And our cat died. Sylvester? Hey, you have had a week. Yeah, and it all happened with Rodney here. Come on, he's just a kid. You don't think... I can't he... get into it now, George, but the the minute he gets off that plane, find someplace else for him. Ted, what's the matter with I'm you? I'm telling you, the minute he gets off that plane, take him to some welfare agency or whatever. Sure. Put him on the plane tomorrow. It's flight 704. With the greatest pleasure. Okay. I'll meet him at this end. You're welcome to him. I'm sorry you think he caused you so much trouble. Anyway, I appreciate you taking care of him. I owe you one, Ed. Forget it. I'm trying to. Okay. I'll meet him at Kennedy tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, George. Bye. Oh. Ronnie. I didn't hear you. You're going back tomorrow. You want to know something, kid? I still think you pushed Mrs. Nathanson out the window. And I still think you had something to do with the cat. <laughs> no response, huh? I can't prove it. I wish I could. Come here. Closer. Yeah, June's right. There isn't anything behind those eyes of yours. What are you? Well, I don't mind telling you, kid. I'll be glad to see you off tomorrow. But I can't find Rodney. We've got to leave in ten minutes. You know, it's another one of his tricks. Like Thursday night. If it's the last thing I do, I'll get him on that plane. Now maybe he's afraid to go back. Oh, he's not afraid of anything. I'll put his stuff in the car. We'll find him. After all that's happened, I still feel kind of sorry. He seems such a lost little boy. Lost my foot. Oh. Oh, there he is. He's sitting in the car. I never thought of looking there. Good. He's as anxious to get out of here as we are to see him go. Okay, Ruddy... You're on your way. Well, there it goes. Bye-bye, Rodney. <laughs> I had to see that plane in the sky before I'd leave. Now let's go home. That's funny. There's a note on the back seat. I... I didn't see it when we took his stuff out. A note? I can reach it. I can't imagine when he put it there. What's it say? Goodbye. It was. Goodbye. It was. But he must have meant to finish the sentence. Like it was nice, or, or it was awful. Just goodbye, and it was. Yep. That's it. Well, that's the last of them, anyway. I wish I knew what he was going to add. You know, maybe he was trying to thank us after all. Hmm. Bad chance of that. It would have been something sinister. You can bet on that. I'm still sick over Mrs. Nathanson. We have to go to her funeral this afternoon. I know. What the... Ed, you went right through that red light. The brakes are gone. I'm down to the floor. Oh, What? I'll try to gear down. Stop it. Stop. Stop. I... That truck's coming right on through. I can't. Ah! Well, I 
I'm glad you could come to the airport with me, Mrs. Parker. Helen hates the trip. Oh, well, I'm here to see New York. I want to see as much as I can. Passengers are coming through the gate now. There, there he is. Hey, Rodney, over here, Rodney. Oh, rather a pale young lad, isn't he? Well, I feel sorry for him. I hope they find him a good home soon. His parents were killed in a car accident. Oh. He was living with his grandmother until she died from a fall. How tragic. And it's nice of you and your wife to take him in. Rodney, I want you to meet Mrs. Parker. She's from England, and she's staying with us for a while. How do you do, Rodney? She'll be sharing your room with you. She, oh, You don't have to be embarrassed. Mrs. Parker has grandchildren older than you. <laughs> Just think of me as a grandmother. I'm sure we'll be good friends. Won't we, Rodney? Oh, I think so, Mrs. Parker. You're going to like Rodney. Well, I certainly don't. I've been thinking over that last curious note Rodney left the carpenters, Ed and June. Just... Goodbye, and it was. Too bad they didn't realize in time, just before their deaths in that terrible crash. Ed had said he'd get Rodney on the plane if it was the last thing he did. Now we know Rodney's cryptic reply. It was. More about Rodney when I return in just a moment. seed, a bad boy who can't help himself, or perhaps a demon from another time, destined to spend eternity causing identical tragedies wherever he goes. The empty eyes, the extra strength, and that curious mistake of Mrs. Nathanson's sister, thinking he was very old. Or was it a mistake? We can only speculate. Our cast included Patricia Elliott, Tony Roberts, Bryna Rayburn, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. They say there do be girls in Galway that are the fairest in the world. Of course, there are other things in Galway, all Ireland for that matter, that you don't find anywhere else. Clericons and banshees, the little folk, and of course the leprechaun himself. Blarney and the Blarney Stone itself. So many things that are hard to credit that the only way is to make a trip there for yourselves. As we are now going to do. Ah! Oh, mother of heaven, he's at it again, Mary. Uncle Terrence? Who else? Rattling his portrait against the chimney stones and wailing like the banshee he is. Oh. Well, Sean, you know what he's after. Eh? Turn the picture face to the wall and give the poor man the chance to dress himself in privacy. Eh, all right, Mary. Oh, but, but where would he want to be off to today? There's no wake or wedding or holy day to celebrate. But if he's taken advantage of the leprechaun's promise, there's something special in the wind. Now, 
You being the man, take a wee peep there and see if he's gone. <laughs> he's gone. The canvas is bare as a turnip. Ah, oh, then mark my word, Sean Daly. We're in for some excitement in Clenford. I wonder what will be this time. <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Wakeful Ghost, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Mackin finished his last year of med school and found himself with a thousand dollars left of his inheritance and two weeks before he began his internship. He was weary from the long struggle for his medical degree because in spite of scholarships, he had to work outside to raise money for the six years of study. Both his parents were dead. So far as he knew, he was alone in the world. But his background was Irish, and he had some vague memory that an aunt and uncle were living still in the old country. So he decided to spend the two weeks on a vacation, which was to change his whole life. Nobody's going to believe this, but it's exactly what happened to me in Ireland. After roaming around a few days in Dublin, I took a train for Ballinaslow and Galway to the west. The only clue I had to my uncle and aunt was an old postcard with that postmark and their names, Sean and Mary Daly, which is sort of equivalent to John and Mary Smith. I didn't have much hope of finding them, but it was a joy just to have nothing to do with my last three days playing detective. No one was more surprised than I when a ruddy-faced little gentleman walked up to me at the station. Sure, now, I couldn't be mistaken, but just for the politeness of the thing and observing the formalities of square. But you wouldn't be Brian Macken from America. Uh, well, yes, that, that's exactly who I would be. And now you may be wondering who I am. Uh, well, yes, I am. I am indeed. <laughs> sure. I'm your great-uncle Terence on your mother's side, once or twice removed. For I was born on the wrong side of the blanket, they say. <laughs> oh, I, I, I don't know myself nor care. For sure. In my own opinion, I was a changeling, which accounts for my close associations with with the uh, well, that, that's of no matter for the moment. Terence Kruskin is the name. Terence Kinsella Clonme Kruskin. But your Uncle Terence will serve. To the way most people know me. Well, I, 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 I'm still puzzled. Um, how did you know me? I have a little cart and a pony waiting. Oh. And if we want to get to your aunt and uncle's before dark, I'm thinking we'd best get along. And I'll tell you all on the way. Uh, I, I, I don't mean to be rude, sir, but I still would like to know how you knew I was coming here today. I only made up my mind on the spur of the moment this morning. Ah, now that's where you're wrong, do you see? Well, what do you mean? Well, while we're riding along, would you like a little dash of potheen to warm the cockles of your heart? <laughs> Is that the Irish whiskey you make out of bog water that's about 180 proof? Ah, uh -huh, the same? Uh, no, thanks. No, that's the stuff I had last night in Dublin that knocked me out like a Mickey. I'm still not over it. <laughs> well, now then, to answer your question. Yeah. How I knew to expect you. Uh -huh. Do you remember the little chap in the green bowler you met at the snook last night? Oh, yeah, I remember him. He, he introduced me to this nectar. Well, now, McDrush is a friend of mine. You know, that's not what he said last night. That he wasn't a friend? Uh, no, I mean that that wasn't his name. Oh, he probably called himself Michael Mahan or some such. Yeah, that's right. Sure, that's what he uses as, as a cover when he's out and about the town. <laughs> What is he, a, a secret agent, an uh, IRA or something? Not him. He's all peace and goodwill. He's a leprechaun. A leprechaun? That's right. Oh, oh, oh God, come on, Uncle Terrence. Stop pulling my leg. Michael Mahan was no leprechaun. Did he have a little green bowler? Well, I don't know if you could call it green. It, it was green. old. Green. And did he have pointy little ears just under his hat rim at the top, like? Well, as a matter of fact... 
Medically, I was interested because the auricular cartilage was strangely shaped. The, the what was what? At the top of his ears. Ah, there, 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 there. You see, you see? There's your answer. Enough to convince an American. Anyway, your friend the leprechaun sent me a message in a way that we have. And that's well, this how must I... must be the greatest put-on of all time. You're not going to tell me you're a leprechaun, too. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I'm more of a banshee, you might call me, but with special privileges. Oh, yes, quite special. Uh, but that can wait. Oh, Mary Nair. Oh, oh. oh, is this where my aunt and uncle live? It is. Sean and Mary Daly? That's who they are. Are they expecting me? Lord bless you, no, but you'll be welcome, son, as welcome as the flowers in May. <laughs> Here, take your bags and, and jump on down. Well, aren't you coming in with me to introduce me? Well, sure, you're a nice, well-mannered lad, and you'll manage by yourself. But it's time enough to put Maureen and the cat and myself away till any of us is needed. God hold you in his pocket till we meet again. We are going to, aren't we? Oh, yes, indeed. I don't know how to be arranged, but I have plans for you and the future of more than one. At the moment, he was calling his back to me. The twilight was upon us. It must have been some trick of the rising evening mist, but I swear, before he reached the corner of the building... Uncle Terence, the old-fashioned cart, and Maureen, who pulled it, seemed to disappear in the gathering gloom. Good evening to you, young gentleman. Uh, excuse me, uh, are you by any chance Mrs. Sean Daly? I am that. Uh, uh, did you have a brother who emigrated to America called Thomas Mackin? I did. And you're from America? Yeah. <gasps> you couldn't be... <laughs> It's just Brian, you are. Brian Larkin, whose mother was Margaret Denise. That's me. Hi, Aunt Mary. Oh, Brian. Oh, me darling boy, me darling boy. Oh, forgive me. Come in. Come in. Sean. Sean, will you look who's here? It's Tommy's son and Margaret. This is your Uncle Sean. Uh, well, it is a pleasure to meet oh, you. Yes, oh, it's sit down, sit down. Sean, take the boy's bag. Yes. yes. How did you ever find us? Oh, it's been years since we lost track. Sean and me had to move so sudden like, and our letters seemed to go astray. Now uh, tell me about Tom and Margaret. Well, uh, uh, mother and dad both died suddenly oh. within a month of each other. Well, I, I've been so busy burying myself in schoolwork, I didn't... Well, I, I let everything else oh, go. Oh, you poor darling. Oh, if I'd known. Oh, you must tell us yeah. all about uh, it. Can I get you a wee nip to settle you? Oh, no, 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 thanks. I'm learning to be careful of Irish nips. Well, then I'll get you something to eat. Now, you'll stay the night with us in a few days. Sure, I, I, I've got till the weekend before I have to catch my plane home. Oh. Anyway, I, I'll wait to have dinner with all of you. Aunt Mary... Uncle Sean and Uncle Terence. Uh, Uncle who? Uncle Terence. Uh, he met me at the station, brought me here. I'd never found you without him. He just went to put the horse and cart away. Hmm. A little mare with one black eye and one white? Yeah, that's Maureen. And did you expect to meet him at the station? No, no. He absolutely floored me. I mean, the only reason I came to Ballinasloe was because I found an old card from you to Mother with a postmark. Uh, I was just taking a wild stab in the dark that someone might know about you or where you live. I wanted to... Well, I, I mean, as far as I know, you are my only living relative. Oh, we are, darling. We are. Well, I didn't know about Uncle Terrence and... Well... And what, Brian? You can be free with us. Well, I, I, I don't know what to say. He talked about uh, leprechauns and banshees, you know, that sort of thing. And, oh, I might have thought he was a little, uh, uh, I guess you'd say, touched, except for... Well, I shouldn't talk this way. I, I loved him. He was, he was fun and amusing, full of a wonderful zest for life, but sort of scary, too. Is he the same at home here? Oh, he can be all of those, though we don't see much of it anymore. Uncle Terence is a great problem oh, for us. Oh, well, I, I'm sorry. Nothing but, to do with you. you know, I, I hope you won't tell him some of the things I just said or, or, or intimated. Uh, when he comes in for dinner, I mean. Yeah, he, uh, he won't be here for dinner. Oh, oh, I thought he lived here. Well, uh, so he does in a, in a sort of way. I think it's time that we told the boy the truth, Sean, as best we can. Ah, uh, yes. Well, you, uh, 
You had a good long look at Uncle Terrence. He, uh, he wouldn't forget it. Oh, no, no, never. Look behind the picture and make sure... Yes. Yes, he's back again. Now, come here. You see this portrait, Brian? Now, would that, uh... Would that be Uncle Terrence? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's him. That's him to the life. You're not exactly. The gentleman you are looking at has been dead these 35 years. What? The but... only problem is that uh, he won't stay decently in his grave. <laughs> So Brian Mackin has come all the way to Ireland to find a real uncle and aunt. And in addition, a quite unreal uncle. A man who appears to be able to rise from the grave full-bodied by the mere device of having his portrait turned to the wall. No wonder Brian is convinced that it's all illusionary. A pipe dream programmed by that potent poteen. And yet, this is only the beginning. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Back again to our world of fantasy and a young American trapped in a web of superstition, illusion, or perhaps just the spell the Emerald Island can weave so easily about any visitor to its shores. Still, whatever doubts and fears he may have taken to bed with him, they are all dispelled by a glorious sunrise that wakes him up with cock crow. My window faced to the east, with the sun streaming in and striking shafts of golden light from a blue river a few miles away. I climbed out of the host of warm blankets and quilt that covered my bed. <laughs> the room was cold enough for me to seek the sun's warmth directly. And it was there, at the window, I first saw Sheila. She was not a small girl. She was tall and sturdy. But she walked as though each footfall was no heavier than a feather landing on the ground. She had long brown hair and purple eyes. With a wide mouth that, well, once I saw it break in a smile... Made me make up my mind this was going to be my gal. Uh, since she was approaching the house carrying a basket, I don't suppose I ever dressed faster in my life to get down in time not to miss meeting her. Good morning, Brian. And did you sleep well? Oh, yes. The best sleep I've had since I can remember. Ah, uh, sure, it was a short enough one, and you so tired. Well, that cock was crowing. And... Ah, that old rooster, <laughs> he's no fake. <laughs> Small use he is to hens anymore. His best days being over. Never a chick in the last two years. There's not over four or five layers we have left. So Sheila here and me, we have a bargain. <laughs> oh, you will not have met Sheila O'Shaughnessy from the next farm over. Sheila, this is my nephew, all the way from the United States of America. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Mr... Uh, uh, M Mackin. Uh, uh, Brian Mackin. Oh, it's a good West Country name. Mr. Mackin. Yeah, well, my grandfather came from here. Uh, from Galway, I mean. <laughs> they say he was quite a bully boy. Aye. Well, those days are past, praise be. Still, the way things are, we were better off with a shillelagh than a gun. Oh, well, I, I couldn't agree with you more... Anyone who plans to be a doctor... Is that what you're away to be? Well, I I already am. I, I mean, I've graduated and have my license. Now I have to intern and be a hospital resident for a few years till I start out on my own. Oh, that's grand. I have a great admiration for doctors. Now, now, then, this will have to hold or the bread will burn up on us. And I want you to get it home with a little heat left in us. <laughs> this is Mrs. Daly's bargain with me. I bring her a basket of eggs... And she bakes the most delicious bread this side of heaven. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, here, no, here's the basket. Keep the towel tucked in good and tight, man. Never fear. Uh, that's that's a heavy basket. Uh, why don't I carry it for you to your house? I was going to give you your breakfast. Yeah, well, uh, it'll wait. I always like a little exercise before I eat. Ah, well, you'll be after getting that, all right. It's a good mile and a half to Sheila's place. Oh. And a road like a switchback all the way. Oh, the basket is nothing. It's light as a feather. No, I, I really would like a walk if, if, if you don't object. I don't object. I have a curious turn of mind. 
And I'd like to hear all about America. Oh, what I'd really like you to be able to do is to show it to you, but... <laughs> Why don't you show me Ireland first? Yeah. Was that Sheila O'Shaughnessy then? The same. Oh, now, damn it. Well, well why, why didn't she wait long enough for me to get down and, and get my little morning pack on the cheek, huh? <laughs> sure, she has little interest in an old gaffer like you. <laughs> but you should have seen her reaction to Brian and his to her. Well, well, will you look at the two of them? She's over shoulder high to him. Oh, what a fine couple they'd make. Uh, don't I know it. And don't I know just as well I should never have let the boy go off with even a pinch of hope in his heart. No, and she can't ever be for him. And is it really true that in Chicago they have a building that's 96 whole stories high in the air? Oh, yeah, that's true enough. It's so damn high that half the time the people on the top floors can't tell what to wear when they go out. Well, how is that? Well, you see, it's air-conditioned. And when the cloud cover is low, they can't see down to the street, so they don't know if it's raining or snowing or cold or hot or what. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just imagine that now, living above the clouds. It'd be a sort of fairyland. Well, nothing like the one you live in here, right on the ground. Oh, sure. Air oh. is lovely. But there are other lovely places in the world I'd want to see. Hey, you know a lot about America anyway. Well, I watch the telly, you know. And I read a lot. And I... Oh, here. <laughs> it's winded you are. I'll slow down a bit. Oh, this is damn hills. <laughs> Up and down like a roller coaster. That's what Mrs. Daly meant by a switchback. I'm surprised to find myself so out of condition. Will you be staying with the Dalys for a while? On one condition. What's that? That you'll take another walk with me? Tomorrow's Saturday. We, we could take a picnic lunch along and uh, climb that mountain over there. Oh, I'm afraid I couldn't do that. You have another date? No, it's not that. It's... Oh, you see, my dad's dead. and It's just my mother and me, and, and she's half crippled with the rheumatism. Oh. I couldn't be leaving her all alone all that time. And, and then... There's the farm chores to be well, done. Well, I could, I could come over and, and help you get those out of the way. Ah, oh, Dr. Mackin. Uh, Brian. Well, it's a bit soon in order, but if you want, Brian. Oh, it's just no good. It's not the way it should be. You, you don't want to go with me? Is that it, Sheila? Sheila. I do want to, Brian, I do. Oh, well, then come. It'd be my only chance now. I'll meet you. Here, by this bridge we're about to cross. And before dawn tomorrow, so we'll not be seen. We'll spend a whole long, lovely day together. With no one the wiser. But, but can I tell Uncle Sean and Aunt Mary? Oh, don't tell anyone. It's our secret. But the picnic... I'll take care of that. Now you leave me here. Till tomorrow at, say, 4.30. Well, whatever you say. Sheila... I know. So do I. God help the both of us. He was gone in a second with that light loping stride that covered ground almost as fast as a man running. I watched her as long as I could, away down that dusty, twisting, hilly road, appearing and disappearing, till at last she was out of sight, but not out of mine. Never out of mind, Sheila. Just her name was a song of love. I walked back on air. But fortunately, as it turned out, as I came back in the house, the first thing my eye fell on was the portrait of Uncle Terence. And for the moment, Sheila was out of my mind. Oh, no, 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 thanks. I, I really, I couldn't eat another thing. <laughs> Now, the only thing I'm hungry for now is information. About Sheila, is that what you mean? Uh, Sheila? Uh, no, no. I, I'd i rather find out about her directly. Uh, Brian, I... Uh, uh, about Sheila. Maybe I ought to tell you something. Uh, no, Uncle... I, I, I'd rather, for the moment, stick to Uncle Terrence. Hmm? Now, you said 
He's been dead for nearly 35 years. Oh, yeah, that's two years almost to the day before that portrait was painted. He died in 1940. Now, are you sure of that? Oh, sure, I know it well. I was just a slip of a girl not married to Sean yet. Huh. But it was the biggest wake this part of Galway has ever seen. Ah, it is a pity he couldn't have enjoyed it for himself. He always was the life and soul of them with his stories and all. Ah, yes, he does dearly love a wake just as much as a wedding. Mm -hmm. I did, uh, Sean. Did what? I did love a wake. But, now, look, I saw him last night. I talked to him. He brought me here. Now, now, lad, you'll have to remember you had a wee drop taken, and Portine can scramble a man's brain. I can't believe that the drip... How did Uncle Terence die? A hero at Dunkirk. Dunkirk? Ah, he was in the First World War, you know, in the Navy. And nothing would do but he had to be in the last big one, too. But a man 60 years old, they wouldn't take him. No. So he joined up with the Home Guard. When the retreat at Dunkirk came, with his Navy experience, he was taking a boat back and forth the whole three days. And when he saw that it would be his last trip... He found one of the fighting boys to take his ship back and gave up his own place to stay behind with a machine gun. The last boat out just ahead of the Jerry's brought him back. Uh, oh, they say he had more lead in him than salt in a full salt cellar. But his finger was still wrapped around the trigger of his gun. It was a sad wake, that, mm. Uncle Terence's. Mm. The only sad one I'd ever been to. Although... None of them are the same without him to keep the jokes flying. <laughs> Even Michael Mahan had naught but sorrow in him. Him who always had a twinkle in his eye. I remember him just standing in front of the portrait there. Just standing. Not even drinking from his glass. And, and do you remember what he said? It was this, it was this. It says, a, a brass of a boy, Terence Mibucco. And you should have lived a hundred years. Well, don't you worry. We'll see you do. I always wondered what he meant by that. Well, now, look, don't you see? If he was McDrewish, I mean, if Mahan was a real leprechaun... Now, Tush, boy, don't let our Irish fancies run off with you. Sure, all he meant was he wouldn't be soon forgotten. Well, now, I, uh, <clears throat> I have to be off to work, and Mary has things to do, and, uh, and Brian. Yeah. Don't dwell on Uncle Terence. Uh, find some other thoughts to fill your head. Yes, I... I have. I have. And that's the great bog to the north. Huh? Don't ever go near there, Brian. Why not, Sheila? Once the peat catches you, you'll never get free. And they say it'll swallow a man in less than a minute. To the southwest are the rest of the Schleivachti Mountains, the ones we're in now. And away down there, to the southeast, is the River Shannon. <gasps> What's the matter? Are you cold? How could I be cold with your arm about me? Bold. <laughs> That's what I am. Bold. Because you love me. And how could you be bashful with a man who loves you now, tomorrow, and forever? <laughs> I, I just can't believe my luck. Don't. Don't what? Ah, oh, Brian Boyne. Don't say anything else. It's all been madness from the start. Love from the start. For us, the same thing. I should never have allowed you to. But I wanted. I loved. And sure, God can't punish me too deep for just one day of all I've dreamed. Kiss me. We've got to go. It's twilight already. Oh, just a little longer. And what about tomorrow? We have no tomorrows. Just kiss me. Goodbye, my love. Goodbye, Brian. Goodbye. Again, she was gone from me on the wind, gliding and leaping down the mountain, picnic basket in hand, as sure-footed and graceful as a mountain goat. Sheila! Sheila! Wait! She didn't stop to look back. And I plunged down after her, recklessly and clumsily as a boar. I hadn't gone 50 yards before I caught my foot on some trailing root, falling heavily and knocking myself stone cold for a moment. 
By the time I came to, she was gone from sight. And in the gathering darkness, limping heavily, it was all I could do to find my way back to the daily farm. Brian, my darling, there you are. Sure we thought you might be lost in the dark. Yeah, I'm lost in the dark, all right, Aunt Mary. Now, look, I don't... I don't know if it's another of your Irish fantasies or what. Oh, where have you been all day, lad? Oh, and you're hurt. Yes. Sean, yes. come in here. Oh, well, I'm, I'm coming, Mary. Wait, wait, you sound as though someone put the fear of God in you. What, yes. What's happened at all? It's Brian, he's hurt. What? And more than physically, I'm thinking. Were you with Sheila O'Shaughnessy this day? Yes, I was. And I love her. And I know she loves me. Oh. But she's told me goodbye. Why? I mean, am I crazy... Is she just another figment of my imagination? Oh, you see, Sean, I told you we should have told the boy the truth. Yeah, well, well, better late than never. Uh, Sheila is engaged to be married to Malachi Malloy. Well, is that all? Huh? Well, then all she has to do is break no, it. No, no, she has a marriage contract. Well, surely that has no real legal standing. Today, no. Except, uh, well, you see, uh, a few years ago... Uh, Sheila's father had a heart attack. He got into financial difficulties, and the only way out was through Malloy, the loan shark. He lent him the money in exchange for his daughter when she became 21. Well, sure, Joe thought he could have things straightened out before then, but, but he suddenly had a second attack and died. Uh, well, I'll pay the money back. Have you got it? Well, no, not right now, but as soon as... Oh, no good for Malachi Malloy. Besides... You make so much as one move at Sheila, and in this county, he'd have his woolly boys sew you in a sack and bury you in the peat bog. And the, uh, the wedding is day after tomorrow. Now, now, look, just wait a minute. I mean, this is crazy. This is the 20th century. I'm an American citizen. There must be something I can do. Ah! What the devil is that? Oh, it's Uncle Terrence. He what? wants out again. The Lord knows what to stir up this time. But there's no way to stop the man. So, here we are back again about where we started. Where are we? But what can Uncle Terence do or undo, even supposing that's what he's after? Still, why couldn't it be? Since he's now well established as a denizen of the afterworld, I'll return shortly with Act Three. It was W.S. Gilbert, probably the finest lyricist of all time, who wrote of John Wellington Wells that he was a dealer in magic and spells, in blessings and curses, and ever-filled purses, in prophecies, witches, and knells. I mention him only because it brings us back to our story of magic, fantasy, and, so far, pleasant sorcery. But will it remain that way as Uncle Terence's picture rocks on the wall, and once again we hear the eldritch scream of the banshee wail? <coughs> I'll turn the picture to the wall. But if he's going to appear, it will only be to the one who turns the picture. I think this time we'd better let it be Brian. Now look, I'm not going to ask any questions anymore. Just leave me alone. I'll, I'll turn the picture. But Brian! Come away, Mary. We're out of this entirely. All right, Uncle Terrence, or whoever you are, I am about to turn the picture. And all I say is, you get me, Sheila... Or show me how to get her. And I'll, I don't care what the price is, short of my immortal soul, and I'll pay that gladly. Uh, here you go. Ah, who wants your immortal soul? Where are you? Turn around. You have eyes, haven't you? Sitting right here in the fireplace nook. Oh. Uh, what are you? Fact or fiction? Oh, why now, in a manner of speaking, I'd say somewhere in between. Well, does it make any sense to talk to you? All oh, the sense in the word. Even to suppose I believed, uh, if you're a banshee. Now, what's the matter with a banshee? Well, it's evil, isn't it? Ah, the abysmal ignorance of the word. 
A banshee, young man, is a domestic spirit devoted to the care of its own particular family. Oh, well, are you going to help Sheila and me? I'm sure I'm going to do my best, but I'm not infallible. We'll have to be quick and nimble as the devil on this one. Well, why can't I just go to this Malachi Malloy and straighten it out man oh, to man? Oh, oh, oh. To begin with, did you ever see him? No. Oh, he's formidable, lad. No doubt of that. The man is a giant, and he's made of steel. Well, look, whose side are you on, mine or his? Easy, lad, easy. Am I not the Banshee, and aren't you one of the family? Besides, he's a black Irisher if there ever was one. But I've got to take thought on this. If you're to have the chance I brought you here for in the first place. You brought me here? Well, sure, you didn't think as an American you'd have enough sense to get here and pick the right Irish girl for yourself. Now, let me go on back up to my frame and get everything shipshape and squared away. I'll see you on the morrow. And, psst, watch your step. <laughs> Uncle Sean and Mary were off to bed by the time our conference was through. I was grateful. I didn't want to talk about Sheila or her intended husband any more that night. I hoped to sleep, but I tossed and turned till morning, and then made the mistake of stepping outside the house for a breath of air. Coming down the road towards me was a great mountain of a man, all covered with black hair wherever his clothes didn't conceal it. The one thing his clothes could not conceal were the bulging muscles that strained at every seam. He was a good five inches taller than I was and 30 pounds heavier. And Would you be the American, Brian Mackins? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's my name. I'm Malachi Malloy. Well, I kind of guessed that. I'm of the understanding that you took my intended bride up the mountain yesterday. Well, she was kind enough to take me up for a picnic and show me the countryside. A picnic, was it? And the grass stains all over her dress. I should have brought a whip. But instead, I'm going to beat you with my bare hands. Malachi, Malachi, don't. Now, you stay out of there, Sheila. What's going on, Brian? Oh, it's just, just a little something between me and Mr. Malloy. Oh, oh, the Lord be praised. Keep them apart and kill him. Oh. Don't touch him, Malachi. Now, you stay back, woman, or I'll kill him. Now, put your hands up, Mac, and... God always defends the right. He was out for breakfast that morning. Now, I'm not exactly a... Oh, Patsy and I, I usually can take care of myself in a, in a fight. But this was a willy pad against a Marciano. He just made hamburger of me until he stopped and turned with me lying at his feet. Have you learned a lesson as, as well as him, Sheila, girl? If you haven't, I'll... I'll beat him to death. I'll make sure he never rises again. Oh, in sweet Mary's name, leave him be, Malachi. I'll marry no one but you if you'll just leave him be. All right, so be it. Now get out of this country tonight, Martin. Or I'll wring your neck like a chicken. Who's that? Open the window and let me in. Quick, now I'm fading in the daylight. Uncle Darren, the picture. Now watch, Uncle. Let, let, let me in there. And close those curtains before I disappear entirely. There, now sure, that's better, better, better that is. What are you? You're just a portrait. And how could you get to the second floor window? Shh, for warning. The only trouble I ever found with a girl is they talk too much. The answer to it all is, I'm a banshee, and I look out for my own. Brian is one of them. Oh, how is he? Was he sore hurt? Oh, a few bruises, and maybe he lost a tooth or cracked a rib. But what's that to a broken heart? You should know. Am I right? If you mean the way I feel. I was getting ready to tie a sack of potatoes around my neck, throw myself in the Shannon. Well, now, that'd be a whole lot of help. Now, I have a better idea. How would you like to meet Brian at Clonmelly's Gate on the way into the Great Bog tonight at midnight? I can't. I can't do it. I owe my father his debts. And besides, Malachi would kill him. Ah, all right, all right. Spare me all the melodramatics. What I mean is, how would you like to convince that 
hickory-headed, lame-brained Maliki. That's what you plan to do. Why? Now, what is a banshee for? Will you let me take care of the arrangements from then on? I will, Uncle Terence. I will. And uh, if I'm successful, would you let me give you away when you marry Brian? How could a banshee do that? Oh, you let me handle that, too. Just say yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Is, is that the bad cheese himself? Is it the leprechaun? God save you, McGrush. God save you, Karen Scripkin. Come here, Brian. Get us a firefly there so we can see what we're at. There, now. That's better. Do you see what Malachi did to the lad? What do you want, right, Brian? Yeah, well, I, I, I took a good beating, but I'll live. It's, uh, it's nice to see you again, Mr. Maha. Yeah, he said, no, no, no. Now, we all know what to do. Yeah, I, I just show myself in the moonlight with you in that cape and hood, and, and, and then... And then McGrush will dematerialize you back to the farm. Right. And Malachi will have no one to chase but me, <laughs> thinking I'm Sheila. I'll tell you all the rest later. <laughs> you, uh, you have the shoes, McGrush. Uh, just the one. You know, we leprechauns never make but one magic shoe. Well, 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 no matter. I can hop like a toad long enough until he's well in the bog. Psst, psst. Now, it is midnight. Here he comes. Send Brian home, Rush. And give me the shoe. And off I go. Sheila. Sheila, I warn you. Wait for me. Eh. So you tried to slip away with your light of love, eh? But you won't get away from me so easy. Eh? Where, where are you leading me? What? We're in the bog. I'm caught. I, I'm sinking. Sheila! Sheila, help me. I'm, I'm sinking in the bog. Now come back. Come back. Come back! Ah! Ah, now there's a darling girl. You wouldn't let me go down to a dark, murky death. You that knows every path and every... Well, that's not you. It's just, that can't be. The vocals have a halt on me. It's Terence Kruskeen. And who's that wee man beside you? Oh, a little friend. One of the wee green men. Here we are, uh, your nemesis or your saviors. Oh, and which would you want us to be? Oh, Lord alive. Save me. I'm up to my waist already. That's no problem. Uh, a little piece of paper. Uh, and since it's hard to read in the moonlight, I'll give you the gist, uh, as they say. I, Malachi Minoy, hereby uh, legally and completely accept the fact that all debts or claims against Thomas O'Shaughnessy uh, are revoked and considered null and void. Oh, this is blackmail. So was what you did to my friend. And the bog is even blacker and you're sinking even deeper. All right, all right. I'll sign, I'll sign. Well, that, that, there's a wee bit more. What, what? I also cancelled the marriage contract between myself and Sheila O'Shaughnessy. Yes. And in consequence of my breach of promise, yes. I award her the sum of 2,000 pounds yes. to see her and her mother started off yes. in a new country. Yes. In exchange, yes. I would accept the farm now mortgaged to me, and etc., etc., etc. For God's sake, nice stop talking! I'm up to my chest already. I'll sign, I'll sign anything. But would you live up to it? Now, there's the reason. Oh, please! You, you, you wouldn't have any idea now of, of attacking young Brian again. No, no! Should, uh, Should we trust him, do you think, McGrush? Sure. He's an Irishman after all. I get one in trouble enough, and you never have to worry. Don't forget you. to send pictures yes, of the wagon. Yes, oh, goodbye. Goodbye. Sorry I have to leave. I, I have to get back for my job. Oh, we're sorry, hey. too, but we'll take care of Mother O'Shaughnessy till you're married and have a place to stay. Uh, well, Mary, <sighs> all's well that ends well, but who'd have thought it? You said they made a wonderful couple. <laughs> I'll never understand how Malachi suddenly got so generous. 
I'll never understand why, but I can guess how. What do you mean? Take a look. We're going to have to get a new picture to hang over the fireplace. Oh, now, what's it doing turn to the wall again? What's he up to now? <laughs> it doesn't turn to the wall. Huh? It's just a blank canvas. That... What do you mean? Have a look for yourself. Holy mother, it's blank on both sides. Where's Uncle Terence? I have a feeling he's off to America. He always did want to see the United 